For 23, Sawyer's Recipe for Forcemeats. Take a pound and a half of lean veal from the fillet, and cut it in long thin slices, scrape with a knife till nothing but the fiber remains, put it in a mortar, pound it 10 minutes, or until in a puree. Pass it through a wire sieve, use the remainder in stock, then take one pound of good fresh beef suet, which skin, shred, and chop very fine, put it in a mortar and pound it, then add six ounces. Of panada, that is, bread soaked in milk and boiled till nearly dry, with the suet, pound them well together, and add the veal, season with a teaspoonful of salt, a quarter one of pepper, half that of nutmeg, work all well together. Then add four eggs by degrees, continually pounding the contents of the mortar. When well mixed, take a small piece in a spoon, and poach it in some boiling water, and if it is delicate, firm, and of a good flavor, it is ready for use. Fried Bread Crumbs For 24, cut the bread into thin slices, place them in a cool oven overnight, and when thoroughly dry and crisp, roll them down into fine crumbs. Put some lard, or clarified dripping, into a frying pan. Bring it to the boiling point, throw in the crumbs, and fry them very quickly. Directly they are done, lift them out with a slice, and drain them before the fire from all greasy moisture. When quite crisp, they are ready for use. The fat they are fried in should be clear, and the crumbs should not have the slightest appearance or taste of having been, in the least degree, burnt. Fried Sippets of Bread, for Garnishing Many Dishes 425. Cut the bread into thin slices, and stamp them out in whatever shape you like, rings, crosses, diamonds, and k. And k. Fry them in the same manner as the bread crumbs, in clear boiling lard, or clarified dripping, and drain them until thoroughly crisp before the fire. When variety is desired, fry some of a pale color, and others of a darker hue. Fried bread for borders. For 26, proceed as above, by frying some slices of bread cut in any fanciful shape. When quite crisp, Dip one side of the sip pet into the beaten white of an egg mixed with a little flour, and place it on the edge of the dish. Continue in this manner till the border is completed, arranging the sip pets a pale and a dark one alternately. Genovese sauce for salmon, trout, and k. Ingredients One small carrot, a small faggot of sweet herbs, including parsley, one onion, five or six mushrooms, when obtainable, one bay leaf, six cloves, one blade of mace, two ounces of butter, one glass of sherry, one and a half pint of white stock, no. 107. Thickening of butter and flour, the juice of half a lemon. Mode. Cut up the onion and carrot into small rings, and put them into a stew pan with the herbs, mushrooms, bay leaf, cloves, and mace. Add the butter and simmer the whole very gently over a slow fire until the onion is quite tender. Pour in the stock and sherry, and stew slowly for one hour, when strain it off into a clean saucepan. Now make a thickening of butter and flour, put it to the sauce, stir it over the fire until perfectly smooth and mellow, add the lemon juice, give one boil, when it will be ready for table. Time. Altogether two hours. Average cost, ones. 3d per pint. Sufficient, half this quantity for two slices of salmon. Illustration, Sage. Sage. This was originally a native of the south of Europe, but it has long been cultivated in the English garden. There are several kinds of it, known as the green, the red, the small-leaved, and the broad-leaved balsamic. In cookery, its principal use is for stuffings and sauces, for which purpose the red is the most agreeable, and the green the next. The others are used for medical purposes. Pickled Gherkins Ingredients Salt and water, one ounce of bruised ginger, half a ounce of whole black pepper, a quarter ounce of whole allspice, for cloves, two blades of mace, a little horseradish. This proportion of pepper, spices, and for one quart of vinegar. Mode. Let the gherkins remain in salt and water for three or four days, when take them out, wipe perfectly dry, and put them into a stone jar. Boil sufficient vinegar to cover them, 
with spices and pepper, and, in the above proportion, for 10 minutes. Pour it, quite boiling, over the gherkins, cover the jar with vine leaves, and put over them a plate, setting them near the fire, where they must remain all night. Next day drain off the vinegar, boil it up again, and pour it hot over them. Cover up with fresh leaves, and let the whole remain till quite cold. Now tie down closely with bladder to exclude the air, and in a month or two, they will be fit for use. Time 4 days Seasonable from the middle of July to the end of August. Illustration, Gherkins 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 are young cucumbers, and the only way in which they are used for cooking purposes is pickling them, as by the recipe here given. Not having arrived at maturity, they have not, of course, so strongly a developed flavor as cucumbers, and, as a pickle, they are very general favorites. Gooseberry Sauce for Boiled Mackerel Ingredients 1 pint of green gooseberries, 3 tablespoonfuls of bechamel, number 367, veal gravy may be substituted for this, 2 ounces of fresh butter, seasoning to taste of salt, pepper, and grated nutmeg. Mode Boil the gooseberries in water until quite tender. Strain them and rub them through a sieve. Put into a saucepan the bechamel or gravy, with the butter and seasoning, add the pulp from the gooseberries, mix all well together, and heat gradually through. A little pounded sugar added to this sauce is by many persons considered an improvement, as the saccharine matter takes off the extreme acidity of the unripe fruit. Time Boil the gooseberries from 20 minutes to half an hour. Sufficient, this quantity, for a large dish of mackerel. Seasonable from May to July. Illustration, the gooseberry. The gooseberry. This useful and wholesome fruit, Rebis gracularia, is thought to be indigenous to the British Isles, and may be occasionally found in a wild state in some of the eastern counties, although, when uncultivated. It is but a very small and inferior berry. The high state of perfection to which it has been here brought, is due to the skill of the English gardeners, for in no other country does it attain the same size and flavor. The humidity of the British climate, however, has doubtless something to do with the result, and it is said that gooseberries produced in Scotland as far north as Inverness, are of a very superior character. Malic and citric acid blended with sugar, produce the pleasant flavor of the gooseberry, and upon the proper development of these properties depends the success of all cooking operations with which they are connected. Glaze for covering cold hams, tongues, and k. Ingredients Stock number 104 or 107, doubling the quantity of meat in each. Mode We may remark at the outset, that unless glaze is wanted in very large quantities, it is seldom made expressly. Either of the stocks mentioned above, boiled down and reduced very considerably, will be found to produce a very good glaze. Put the stock into a stew pan, over a nice clear fire. Let it boil till it becomes somewhat stiff, when keep stirring, to prevent its burning. The moment it is sufficiently reduced, and comes to a glaze, turn it out into the glaze pot, of which we have here given an engraving. As, however, this is not to be found in every establishment, a white earthenware jar would answer the purpose, and this may be placed in a vessel of boiling water, to melt the glaze when required. It should never be warmed in a saucepan, except on the principle of the bain marie lest it should reduce too much, and become black and bitter. If the glaze is wanted of a pale color, more veal than beef should be used in making the stock. And it is as well to omit turnips and celery, as these impart a disagreeable bitter flavor. 2. Glaze cold joints, and k. Melt the glaze by placing the vessel which contains it, into the bain-marie or saucepan of boiling water. Brush it over the meat with a paste brush, and if in places it is not quite covered, repeat the operation. The glaze should not be too dark a color. See colored cut of glazed ham, p. Illustration, glaze kettle. Illustration, the bain-marie. Glaze kettle. This is a kettle used for keeping the strong stock boiled down to a jelly, which is known by the name of glaze. It is composed of two tin vessels, as shown in the cut, one of which, the upper, 
containing the glaze, is inserted into one of larger diameter and containing boiling water. A brush is put in a small hole at the top of the lid, and is employed for putting the glaze on anything that may require it. The Bain Marie So long ago as the time when emperors ruled in Rome, and the yellow Tiber passed through a populous and wealthy city, this utensil was extensively employed, and it is frequently mentioned by that profound culinary chemist of the ancients, Apicius. It is an open kind of vessel, as shown in the engraving and explained in our paragraph number 87, on the French terms used in modern cookery, filled with boiling or nearly boiling water. And into this water should be put all the stew pans containing those ingredients which it is desired to keep hot. The quantity and quality of the contents of these vessels are not at all affected. And if the hour of dinner is uncertain in any establishment, by reason of the nature of the master's business, nothing is so certain a means of preserving the flavor of all dishes as the employment of the bain marie. Green sauce for green geese or ducklings. Ingredients. One quarter pint of sorrel juice, one glass of sherry, one half pint of green gooseberries, one teaspoonful of pounded sugar, one ounce of fresh butter. Mode. Boil the gooseberries in water until they are quite tender, mash them and press them through a sieve, put the pulp into a saucepan with the above ingredients, simmer for three or four minutes, and serve very hot. Time. Three or four minutes. Note. We have given this recipe as a sauce for green geese, thinking that some of our readers might sometimes require it, but, at the generality of fashionable tables, it is now seldom or never served. Illustration, Sorrel Sorrel We gather from the pages of Pliny and Apicius, that sorrel was cultivated by the Romans in order to give it more strength and flavor, and that they also partook of it sometimes stewed with mustard, being seasoned with a little oil and vinegar. At the present day, English cookery is not much indebted to this plant, Romex acetosa, although the French make use of it to a considerable extent. It is found in most parts of Great Britain, and also on the continent, growing wild in the grass meadows, and, in a few gardens, it is cultivated. The acid of sorrel is very prominent, and is what chemists term a binoxalate of potash. That is, a combination of oxalic acid with potash. General stock for gravies. For 32, either of the stocks, numbers 104, 105, or 107, will be found to answer very well for the basis of many gravies, unless these are wanted very rich indeed. By the addition of various store sauces, thickening and flavoring, the stocks here referred to may be converted into very good gravies. It should be borne in mind, however, that the goodness and strength of spices, wines, flavorings, and evaporate, and that they lose a great deal of their fragrance, if added to the gravy a long time before they are wanted. If this point is attended to, a saving of one half the quantity of these ingredients will be effected, as, with long boiling, the flavor almost entirely passes away. The shank bones of mutton, previously well soaked, will be found a great assistance in enriching gravies, a kidney or melt, beef skirt, trimmings of meat, and and Answer very well when only a small quantity is wanted, and, as we have before observed, a good gravy need not necessarily be so very expensive, for economically prepared dishes are oftentimes found as savory and wholesome as dearer ones. The cook should also remember that the fragrance of gravies should not be overpowered by too much spice, or any strong essences, and that they should always be warmed in a bain-marie, after they are flavored or else in a jar or jug placed in a saucepan full of boiling water. The remains of roast meat gravy should always be saved, as, when no meat is at hand, a very nice gravy in haste may be made from it, and when added to hashes, ragouts, and, is a great improvement. Illustration, Gravy Kettle Gravy Kettle This is a utensil which will not be found in every kitchen but it is a useful one where it is necessary to keep gravies hot for the purpose of pouring over various dishes as they are cooking. It is made of copper, and should, consequently, be heated over the hot plate, if there be one, or a charcoal stove. The price at which it can be purchased is set down by Messrs. Slack at 14. Gravy for Roast Meat Ingredients 
Gravy, salt. Mode. Put a common dish with a small quantity of salt in it under the meat, about a quarter of an hour before it is removed from the fire. When the dish is full, take it away, baste the meat, and pour the gravy into the dish on which the joint is to be served. Sauces and gravies in the Middle Ages. Neither poultry, butcher's meat, nor roast game were eaten dry in the Middle Ages, any more than fried fish is now. Different sauces, each having its own peculiar flavor, were served with all these dishes, and even with the various parts of each animal. Strange and grotesque sauces, as, for example, eggs cooked on the spit, butter fried and roasted, were invented by the cooks of those days, but these preparations had hardly any other merit than that of being surprising and difficult to make. A quickly made gravy. Ingredients. Half a pound, of shin of beef, one half onion, one quarter carrot, two or three sprigs of parsley and savory herbs, a piece of butter about the size of a walnut, cayenne and mace to taste, three quarters pint of water. Mode. Cut up the meat into very small pieces, slice the onion and carrot, and put them into a small saucepan with the butter. Keep stirring over a sharp fire until they have taken a little color, when add the water and the remaining ingredients. Simmer for half an hour, skim well, strain, and flavor, when it will be ready for use. Time. Half an hour. Average cost, for this quantity, 5d. A hundred different dishes. Modern housewives know pretty well how much care, and attention, and foresight are necessary in order to serve well a little dinner for six or eight persons, a dinner which will give credit to the menage and satisfaction and pleasure to the guests. A quickly made gravy, under some circumstances that we have known occur, will be useful to many housekeepers when they have not much time for preparation. But, talking of speed, and time, and preparation, what a combination of all these must have been necessary for the feast at the wedding of Charles VI. Of France. On that occasion, as Froissart the chronicler tells us, the art of cooking, with its innumerable paraphernalia of sauces, with gravy, pepper, cinnamon, garlic, scallion, brains, gravy soups, milk potage, and ragouts, had a signal triumph. The skillful chef de cuisine of the royal household covered the great marble table of the regal palace with no less than a hundred different dishes, prepared in a hundred different ways. A good beef gravy for poultry, game, and c ingredients. Half a pound, of lean beef, one half pint of cold water, one shallot or small onion, one half a teaspoonful of salt, a little pepper, one tablespoonful of Harvey's sauce or mushroom ketchup, one half a teaspoonful of arrowroot. Mode. Cut up the beef into small pieces, and put it, with the water, into a stew pan. Add the shallot and seasoning, and simmer gently for three hours, taking care that it does not boil fast. A short time before it is required, take the arrowroot, and having mixed it with a little cold water, pour it into the gravy, which keeps stirring, adding the Harvey sauce, and just letting it boil. Strain off the gravy in a tureen, and serve very hot. Time. 3 hours. Average cost, 8d. Per pint. Brown gravy. Ingredients. 2 ounces of butter, 2 large onions, 2 pounds. Of shin of beef, 2 small slices of lean bacon, if at hand, salt and whole pepper to taste, 3 cloves, 2 quarts of water. For thickening, 2 ounces of butter, 3 ounces of flour. Mode. Put the butter into a stew pan. Set this on the fire, throw in the onions cut in rings, and fry them a light brown, then add the beef and bacon, which should be cut into small square pieces, season, and pour in a teacupful of water. Let it boil for about 10 minutes, or until it is of a nice brown color, occasionally stirring the contents. Now fill up with water in the above proportion, let it boil up, when draw it to the side of the fire to simmer very gently for one and a half hour. Strain, and when cold, take off all the fat. In thickening this gravy, Melt 3 ounces of butter in a stew pan, add 2 ounces of flour, and stir till of a light brown color, when cold, add it to the strained gravy, and boil it up quickly. This thickening may be made in larger quantities, 
and kept in a stone jar for use when wanted. Time. Altogether, 2 hours. Average cost, 4d. Per pint. Cloves. This very agreeable spice is the unexpanded flower buds of the Caryophyllus aromaticus, a handsome, branching tree, a native of the Malacca Islands. They take their name from the Latin word clavis, or the French clue, both meaning a nail, and to which the clove has a considerable resemblance. Cloves were but little known to the ancients, and Pliny appears to be the only writer who mentions them. And he says, vaguely enough, that some were brought to Rome, very similar to grains of pepper, but somewhat longer, that they were only to be found in India, in a wood consecrated to the gods, and that they served in the manufacture of perfumes. The Dutch, as in the case of the nutmeg, c. 378, endeavored, when they gained possession of the Spice Islands, to secure a monopoly of cloves, and, so that the cultivation of the tree might be confined to Amboina, their chief island, bribed the surrounding chiefs to cut down all trees found elsewhere. The Amboina, or royal clove, is said to be the best, and is rare, but other kinds, nearly equally good, are produced in other parts of the world, and they come to Europe from Mauritius, Bourbon, Cayenne, and Martinique, as also from St. Kitts, St. Vincent's, and Trinidad. The clove contains about 20% of volatile aromatic oil, to which it owes its peculiar pungent flavor, its other parts being composed of woody fiber, water, gum, and resin. Brown gravy without meat. Ingredients. Two large onions, one large carrot, two ounces of butter, three pints of boiling water, one bunch of savory herbs, a wineglassful of good beer, salt and pepper to taste. Mode. Slice, flour, and fry the onions and carrots in the butter until of a nice light brown color, then add the boiling water and the remaining ingredients, let the whole stew gently for about an hour, then strain, and when cold, skim off all the fat. Thicken it in the same manner as recipe number 436, and, if thought necessary, add a few drops of coloring number 108. Time. 1 hour. Average cost, 2d. Per pint. Note. The addition of a small quantity of mushroom ketchup or Harvey's sauce very much improves the flavor of this gravy. Rich gravy for hashes, ragouts, and k. Ingredients. 2 pounds. Of shin of beef, 1 large onion or a few shallots, a little flour, a bunch of savory herbs, 2 blades of mace, 2 or 3 cloves, for whole allspice, 1 quarter teaspoonful of whole pepper, 1 slice of lean ham or bacon, 1 half a head of celery, when at hand. 2 pints of boiling water. Salt and cayenne to taste. Mode. Cut the beef into thin slices, as also the onions, dredge them with flour, and fry of a pale brown, but do not allow them to get black, pour in the boiling water, let it boil up, and skim. Add the remaining ingredients, and simmer the whole very gently for two hours, or until all the juices are extracted from the meat, put it by to get cold, when take off all the fat. This gravy may be flavored with ketchup, store sauces, wine, or, in fact, anything that may give additional and suitable relish to the dish it is intended for. Time. Rather more than 2 hours. Average cost, 8d. Per pint. Illustration, Pimento. Allspice. This is the popular name given to pimento, or Jamaica pepper, known to naturalists as Eugenia pimenta, and belonging to the order of Myrtaceae. It is the berry of a fine tree in the West Indies and South America, which attains a height of from 15 to 20 feet, the berries are not allowed to ripen, but, being gathered green, are then dried in the sun, and then become black. It is an inexpensive spice, and is considered more mild and innocent than most other spices, consequently, it is much used for domestic purposes, combining a very agreeable variety of flavors. Gravy made without meat for fowls. Ingredients The necks, feet, livers, and gizzards of the fowls, one slice of toasted bread, one half onion, one faggot of savory herbs, salt and pepper to taste, one half pint of water, thickening of butter and flour, one dessertspoonful of ketchup. Mode 
wash the feet of the fowls thoroughly clean, and cut them and the neck into small pieces. Put these into a stew pan with the bread, onion, herbs, seasoning, livers, and gizzards, pour the water over them and simmer gently for one hour. Now take out the liver, pound it, and strain the liquor to it. Add a thickening of butter and flour, and a flavoring of mushroom ketchup, boil it up and serve. Time. 1 hour. Average cost, 4d. Per pint. A cheap gravy for hashes, and k. Ingredients. Bones and trimmings of the cooked joint intended for hashing, 1 quarter teaspoonful of salt, 1 quarter teaspoonful of whole pepper, 1 quarter teaspoonful of whole allspice, a small faggot of savory herbs, 1 half head of celery, 1 onion, 1 ounce of butter, thickening, sufficient boiling water to cover the bones. Mode. Chop the bones in small pieces, and put them in a stew pan, with the trimmings, salt, pepper, spice, herbs, and celery. Cover with boiling water, and let the whole simmer gently for one and a half or two hours. Slice and fry the onion in the butter till it is of a pale brown, and mix it gradually with the gravy made from the bones, boil for a quarter hour, and strain into a basin. Now put it back into the stew pan, flavor with walnut pickle or ketchup, pickled onion liquor, or any store sauce that may be preferred. Thicken with a little butter and flour, kneaded together on a plate, and the gravy will be ready for use. After the thickening is added, the gravy should just boil, to take off the rawness of the flour. Time. 2 hours, or rather more. Average cost, 4d, exclusive of the bones and trimmings. Jugged gravy, excellent. Ingredients. 2 pounds. Of shin of beef, a quarter pound, of lean ham, one onion or a few shallots, two pints of water, salt and whole pepper to taste, one blade of mace, a faggot of savory herbs, one half a large carrot, one half a head of celery. Mode. Cut up the beef and ham into small pieces, and slice the vegetables. Take a jar, capable of holding two pints of water, and arrange therein, in layers, the ham, meat, vegetables, and seasoning, alternately, filling up with the above quantity of water. Tie down the jar, or put a plate over the top, so that the steam may not escape, place it in the oven, and let it remain there from six to eight hours, should, however, the oven be very hot, less time will be required. When sufficiently cooked, strain the gravy, and when cold, remove the fat. It may be flavored with ketchup, wines, or any other store sauce that may be preferred. It is a good plan to put the jar in a cool oven overnight, to draw the gravy. And then it will not require so long baking the following day. Time. From 6 to 8 hours, according to the oven. Average cost, 7d. Per pint. Illustration, Celery. Celery. As in the above recipe, the roots of celery are principally used in England for flavoring soups, sauces, and gravies, and for serving with cheese at the termination of a dinner, and as an ingredient for salad. In Italy, however, the green leaves and stems are also employed for stews and soups, and the seeds are also more frequently made use of on the continent than in our own islands. In Germany, celery is very highly esteemed. And it is there boiled and served up as a dish by itself, as well as used in the composition of mixed dishes. We ourselves think that this mild aromatic plant might oftener be cooked than it is. For there are very few nicer vegetable preparations brought to table than a well-dressed plate of stewed celery. Veal gravy for white sauces, fricassees, and k. Ingredients. Two slices of nicely flavored lean ham, any poultry trimmings, three pounds. Of lean veal, a faggot of savory herbs, including parsley, a few green onions, or one large onion may be substituted for these, a few mushrooms, when obtainable, one blade of mace, salt to taste, three pints of water. Mode. Cut up the ham and veal into small square pieces, put these in a stew pan, moistening them with a small quantity of water, place them over the fire to draw down. When the bottom of the stewpan becomes covered with a white glaze, fill up with water in the above proportion, 
add the remaining ingredients, stew very slowly for 3 or 4 hours, and do not forget to skim well the moment it boils. Put it by, and, when cold, take off all the fat. This may be used for bechamel, sauce tourney, and many other white sauces. Time. 3 or 4 hours. Average cost, 9d. Per pint. Cheap gravy for minced veal. Ingredients. Bones and trimmings of cold roast or boiled veal, one and a half pint of water, one onion, one quarter teaspoonful of minced lemon peel, one quarter teaspoonful of salt, one blade of pounded mace, the juice of one quarter lemon, thickening of butter and flour. Mode. Put all the ingredients into a stew pan, except the thickening and lemon juice, and let them simmer very gently for rather more than one hour, or until the liquor is reduced to a pint, when strained through a hair sieve. Add a thickening of butter and flour, and the lemon juice, set it on the fire, and let it just boil up, when it will be ready for use. It may be flavored with a little tomato sauce, and, where a rather dark colored gravy is not objected to, ketchup, or Harvey's sauce, may be added at pleasure. Time. Rather more than one hour. Average cost, 3D. Gravy for venison. Ingredients. Trimmings of venison, 3 or 4 mutton shank bones, salt to taste, 1 pint of water, 2 teaspoonfuls of walnut ketchup. Mode. Brown the trimmings over a nice clear fire, and put them in a stew pan with the shank bones and water. Simmer gently for 2 hours, strain and skim, and add the walnut ketchup and a seasoning of salt. Let it just boil, when it is ready to serve. Time. 2 hours. Illustration, the deer. Venison. Far, far away in ages past, our fathers loved the chase, and what it brought. And it is usually imagined that when Isaac ordered his son Esau to go out with his weapons, his quiver and his bow, and to prepare for him savory meat, such as he loved, that it was venison he desired. The wise Solomon, too, delighted in this kind of fare, for we learn that, at his table, every day were served the wild ox, the roebuck, and the stag. Xenophon informs us, in his history, that Cyrus, king of Persia, ordered that venison should never be wanting at his repasts, and of the effeminate Greeks it was the delight. The Romans, also, were devoted admirers of the flesh of the deer. And our own kings and princes, from the great Alfred down to the prince consort, have hunted, although, it must be confessed, under vastly different circumstances, the swift buck, and relished their paunch all the more keenly. That they had borne themselves bravely in the pursuit of the animal. To dry herbs for winter use. For forty-five, on a very dry day, gather the herbs, just before they begin to flower. If this is done when the weather is damp, the herbs will not be so good a color. It is very necessary to be particular in little matters like this, for trifles constitute perfection, and herbs nicely dried will be found very acceptable when frost and snow are on the ground. It is hardly necessary, however, to state that the flavor and fragrance of fresh herbs are incomparably finer. They should be perfectly freed from dirt and dust, and be divided into small bunches, with their roots cut off. Dry them quickly in a very hot oven, or before the fire, as by this means most of their flavor will be preserved, and be careful not to burn them, tie them up in paper bags, and keep in a dry place. This is a very general way of preserving dried herbs, but we would recommend the plan described in a former recipe. Seasonable From the month of July to the end of September is the proper time for storing herbs for winter use. Herb powder for flavoring, when fresh herbs are not obtainable. Ingredients 1 ounce of dried lemon thyme, 1 ounce of dried winter savory, 1 ounce of dried sweet marjoram and basil, 2 ounces of dried parsley, 1 ounce of dried lemon peel. Mode. Prepare and dry the herbs by recipe number 445, pick the leaves from the stalks, pound them, and sift them through a hair sieve, mix in the above proportions, and keep in glass bottles, carefully excluding the air. This, we think, a far better method of keeping herbs, as the flavor and fragrance do not evaporate so much as when they are merely put in paper bags. Preparing them in this way, you have them ready for use at a moment's notice. 
mint, sage, parsley, and dried, pounded, and each put into separate bottles, will be found very useful in winter. Illustration, cork with wooden top. Corks with wooden tops. These are the best corks to use and it is indispensable that the air should not be admitted to the ingredients contained in bottles which are in constant use. The top, which, as will be seen by the accompanying little cut, is larger than the cork, is made of wood. And, besides effectually covering the whole top of the bottle, can be easily removed and again used, as no corkscrew is necessary to pull it out. Savory. This we find described by Columella, a voluminous Roman writer on agriculture, as an odoriferous herb, which, in the brave days of old, entered into the seasoning of nearly every dish. Verily, there are but few new things under the sun, and we don't find that we have made many discoveries in gastronomy, at least beyond what was known to the ancient inhabitants of Italy. We possess two varieties of this aromatic herb, known to naturalists as Saccharigia. They are called summer and winter savory, according to the time of the year when they are fit for gathering. Both sorts are in general cultivation throughout England. Horseradish sauce, to serve with roast beef. Ingredients 4 tablespoonfuls of grated horseradish, 1 teaspoonful of pounded sugar, 1 teaspoonful of salt, 1 half teaspoonful of pepper, 2 teaspoonfuls of made mustard, vinegar. Mode Grate the horseradish, and mix it well with the sugar, salt, pepper, and mustard. Moisten it with sufficient vinegar to give it the consistency of cream, and serve in a tureen, three or four tablespoonfuls of cream added to the above, very much improve the appearance and flavor of this sauce. To heat it to serve with hot roast beef, put it in a bain-marie or a jar, which place in a saucepan of boiling water, make it hot, but do not allow it to boil, or it will curdle. Note. This sauce is a great improvement on the old-fashioned way of serving cold scraped horseradish with hot roast beef. The mixing of the cold vinegar with the warm gravy cools and spoils everything on the plate. Of course, with cold meat, the sauce should be served cold. Illustration, the horseradish. The horseradish. This has been, for many years, a favorite accompaniment of roast beef, and is a native of England. It grows wild in wet ground, but has long been cultivated in the garden, and is, occasionally, used in winter salads and in sauces. On account of the great volatility of its oil, it should never be preserved by drying, but should be kept moist by being buried in sand. So rapidly does its volatile oil evaporate, that even when scraped for the table, it almost immediately spoils by exposure to the air. Horseradish Vinegar Ingredients a quarter pound, of scraped horseradish, one ounce. Of minced shallot, one dram of cayenne, one quart of vinegar. Mode. Put all the ingredients into a bottle, which shake well every day for a fortnight. When it is thoroughly steeped, strain and bottle, and it will be fit for use immediately. This will be found an agreeable relish to cold beef, and seasonable. This vinegar should be made either in October or November, as horseradish is then in its highest perfection. Indian curry powder, founded on Dr. Kitchener's recipe. Ingredients A quarter pound, of coriander seed, a quarter pound, of turmeric, two ounces of cinnamon seed, half a ounce of cayenne, one ounce of mustard, one ounce of ground ginger, one half ounce of allspice, two ounces of fenugreek seed. Mode Put all the ingredients in a cool oven, where they should remain one night, then pound them in a mortar, rub them through a sieve, and mix thoroughly together, keep the powder in a bottle, from which the air should be completely excluded. Note. We have given this recipe for curry powder, as some persons prefer to make it at home, but that purchased at any respectable shop is, generally speaking, far superior, and, taking all things into consideration, very frequently more economical. Indian mustard, an excellent relish to bread and butter, or any cold. Meat. Ingredients. A quarter pound, of the best mustard, a quarter pound, of flour, half a ounce. Of salt, for shallots, four tablespoonfuls of vinegar, four tablespoonfuls of ketchup, one quarter bottle of anchovy sauce. Mode. 
Put the mustard, flour, and salt into a basin, and make them into a stiff paste with boiling water. Boil the shallots with the vinegar, ketchup, and anchovy sauce, for 10 minutes, and pour the whole, boiling, over the mixture in the basin, stir well, and reduce it to a proper thickness. Put it into a bottle, with a bruised shallot at the bottom, and store away for use. This makes an excellent relish, and if properly prepared will keep for years. Illustration, Mustard Mustard Before the year 1729, mustard was not known at English tables. About that time an old woman, of the name of Clements, residing in Durham, began to grind the seed in a mill, and to pass the flour through several processes necessary to free the seed from its husks. She kept her secret for many years to herself, during which she sold large quantities of mustard throughout the country, but especially in London. Here it was introduced to the royal table, when it received the approval of George I. From the circumstance of Mrs. Clements being a resident at Durham, it obtained the name of Durham Mustard. In the county of that name it is still principally cultivated, and the plant is remarkable for the rapidity of its growth. It is the best stimulant employed to impart strength to the digestive organs, and even in its previously coarsely pounded state, had a high reputation with our ancestors. Indian Pickle, Very Superior Ingredients To each gallon of vinegar allow six cloves of garlic, twelve shallots, two sticks of sliced horseradish, a quarter pound, of bruised ginger, two ounces of whole black pepper, one ounce of long pepper, one ounce of allspice, twelve cloves, a quarter ounce of cayenne, two ounces. Of mustard seed, a quarter pound, of mustard, one ounce of turmeric, a white cabbage, cauliflowers, radish pods, French beans, gherkins, small round pickling onions, nasturtiums, capsicums, chilies, and Mode. Cut the cabbage, which must be hard and white, into slices, and the cauliflowers into small branches, sprinkle salt over them in a large dish, and let them remain two days. Then dry them, and put them into a very large jar, with garlic, shallots, horseradish, ginger, pepper, allspice, and cloves, in the above proportions. Boil sufficient vinegar to cover them, which pour over, and, when cold, cover up to keep them free from dust. As the other things for the pickle ripen at different times, they may be added as they are ready, these will be radish pods, French beans, gherkins, small onions, nasturtiums, capsicums, chilies, and k. And k. As these are procured, they must, first of all, be washed in a little cold vinegar, wiped, and then simply added to the other ingredients in the large jar, only taking care that they are covered by the vinegar. If more vinegar should be wanted to add to the pickle, do not omit first to boil it before adding it to the rest. When you have collected all the things you require, turn all out in a large pan, and thoroughly mix them. Now put the mixed vegetables into smaller jars, without any of the vinegar. Then boil the vinegar again, adding as much more as will be required to fill the different jars, and also cayenne, mustard seed, turmeric, and mustard which must be well mixed with a little cold vinegar. Allowing the quantities named above to each gallon of vinegar. Pour the vinegar, boiling hot, over the pickle, and when cold, tie down with a bladder. If the pickle is wanted for immediate use, the vinegar should be boiled twice more, but the better way is to make it during one season for use during the next. It will keep for years, if care is taken that the vegetables are quite covered by the vinegar. This recipe was taken from the directions of a lady whose pickle was always pronounced excellent by all who tasted it, and who has, for many years, exactly followed the recipe given above. Underscore underscore note underscore. For small families, perhaps the above quantity of pickle will be considered too large, but this may be decreased at pleasure, taking care to properly proportion the various ingredients. Illustration, India Pickle Keeping Pickles Nothing shows more, perhaps, the difference between a tidy thrifty housewife and a lady to whom these desirable epithets may not honestly be applied, than the appearance of their respective store closets. The former is able, the moment anything is wanted, to put her hand on it at once. No time is lost, no vexation incurred, no dish spoilt for the want of, just little something, 
the latter, on the contrary, hunts all over her cupboard for the ketchup the cook requires. Or the pickle the husband thinks he should like a little of with his cold roast beef or mutton chop, and vainly seeks for the emden groats, or arrowroot, to make one of her little boys some gruel. One plan, then, we strenuously advise all who do not follow, to begin at once, and that is, to label all their various pickles and store sauces, in the same way as the cut here shows. It will occupy a little time at first, but there will be economy of it in the long run. Vinegar. This term is derived from the two French words vinegar, sour wine, and should, therefore, be strictly applied to that which is made only from wine. As the acid is the same, however it is procured, that made from ale also takes the same name. Nearly all ancient nations were acquainted with the use of vinegar. We learn in Ruth, that the reapers in the east soaked their bread in it to freshen it. The Romans kept large quantities of it in their cellars, using it, to a great extent, in their seasonings and sauces. This people attributed very beneficial qualities to it, as it was supposed to be digestive, antibilious, and antiscorbutic, as well as refreshing. Spartianus, a Latin historian, tells us that, mixed with water, it was the drink of the soldiers, and that, thanks to this beverage, the veterans of the Roman army braved, by its use. The inclemency and variety of all the different seasons and climates of Europe, Asia, and Africa. It is said, the Spanish peasantry, and other inhabitants of the southern parts of Europe, still follow this practice, and add to a gallon of water about a gill of wine vinegar, with a little salt. And that this drink, with a little bread, enables them, under the heat of their burning sun, to sustain the labors of the field. Indian Chetney Sauce Ingredients 8 ounces of sharp, sour apples, pared and cored, 8 ounces of tomatoes, 8 ounces of salt, 8 ounces of brown, sugar, 8 ounces of stoned raisins, 4 ounces of cayenne, 4 ounces of powdered ginger, 2 ounces of garlic, 2 ounces of shallots, 3 quarts of vinegar, 1 quart of lemon juice. Mode. Chop the apples in small square pieces, and add to them the other ingredients. Mix the whole well together, and put in a well-covered jar. Keep this in a warm place, and stir every day for a month, taking care to put on the lid after this operation, strain, but do not squeeze it dry. Store it away in clean jars or bottles for use, and the liquor will serve as an excellent sauce for meat or fish. Seasonable. Make this sauce when tomatoes are in full season, that is, from the beginning of September to the end of October. Pickles. The ancient Greeks and Romans held their pickles in high estimation. They consisted of flowers, herbs, roots, and vegetables, preserved in vinegar, and which were kept, for a long time, in cylindrical vases with wide mouths. Their cooks prepared pickles with the greatest care, and the various ingredients were macerated in oil, brine, and vinegar, with which they were often impregnated drop by drop. Meat, also, after having been cut into very small pieces, was treated in the same manner. Italian Sauce Brown. Ingredients. A few chopped mushrooms and shallots, one half pint of stock, no. 105, one half glass of Madeira, the juice of one half lemon, one half teaspoonful of pounded sugar, one teaspoonful of chopped parsley. Mode. Put the stock into a stew pan with the mushrooms, shallots, and Madeira, and stew gently for a quarter hour, then add the remaining ingredients, and let them just boil. When the sauce is done enough, put it in another stew pan, and warm it in a bain-marie. See number 430. The mushrooms should not be chopped long before they are wanted, as they will then become black. Time. A quarter hour. Average cost, for this quantity, 7d. Sufficient for a small dish. Italian sauce, white. Ingredients. One half pint of white stock, number 107, two tablespoonfuls of chopped mushrooms, one dessert spoonful of chopped shallots, one slice of ham, minced very fine, one quarter pint of bechamel, number 367. Salt to taste, a few drops of garlic vinegar, one half teaspoonful of pounded sugar, a squeeze of lemon juice. Mode. 
Put the shawats and mushrooms into a stew pan with the stock and ham, and simmer very gently for half an hour, when add the bechamel. Let it just boil up, and then strain it through a tammy, season with the above ingredients, and serve very hot. If this sauce should not have retained a nice white color, a little cream may be added. Time. Half an hour. Average cost, for this quantity, 10 d. Sufficient for a moderate-sized dish. Note. To preserve the color of the mushrooms after pickling, throw them into water to which a little lemon juice has been added. To pickle lemons with the peel on. Ingredients. 6 lemons, 2 quarts of boiling water, to each quart of vinegar allow half a ounce of cloves, half a ounce of white pepper, 1 ounce of bruised ginger, a quarter ounce of mace and chilies, 1 ounce. Of mustard seed, 1 half stick of sliced horseradish, a few cloves of garlic. Mode. Put the lemons into a brine that will bear an egg, let them remain in it 6 days, stirring them every day. Have ready 2 quarts of boiling water, put in the lemons, and allow them to boil for a quarter hour, take them out, and let them lie in a cloth until perfectly dry and cold. Boil up sufficient vinegar to cover the lemons, with all the above ingredients, allowing the same proportion as stated to each quart of vinegar. Pack the lemons in a jar, pour over the vinegar, and boiling hot, and tie down with a bladder. They will be fit for use in about 12 months, or rather sooner. Seasonable. This should be made from November to April. The lemon. In the earlier ages of the world, the lemon does not appear to have been at all known, and the Romans only became acquainted with it at a very late period, and then only used it to keep moths from their garments. Its acidity would seem to have been unpleasant to them, and in Pliny's time, at the commencement of the Christian era, this fruit was hardly accepted, otherwise than as an excellent antidote against the effects of poison. Many anecdotes have been related concerning the antivenomous properties of the lemon. Athenius, a Latin writer, telling us, that on one occasion, two men felt no effects from the bites of dangerous serpents, because they had previously eaten of this fruit. To pickle lemons without the peel. Ingredients. 6 lemons, 1 pound. Of fine salt, to each quart of vinegar, the same ingredients as number 455. Mode. Peel the lemons, slit each one down three times, so as not to divide them, and rub the salt well into the divisions. Place them in a pan, where they must remain for a week, turning them every other day, then put them in a Dutch oven before a clear fire until the salt has become perfectly dry, then arrange them in a jar. Pour over sufficient boiling vinegar to cover them, to which have been added the ingredients mentioned in the foregoing recipe, tie down closely, and in about nine months they will be fit for use. Seasonable. The best time to make this is from November to April. Note. After this pickle has been made from four to five months, the liquor may be strained and bottled, and will be found an excellent lemon ketchup. Lemon juice. Citric acid is the principal component part of lemon juice, which, in addition to the agreeableness of its flavor, is also particularly cooling and grateful. It is likewise an antiscorbutic, and this quality enhances its value. In order to combat the fatal effects of scurvy amongst the crews of ships at sea, a regular allowance of lemon juice is served out to the men, and by this practice, the disease has almost entirely disappeared. By putting the juice into bottles, and pouring on the top sufficient oil to cover it, it may be preserved for a considerable time. Italy and Turkey export great quantities of it in this manner. Lemon sauce for boiled fowls. Ingredients. One small lemon, three quarters pint of melted butter, number 380. Mode. Cut the lemon into very thin slices, and these again into very small dice. Have ready three quarters pint of melted butter, made by recipe number 380, put in the lemon. Let it just simmer, but not boil, and pour it over the fowls. Time. 1 minute to simmer. Average cost, 6d. Sufficient for a pair of large fowls. Lemon white sauce, for fowls, fricassees, and k. Ingredients. 3 quarters pint of cream, the rind and juice of 1 lemon, 
one half teaspoonful of whole white pepper, one sprig of lemon thyme, three ounces of butter, one dessertspoonful of flour, one teacupful of white stock, salt to taste. Mode. Put the cream into a very clean saucepan, a lined one is best, with the lemon peel, pepper, and thyme, and let these infuse for half an hour, when simmer gently for a few minutes, or until there is a nice flavor of lemon. Strain it, and add a thickening of butter and flour in the above proportions, stir this well in, and put in the lemon juice at the moment of serving, mix the stock with the cream, and add a little salt. This sauce should not boil after the cream and stock are mixed together. Time. Altogether, 3 quarters hour. Average cost, 1s. 6d. Sufficient, this quantity, for a pair of large boiled fowls. Note. Where the expense of the cream is objected to, milk may be substituted for it. In this case, an additional dessert spoonful, or rather more, of flour must be added. Illustration, Lemon Thyme. Lemon Thyme. Two or three tufts of this species of thyme, Thymus citriodorus, usually find a place in the herb compartment of the kitchen garden. It is a trailing evergreen, is of smaller growth than the common kind, see no. 166, and is remarkable for its smell, which closely resembles that of the rind of a lemon. Hence its distinctive name. It is used for some particular dishes, in which the fragrance of the lemon is desired to slightly predominate. Lemington sauce, an excellent sauce for flavoring gravies, hashes, soups, and k. Author's recipe. Ingredients. Walnuts. To each quart of walnut juice allow 3 quarts of vinegar, 1 pint of Indian soy, 1 ounce of cayenne, 2 ounces. Of shallots, 3 quarters ounce of garlic, 1 half pint of port wine. Mode. Be very particular in choosing the walnuts as soon as they appear in the market, for they are more easily bruised before they become hard and shelled. Pound them in a mortar to a pulp, strew some salt over them, and let them remain thus for two or three days, occasionally stirring and moving them about. Press out the juice, and to each quart of walnut liquor allow the above proportion of vinegar, soy, cayenne, shallots, garlic, and port wine. Pound each ingredient separately in a mortar, then mix them well together, and store away for use in small bottles. The corks should be well sealed. Seasonable. This sauce should be made as soon as walnuts are obtainable, from the beginning to the middle of July. Lemon brandy. Ingredients. One pint of brandy, the rind of two small lemons, two ounces of loaf sugar, one quarter pint of water. Mode. Peel the lemons rather thin, taking care to have none of the white pith. Put the rinds into a bottle with the brandy, and let them infuse for 24 hours, when they should be strained. Now boil the sugar with the water for a few minutes, skim it, and, when cold, add it to the brandy. A dessert spoonful of this will be found an excellent flavoring for boiled custards. Lemon rind or peel. This contains an essential oil of a very high flavor and fragrance, and is consequently esteemed both a wholesome and agreeable stomachic. It is used, as will be seen by many recipes in this book, as an ingredient for flavoring a number of various dishes. Under the name of candied lemon peel, it is cleared of the pulp and preserved by sugar, when it becomes an excellent sweetmeat. By the ancient medical philosopher Galen, and others, it may be added, that dried lemon peel was considered as one of the best digestives, and recommended to weak and delicate persons. Liaison of Eggs for Thickening Sauces Ingredients The yolks of three eggs, eight tablespoonfuls of milk or cream. Mode Beat up the yolks of the eggs, to which add the milk, and strain the whole through a hair sieve. When the liaison is being added to the sauce it is intended to thicken, care must be exercised to keep stirring it during the whole time, or, otherwise, the eggs will curdle. It should only just simmer, but not boil. Liver and Lemon Sauce for Poultry Ingredients The liver of a fowl, one lemon, salt to taste, one half pint of melted butter. Number 376 Mode Wash the liver, and let it boil for a few minutes. 
Peel the lemon very thin, remove the white part in pips, and cut it into very small dice. Mince the liver and a small quantity of the lemon rind very fine, add these ingredients to one half pint of smoothly made melted butter. Season with a little salt, put in a cut lemon, heat it gradually, but do not allow it to boil, lest the butter should oil. Time. 1 minute to simmer. Sufficient to serve with a pair of small fowls. Liver and parsley sauce for poultry. Ingredients. The liver of a fowl, 1 tablespoonful of minced parsley, 1 half pint of melted butter, number 376. Mode. Wash and score the liver, boil it for a few minutes, and mince it very fine. Blanch or scald a small bunch of parsley, of which there should be sufficient when chopped to fill a tablespoon, add this, with the minced liver, to one half pint of smoothly made melted butter, let it just boil, when serve. Time. One minute to simmer. Sufficient for a pair of small fowls. Lobster sauce, to serve with turbot, salmon, brill, and k. Very good. Ingredients. One middling-sized hen lobster, three-quarters pint of melted butter, number 376, one tablespoonful of anchovy sauce, half an ounce. Of butter, salt and cayenne to taste, a little pounded mace when liked, two or three tablespoonfuls of cream. Mode. Choose a hen lobster, as this is indispensable, in order to render this sauce as good as it ought to be. Pick the meat from the shells, and cut it into small square pieces, put the spawn, which will be found under the tail of the lobster, into a mortar with half a ounce of butter, and pound it quite smooth. Rub it through a hair sieve, and cover up till wanted. Make three quarters pint of melted butter by recipe number 376. Put in all the ingredients except the lobster meat, and well mix the sauce before the lobster is added to it, as it should retain its square form, and not come to table shredded and ragged. Put in the meat, let it get thoroughly hot, but do not allow it to boil, as the color would immediately be spoiled, for it should be remembered that this sauce should always have a bright red appearance. If it is intended to be served with turbot or brill, a little of the spawn, dried and rubbed through a sieve without butter, should be saved to garnish with. But as the goodness, flavor, and appearance of the sauce so much depend on having a proper quantity of spawn, the less used for garnishing the better. Time. 1 minute to simmer. Average cost, for this quantity, 2s. Seasonable at any time. Sufficient to serve with a small turbot, a brill, or salmon for 6 persons. Note. Melted butter made with milk, number 380, will be found to answer very well for lobster sauce, as by employing it a nice white color will be obtained. Less quantity than the above may be made by using a very small lobster, to which add only one half pint of melted butter, and season as above. Where economy is desired, the cream may be dispensed with, and the remains of a cold lobster left from table, may, with a little care, be converted into a very good sauce. Maitre d'hôtel butter, for putting into broiled fish just before it is sent to table. Ingredients A quarter pound, of butter, two dessertspoonfuls of minced parsley, salt and pepper to taste, the juice of one large lemon. Mode. Work the above ingredients well together, and let them be thoroughly mixed with a wooden spoon. If this is used as a sauce, it may be poured either under or over the meat or fish it is intended to be served with. Average cost, for this quantity, 5d. Note. For tablespoonfuls of bechamel, number 367, 2 do. Of white stock, number 107, with 2 ounces. Of the above maitre d'hotel butter stirred into it, and just allowed to simmer for one minute, will be found an excellent hot maitre d'hotel sauce. The maitre d'hotel. The house steward of England is synonymous with the maitre d'hotel of France. And, in ancient times, amongst the Latins, he was called procurator, or majordomo. In Rome, the slaves, after they had procured the various articles necessary for the repasts of the day, would return to the spacious kitchen laden with meat, game, sea fish, vegetables, fruit, and. Each one would then lay his basket at the feet of the majordomo, 
who would examine its contents and register them on his tablets, placing in the pantry contiguous to the dining room, those of the provisions which need no preparation. And consigning the others to the more immediate care of the cooks. Maitre d'hôtel sauce, hot, to serve with calves' head, boiled eels, and different fish. Ingredients. One slice of minced ham, a few poultry trimmings, two shallots, one clove of garlic, one bay leaf, three quarters pint of water, two ounces. Of butter, one dessert spoonful of flour, one heaped tablespoonful of chopped parsley, salt, pepper, and cayenne to taste, the juice of one half large lemon, one quarter teaspoonful of pounded sugar. Mode. Put at the bottom of a stew pan the minced ham, and over it the poultry trimmings, if these are not at hand, veal should be substituted, with the shallots, garlic, and bay leaf. Pour in the water, and let the whole simmer gently for one hour, or until the liquor is reduced to a full one-half pint. Then strain this gravy, put it in another saucepan, make a thickening of butter and flour in the above proportions, and stir it to the gravy over a nice clear fire, until it is perfectly smooth and rather thick. Care being taken that the butter does not float on the surface. Skim well, add the remaining ingredients, let the sauce gradually heat, but do not allow it to boil. If this sauce is intended for an entree, it is necessary to make it of a sufficient thickness, so that it may adhere to what it is meant to cover. Time. One and a half hour. Average cost, ones. 2d, per pint. Sufficient for rewarming the remains of one half calf's head, or a small dish of cold flaked turbot, cod, and k. Mager maitre d'hôtel sauce, hot. Made without meat. Ingredients. One half pint of melted butter, number 376, one heaped tablespoonful of chopped parsley, salt and pepper to taste, the juice of one half large lemon, when liked, two minced shallots. Mode. Make one half pint of melted butter, by recipe number 376. Stir in the above ingredients, and let them just boil, when it is ready to serve. Time. One minute to simmer. Average cost, 9d. Per pint. Mayonnaise, a sauce or salad dressing for cold chicken, meat, and other cold dishes. Ingredients. The yolks of two eggs, six tablespoonfuls of salad oil, four tablespoonfuls of vinegar, salt and white pepper to taste, one tablespoonful of white stock, number 107, two tablespoonfuls of cream. Mode. Put the yolks of the eggs into a basin, with a seasoning of pepper and salt, have ready the above quantities of oil and vinegar, in separate vessels, add them very gradually to the eggs. Continue stirring and rubbing the mixture with a wooden spoon, as herein consists the secret of having a nice smooth sauce. It cannot be stirred too frequently, and it should be made in a very cool place, or, if ice is at hand, it should be mixed over it. When the vinegar and oil are well incorporated with the eggs, add the stock and cream, stirring all the time, and it will then be ready for use. For a fish mayonnaise, this sauce may be colored with lobster spawn, pounded. And for poultry or meat, where variety is desired, a little parsley juice may be used to add to its appearance. Cucumber, tarragon, or any other flavored vinegar, may be substituted for plain, where they are liked. Average cost, for this quantity, 7d. Sufficient for a small salad. Note. In mixing the oil and vinegar with the eggs, put in first a few drops of oil, and then a few drops of vinegar, never adding a large quantity of either at one time. By this means, you can be more certain of the sauce not curdling. Patience and practice, let us add, are two essentials for making this sauce good. Mint sauce, to serve with roast lamb. Ingredients. For dessert spoonfuls of chopped mint, two dessert spoonfuls of pounded white sugar, one quarter pint of vinegar. Mode. Wash the mint, which should be young and fresh gathered, free from grit. Pick the leaves from the stalks, mince them very fine, and put them into a tureen, add the sugar and vinegar, and stir till the former is dissolved. This sauce is better by being made two or three hours before wanted for table, as the vinegar then becomes impregnated with the flavor of the mint. 
By many persons, the above proportion of sugar would not be considered sufficient. But as tastes vary, we have given the quantity which we have found to suit the general palate. Average cost, 3d. Sufficient to serve with a middling-sized joint of lamb. Note. Where green mint is scarce and not obtainable, mint vinegar may be substituted for it, and will be found very acceptable in early spring. Illustration, Mint. Mint. The common mint cultivated in our gardens is known as the mint of Oridus, and is employed in different culinary processes, being sometimes boiled with certain dishes, and afterwards withdrawn. It has an agreeable aromatic flavor, and forms an ingredient in soups, and sometimes is used in spring salads. It is valuable as a stomachic and antispasmodic, on which account it is generally served at table with pea soup. Several of its species grow wild in low situations in the country. Mint Vinegar Ingredients Vinegar, Mint Mode Procure some nice fresh mint, pick the leaves from the stalks, and fill a bottle or jar with them. Add vinegar to them until the bottle is full, cover closely to exclude the air, and let it infuse for a fortnight. Then strain the liquor, and put it into small bottles for use, of which the corks should be sealed. Seasonable. This should be made in June, July, or August. Mixed pickle. Very good. Ingredients. To each gallon of vinegar allow a quarter pound, of bruised ginger, a quarter pound, of mustard, a quarter pound, of salt, two ounces of mustard seed, one and a half ounces of turmeric, one ounce. Of ground black pepper, a quarter ounce of cayenne, cauliflowers, onions, celery, sliced cucumbers, gherkins, French beans, nasturtiums, capsicums. Mode. Have a large jar, with a tightly fitting lid, in which put as much vinegar as required, reserving a little to mix the various powders to a smooth paste. Put into a basin the mustard, turmeric, pepper, and cayenne. Mix them with vinegar, and stir well until no lumps remain, add all the ingredients to the vinegar, and mix well. Keep this liquor in a warm place, and thoroughly stir every morning for a month with a wooden spoon, when it will be ready for the different vegetables to be added to it. As these come into season, have them gathered on a dry day, and, after merely wiping them with a cloth, to free them from moisture, put them into the pickle. The cauliflowers, it may be said, must be divided into small bunches. Put all these into the pickle raw, and at the end of the season, when there have been added as many of the vegetables as could be procured, store it away in jars, and tie over with bladder. As none of the ingredients are boiled, this pickle will not be fit to eat till twelve months have elapsed. Whilst the pickle is being made, keep a wooden spoon tied to the jar, and its contents, it may be repeated, must be stirred every morning. Seasonable. Make the pickle liquor in May or June, as the season arrives for the various vegetables to be picked. Mushroom Ketchup Ingredients To each peck of mushrooms half a pound, of salt, to each quart of mushroom liquor one slash four ounce. Of cayenne, half a ounce of allspice, half a ounce of ginger, two blades of pounded mace. Mode Choose full-grown mushroom flaps, and take care they are perfectly fresh gathered when the weather is tolerably dry. For, if they are picked during very heavy rain, the ketchup from which they are made is liable to get musty, and will not keep long. Put a layer of them in a deep pan, sprinkle salt over them, and then another layer of mushrooms, and so on alternately. Let them remain for a few hours, when break them up with the hand. Put them in a nice cool place for three days, occasionally stirring and mashing them well, to extract from them as much juice as possible. Now measure the quantity of liquor without straining, and to each quart allow the above proportion of spices, and put all into a stone jar, cover it up very closely, put it in a saucepan of boiling water, set it over the fire, and let it boil for three hours. Have ready a nice clean stew pan. Turn into it the contents of the jar, and let the whole simmer very gently for half an hour, pour it into a jug, where it should stand in a cool place till the next day. Then pour it off into another jug, and strain it into very dry clean bottles, and do not squeeze the mushrooms. 
To each pint of ketchup add a few drops of brandy. Be careful not to shake the contents, but leave all the sediment behind in the jug. Cork well, and either seal or rosin the cork, so as perfectly to exclude the air. When a very clear bright ketchup is wanted, the liquor must be strained through a very fine hair sieve, or flannel bag, after it has been very gently poured off. If the operation is not successful, it must be repeated until you have quite a clear liquor. It should be examined occasionally, and if it is spoiling, should be reboiled with a few peppercorns. Seasonable from the beginning of September to the middle of October, when this ketchup should be made. Note. This flavoring ingredient, if genuine and well prepared, is one of the most useful store sauces to the experienced cook, and no trouble should be spared in its preparation. Double ketchup is made by reducing the liquor to half the quantity. For example, one quart must be boiled down to one pint. This goes farther than ordinary ketchup, as so little is required to flavor a good quantity of gravy. The sediment may also be bottled for immediate use, and will be found to answer for flavoring thick soups or gravies. How to distinguish mushrooms from toadstools? The cultivated mushroom, known as Agaricus campestris, may be distinguished from other poisonous kinds of fungi by its having pink or flesh-colored gills, or underside, and by its invariably having an agreeable smell, which the toadstool has not. When young, mushrooms are like a small round button, both the stalk and head being white. As they grow larger, they expand their heads by degrees into a flat form, the gills underneath being at first of a pale flesh color, but becoming, as they stand longer, dark brown or blackish. Nearly all the poisonous kinds are brown, and have in general a rank and putrid smell. Edible mushrooms are found in closely fed pastures, but seldom grow in woods, where most of the poisonous sorts are to be found. To dry mushrooms. 473. Mode. Wipe them clean, take away the brown part, and peel off the skin, lay them on sheets of paper to dry, in a cool oven, when they will shrivel considerably. Keep them in paper bags, which hang in a dry place. When wanted for use, put them into cold gravy, bring them gradually to simmer, and it will be found that they will regain nearly their usual size. Illustration, The Mushroom The Mushroom The cultivated or garden mushroom is a species of fungus, which, in England, is considered the best, and is there usually eaten. The tribe, however, is numerous, and a large proportion of them are poisonous. Hence it is always dangerous to make use of mushrooms gathered in their wild state. In some parts of Europe, as in Germany, Russia, and Poland, many species grow wild, and are used as food, but in Britain, two only are generally eaten. These are mostly employed for the flavoring of dishes, and are also dried and pickled. Catsup, or ketchup, is made from them by mixing spices and salt with their juice. The young, called buttons, are the best for pickling when in the globular form. Brown mushroom sauce, to serve with roast meat, and Ingredients 1 half pint of button mushrooms, 1 half pint of good beef gravy, number 435, 1 tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup, if at hand, thickening of butter and flour. Mode Put the gravy into a saucepan, thicken it, and stir over the fire until it boils. Prepare the mushrooms by cutting off the stalks and wiping them free from grit and dirt. The large flat mushrooms cut into small pieces will answer for a brown sauce, when the buttons are not obtainable, put them into the gravy, and let them simmer very gently for about 10 minutes, then add the ketchup, and serve. Time. Rather more than 10 minutes. Seasonable from August to October. Note. When fresh mushrooms are not obtainable, the powder number 477 may be used as a substitute for brown sauce. White mushroom sauce, to serve with boiled fowls, cutlets, and k. I. Ingredients. Rather more than one half pint of button mushrooms, lemon juice and water, one ounce of butter, one half pint of bechamel, number 367, one quarter teaspoonful of pounded sugar. Mode. Turn the mushrooms white by putting them into lemon juice and water, having previously cut off the stalks and wiped them perfectly free from grit. Chop them, and put them in a stew pan with the butter. 
When the mushrooms are softened, add the bechamel, and simmer for about 5 minutes, should they, however, not be done enough, allow rather more time. They should not boil longer than necessary, as they would then lose their color and flavor. Rub the whole through a tammy, and serve very hot. After this, it should be warmed in a bain-marie. Time. Altogether, a quarter hour. Average cost, ones. Seasonable from August to October. 2. A more simple method. Ingredients. 1 half pint of melted butter, made with milk, number 380, 1 half pint of button mushrooms, 1 dessertspoonful of mushroom ketchup, if at hand, cayenne and salt to taste. Mode. Make the melted butter by recipe no. 380, and add to it the mushrooms, which must be nicely cleaned, and free from grit, and the stalks cut off. Let them simmer gently for about 10 minutes, or until they are quite tender. Put in the seasoning and ketchup, let it just boil, when serve. Time. Rather more than 10 minutes. Average cost, 8d. Seasonable from August to October. Growth of the mushroom and other fungi. The quick growth of the mushroom and other fungi is no less wonderful than the length of time they live, and the numerous dangers they resist while they continue in the dormant state. To spring up, like a mushroom in a night, is a scriptural mode of expressing celerity, and this completely accords with all the observations which have been made concerning this curious class of plants. Mr. Sowerby remarks, I have often placed specimens of the phallus caninus by a window overnight, while in the egg form, and they have been fully grown by the morning. Mushroom powder, a valuable addition to sauces and gravies, when fresh. Mushrooms are not obtainable. Ingredients 1 half peck of large mushrooms, 2 onions, 12 cloves, a quarter ounce of pounded mace, 2 teaspoonfuls of white pepper. Mode Peel the mushrooms, wipe them perfectly free from grit and dirt, remove the black fur, and reject all those that are at all worm-eaten, put them into a stew pan with the above ingredients, but without water. Shake them over a clear fire, till all the liquor is dried up, and be careful not to let them burn, arrange them on tins, and dry them in a slow oven, pound them to a fine powder, which put into small dry bottles. Cork well, seal the corks, and keep it in a dry place. In using this powder, add it to the gravy just before serving, when it will merely require one boil up. The flavor imparted by this means to the gravy, ought to be exceedingly good. Seasonable. This should be made in September, or at the beginning of October. Note. If the bottles in which it is stored away are not perfectly dry, as, also the mushroom powder, it will keep good but a very short time. Pickled Mushrooms. Ingredients. Sufficient vinegar to cover the mushrooms, to each quart of mushrooms, two blades of pounded mace, one ounce of ground pepper, salt to taste. Mode. Choose some nice young button mushrooms for pickling, and rub off the skin with a piece of flannel and salt, and cut off the stalks, if very large, take out the red inside, and reject the black ones, as they are too old. Put them in a stew pan, sprinkle salt over them, with pounded mace and pepper in the above proportion, shake them well over a clear fire until the liquor flows, and keep them there until it is all dried up again. Then add as much vinegar as will cover them, just let it simmer for one minute, and store it away in stone jars for use. When cold, tie down with bladder and keep in a dry place. They will remain good for a length of time, and are generally considered delicious. Seasonable. Make this the same time as ketchup, from the beginning of September to the middle of October. Nature of the Mushroom Locality has evidently a considerable influence on the nature of the juices of the mushroom. For it has been discovered, after fatal experience, that some species, which are perfectly harmless when raised in open meadows and pasturelands, become virulently poisonous when they happen to grow in contact with stagnant water or putrescent animal and vegetable substances. What the precise nature of the poison in fungi may be, has not been accurately ascertained. A very rich and good mushroom sauce, to serve with fowls or rabbits. Ingredients 
one pint of mushroom buttons, salt to taste, a little grated nutmeg, one blade of pounded mace, one pint of cream, two ounces of butter, flour to thicken. Mode. Rub the buttons with a piece of flannel and salt to take off the skin. Cut off the stalks and put them in a stew pan with the above ingredients, previously kneading together the butter and flour, boil the whole for about 10 minutes, stirring all the time. Pour some of the sauce over the fowls, and the remainder serve in a tureen. Time. 10 minutes. Average cost, twos. Sufficient to serve with a pair of fowls. Seasonable from August to October. How to mix mustard. Ingredients. Mustard, salt, and water. Mode. Mustard should be mixed with water that has been boiled and allowed to cool, hot water destroys its essential properties, and raw cold water might cause it to ferment. Put the mustard in a cup, with a small pinch of salt, and mix with it very gradually sufficient boiled water to make it drop from the spoon without being watery. Stir and mix well, and rub the lumps well down with the back of a spoon, as well mixed mustard should be perfectly free from these. The mustard pot should not be more than half full, or rather less if it will not be used in a day or two, as it is so much better when freshly mixed. Tartar Mustard Ingredients Horseradish vinegar, cayenne, one half a teacupful of mustard. Mode Have ready sufficient horseradish vinegar to mix with the above proportion of mustard, put the mustard in a cup, with a slight seasoning of cayenne, mix it perfectly smooth with the vinegar, adding this a little at a time. Rub down with the back of a spoon any lumps that may appear, and do not let it be too thin. Mustard may be flavored in various ways, with tarragon, shallot, celery, and many other vinegars, herbs, spices, and k. But this is more customary in France than in England, as there it is merely considered a vehicle of flavors, as it has been termed. Pickled nasturtiums, a very good substitute for capers. Ingredients To each pint of vinegar, one ounce. Of salt, six peppercorns, nasturtiums. Mode Gather the nasturtium pods on a dry day, and wipe them clean with a cloth, put them in a dry glass bottle, with vinegar, salt, and pepper in the above proportion. If you cannot find enough ripe to fill a bottle, Cork up what you have got until you have some more fit, they may be added from day to day. Bung up the bottles, and seal or rosin the tops. They will be fit for use in 10 or 12 months. And the best way is to make them one season for the next. Seasonable. Look for nasturtium pods from the end of July to the end of August. Illustration, Nasturtiums. Nasturtiums. The elegant nasturtium plant, called by naturalists tropeolum, and which sometimes goes by the name of Indian cress, came originally from Peru, but was easily made to grow in these islands. Its young leaves and flowers are of a slightly hot nature, and many consider them a good adjunct to salads, to which they certainly add a pretty appearance. When the beautiful blossoms, which may be employed with great effect in garnishing dishes, are off, then the fruit is used as described in the above recipe. French onion sauce, or soubise. Ingredients. One half pint of bechamel, no. 367, one bay leaf, seasoning to taste of pounded mace and cayenne, six onions, a small piece of ham. Mode. Peel the onions and cut them in halves. Put them in a stew pan, with just sufficient water to cover them, and add the bay leaf, ham, cayenne, and mace, be careful to keep the lid closely shut and simmer them until tender. Take them out and drain thoroughly. Rub them through a tammy or sieve, an old one does for the purpose, with a wooden spoon, and put them to one half pint of bechamel, keep stirring over the fire until it boils, when serve. If it should require any more seasoning, add it to taste. Time. Three quarters hour to boil the onions. Average cost. 10d. For this quantity. Sufficient for a moderate sized dish. White onion sauce, for boiled rabbits, roast shoulder of mutton, and. Ingredients. 
9 large onions, or 12 middling sized ones, 1 pint of melted butter made with milk, number 380, 1 half teaspoonful of salt, or rather more. Mode. Peel the onions and put them into water to which a little salt has been added, to preserve their whiteness, and let them remain for a quarter hour. Then put them in a stew pan, cover them with water, and let them boil until tender, and, if the onions should be very strong, change the water after they have been boiling for a quarter hour. Drain them thoroughly, chop them, and rub them through a tammy or sieve. Make one pint of melted butter, by recipe number 380, and when that boils, put in the onions, with a seasoning of salt, stir it till it simmers, when it will be ready to serve. If these directions are carefully attended to, this onion sauce will be delicious. Time. From 3 quarters to 1 hour, to boil the onions. Average cost, 9d. Per pint. Sufficient to serve with a roast shoulder of mutton, or boiled rabbit. Seasonable from August to March. Note. To make this sauce very mild and delicate, use Spanish onions, which can be procured from the beginning of September to Christmas. Two or three tablespoonfuls of cream added just before serving, will be found to improve its appearance very much. Small onions, when very young, may be cooked whole, and served in melted butter. A sieve or tammy should be kept expressly for onions, an old one answers the purpose, as it is liable to retain the flavor and smell, which of course would be excessively disagreeable in delicate preparations. Brown Onion Sauce Ingredients 6 large onions, rather more than 1 half pint of good gravy, 2 ounces of butter, salt and pepper to taste. Mode Slice and fry the onions of a pale brown in a stew pan, with the above quantity of butter, keeping them well stirred, that they do not get black. When a nice color, pour over the gravy, and let them simmer gently until tender. Now skim off every particle of fat, add the seasoning, and rub the whole through a tammy or sieve, put it back in the saucepan to warm, and when it boils, serve. Time. Altogether one hour. Seasonable from August to March. Note. Where a very high flavoring is liked, add one tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup, or a small quantity of port wine. History of the Onion It is not supposed that any variety of the onion is indigenous to Britain, as when the large and mild roots imported from warmer climates, have been cultivated in these islands a few years, they deteriorate both in size and sweetness. It is therefore most likely that this plant was first introduced into England from continental Europe, and that it originally was produced in a southern climate, and has gradually become acclimatized to a colder atmosphere. See number 139. Pickled onions, a very simple method, and exceedingly good. Ingredients. Pickling onions, to each quart of vinegar, 2 teaspoonfuls of allspice, 2 teaspoonfuls of whole black pepper. Mode. Have the onions gathered when quite dry and ripe, and, with the fingers, take off the thin outside skin. Then, with a silver knife, steel should not be used, as it spoils the color of the onions, remove one more skin, when the onion will look quite clear. Have ready some very dry bottles or jars, and as fast as they are peeled, put them in. Pour over sufficient cold vinegar to cover them, with pepper and allspice in the above proportions, taking care that each jar has its share of the latter ingredients. Tie down with bladder, and put them in a dry place, and in a fortnight they will be fit for use. This is a most simple recipe and very delicious, the onions being nice and crisp. They should be eaten within six or eight months after being done, as the onions are liable to become soft. Seasonable from the middle of July to the end of August. Pickled Onions Ingredients 1 gallon of pickling onions, salt and water, milk. To each one half gallon of vinegar, one ounce of bruised ginger, one quarter teaspoonful of cayenne, one ounce of allspice, one ounce of whole black pepper, a quarter ounce of whole nutmeg bruised, eight cloves, a quarter ounce of mace. Mode. Gather the onions, which should not be too small, when they are quite dry and ripe, wipe off the dirt, but do not pare them. Make a strong solution of salt and water, 
into which put the onions, and change this, morning and night, for three days, and save the last brine they were put in. Then take the outside skin off, and put them into a tin saucepan capable of holding them all, as they are always better done together. Now take equal quantities of milk and the last salt and water the onions were in, and pour this to them. To this add two large spoonfuls of salt, put them over the fire, and watch them very attentively. Keep constantly turning the onions about with a wooden skimmer, those at the bottom to the top, and vice versa. And let the milk and water run through the holes of the skimmer. Remember, the onions must never boil, or, if they do, they will be good for nothing, and they should be quite transparent. Keep the onions stirred for a few minutes, and, in stirring them, be particular not to break them. Then have ready a pan with a colander, into which turn the onions to drain, covering them with a cloth to keep in the steam. Place on a table an old cloth, two or three times double, put the onions on it when quite hot, and over them an old piece of blanket, cover this closely over them, to keep in the steam. Let them remain till the next day, when they will be quite cold, and look yellow and shriveled, take off the shriveled skins, when they should be as white as snow. Put them in a pan, make a pickle of vinegar and the remaining ingredients, boil all these up, and pour hot over the onions in the pan. Cover very closely to keep in all the steam, and let them stand till the following day, when they will be quite cold. Put them into jars or bottles well bunged, and a tablespoonful of the best olive oil on the top of each jar or bottle. Tie them down with bladder, and let them stand in a cool place for a month or six weeks, when they will be fit for use. They should be beautifully white and eat crisp, without the least softness, and will keep good many months. Seasonable from the middle of July to the end of August. Orange gravy, for wildfowl, widgeon, teal, and Ingredients 1 half pint of white stock, no. 107, 1 small onion, 3 or 4 strips of lemon or orange peel, a few leaves of basil, if at hand, the juice of a Seville orange or lemon, salt and pepper to taste, 1 glass of port wine. Mode Put the onion, cut in slices, into a stew pan with the stock, orange peel, and basil, and let them simmer very gently for a quarter hour or rather longer, should the gravy not taste sufficiently of the peel. Strain it off, and add to the gravy the remaining ingredients, let the whole heat through, and, when on the point of boiling, serve very hot in a tureen which should have a cover to it. Time. Altogether half an hour. Sufficient for a small tureen. Oyster forcemeat, for roast or boiled turkey. Ingredients. One half pint of bread crumbs, one and a half ounces of chopped suet or butter, one faggot of savory herbs, one quarter salt spoonful of grated nutmeg, salt and pepper to taste, two eggs, eighteen oysters. Mode. Grate the bread very fine, and be careful that no large lumps remain, put it into a basin with the suet, which must be very finely minced, or, when butter is used, that must be cut up into small pieces. Add the herbs, also chopped as small as possible, and seasoning, mix all these well together, until the ingredients are thoroughly mingled. Open and beard the oysters, chop them, but not too small, and add them to the other ingredients. Beat up the eggs, and, with the hand, work all together, until it is smoothly mixed. The turkey should not be stuffed too full, if there should be too much forcemeat, roll it into balls, fry them, and use them as a garnish. Sufficient for one turkey. Oyster ketchup. Ingredients. Sufficient oysters to fill a pint measure, one pint of sherry, three ounces of salt, one dram of cayenne, two drams of pounded mace. Mode. Procure the oysters very fresh, and open sufficient to fill a pint measure. Save the liquor, and scald the oysters in it with the sherry, strain the oysters, and put them in a mortar with the salt, cayenne, and mace, pound the whole until reduced to a pulp, then add it to the liquor in which they were scalded. Boil it again five minutes, and skim well, rub the whole through a sieve, and, when cold, bottle and cork closely. The cork should be sealed. Seasonable from September to April. Note. Cider may be substituted for the sherry. Pickled oysters. 
Ingredients 100 oysters, to each one half pint of vinegar, one blade of pounded mace, one strip of lemon peel, 12 black peppercorns. Mode Get the oysters in good condition, open them, place them in a saucepan, and let them simmer in their own liquor for about 10 minutes, very gently. Then take them out, one by one, and place them in a jar, and cover them, when cold, with a pickle made as follows, measure the oyster liquor. Add to it the same quantity of vinegar, with mace, lemon peel, and pepper in the above proportion, and boil it for 5 minutes, when cold, pour over the oysters, and tie them down very closely, as contact with the air spoils them. Seasonable from September to April. Note. Put this pickle away in small jars, because directly one is opened, its contents should immediately be eaten, as they soon spoil. The pickle should not be kept more than two or three months. Oyster sauce, to serve with fish, boiled poultry, and k. Ingredients. Three dozen oysters, one half pint of melted butter, made with milk, number 380. Mode. Open the oysters carefully, and save their liquor. Strain it into a clean saucepan, a lined one is best, put in the oysters, and let them just come to the boiling point, when they should look plump. Take them off the fire immediately, and put the whole into a basin. Strain the liquor from them, mix with it sufficient milk to make one half pint altogether, and follow the directions of number 380. When the melted butter is ready and very smooth, put in the oysters, which should be previously bearded, if you wish the sauce to be really nice. Set it by the side of the fire to get thoroughly hot, but do not allow it to boil, or the oysters will immediately harden. Using cream instead of milk makes this sauce extremely delicious. When liked, add a seasoning of cayenne, or anchovy sauce. But, as we have before stated, a plain sauce should be plain, and not be overpowered by highly flavored essences, therefore we recommend that the above directions be implicitly followed, and no seasoning added. Average cost for this quantity, twos. Sufficient for six persons. Never allow fewer than six oysters to one person, unless the party is very large. Seasonable from September to April. A more economical sauce may be made by using a smaller quantity of oysters, and not bearding them before they are added to the sauce, this may answer the purpose. But we cannot undertake to recommend it as a mode of making this delicious adjunct to fish, and k. Parsley and butter, to serve with calf's head. Boiled fowls, and k. Ingredients. 2 tablespoonfuls of minced parsley, 1 half pint of melted butter, number 376. Mode. Put into a saucepan a small quantity of water, slightly salted, and when it boils, throw in a good bunch of parsley which has been previously washed and tied together in a bunch. Let it boil for 5 minutes, drain it, mince the leaves very fine, and put the above quantity in a tureen, pour over it one half pint of smoothly made melted butter, stir once, that the ingredients may be thoroughly mixed, and serve. Time. 5 minutes to boil the parsley. Average cost, 4D. Sufficient for one large fowl, allow rather more for a pair. Seasonable at any time. Note. Sometimes, in the middle of winter, parsley leaves are not to be had, when the following will be found an excellent substitute, tie up a little parsley seed in a small piece of muslin, and boil it for 10 minutes in a small quantity of water. Use this water to make the melted butter with, and throw into it a little boiled spinach, minced rather fine, which will have an appearance similar to that of parsley. Illustration, Parsley Parsley If there be nothing new under the sun, there are, at any rate, different uses found for the same thing. For this pretty aromatic herb was used in ancient times, as we learn from mythological narrative, to adorn the head of a hero, no less than Hercules, and now, was ever fall so great, we moderns use it in connection with the head of, a calf. According to Homer's Iliad, warriors fed their chariot steeds on parsley, and Pliny acquaints us with the fact that, as a symbol of mourning, it was admitted to furnish the funeral tables of the Romans. Egypt, some say, first produced this herb. Thence it was introduced, by some unknown voyager, 
into Sardinia, where the Carthaginians found it, and made it known to the inhabitants of Marseilles. See number 123. Fried Parsley, for Garnishing. Ingredients. Parsley, hot lard or clarified dripping. Mode. Gather some young parsley, wash, pick, and dry it thoroughly in a cloth, put it into the wire basket of which we have given an engraving, and hold it in boiling lard or dripping for a minute or two. Directly it is done, lift out the basket, and let it stand before the fire, that the parsley may become thoroughly crisp, and the quicker it is fried the better. Should the kitchen not be furnished with the above article, throw the parsley into the frying pan, and when crisp, lift it out with a slice, dry it before the fire, and when thoroughly crisp, it will be ready for use. Illustration, Wire Basket Wire Basket For this recipe, a wire basket, as shown in the annexed engraving, will be found very useful. It is very light and handy, and may be used for other similar purposes besides that described above. Parsley Juice, for coloring various dishes. For 95, procure some nice young parsley, wash it and dry it thoroughly in a cloth, pound the leaves in a mortar till all the juice is extracted, and put the juice in a teacup or small jar. Place this in a saucepan of boiling water, and warm it on the bain-marie principle just long enough to take off its rawness, let it drain, and it will be ready for coloring. To preserve parsley through the winter. 496. Use freshly gathered parsley for keeping, and wash it perfectly free from grit and dirt, put it into boiling water which has been slightly salted and well skimmed, and then let it boil for two or three minutes. Take it out, let it drain, and lay it on a sieve in front of the fire, when it should be dried as expeditiously as possible. Store it away in a very dry place in bottles, and when wanted for use, pour over it a little warm water, and let it stand for about five minutes. Seasonable. This may be done at any time between June and October. An excellent pickle. Ingredients. Equal quantities of medium-sized onions, cucumbers, and sauce apples, one and a half teaspoonful of salt, three quarters teaspoonful of cayenne, one wine glassful of soy, one wine glassful of sherry, vinegar. Mode. Slice sufficient cucumbers, onions, and apples to fill a pint stone jar, taking care to cut the slices very thin, arrange them in alternate layers, shaking in as you proceed salt and cayenne in the above proportion. Pour in the soy and wine, and fill up with vinegar. It will be fit for use the day it is made. Seasonable in August and September. This recipe was forwarded to the editress of this work by a subscriber to the Englishwoman's Domestic Magazine. Mrs. Beaton, not having tested it, cannot vouch for its excellence, but the contributor spoke very highly in its favor. Soy. This is a sauce frequently made use of for fish, and comes from Japan, where it is prepared from the seeds of a plant called Dalako soja. The Chinese also manufacture it, but that made by the Japanese is said to be the best. All sorts of statements have been made respecting the very general adulteration of this article in England, and we fear that many of them are too true. When genuine, it is of an agreeable flavor, thick, and of a clear brown color. Pickled Red Cabbage Ingredients Red cabbages, salt and water, to each quart of vinegar, half a ounce of ginger well bruised, one ounce of whole black pepper, and, when liked, a little cayenne. Mode. Take off the outside decayed leaves of a nice red cabbage, cut it in quarters, remove the stalks, and cut it across in very thin slices. Lay these on a dish, and strew them plentifully with salt, covering them with another dish. Let them remain for 24 hours, turn into a colander to drain, and, if necessary, wipe lightly with a clean soft cloth. Put them in a jar, boil up the vinegar with spices in the above proportion, and, when cold, pour it over the cabbage. It will be fit for use in a week or two, and, if kept for a very long time, the cabbage is liable get soft and to discolor. To be really nice and crisp, and of a good red color, it should be eaten almost immediately after it is made. A little bruised cochineal boiled with the vinegar adds much to the appearance of this pickle. Tie down with bladder, and keep in a dry place. 
Seasonable in July and August, but the pickle will be much more crisp if the frost has just touched the leaves. Red Cabbage This plant, in its growth, is similar in form to that of the white, but is of a bluish-purple color, which, however, turns red on the application of acid, as is the case with all vegetable blues. It is principally from the white vegetable that the Germans make their sauerkraut. A dish held in such high estimation with the inhabitants of Vaderland, but which requires, generally speaking, with strangers, a long acquaintance in order to become sufficiently impressed with its numerous merits. The large red Dutch is the kind generally recommended for pickling. Plum Pudding Sauce Ingredients 1 wine glassful of brandy, 2 ounces of very fresh butter, 1 glass of Madeira, pounded sugar to taste. Mode Put the pounded sugar in a basin, with part of the brandy and the butter, let it stand by the side of the fire until it is warm and the sugar and butter are dissolved, then add the rest of the brandy, with the Madeira. Either pour it over the pudding, or serve in a tureen. This is a very rich and excellent sauce. Average cost, 1s. 3d for this quantity. Sufficient for a pudding made for 6 persons. Quinn sauce, an excellent fish sauce. Ingredients. 1 half pint of walnut pickle, 1 half pint of port wine, 1 pint of mushroom ketchup, 1 dozen anchovies, 1 dozen shallots, 1 quarter pint of soy, 1 half teaspoonful of cayenne. Mode. Put all the ingredients into a saucepan, having previously chopped the shallots and anchovies very small, simmer for 15 minutes, strain, and, when cold, bottle off for use, the corks should be well sealed to exclude the air. Time. A quarter hour. Seasonable at any time. Ravigot, a French salad sauce. Mons. Ude's recipe. Ingredients. 1 teaspoonful of mushroom ketchup, 1 teaspoonful of cavus, 1 teaspoonful of chili vinegar, 1 teaspoonful of reading sauce, a piece of butter the size of an egg, 3 tablespoonfuls of thick bechamel, no. 367, 1 tablespoonful of minced parsley, 3 tablespoonfuls of cream, salt and pepper to taste. Mode. Scald the parsley, mince the leaves very fine, and add it to all the other ingredients. After mixing the whole together thoroughly, the sauce will be ready for use. Average cost, for this quantity, 10 d. Seasonable at any time. Reading sauce. Ingredients. 2 and a half pints of walnut pickle, 1 and a half ounces. Of shallots, 1 quart of spring water, 3 quarters pint of Indian soy, half a ounce of bruised ginger, half a ounce of long pepper, 1 ounce of mustard seed, 1 anchovy, half a ounce of cayenne, a quarter ounce of dried sweet bay leaves. Mode. Bruise the shallots in a mortar, and put them in a stone jar with the walnut liquor, place it before the fire, and let it boil until reduced to two pints. Then, into another jar, put all the ingredients except the bay leaves, taking care that they are well bruised, so that the flavor may be thoroughly extracted, put this also before the fire, and let it boil for one hour, or rather more. When the contents of both jars are sufficiently cooked, mix them together, stirring them well as you mix them, and submit them to a slow boiling for half an hour, cover closely, and let them stand 24 hours in a cool place. Then open the jar and add the bay leaves, let it stand a week longer closed down, when strained through a flannel bag, and it will be ready for use. The above quantities will make one half gallon. Time. Altogether, 3 hours. Seasonable. This sauce may be made at any time. Remoulade, or French salad dressing. Ingredients. For eggs, 1 half tablespoonful of made mustard, salt and cayenne to taste, 3 tablespoonfuls of olive oil, 1 tablespoonful of tarragon or plain vinegar. Mode. Boil 3 eggs quite hard for about a quarter hour, put them into cold water, and let them remain in it for a few minutes, strip off the shells, put the yolks in a mortar, and pound them very smoothly. Add to them, very gradually, the mustard, seasoning, and vinegar, keeping all well stirred and rubbed down with the back of a wooden spoon. Put in the oil drop by drop, 
and when this is thoroughly mixed with the other ingredients, add the yolk of a raw egg, and stir well, when it will be ready for use. This sauce should not be curdled. And to prevent this, the only way is to mix a little of everything at a time, and not to cease stirring. The quantities of oil and vinegar may be increased or diminished according to taste, as many persons would prefer a smaller proportion of the former ingredient. Green remoulade is made by using tarragon vinegar instead of plain, and coloring with a little parsley juice, number 495. Harvey's sauce, or chili vinegar, may be added at pleasure. Time. A quarter hour to boil the eggs. Average cost, for this quantity, 7d. Sufficient for a salad made for four or six persons. Illustration, tarragon. Tarragon. The leaves of this plant, known to naturalists as Artemisia dracunculus, are much used in France as a flavoring ingredient for salads. From it also is made the vinegar known as tarragon vinegar, which is employed by the French in mixing their mustard. It originally comes from Tartary, and does not seed in France. Sage and onion stuffing, for geese, ducks, and pork. Ingredients For large onions, 10 sage leaves, a quarter pound, of bread crumbs, one and a half ounces of butter, salt and pepper to taste, one egg. Mode Peel the onions, put them into boiling water, let them simmer for five minutes or rather longer, and, just before they are taken out, put in the sage leaves for a minute or two to take off their rawness. Chop both these very fine, add the bread, seasoning, and butter, and work the whole together with the yolk of an egg, when the stuffing will be ready for use. It should be rather highly seasoned, and the sage leaves should be very finely chopped. Many cooks do not parboil the onions in the manner just stated, but merely use them raw. The stuffing then, however, is not nearly so mild, and, to many tastes, its strong flavor would be very objectionable. When made for goose, a portion of the liver of the bird, simmered for a few minutes and very finely minced, is frequently added to this stuffing and where economy is studied, the egg may be dispensed with. Time. Rather more than 5 minutes to simmer the onions. Average cost, for this quantity, 4d. Sufficient for one goose, or a pair of ducks. 505, Sawyer's Recipe for Goose Stuffing. Take 4 apples, peeled and cored, 4 onions, 4 leaves of sage, and 4 leaves of lemon thyme not broken, and boil them in a stew pan with sufficient water to cover them, when done, pulp them through a sieve, removing the sage in time. Then add sufficient pulp of mealy potatoes to cause it to be sufficiently dry without sticking to the hand, add pepper and salt, and stuff the bird. Salad dressing, excellent. I. Ingredients. 1 teaspoonful of mixed mustard, 1 teaspoonful of pounded sugar, 2 tablespoonfuls of salad oil, 4 tablespoonfuls of milk, 2 tablespoonfuls of vinegar, cayenne and salt to taste. Mode. Put the mixed mustard into a salad bowl with the sugar, and add the oil drop by drop, carefully stirring and mixing all these ingredients well together. Proceed in this manner with the milk and vinegar, which must be added very gradually, or the sauce will curdle. Put in the seasoning, when the mixture will be ready for use. If this dressing is properly made, it will have a soft creamy appearance, and will be found very delicious with crab, or cold fried fish, the latter cut into dice, as well as with salads. In mixing salad dressings, the ingredients cannot be added too gradually, or stirred too much. Average cost, for this quantity, 3d. Sufficient for a small salad. This recipe can be confidently recommended by the editress, to whom it was given by an intimate friend noted for her salads. Scarcity of salads in England Three centuries ago, very few vegetables were cultivated in England, and an author writing of the period of Henry VIII's reign, tells us that neither salad, nor carrots, nor cabbages, nor radishes, nor any other comestibles of a like nature, were grown in any part of the kingdom they came from Holland and Flanders. We further learn, that Queen Catherine herself, with all her royalty, could not procure a salad of English growth for her dinner. The king was obliged to mend this sad state of affairs, 
and send to Holland for a gardener in order to cultivate those pot herbs, in the growth of which England is now, perhaps, not behind any other country in Europe. Illustration, The Olive The Olive and Olive Oil This tree assumes a high degree of interest from the historical circumstances with which it is connected. A leaf of it was brought into the ark by the dove, when that vessel was still floating on the waters of the great deep, and gave the first token that the deluge was subsiding. Among the Greeks, the prize of the victor in the Olympic Games was a wreath of wild olive, and the Mount of Olives is rendered familiar to our ears by its being mentioned in the scriptures as near to Jerusalem. The tree is indigenous in the north of Africa, Syria, and Greece, and the Romans introduced it to Italy. In Spain and the south of France it is now cultivated, and although it grows in England, its fruit does not ripen in the open air. Both in Greece and Portugal the fruit is eaten in its ripe state, but its taste is not agreeable to many palates. To the Italian shepherd, bread and olives, with a little wine, form a nourishing diet. But in England, olives are usually only introduced by way of dessert, to destroy the taste of the viands which have been previously eaten, that the flavor of the wine may be the better enjoyed. There are three kinds of olives imported to London, the French, Spanish, and Italian, the first are from Provence, and are generally accounted excellent, the second are larger, but more bitter, and the last are from Lucca, and are esteemed the best. The oil extracted from olives, called olive oil, or salad oil, is, with the continentals, in continual request, more dishes being prepared with than without it, we should imagine. With us, it is principally used in mixing a salad, and when thus employed, it tends to prevent fermentation, and is an antidote against flatulency. 2. Ingredients For eggs, 1 teaspoonful of mixed mustard, 1 quarter teaspoonful of white pepper, half that quantity of cayenne, salt to taste, 4 tablespoonfuls of cream, vinegar. Mode Boil the eggs until hard, which will be in about a quarter hour or twenty minutes. Put them into cold water, take off the shells, and pound the yolks in a mortar to a smooth paste. Then add all the other ingredients, except the vinegar, and stir them well until the whole are thoroughly incorporated one with the other. Pour in sufficient vinegar to make it of the consistency of cream, taking care to add but little at a time. The mixture will then be ready for use. Average cost, for this quantity, 7d. Sufficient for a moderate-sized salad. Note. The whites of the eggs, cut into rings, will serve very well as a garnishing to the salad. 3. Ingredients. 1 egg, 1 teaspoonful of salad oil, 1 teaspoonful of mixed mustard, 1 quarter teaspoonful of salt, 1 half teaspoonful of pounded sugar, 2 tablespoonfuls of vinegar, 6 tablespoonfuls of cream. Mode. Prepare and mix the ingredients by the preceding recipe, and be very particular that the whole is well stirred. Note. In making salads, the vegetables, and k, should never be added to the sauce very long before they are wanted for table. The dressing, however, may always be prepared some hours before required. Where salads are much in request, it is a good plan to bottle off sufficient dressing for a few days' consumption, as, thereby, much time and trouble are saved. If kept in a cool place, it will remain good for four or five days. Poetic Recipe for Salad The Reverend Sidney Smith, the witty canon of St. Paul's, who thought that an enjoyment of the good things of this earth was compatible with aspirations for things higher, wrote the following excellent recipe for salad, which we should advise our readers not to pass by without a trial. When the hot weather invites to a dish of cold lamb, may they find the flavor equal to the rhyme. Two large potatoes, passed through kitchen sieve. Smoothness and softness to the salad give. Of more dent mustard add a single spoon. Distrust the condiment that bites too soon. But deem it not, thou man of herbs, a fault. To add a double quantity of salt. For times the spoon with oil of Luca crown. And twice with vinegar procured from town. True flavor needs it, and your poet begs. The pounded yellow of two well-boiled eggs. Let onions atoms lurk within the bowl. And, scarce suspected, 
animate the whole. And, lastly, in the flavored compound toss. A magic spoonful of anchovy sauce. Oh! Great and glorious, and herbaceous treat. Twould tempt the dying anchorite to eat. Back to the world he'd turn his weary soul. And plunge his fingers in the salad bowl. Sauce Alamand, or German sauce. Ingredients. One half pint of sauce tourney, number 517, the yolks of two eggs. Mode. Put the sauce into a stew pan, heat it, and stir to it the beaten yolks of two eggs, which have been previously strained. Let it just simmer, but not boil, or the eggs will curdle. And after they are added to the sauce, it must be stirred without ceasing. This sauce is a general favorite, and is used for many made dishes. Time. 1 minute to simmer. Average cost, 6d. Sauce aristocratique, a store sauce. Ingredients. Green walnuts. To every pint of juice, 1 pound, of anchovies, 1 dram of cloves, 1 dram of mace, 1 dram of Jamaica ginger bruised, 8 shallots. To every pint of the boiled liquor, 1 half pint of vinegar, 1 quarter pint of port wine, 2 tablespoonfuls of soy. Mode. Pound the walnuts in a mortar, squeeze out the juice through a strainer, and let it stand to settle. Pour off the clear juice, and to every pint of it, add anchovies, spices, and cloves in the above proportion. Boil all these together till the anchovies are dissolved, then strain the juice again, put in the shallots, eight to every pint, and boil again. To every pint of the boiled liquor add vinegar, wine, and soy, in the above quantities, and bottle off for use. Cork well, and seal the corks. Seasonable. Make this sauce from the beginning to the middle of July, when walnuts are in perfection for sauces and pickling. Average cost, threes. 6d for a quart. Manufacture of sauces. In France, during the reign of Louis XII. At the latter end of the 14th century, there was formed a company of sauce manufacturers, who obtained, in those days of monopolies, the exclusive privilege of making sauces. The statutes drawn up by this company inform us that the famous sauce a la cameline, sold by them, was to be composed or, good cinnamon, good ginger, good cloves, good grains of paradise, good bread, and good vinegar. The sauce tense, was to be made of, good sound almonds, good ginger, good wine, and good verjuice. May we respectfully express a hope, not that we desire to doubt it in the least, that the English sauce manufacturers of the 19th century are equally considerate and careful in choosing their ingredients for their various well-known preparations. Sauce a loror, for trout, sauls, and k. Ingredients. The spawn of one lobster, one ounce of butter, one half pint of bechamel, number 367, the juice of one half lemon, a high seasoning of salt and cayenne. Mode. Take the spawn and pound it in a mortar with the butter, until quite smooth, and work it through a hair sieve. Put the bechamel into a stew pan, add the pounded spawn, the lemon juice, which must be strained, and a plentiful seasoning of cayenne and salt. Let it just simmer, but do not allow it to boil, or the beautiful red color of the sauce will be spoiled. A small spoonful of anchovy essence may be added at pleasure. Time. One minute to simmer. Average cost, for this quantity, ones. Sufficient for a pair of large sols. Seasonable at any time. Sauce a la matelote, for fish. Ingredients. One half pint of espagnol, no. For eleven, three onions, two tablespoonfuls of mushroom ketchup, one half glass of port wine, a bunch of sweet herbs, one half bay leaf, salt and pepper to taste, one clove, two berries of allspice, a little liquor in which the fish has been boiled, lemon juice. An anchovy sauce. Mode. Slice and fry the onions of a nice brown color, and put them into a stew pan with the espagnole, ketchup, wine, and a little liquor in which the fish has been boiled. Add the seasoning, herbs, and spices, and simmer gently for 10 minutes, stirring well the whole time, strain it through a fine hair sieve, 
put in the lemon juice and anchovy sauce, and pour it over the fish. This sauce may be very much enriched by adding a few small canals, or force meat balls made of fish, and also glazed onions or mushrooms. These, however, should not be added to the matelote till it is dished. Time 10 minutes. Average cost, 1s. 6d. Seasonable at any time. Note. This sauce originally took its name as being similar to that which the French sailor, Matlow, employed as a relish to the fish he caught and ate. In some cases, cider and perry were substituted for the wine. The Norman Matlows were very celebrated. Illustration, The Bay. The Bay. We have already described, see no. 180, the difference between the cherry laurel, Prunus laurus cerasus, and the classic laurel, Laurus nobilis, the former only being used for culinary purposes. The latter beautiful evergreen was consecrated by the ancients to priests and heroes, and used in their sacrifices. A crown of bay was the earnestly desired reward for great enterprises, and for the display of uncommon genius in oratory or writing. It was more particularly sacred to Apollo, because, according to the fable, the nymph Daphne was changed into a laurel tree. The ancients believed, too, that the laurel had the power of communicating the gift of prophecy, as well as poetic genius. And, when they wished to procure pleasant dreams, would place a sprig under the pillow of their bed. It was the symbol, too, of victory, and it was thought that the laurel could never be struck by lightning. From this word comes that of, laureate. Alfred Tennyson being the present poet laureate, crowned with laurel as the first of living bards. Sauce picante, for cutlets, roast meat, and c. Ingredients. 2 ounces. Of butter, 1 small carrot, 6 shallots, 1 small bunch of savory herbs, including parsley, 1 half a bay leaf, 2 slices of lean ham, 2 cloves, 6 peppercorns, 1 blade of mace, 3 whole allspice, 4 tablespoonfuls of vinegar, 1 half pint of stock, no. 104 or 105, 1 small lump of sugar, 1 quarter salt spoonful of cayenne, salt to taste. Mode. Put into a stew pan the butter, with the carrot and shallots, both of which must be cut into small slices. Add the herbs, bay leaf, spices, and ham, which must be minced rather finely, and let these ingredients simmer over a slow fire, until the bottom of the stew pan is covered with a brown glaze. Keep stirring with a wooden spoon, and put in the remaining ingredients. Simmer very gently for a quarter hour, skim off every particle of fat, strain the sauce through a sieve, and serve very hot. Care must be taken that this sauce be not made too acid, although it should possess a sharpness indicated by its name. Of course the above quantity of vinegar may be increased or diminished at pleasure, according to taste. Time. Altogether half an hour. Average cost, 10 d. Sufficient for a medium-sized dish of cutlets. Seasonable at any time. A good sauce for various boiled puddings. Ingredients. A quarter pound, of butter, a quarter pound. Of pounded sugar, a wine glassful of brandy or rum. Mode. Beat the butter to a cream, until no lumps remain, add the pounded sugar, and brandy or rum, stir once or twice until the whole is thoroughly mixed, and serve. This sauce may either be poured round the pudding or served in a tureen, according to the taste or fancy of the cook or mistress. Average cost, 8d. For this quantity. Sufficient for a pudding. Sauce Robert, for steaks, and c. Ingredients. 2 ounces. Of butter, 3 onions, 1 teaspoonful of flour, 4 tablespoonfuls of gravy, or stock number 105, salt and pepper to taste, 1 teaspoonful of made mustard, 1 teaspoonful of vinegar, the juice of 1 half lemon. Mode. Put the butter into a stew pan, set it on the fire, and, when browning, throw in the onions, which must be cut into small slices. Fry them brown, but do not burn them, add the flour, shake the onions in it, and give the whole another fry. Put in the gravy and seasoning, and boil it gently for 10 minutes, 
skim off the fat, add the mustard, vinegar, and lemon juice, give it one boil, and pour round the steaks, or whatever dish the sauce has been prepared for. Time. Altogether half an hour. Average cost, for this quantity, 6d. Seasonable at any time. Sufficient for about 2 pounds, of steak. Note. This sauce will be found an excellent accompaniment to roast goose, pork, mutton cutlets, and various other dishes. A good sauce for steaks. Ingredients. 1 ounce of whole black pepper, half a ounce of allspice, 1 ounce of salt, half a ounce grated horseradish, half a ounce of pickled shallots, 1 pint of mushroom ketchup or walnut pickle. Mode. Pound all the ingredients finely in a mortar, and put them into the ketchup or walnut liquor. Let them stand for a fortnight, when strain off the liquor and bottle for use. Either pour a little of the sauce over the steaks or mix it in the gravy. Seasonable. This can be made at any time. Note. In using a jar of pickled walnuts, there is frequently left a large quantity of liquor, this should be converted into a sauce like the above, and will be found a very useful relish. The growth of the pepper plant. Our readers will see at numbers 369 and 399, a description, with engravings, of the qualities of black and long pepper, and an account of where these spices are found. We will here say something of the manner of the growth of the pepper plant. Like the vine, it requires support, and it is usual to plant a thorny tree by its side, to which it may cling. In Malabar, the chief pepper district of India, the jaca tree, Articarpus integrifolia, is made thus to yield its assistance, the same soil being adapted to the growth of both plants. The stem of the pepper plant entwines round its support to a considerable height, the flexile branches then droop downwards, bearing at their extremities, as well as at other parts, spikes of green flowers, which are followed by the pungent berries. These hang in large bunches, resembling in shape those of grapes, but the fruit grows distinct, each on a little stalk, like currants. Each berry contains a single seed, of a globular form and brownish color, but which changes to a nearly black when dried, and this is the pepper of commerce. The leaves are not unlike those of the ivy, but are larger and of rather lighter color. They partake strongly of the peculiar smell and pungent taste of the berry. Sauce tourney. Ingredients. 1 pint of white stock, number 107, thickening of flour and butter, or white roux, no. 526, a faggot of savory herbs, including parsley, 6 chopped mushrooms, 6 green onions. Mode. Put the stock into a stew pan with the herbs, onions, and mushrooms, and let it simmer very gently for about half an hour. Stir in sufficient thickening to make it of a proper consistency, let it boil for a few minutes, then skim off all the fat, strain and serve. This sauce, with the addition of a little cream, is now frequently called velouté. Time. Half an hour. Average cost, for this quantity, 6d. Note. If poultry trimmings are at hand, the stock should be made of these, and the above sauce should not be made too thick, as it does not then admit of the fat being nicely removed. Sweet sauce, for venison. Ingredients. A small jar of red currant jelly, one glass of port wine. Mode. Put the above ingredients into a stew pan, set them over the fire, and, when melted, pour in a tureen and serve. It should not be allowed to boil. Time. 5 minutes to melt the jelly. Average cost, for this quantity, 1s. Sauce for wildfowl. Ingredients. 1 glass of port wine, 1 tablespoonful of lemington sauce, no. 459, 1 tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup, 1 tablespoonful of lemon juice, 1 slice of lemon peel, 1 large shallot cut in slices, 1 blade of mace, cayenne to taste. Mode. Put all the ingredients into a stew pan, set it over the fire, and let it simmer for about 5 minutes, then strain and serve the sauce in a tureen. Time. 5 minutes. Average cost, for this quantity, 8d. Sausage meat stuffing, for turkey. Ingredients. 
6 ounces of lean pork, 6 ounces of fat pork, both weighed after being chopped, beef suet may be substituted for the latter, 2 ounces. Of bread crumbs, 1 small tablespoonful of minced sage, 1 blade of pounded mace, salt and pepper to taste, 1 egg. Mode. Chop the meat and fat very finely, mix with them the other ingredients, taking care that the whole is thoroughly incorporated. Moisten with the egg, and the stuffing will be ready for use. Equal quantities of this stuffing and forcemeat, number 417, will be found to answer very well, as the herbs, lemon peel, and k. In the latter, impart a very delicious flavor to the sausage meat. As preparations, however, like stuffings and forcemeats, are matters to be decided by individual tastes, they must be left, to a great extent, to the discrimination of the cook, who should study her employer's taste in this. As in every other respect. Average cost, 9d. Sufficient for a small turkey. Savory jelly for meat pies. Ingredients. 3 pounds, of shin of beef, 1 calf's foot, 3 pounds. Of knuckle of veal, poultry trimmings, if for game pies, any game trimmings, 2 onions stuck with cloves, 2 carrots, for shallots, a bunch of savory herbs, 2 bay leaves, when liked, 2 blades of mace and a little spice. 2 slices of lean ham, rather more than 2 quarts of water. Mode. Cut up the meat and put it into a stew pan with all the ingredients except the water. Set it over a slow fire to draw down, and, when the gravy ceases to flow from the meat, pour in the water. Let it boil up, then carefully take away all scum from the top. Cover the stew pan closely, and let the stock simmer very gently for 4 hours, if rapidly boiled, the jelly will not be clear. When done, strain it through a fine sieve or flannel bag, and when cold, the jelly should be quite transparent. If this is not the case, clarify it with the whites of eggs, as described in recipe number 109. Time. 4 hours. Average cost, for this quantity, fives. Shrimp sauce, for various kinds of fish. Ingredients. One third pint of melted butter, no. 376, one quarter pint of picked shrimps, cayenne to taste. Mode. Make the melted butter very smoothly by recipe number 376, shell the shrimps, sufficient to make one quarter pint when picked, and put them into the butter. Season with cayenne, and let the sauce just simmer, but do not allow it to boil. When liked, a teaspoonful of anchovy sauce may be added. Time. 1 minute to simmer. Average cost, 6d. Sufficient for 3 or 4 persons. Spinach green for coloring various dishes. Ingredients. 2 handfuls of spinach. Mode. Pick and wash the spinach free from dirt, and pound the leaves in a mortar to extract the juice. Then press it through a hair sieve, and put the juice into a small stew pan or jar. Place this in a bain-marie, or saucepan of boiling water, and let it set. Watch it closely, as it should not boil. And, as soon as it is done, lay it in a sieve, so that all the water may drain from it, and the green will then be ready for coloring. If made according to this recipe, the spinach green will be found far superior to that boiled in the ordinary way. Hot spice, a delicious adjunct to chops, steaks, gravies, and k. Ingredients 3 drams each of ginger, black pepper, and cinnamon, 7 cloves, half a ounce mace, a quarter ounce of cayenne, 1 ounce grated nutmeg, 1 and a half ounces white pepper. Mode Pound the ingredients and mix them thoroughly together, taking care that everything is well blended. Put the spice in a very dry glass bottle for use. The quantity of cayenne may be increased, should the above not be enough to suit the palate. Illustration, Cinnamon Cinnamon The cinnamon tree, Laura cinnamomum, is a valuable and beautiful species of the laurel family, and grows to the height of 20 or 30 feet. The trunk is short and straight, with wide-spreading branches, and it has a smooth ash-like bark. The leaves are upon short stalks, and are of an oval shape, and 3 to 5 inches long. 
The flowers are in panicles, with six small petals, and the fruit is about the size of an olive, soft, insipid, and of a deep blue. This encloses a nut, the kernel of which germinates soon after it falls. The wood of the tree is white and not very solid, and its root is thick and branching, exuding a great quantity of camphor. The inner bark of the tree forms the cinnamon of commerce. Ceylon was thought to be its native island. But it has been found in Malabar, Cochin China, Sumatra, and the Eastern Islands, also in the Brazils, the Mauritius, Jamaica, and other tropical localities. Brown roux, a French thickening for gravies and sauces. Ingredients 6 ounces of butter, 9 ounces of flour. Mode Melt the butter in a stewpan over a slow fire, and dredge in, very gradually, the flour. Stir it till of a light brown color, to obtain this do it very slowly, otherwise the flour will burn and impart a bitter taste to the sauce it is mixed with. Pour it in a jar, and keep it for use, it will remain good some time. Time. About half an hour. Average cost, 7d. White roux, for thickening white sauces. 526. Allow the same proportions of butter and flour as in the preceding recipe, and proceed in the same manner as for brown roux, but do not keep it on the fire too long, and take care not to let it color. This is used for thickening white sauce. Pour it into a jar to use when wanted. Time. A quarter hour. Average cost, 7d. Sufficient, a dessert spoonful will thicken a pint of gravy. Note. Besides the above, sauces may be thickened with potato flour, ground rice, baked flour, arrowroot, and k. The latter will be found far preferable to the ordinary flour for white sauces. A slice of bread, toasted and added to gravies, answers the two purposes of thickening and coloring them. Spanish onions, pickled. Ingredients. Onions, vinegar. Salt and cayenne to taste. Mode. Cut the onions in thin slices, put a layer of them in the bottom of a jar, sprinkle with salt and cayenne, then add another layer of onions, and season as before. Proceeding in this manner till the jar is full, pour in sufficient vinegar to cover the whole, and the pickle will be fit for use in a month. Seasonable. May be had in England from September to February. Store sauce, or Cherokee. Ingredients. Half a ounce of cayenne pepper, five cloves of garlic, two tablespoonfuls of soy, one tablespoonful of walnut ketchup, one pint of vinegar. Mode. Boil all the ingredients gently for about half an hour, strain the liquor, and bottle off for use. Time. Half an hour. Seasonable. This sauce can be made at any time. Tomato sauce, hot, to serve with cutlets, roast meats, and k. Ingredients. 6 tomatoes, 2 shallots, 1 clove, 1 blade of mace, salt and cayenne to taste, 1 quarter pint of gravy, number 436, or stock number 104. Mode. Cut the tomatoes in two, and squeeze the juice and seeds out, put them in a stew pan with all the ingredients, and let them simmer gently until the tomatoes are tender enough to pulp. Rub the whole through a sieve, boil it for a few minutes, and serve. The shallots and spices may be omitted when their flavor is objected to. Time. One hour, or rather more, to simmer the tomatoes. Average cost, for this quantity, ones. In full season in September and October. Illustration, the tomato. Tomato, or love apple. The plant which bears this fruit is a native of South America, and takes its name from a Portuguese word. The tomato fruit is about the size of a small potato, and is chiefly used in soups, sauces, and gravies. It is sometimes served to table roasted or boiled, and when green, makes a good ketchup or pickle. In its unripe state, it is esteemed as excellent sauce for roast goose or pork, and when quite ripe, a good store sauce may be prepared from it. Tomato sauce for keeping, excellent. I. Ingredients. 
To every quart of tomato pulp allow one pint of cayenne vinegar, number 386, three quarters ounce of shallots, three quarters ounce of garlic, peeled and cut in slices, salt to taste. To every six quarts of liquor, one pint of soy, one pint of anchovy sauce. Mode. Gather the tomatoes quite ripe, bake them in a slow oven till tender, rub them through a sieve, and to every quart of pulp add cayenne vinegar, shallots, garlic, and salt, in the above proportion. Boil the whole together till the garlic and shallots are quite soft. Then rub it through a sieve, put it again into a saucepan, and, to every six quarts of the liquor, add one pint of soy and the same quantity of anchovy sauce, and boil all together for about 20 minutes. Bottle off for use, and carefully seal or rosin the corks. This will keep good for two or three years, but will be fit for use in a week. A useful and less expensive sauce may be made by omitting the anchovy and soy. Time. Altogether one hour. Seasonable. Make this from the middle of September to the end of October. 2. Ingredients. 1 dozen tomatoes, 2 teaspoonfuls of the best powdered ginger, 1 dessertspoonful of salt, 1 head of garlic chopped fine, 2 tablespoonfuls of vinegar, 1 dessertspoonful of chili vinegar, a small quantity of cayenne may be substituted for this. Mode. Choose ripe tomatoes, put them into a stone jar, and stand them in a cool oven until quite tender, when cold, take the skins and stalks from them, mix the pulp with the liquor which is in the jar, but do not strain it. Add all the other ingredients, mix well together, and put it into well-sealed bottles. Stored away in a cool dry place, it will keep good for years. It is ready for use as soon as made, but the flavor is better after a week or two. Should it not appear to keep, turn it out, and boil it up with a little additional ginger and cayenne. For immediate use, the skins should be put into a wide-mouthed bottle with a little of the different ingredients, and they will be found very nice for hashes or stews. Time. 4 or 5 hours in a cool oven. Seasonable from the middle of September to the end of October. 3. Ingredients. 3 dozen tomatoes. To every pound of tomato pulp allow 1 pint of chili vinegar, 1 ounce of garlic, 1 ounce of shallot, 2 ounces. Of salt, 1 large green capsicum, 1 half teaspoonful of cayenne, 2 pickled gherkins, 6 pickled onions, 1 pint of common vinegar, and the juice of 6 lemons. Mode. Choose the tomatoes when quite ripe and red. Put them in a jar with a cover to it, and bake them till tender. The better way is to put them in the oven overnight, when it will not be too hot, and examine them in the morning to see if they are tender. Do not allow them to remain in the oven long enough to break them, but they should be sufficiently soft to skin nicely and rub through the sieve. Measure the pulp, and to each pound of pulp, add the above proportion of vinegar and other ingredients, taking care to chop very fine the garlic, shallot, capsicum, onion, and gherkins. Boil the whole together till everything is tender. Then again rub it through a sieve, and add the lemon juice. Now boil the whole again till it becomes as thick as cream, and keep continually stirring, bottle it when quite cold, cork well, and seal the corks. If the flavor of garlic and shallot is very much disliked, diminish the quantities. Time. Bake the tomatoes in a cool oven all night. Seasonable from the middle of September to the end of October. Note. A quantity of liquor will flow from the tomatoes, which must be put through the sieve with the rest. Keep it well stirred while on the fire, and use a wooden spoon. Universal Pickle. Ingredients. To 6 quarts of vinegar allow 1 pound. Of salt, a quarter pound, of ginger, 1 ounce of mace, half a pound, of shallots, 1 tablespoonful of cayenne, 2 ounces of mustard seed, 1 and a half ounces of turmeric. Mode. Boil all the ingredients together for about 20 minutes. When cold, put them into a jar with whatever vegetables you choose, such as radish pods, French beans, cauliflowers, gherkins, and k. And k, as these come into season. Put them in fresh as you gather them, having previously wiped them perfectly free from moisture and grit. 
this pickle will be fit for use in about 8 or 9 months. Time. 20 minutes. Seasonable. Make the pickle in May or June, to be ready for the various vegetables. Note. As this pickle takes two or three months to make, that is to say, nearly that time will elapse before all the different vegetables are added, care must be taken to keep the jar which contains the pickle well covered, either with a closely fitting lid, or a piece of bladder securely tied over, so as perfectly to exclude the air. Pickled walnuts, very good. Ingredients. 100 walnuts, salt and water. To each quart of vinegar allow 2 ounces of whole black pepper, 1 ounce of allspice, 1 ounce of bruised ginger. Mode. Procure the walnuts while young. Be careful they are not woody, and prick them well with a fork, prepare a strong brine of salt and water, 4 pounds, of salt to each gallon of water, into which put the walnuts, letting them remain 9 days, and changing the brine every third day. Drain them off, put them on a dish, place it in the sun until they become perfectly black, which will be in two or three days, have ready dry jars, into which place the walnuts, and do not quite fill the jars. Boil sufficient vinegar to cover them, for ten minutes, with spices in the above proportion, and pour it hot over the walnuts, which must be quite covered with the pickle, tie down with bladder, and keep in a dry place. They will be fit for use in a month, and will keep good two or three years. Time. 10 minutes. Seasonable. Make this from the beginning to the middle of July, before the walnuts harden. Note. When liked, a few shallots may be added to the vinegar, and boiled with it. Walnut ketchup. I. Ingredients. 100 walnuts, 1 handful of salt, 1 quart of vinegar, a quarter ounce of mace, a quarter ounce of nutmeg, a quarter ounce of cloves, a quarter ounce of ginger, a quarter ounce of whole black pepper, a small piece of horseradish, twenty shallots, a quarter pound of anchovies, one pint of port wine. Mode. Procure the walnuts at the time you can run a pin through them, slightly bruise, and put them into a jar with the salt and vinegar, let them stand eight days, stirring every day. Then drain the liquor from them, and boil it, with the above ingredients, for about half an hour. It may be strained or not, as preferred, and, if required, a little more vinegar or wine can be added, according to taste. When bottled well, seal the corks. Time. Half an hour. Seasonable. Make this from the beginning to the middle of July, when walnuts are in perfection for pickling purposes. Two. Ingredients. One half sieve of walnut shells, two quarts of water, salt, half a pound, of shallots, one ounce of cloves, one ounce of mace, one ounce of whole pepper, one ounce of garlic. Mode. Put the walnut shells into a pan, with the water, and a large quantity of salt. Let them stand for ten days, then break the shells up in the water, and let it drain through a sieve, putting a heavy weight on the top to express the juice, place it on the fire, and remove all scum that may arise. Now boil the liquor with the shallots, cloves, mace, pepper, and garlic, and let all simmer till the shallots sink, then put the liquor into a pan, and, when cold, bottle, and cork closely. It should stand six months before using, should it ferment during that time, it must be again boiled and skimmed. Time about three quarters hour. Seasonable in September, when the walnut shells are obtainable. Illustration, the walnut. The walnut. This nut is a native of Persia, and was introduced into England from France. As a pickle, it is much used in the green state, and grated walnuts in Spain are much employed, both in tarts and other dishes. On the continent it is occasionally employed as a substitute for olive oil in cooking but it is apt, under such circumstances, to become rancid. The matter which remains after the oil is extracted is considered highly nutritious for poultry. It is called mare, and in Switzerland is eaten under the name of pain ammer by the poor. The oil is frequently manufactured into a kind of soap, and the leaves and green husks yield an extract, which, as a brown dye, is used to stain hair, wool, and wood. 
White sauce, good. Ingredients. 1 half pint of white stock, no. 107, 1 half pint of cream, 1 dessert spoonful of flour, salt to taste. Mode. Have ready a delicately clean saucepan, into which put the stock, which should be well flavored with vegetables, and rather savory. Mix the flour smoothly with the cream, add it to the stock, season with a little salt, and boil all these ingredients very gently for about 10 minutes, keeping them well stirred the whole time, as this sauce is very liable to burn. Time. 10 minutes. Average cost, ones. Sufficient for a pair of fowls. Seasonable at any time. White sauce, made without meat. Ingredients. 2 ounces. Of butter, 2 small onions, 1 carrot, 1 half a small teacupful of flour, 1 pint of new milk, salt and cayenne to taste. Mode. Cut up the onions and carrot very small, and put them into a stew pan with the butter. Simmer them till the butter is nearly dried up, then stir in the flour, and add the milk, boil the whole gently until it thickens, strain it, season with salt and cayenne, and it will be ready to serve. Time. A quarter hour. Average cost, 5d. Sufficient for a pair of fowls. Seasonable at any time. White sauce, a very simple and inexpensive method. Ingredients. One and a half pint of milk, one and a half ounces of rice, one strip of lemon peel, one small blade of pounded mace, salt and cayenne to taste. Mode. Boil the milk with the lemon peel and rice until the latter is perfectly tender, then take out the lemon peel and pound the milk and rice together. Put it back into the stew pan to warm, add the mace and seasoning, give it one boil, and serve. This sauce should be of the consistency of thick cream. Time. About one and a half hour to boil the rice. Average cost, 4D. Sufficient for a pair of fowls. Seasonable at any time. Illustration, the Lemington stove, or Kitchener. Various modes of cooking meat. Chapter 11. General Remarks. 540, in our, Introduction to Cookery, see no. 76, we have described the gradual progress of mankind in the art of cookery, the probability being, that the human race, for a long period, lived wholly on fruits. Man's means of attacking animals, even if he had the desire of slaughtering them, were very limited, until he acquired the use of arms. He, however, made weapons for himself, and, impelled by a carnivorous instinct, made prey of the animals that surrounded him. It is natural that man should seek to feed on flesh. He has too small a stomach to be supported alone by fruit, which has not sufficient nourishment to renovate him. It is possible he might subsist on vegetables. But their preparation needs the knowledge of art, only to be obtained after the lapse of many centuries. Man's first weapons were the branches of trees, which were succeeded by bows and arrows, and it is worthy of remark, that these latter weapons have been found with the natives of all climates and latitudes. It is singular how this idea presented itself to individuals so differently placed. 541 Brillat Saverin says, that raw flesh has but one inconvenience, from its viscousness it attaches itself to the teeth. He goes on to say, that it is not, however, disagreeable, but, when seasoned with salt, that it is easily digested. He tells a story of a Croat captain, whom he invited to dinner in 1815, during the occupation of Paris by the Allied troops. This officer was amazed at his host's preparations, and said, when we are campaigning, and get hungry, we knock over the first animal we find, cut off a steak, powder it with salt, which we always have in the sabotage, put it under the saddle. Gallop over it for half a mile, and then dine like princes. Again, of the huntsmen of Dauphiny it is said, that when they are out shooting in September, they take with them both pepper and salt. If they kill a very fat bird, they pluck and season it, and, after carrying it some time in their caps, eat it. This, they declare, is the best way of serving it up. 542, subsequently to the Croat mode, which, doubtless, was in fashion in the earlier ages of the world, 
fire was discovered. This was an accident. For fire is not, although we are accustomed to call it so, an element, or spontaneous. Many savage nations have been found utterly ignorant of it, and many races had no other way of dressing their food than by exposing it to the rays of the sun. 543, the inhabitants of the Marian Islands, which were discovered in 1521, had no idea of fire. Never was astonishment greater than theirs when they first saw it, on the descent of Magellan, the navigator, on one of their isles. At first they thought it a kind of animal, that fixed itself to and fed upon wood. Some of them, who approached too near, being burnt, the rest were terrified, and durst only look upon it at a distance. They were afraid, they said, of being bit, or lest that dreadful animal should wound with his violent respiration and dreadful breath, for these were the first notions they formed of the heat and flame. Such, too, probably, were the notions the Greeks originally formed of them. 544, fire having been discovered, mankind endeavored to make use of it for drying, and afterwards for cooking their meat. But they were a considerable time before they hit upon proper and commodious methods of employing it in the preparation of their food. 545. Meat, then, placed on burning fuel was found better than when raw, it had more firmness, was eaten with less difficulty, and the osmazome being condensed by the carbonization, gave it a pleasing perfume and flavor. Still, however, the meat cooked on the coal would become somewhat befouled, certain portions of the fuel adhering to it. This disadvantage was remedied by passing spits through it, and placing it at a suitable height above the burning fuel. Thus grilling was invented, and it is well known that, simple as is this mode of cookery, yet all meat cooked in this way is richly and pleasantly flavored. In Homer's time, the art of cookery had not advanced much beyond this. For we read in the Iliad, how the great Achilles and his friend Patroclus regaled the three Grecian leaders on bread, wine, and broiled meat. It is noticeable, too, that Homer does not speak of boiled meat anywhere in his poems. Later, however, the Jews, coming out of their captivity in Egypt, had made much greater progress. They undoubtedly possessed kettles, and in one of these, Esau's mess of pottage, for which he sold his birthright, must have been prepared. 546. Having thus briefly traced a history of gastronomical progresses, we will now proceed to describe the various methods of cooking meat, and make a few observations on the chemical changes which occur in each of the operations. 547. In this country, plain boiling, roasting, and baking are the usual methods of cooking animal food. To explain the philosophy of these simple culinary operations, we must advert to the effects that are produced by heat on the principal constituents of flesh. When finely chopped mutton or beef is steeped for some time in a small quantity of clean water, and then subjected to slight pressure, the juice of the meat is extracted, and there is left a white tasteless residue. Consisting chiefly of muscular fibers. When this residue is heated to between 158 degrees and 177 degrees Fahrenheit, the fibers shrink together, and become hard and horny. The influence of an elevated temperature on the soluble extract of flesh is not less remarkable. When the watery infusion, which contains all the savory constituents of the meat, is gradually heated, it soon becomes turbid, and, when the temperature reaches 133 degrees, flakes of whitish matter separate. These flakes are albumin, a substance precisely similar, in all its properties, to the white of egg, see number 101. When the temperature of the watery extract is raised to 158 degrees, the coloring matter of the blood coagulates, and the liquid, which was originally tinged red by this substance, is left perfectly clear, and almost colorless. When evaporated, even at a gentle heat, this residual liquid gradually becomes brown, and acquires the flavor of roast meat. 548, these interesting facts, discovered in the laboratory, throw a flood of light upon the mysteries of the kitchen. The fibers of meat are surrounded by a liquid which contains albumin in its soluble state, just as it exists in the unboiled egg. During the operation of boiling or roasting, this substance coagulates, and thereby prevents the contraction and hardening of the fibers. 
the tenderness of well-cooked meat is consequently proportioned to the amount of albumin deposited in its substance. Meat is underdone when it has been heated throughout only to the temperature of coagulating albumin, it is thoroughly done when it has been heated through its whole mass to the temperature at which the coloring matter of the blood coagulates, it is overdone when the heat has been continued long enough to harden the fibers. 549. The juice of flesh is water, holding in solution many substances besides albumin, which are of the highest possible value as articles of food. In preparing meat for the table, great care should be taken to prevent the escape of this precious juice, as the succulence and sapidity of the meat depend on its retention. The meat to be cooked should be exposed at first to a quick heat, which immediately coagulates the albumin on and near the surface. A kind of shell is thus formed, which effectually retains the whole of the juice within the meat. 550. During the operations of boiling, boasting, and baking, fresh beef and mutton, when moderately fat, lose, according to Johnston, on an average about. In boiling. In baking. In roasting. 4 pounds, of beef lose 1 pound, 1 pound, 3 ounces 1 pound, 5 ounces. 4 pounds. Of mutton lose 14 ounces 1 pound, 4 ounces 1 pound, 6 ounces. Baking. Illustration, baking dish. 551. The difference between roasting meat and baking it, may be generally described as consisting in the fact, that, in baking it, the fumes caused by the operation are not carried off in the same way as occurs in roasting. Much, however, of this disadvantage is obviated by the improved construction of modern ovens, and of especially those in connection with the Leamington Kitchener, of which we give an engraving here. And a full description of which will be seen at paragraph no. 65, with the prices at which they can be purchased of Messrs. R. and J. Slack, of the Strand. With meat baked in the generality of ovens, however, which do not possess ventilators on the principle of this kitchener, there is undoubtedly a peculiar taste, which does not at all equal the flavor developed by roasting meat. The chemistry of baking may be said to be the same as that described in roasting. 552. Should the oven be very brisk, it will be found necessary to cover the joint with a piece of white paper, to prevent the meat from being scorched and blackened outside, before the heat can penetrate into the inside. This paper should be removed half an hour before the time of serving dinner, so that the joint may take a good color. 553. By means of a jar, many dishes, which will be enumerated under their special heads, may be economically prepared in the oven. The principal of these are soup, gravies, jugged hare, beef tea. And this mode of cooking may be advantageously adopted with a ham, which has previously been covered with a common crust of flour and water. 554. All dishes prepared for baking should be more highly seasoned than when intended to be roasted. There are some dishes which, it may be said, are at least equally well cooked in the oven as by the roaster. Thus, a shoulder of mutton and baked potatoes, a fillet or breast of veal, a sucking pig, a hare, well basted, will be received by connoisseurs as well, when baked, as if they had been roasted. Indeed, the baker's oven, or the family oven, may often, as has been said, be substituted for the cook and the spit with greater economy and convenience. 555. A baking dish, of which we give an engraving, should not be less than six or seven inches deep. So that the meat, which of course cannot be basted, can stew in its own juices. In the recipe for each dish, full explanations concerning any special points in relation to it will be given. Boiling 556. Boiling, or the preparation of meat by hot water, though one of the easiest processes in cookery, requires skillful management. Boiled meat should be tender, savory, and full of its own juice, or natural gravy. But, through the carelessness and ignorance of cooks, it is too often sent to table hard, tasteless, and inattritious. To ensure a successful result in boiling flesh, the heat of the fire must be judiciously regulated, the proper quantity of water must be kept up in the pot, and the scum which rises to the surface must be carefully removed. 557. 
Many writers on cookery assert that the meat to be boiled should be put into cold water, and that the pot should be heated gradually. But Liebig, the highest authority on all matters connected with the chemistry of food, has shown that meat so treated loses some of its most nutritious constituents. If the flesh, says the great chemist, be introduced into the boiler when the water is in a state of brisk ebullition, and if the boiling be kept up for a few minutes, and the pot then placed in a warm place. So that the temperature of the water is kept at 158 degrees to 165 degrees, we have the united conditions for giving to the flesh the qualities which best fit it for being eaten. When a piece of meat is plunged into boiling water, the albumen which is near the surface immediately coagulates, forming an envelope, which prevents the escape of the internal juice, and most effectually excludes the water, which, by mixing with this juice, would render the meat insipid. Meat treated thus is juicy and well-flavored, when cooked, as it retains most of its savory constituents. On the other hand, if the piece of meat be set on the fire with cold water, and this slowly heated to boiling, the flesh undergoes a loss of soluble and nutritious substances, while, as a matter of course, the soup becomes richer in these matters. The albumen is gradually dissolved from the surface to the center, the fiber loses, more or less, its quality of shortness or tenderness, and becomes hard and tough, the thinner the piece of meat is, the greater is its loss of savory constituents. In order to obtain well-flavored and eatable meat, we must relinquish the idea of making good soup from it, as that mode of boiling which yields the best soup gives the driest, toughest, and most vapid meat. Slow boiling whitens the meat. And, we suspect, that it is on this account that it is in such favor with the cooks. The wholesomeness of food is, however, a matter of much greater moment than the appearance it presents on the table. It should be borne in mind, that the whiteness of meat that has been boiled slowly, is produced by the loss of some important alimentary properties. 558. The objections we have raised to the practice of putting meat on the fire in cold water, apply with equal force to the practice of soaking meat before cooking it, which is so strongly recommended by some cooks. Fresh meat ought never to be soaked, as all its most nutritive constituents are soluble in water. Soaking, however, is an operation that cannot be entirely dispensed with in the preparation of animal food. Salted and dried meats require to be soaked for some time in water before they are cooked. 559. For boiling meat, the softer the water is, the better. When spring water is boiled, the chalk which gives to it the quality of hardness, is precipitated. This chalk stains the meat and communicates to it an unpleasant earthy taste. When nothing but hard water can be procured, it should be softened by boiling it for an hour or two before it is used for culinary purposes. 560. The fire must be watched with great attention during the operation of boiling, so that its heat may be properly regulated. As a rule, the pot should be kept in a simmering state, a result which cannot be attained without vigilance. 561. The temperature at which water boils, under usual circumstances, is 212 degrees FAHR. Water does not become hotter after it has begun to boil, however long or with whatever violence the boiling is continued. This fact is of great importance in cookery, and attention to it will save much fuel. Water made to boil in a gentle way by the application of a moderate heat is just as hot as when it is made to boil on a strong fire with the greatest possible violence. When once water has been brought to the boiling point, the fire may be considerably reduced, as a very gentle heat will suffice to keep the water at its highest temperature. 562. The scum which rises to the surface of the pot during the operation of boiling must be carefully removed, otherwise it will attach itself to the meat, and thereby spoil its appearance. The cook must not neglect to skim during the whole process, though by far the greater part of the scum rises at first. The practice of wrapping meat in a cloth may be dispensed with if the skimming be skillfully managed. If the scum be removed as fast as it rises, the meat will be cooked clean and pure, and come out of the vessel in which it was boiled, much more delicate and firm than when cooked in a cloth. 563. When taken from the pot, the meat must be wiped with a clean cloth, or, what will be found more convenient, 
a sponge previously dipped in water and wrung dry. The meat should not be allowed to stand a moment longer than necessary, as boiled meat, as well as roasted, cannot be eaten too hot. 564. The time allowed for the operation of boiling must be regulated according to the size and quality of the meat. As a general rule, 20 minutes, reckoning from the moment when the boiling commences, may be allowed for every pound of meat. All the best authorities, however, agree in this, that the longer the boiling the more perfect the operation. 565. A few observations on the nutritive value of salted meat may be properly introduced in this place. Every housewife knows that dry salt in contact with fresh meat gradually becomes fluid brine. The application of salt causes the fibers of the meat to contract, and the juice to flow out from its pores, as much as one-third of the juice of the meat is often forced out in this manner. Now, as this juice is pure extract of meat, containing albumin, osmazome, and other valuable principles, it follows that meat which has been preserved by the action of salt can never have the nutritive properties of fresh meat. 566. The vessels used for boiling should be made of cast iron, well tinned within, and provided with closely fitting lids. They must be kept scrupulously clean, otherwise they will render the meat cooked in them unsightly and unwholesome. Copper pans, if used at all, should be reserved for operations that are performed with rapidity, as, by long contact with copper, food may become dangerously contaminated. The kettle in which a joint is dressed should be large enough to allow room for a good supply of water, if the meat be cramped and be surrounded with but little water, it will be stewed, not boiled. 567. In stewing, IT is not requisite to have so great a heat as in boiling. A gentle simmering in a small quantity of water, so that the meat is stewed almost in its own juices, is all that is necessary. It is a method much used on the continent, and is wholesome and economical. Illustration, Boiling Pot Illustration, Stupan Two useful culinary vessels are represented above. One is a boiling pot, in which large joints may be boiled. The other is a stewpan, with a closely fitting lid, to which is attached a long handle, so that the cover can be removed without scalding the fingers. Illustration, Hot Plate 568 The hot plate is a modern improvement on the old kitchen ranges, being used for boiling and stewing. It is a plate of cast iron, having a closed fire burning beneath it, by which it is thoroughly well heated. On this plate are set the various saucepans, stewpans, and k and, by this convenient and economical method, a number of dishes may be prepared at one time. The culinary processes of braising and stewing are, in this manner, rendered more gradual, and consequently the substance acted on becomes more tender, and the gravy is not so much reduced. Broiling Illustration, Revolving Gridiron 569 Generally speaking, small dishes only are prepared by this mode of cooking, Amongst these, the beefsteak and mutton chop of the solitary English diner may be mentioned as celebrated all the world over. Our beefsteak, indeed, has long crossed the channel, and, with a view of pleasing the Britons, there is in every cart at every French restaurant, by the side of a la Marengo, and a la Mayonnaise, Biftec d'Angleterre. In order to succeed in a broil, the cook must have a bright, clear fire, so that the surface of the meat may be quickly heated. The result of this is the same as that obtained in roasting. Namely, that a crust, so to speak, is formed outside, and thus the juices of the meat are retained. The appetite of an invalid, so difficult to minister to, is often pleased with a broiled dish, as the flavor and sapidity of the meat are so well preserved. 570. The utensils used for broiling need but little description. The common gridiron, for which see engraving at no. 68, is the same as it has been for ages past, although some little variety has been introduced into its manufacture, by the addition of grooves to the bars, by means of which the liquid fat is carried into a small trough. One point it is well to bear in mind, viz., that the gridiron should be kept in a direction slanting towards the cook, so that as little fat as possible may fall into the fire. It has been observed, 
that broiling is the most difficult manual office the general cook has to perform, and one that requires the most unremitting attention. For she may turn her back upon the stew pan or the spit, but the gridiron can never be left with impunity. The revolving gridiron, shown in the engraving, possesses some advantages of convenience, which will be at once apparent. Frying. Illustration, Sot Pan. 571. This very favorite mode of cooking may be accurately described as boiling in fat or oil. Substances dressed in this way are generally well received, for they introduce an agreeable variety, possessing, as they do, a peculiar flavor. By means of frying, cooks can soon satisfy many requisitions made on them, it being a very expeditious mode of preparing dishes for the table. And one which can be employed when the fire is not sufficiently large for the purposes of roasting and boiling. The great point to be borne in mind in frying, is that the liquid must be hot enough to act instantaneously, as all the merit of this culinary operation lies in the invasion of the boiling liquid, which carbonizes or burns. At the very instant of the immersion of the body placed in it. It may be ascertained if the fat is heated to the proper degree, by cutting a piece of bread and dipping it in the frying pan for five or six seconds, and if it be firm and of a dark brown when taken out, put in immediately what you wish to prepare. If it be not, let the fat be heated until of the right temperature. This having been effected, moderate the fire, so that the action may not be too hurried, and that by a continuous heat the juices of the substance may be preserved, and its flavor enhanced. 572. The philosophy of frying consists in this, that liquids subjected to the action of fire do not all receive the same quantity of heat. Being differently constituted in their nature, they possess different capacities for caloric. Thus, you may, with impunity, dip your finger in boiling spirits of wine, you would take it very quickly from boiling brandy, yet more rapidly from water, whilst the effects of the most rapid immersion in boiling oil need not be told. As a consequence of this, heated fluids act differently on the sapid bodies presented to them. Those put in water, dissolve, and are reduced to a soft mass, the result being bouillon, stock, and c. See number 103. Those substances, on the contrary, treated with oil, harden, assume a more or less deep color, and are finely carbonized. The reason of these different results is, that, in the first instance, water dissolves and extracts the interior juices of the alimentary substances placed in it, whilst, in the second, the juices are preserved, for they are insoluble in oil. 573. It is T.O.B. especially remembered, in connection with frying, that all dishes fried in fat should be placed before the fire on a piece of blotting paper, or sieve reversed, and they're left for a few minutes. So that any superfluous greasy moisture may be removed. 574. The utensils used for the purposes of frying are confined to frying pans, although these are of various sizes, and, for small and delicate dishes, such as collops, fritters, pancakes, and c. The sauté pan, of which we give an engraving, is used. Cooking by gas. Illustration, gas stove. 575. Gas cooking can scarcely now be considered a novelty, many establishments, both small and large, have been fitted with apparatus for cooking by this mode, which undoubtedly exhibits some advantages. Thus the heat may be more regularly supplied to the substance cooking, and the operation is essentially a clean one, because there can be no cinders or other dirt to be provided for. Some labor and attention necessary, too, with a coal fire or close stove, may be saved, and, besides this, it may, perhaps, be said that culinary operations are reduced, by this means, to something like a certainty. 576. There are, however, we think, many objections to this mode of cooking, more especially when applied to small domestic establishments. For instance, the ingenious machinery necessary for carrying it out, requires cooks perfectly conversant with its use. And if the gas, when the cooking operations are finished, be not turned off, there will be a large increase in the cost of cooking, instead of the economy which it has been supposed to bring. For large establishments, such as some of the immense London warehouses, where a large number of young men have to be catered for daily, it may be well adapted. 
as it is just possible that a slight increase in the supply of gas necessary for a couple of joints may serve equally to cook a dozen dishes. Roasting 577. Of the various methods of preparing meat, roasting is that which most effectually preserves its nutritive qualities. Meat is roasted by being exposed to the direct influence of the fire. This is done by placing the meat before an open grate, and keeping it in motion to prevent the scorching on any particular part. When meat is properly roasted, the outer layer of its albumen is coagulated, and thus presents a barrier to the exit of the juice. In roasting meat, the heat must be strongest at first, and it should then be much reduced. To have a good juicy roast, therefore, the fire must be red and vigorous at the very commencement of the operation. In the most careful roasting, some of the juice is squeezed out of the meat, this evaporates on the surface of the meat, and gives it a dark brown color, a rich luster, and a strong aromatic taste. Besides these effects on the albumen and the expelled juice, Roasting converts the cellular tissue of the meat into gelatin, and melts the fat out of the fat cells. 578. If a spit is used to support the meat before the fire, it should be kept quite bright. Sand and water ought to be used to scour it with, for brick dust and oil may give a disagreeable taste to the meat. When well scoured, it must be wiped quite dry with a clean cloth, and, in spitting the meat, the prime parts should be left untouched, so as to avoid any great escape of its juices. 579. Kitchens in large establishments are usually fitted with what are termed smoke jacks. By means of these, several spits, if required, may be turned at the same time. This not being, of course, necessary in smaller establishments, a roasting apparatus, more economical in its consumption of coal, is more frequently in use. Illustration, Bottle Jack, with Wheel and Hook 580. The Bottle Jack, of which we here give an illustration, with the wheel and hook, and showing the precise manner of using it, is now commonly used in many kitchens. This consists of a spring enclosed in a brass cylinder, and requires winding up before it is used, and sometimes, also, during the operation of roasting. The joint is fixed to an iron hook, which is suspended by a chain connected with a wheel, and which, in its turn, is connected with the bottle jack. Beneath it stands the dripping pan, which we have also engraved, together with the basting ladle, the use of which latter should not be spared, as there can be no good roast without good basting. Spare the rod, and spoil the child, might easily be paraphrased into, spare the basting, and spoil the meat. If the joint is small and light, and so turns unsteadily, this may be remedied by fixing to the wheel one of the kitchen weights. Sometimes this jack is fixed inside a screen, but there is this objection to this apparatus, that the meat cooked in it resembles the flavor of baked meat. This is derived from its being so completely surrounded with the tin, that no sufficient current of air gets to it. It will be found preferable to make use of a common meat screen, such as is shown in the woodcut. This contains shelves for warming plates and dishes, and with this, the reflection not being so powerful, and more air being admitted to the joint, the roast may be very excellently cooked. Illustration, Dripping Pan and Basting Ladle 581. In stirring the fire, or putting fresh coals on it, the dripping pan should always be drawn back, so that there may be no danger of the coal, cinders, or ashes falling down into it. 582. Under each particular recipe there is stated the time required for roasting each joint, but, as a general rule, it may be here given, that for every pound of meat, in ordinary size joints, a quarter of an hour may be allotted. Illustration, Heat Screen. 583. White meats, and the meat of young animals, require to be very well roasted, both to be pleasant to the palate and easy of digestion. Thus veal, pork, and lamb, should be thoroughly done to the center. 584. Mutton and beef, on the other hand, do not, generally speaking, require to be so thoroughly done, and they should be dressed to the point, that, in carving them, the gravy should just run, but not too freely. Of course in this, as in most other dishes, the tastes of individuals vary, and there are many who cannot partake, 
with satisfaction, of any joint unless it is what others would call overdressed. Illustration Illustration Quadrupeds Chapter 12 General Observations on Quadrupeds 585, By the general ascent of mankind, the empire of nature has been divided into three kingdoms, the first consisting of minerals, the second of vegetables, and the third of animals. The mineral kingdom comprises all substances which are without those organs necessary to locomotion, and the due performance of the functions of life. They are composed of the accidental aggregation of particles, which, under certain circumstances, take a constant and regular figure, but which are more frequently found without any definite conformation. They also occupy the interior parts of the earth, as well as compose those huge masses by which we see the land in some parts guarded against the encroachments of the sea. The vegetable kingdom covers and beautifies the earth with an endless variety of form and color. It consists of organized bodies, but destitute of the power of locomotion. They are nourished by means of roots, they breathe by means of leaves, and propagate by means of seed, dispersed within certain limits. The animal kingdom consists of sentient beings, that enliven the external parts of the earth. They possess the powers of voluntary motion, respire air, and are forced into action by the cravings of hunger or the parching of thirst, by the instincts of animal passion, or by pain. Like the vegetable kingdom, they are limited within the boundaries of certain countries by the conditions of climate and soil, and some of the species prey upon each other. Linnaeus has divided them into six classes. Mammalia, birds, fishes, amphibious animals, insects, and worms. The three latter do not come within the limits of our domain, of fishes we have already treated, of birds we shall treat, and of mammalia we will now treat. 586. This class of animals embraces all those that nourish their young by means of lacteal glands, or teats, and are so constituted as to have a warm or red blood. In it the whale is placed, an order which, from external habits, has usually been classed with the fishes. But, although this animal exclusively inhabits the water, and is supplied with fins, it nevertheless exhibits a striking alliance to quadrupeds. It has warm blood, and produces its young alive. It nourishes them with milk, and, for that purpose, is furnished with teats. It is also supplied with lungs, and two oracles and two ventricles to the heart. All of which bring it still closer into an alliance with the quadrupedal species of the animal kingdom. 587 The general characteristics of the mammalia have been frequently noticed. The bodies of nearly the whole species are covered with hair, a kind of clothing which is both soft and warm, little liable to injury, and bestowed in proportion to the necessities of the animal and the nature of the climate it inhabits. In all the higher orders of animals, the head is the principal seat of the organs of sense. It is there that the eyes, the ears, the nose, and the mouth are placed. Through the last they receive their nourishment. In it are the teeth, which, in most of the mammalia, are used not only for the mastication of food, but as weapons of offense. They are inserted into two movable bones called jaws, and the front teeth are so placed that their sharp edges may easily be brought in contact with their food, in order that its fibers may readily be separated. Next to these, on each side, are situated the canine teeth, or tusks, which are longer than the other teeth, and, being pointed, are used to tear the food. In the back jaws are placed another form of teeth, called grinders. These are for masticating the food, and in those animals that live on vegetables, they are flattened at the top, but, in carnivora, their upper surfaces are furnished with sharp-pointed protuberances. From the numbers, form, and disposition of the teeth, the various genera of quadrupeds have been arranged. The nose is a cartilaginous body, pierced with two holes, which are called nostrils. Through these the animal is affected by the sense of smell, and in some it is prominent, whilst in others it is flat, compressed, turned upwards, or bent downwards. In beasts of prey, it is frequently longer than the lips. And in some other animals it is elongated into a movable trunk or proboscis, whilst, in the rhinoceros tribe, it is armed with a horn. The eyes of quadrupeds are generally defended by movable lids, 
on the outer margins of which are fringes of hair, called eyelashes. The opening of the pupil is in general circular. But to some species, as in those of the cat and hare, it is contracted into a perpendicular line, whilst in the horse, the ox, and a few others, it forms a transverse bar. The ears are openings, generally accompanied with a cartilage which defends and covers them, called the external ears. In water animals the latter are wanting. Sound, in them, being transmitted merely through orifices in the head, which have the name of auditory holes. The most defenseless animals are extremely delicate in the sense of hearing, as are likewise most beasts of prey. Most of the mammiferous animals walk on four feet, which, at the extremities, are usually divided into toes or fingers. In some, however, the feet end in a single cornea substance called a hoof. The toes of a few end in broad, flat nails, and of most others, in pointed claws. Some, again, have the toes connected by a membrane, which is adapted to those that are destined to pass a considerable portion of their lives in water. Others, again, as in the bat, have the digitations of the anterior feet greatly elongated, the intervening space being filled by a membrane, which extends round the hinder legs and tail, and by means of which they are enabled to rise into the air. In man, the hand alone comprises fingers, separate, free, and flexible, but apes, and some other kinds of animals, have fingers both to the hands and feet. These, therefore, are the only animals that can hold movable objects in a single hand. Others, such as rats and squirrels, have the fingers sufficiently small and flexible to enable them to pick up objects, but they are compelled to hold them in both hands. Others, again, have the toes shorter, and must rest on the four feet, as is the case with dogs and cats when they wish to hold a substance firmly on the ground with their paws. There are still others that have their toes united and drawn under the skin, or enveloped in corneous hoofs, and are thereby enabled to exercise no prehensile power whatever. 588. According to the design and end of nature, mammiferous animals are calculated, when arrived at maturity, to subsist on various kinds of food, some to live wholly upon flesh, others upon grain, herbs, or fruits. But in their infant state, milk is the appropriate food of the whole. That this food may never fail them, it is universally ordained, that the young should no sooner come into the world. Then the milk should flow in abundance into the members with which the mother is supplied for the secretion of that nutritious fluid. By a wonderful instinct of nature, too, the young animal, almost as soon as it has come into life, searches for the teat, and knows perfectly, at the first, how, by the process of suction, it will be able to extract the fluid necessary to its existence. 589. In the general economy of nature, this class of animals seems destined to preserve a constant equilibrium in the number of animated beings that hold their existence on the surface of the earth. To man they are immediately useful in various ways. Some of their bodies afford him food, their skin shoes, and their fleece clothes. Some of them unite with him in participating the dangers of combat with an enemy, and others assist him in the chase, in exterminating wilder sorts, or banishing them from the haunts of civilization. Many, indeed, are injurious to him. But most of them, in some shape or other, he turns to his service. Of these there is none he has made more subservient to his purposes than the common ox, of which there is scarcely a part that he has not been able to convert into some useful purpose. Of the horns he makes drinking vessels, knife handles, combs, and boxes, and when they are softened by means of boiling water, he fashions them into transparent plates for lanterns. This invention is ascribed to King Alfred, who is said to have been the first to use them to preserve his candle time measures from the wind. Glue is made of the cartilages, gristles, and the finer pieces of the parings and cuttings of the hides. Their bone is a cheap substitute for ivory. The thinnest of the calf skins are manufactured into vellum. Their blood is made the basis of Prussian blue, and saddlers use a fine sort of thread prepared from their sinews. The hair is used in various valuable manufactures, the suet, fat, and tallow, are molded into candles, and the milk and cream of the cow yield butter and cheese. Thus is every part of this animal valuable to man, who has spared no pains to bring it to the highest state of perfection.
Illustration, Shorthorn Cow. Illustration, Shorthorn Bull. 590. Among the various breeds of the OX, upon which man has bestowed his highest powers of culture, there is now none takes a higher place than that known by the name of Shorthorns. From the earliest ages, Great Britain has been distinguished for the excellence of her native breeds of cattle, and there are none in England that have obtained greater celebrity than those which have this name, and which originated. About seventy years ago, on the banks of the Tees. Thence they have spread into the valleys of the Tweed, thence to the Lothians, in Scotland, and southward, into the fine pastures of England. They are now esteemed the most profitable breed of cattle, as there is no animal which attains sooner to maturity, and none that supplies meat of a superior quality. The value of some of the improved breeds is something enormous. At the sale of Mr. Charles Colling, a breeder in Yorkshire, in 1810, his bull, Comet, sold for 1,000 guineas. At the sale of Earl Spencer's herd in 1846, 104 cows, heifers, and calves, with 19 bulls, fetched 8,468 pounds. Fives, being an average of 68 pounds. Seventeenths, the piece. The value of such animals is scarcely to be estimated by those who are unacquainted with the care with which they are tended, and with the anxious attention which is paid to the purity of their breed. A modern writer, well acquainted with this subject, says, there are now, at least, five hundred herds, large and small, in this kingdom, and from six to seven thousand head registered every alternate year in the herd book. The necessity for thus recording the breeds is greater than might, at first sight, be imagined, as it tends directly to preserve the character of the cattle, while it sometimes adds to the value and reputation of the animal thus entered. Besides, many of the Americans, and large purchasers for the foreign market, will not look at an animal without the breeder has taken care to qualify him for such reference. Of shorthorn stock, there is annually sold from £40,000 to £50,000 worth by public auction, independent of the vast numbers disposed of by private contract. The brood is highly prized in Belgium, Prussia, France, Italy, and Russia. It is imported into most of the British colonies, and is greatly esteemed both for its meat and its dairy produce, wherever it is known. The quickness with which it takes on flesh, and the weight which it frequently makes, are well known. But we may mention that it is not uncommon to tea steers of from 4 to 5 years old realize a weight of from 800 to 1,000 pounds. Such animals command from the butcher from 30 pounds to 40 pounds per head, according to the quality. Whilst others, of two or three years old, and, of course, of less weight, bring as much as twenty pounds apiece. Illustration, Longhorn Bull. Illustration, Longhorn Cow. 591, Longhorns. This is the prevailing breed in our Midland counties and in Ireland, but they are greatly inferior to the shorthorns, and are fast being supplanted by them. Even where they have been cultivated with the nicest care and brought to the greatest perfection, they are inferior to the others, and must ultimately be driven from the farm. Illustration, Alderney Cow. Illustration, Alderney Bull. 592. The Alderney. Among the dairy breeds of England, the Alderney takes a prominent place, not on account of the quantity of milk which it yields, but on account of the excellent quality of the cream and butter which are produced from it. Its docility is marvellous, and in appearance it greatly resembles the Ayrshire breed of Scotland, the excellence of which is supposed to be, in some degree, derived from a mixture of the Alderney blood with that breed. The distinction between them, however, lies both in the quantity and quality of the milk which they severally produce, that of the Alderney being rich in quality, and that of the Ayrshire abundant in quantity. The merit of the former, however, ends with its milk, for as a grazer it is worthless. Illustration, Galloway Bull. Illustration, Galloway Cow. 593, Scottish Breeds. Of these the Kylo, which belongs to the Highlands of Scotland. The Galloway, which has been called the Kylo without horns, and the Ayrshire, are the breeds most celebrated. The first has kept his place, and on account of the compactness of his form, and the excellent quality of his flesh, he is a great favorite with butchers who have a select family trade. 
it is alike unsuitable for the dairy and the arable farm. But in its native highlands it attains to great perfection, thriving upon the scanty and coarse herbage which it gathers on the sides of the mountains. The Galloway has a larger frame, and when fattened makes excellent beef. But it has given place to the short horns in its native district, where turnip husbandry is pursued with advantage. The Ayrshire is peculiarly adapted for the dairy, and for the abundance of its milk cannot be surpassed in its native district. In this it stands unrivaled, and there is no other breed capable of converting the produce of a poor soil into such fine butter and cheese. It is difficult to fatten, however, and its beef is of a coarse quality. We have chosen these as among the principal representative breeds of the ox species, but there are other breeds which, at all events, have a local if not a general celebrity. Illustration, side of beef, showing the several joints. 594. The general mode of slaughtering oxen in this country is by striking them a smart blow with a hammer or poleaxe on the head, a little above the eyes. By this means, when the blow is skillfully given, the beast is brought down at one blow, and, to prevent recovery, a cane is generally inserted, by which the spinal cord is perforated, which instantly deprives the ox of all sensation of pain. In Spain, and some other countries on the continent, it is also usual to deprive oxen of life by the operation of pithing or dividing the spinal cord in the neck, close to the back part of the head. This is, in effect, the same mode as is practiced in the celebrated Spanish bullfights by the matador, and it is instantaneous in depriving the animal of sensation, if the operator be skillful. We hope and believe that those men whose disagreeable duty it is to slaughter the beasts of the field to provide meat for mankind, inflict as little punishment and cause as little suffering as possible. 595. The manner in which a side of beef is cut up in London, is shown in the engraving on this page. In the metropolis, on account of the large number of its population possessing the means to indulge in the best of everything, the demand for the most delicate joints of meat is great, the price, at the same time, being much higher for these than for the other parts. The consequence is, that in London the carcass is there divided so as to obtain the greatest quantity of meat on the most esteemed joints. In many places, however, where, from a greater equality in the social condition and habits of the inhabitants, the demand and prices for the different parts of the carcasses are more equalized. There is not the same reason for the butcher to cut the best joints so large. 596. The meat on those parts of the animal in which the muscles are least called into action, is most tender and succulent, as, for instance, along the back, from the rump to the hinder part of the shoulder. Whilst the limbs, shoulder, and neck, are the toughest, driest, and least esteemed. 597. The names of the several joints in the hind and four quarters of a side of beef, and the purposes for which they are used, are as follows. Hind quarter. 1. Sirloin. The two sirloins, cut together in one joint, form a baron, this, when roasted, is the famous national dish of Englishmen, at entertainments, on occasion of rejoicing. 2. Rump, the finest part for steaks. 3. H bone, boiling piece. 4. Buttock, prime boiling piece. 5. Mouse round, boiling or stewing. 6. Hawk, stewing. 7. Thick flank, cut with the utter fat, primest boiling piece. 8. Thin flank, boiling. 4 quarter. 9. Five ribs, called the fore rib. This is considered the primest roasting piece. 10. Four ribs, called the middle rib, greatly esteemed by housekeepers as the most economical joint for roasting. 11. Two ribs, called the chuck rib, used for second quality of steaks. 12. Leg of mutton piece, the muscles of the shoulder dissected from the breast. 13. Brisket, or breast, used for boiling, after being salted. 14. Neck, clod, and sticking piece, used for soups, gravies, stocks, pies, and mincing for sausages. 15. Shin, stewing. The following is a classification of the qualities of meat, according to the several joints of beef, when cut up in the London manner. 
First class. Includes the sirloin, with the kidney suet, 1, the rump steak piece, 2, the four rib, 9. Second class. The buttock, 4, the thick flank, 7, the middle rib, 10. Third class. The H bone, 3, the mouse round, 5, the thin flank, 8, the chuck, 11, the leg of mutton piece, 12, the brisket, 13. Fourth class. The neck, clod, and sticking piece, 14. Fifth class. The hawk, 6, the shin, 15. Recipes. Chapter 13. Baked beef, cold meat cookery. I. Ingredients. About 2 pounds. Of cold roast beef, 2 small onions, 1 large carrot or 2 small ones, 1 turnip, a small bunch of savory herbs, salt and pepper to taste, 4 tablespoonfuls of gravy, 3 tablespoonfuls of ale, crust or mashed potatoes. Mode. Cut the beef in slices, allowing a small amount of fat to each slice, place a layer of this in the bottom of a pie dish, with a portion of the onions, carrots, and turnips, which must be sliced. Mince the herbs, strew them over the meat, and season with pepper and salt. Then put another layer of meat, vegetables, and seasoning, and proceed in this manner until all the ingredients are used. Pour in the gravy and ale, water may be substituted for the former, but it is not so nice, cover with a crust or mashed potatoes, and bake for half an hour, or rather longer. Time. Rather more than half an hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 6d. Sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable at any time. Note. It is as well to parboil the carrots and turnips before adding them to the meat, and to use some of the liquor in which they were boiled as a substitute for gravy. That is to say, when there is no gravy at hand. Be particular to cut the onions in very thin slices. 2. Ingredients. Slices of cold roast beef, salt and pepper to taste, 1 sliced onion, 1 teaspoonful of minced savory herbs, 5 or 6 tablespoonfuls of gravy or sauce of any kind, mashed potatoes. Mode. Butter the sides of a deep dish, and spread mashed potatoes over the bottom of it. On this place layers of beef in thin slices, this may be minced if there is not sufficient beef to cut into slices, well seasoned with pepper and salt, and a very little onion and herbs, which should be previously fried of a nice brown. Then put another layer of mashed potatoes, and beef, and other ingredients, as before, pour in the gravy or sauce, cover the whole with another layer of potatoes, and bake for half an hour. This may be served in the dish, or turned out. Time. Half an hour. Average cost, exclusive of the cold beef, 6d. Sufficient. A large pie dish full for five or six persons. Seasonable at any time. Beef. The quality of beef depends on various circumstances. Such as the age, the sex, the breed of the animal, and also on the food upon which it has been raised. Bull beef is, in general, dry and tough, and by no means possessed of an agreeable flavor. Whilst the flesh of the ox is not only highly nourishing and digestible, but, if not too old, extremely agreeable. The flesh of the cow is, also, nourishing, but it is not so agreeable as that of the ox, although that of a heifer is held in high estimation. The flesh of the smaller breeds is much sweeter than that of the larger, which is best when the animal is about seven years old. That of the smaller breeds is best at about five years, and that of the cow can hardly be eaten too young. Baked Beef Steak Pudding Ingredients 6 ounces of flour, 2 eggs, not quite 1 pint of milk, salt to taste, one and a half pounds, of rump steaks, 1 kidney, pepper and salt. Mode Cut the steaks into nice square pieces, with a small quantity of fat, and the kidney divide into small pieces. Make a batter of flour, eggs, and milk in the above proportion, lay a little of it at the bottom of a pie dish. Then put in the steaks and kidney, which should be well seasoned with pepper and salt, and pour over the remainder of the batter, 
and bake for one and a half hour in a brisk but not fierce oven. Time. One and a half hour. Average cost, twos. Sufficient for four or five persons. Seasonable at any time. Beef a la mode. Economical. Ingredients. About three pounds, of clawed or sticking of beef, two ounces. Of clarified dripping, one large onion, flour, two quarts of water, twelve berries of allspice, two bay leaves, one half teaspoonful of whole black pepper, salt to taste. Mode. Cut the beef into small pieces, and roll them in flour. Put the dripping into a stew pan with the onion, which should be sliced thin. Let it get quite hot, lay in the pieces of beef, and stir them well about. When nicely browned all over, add by degrees boiling water in the above proportion, and, as the water is added, keep the whole well stirred. Put in the spice, bay leaves, and seasoning, cover the stew pan closely, and set it by the side of the fire to stew very gently, till the meat becomes quite tender, which will be in about three hours, when it will be ready to serve. Remove the bay leaves before it is sent to table. Time. Three hours. Average cost, ones. 3D. Sufficient for six persons. Seasonable at any time. Beef a la mode. Ingredients. Six or seven pounds. Of the thick flank of beef, a few slices of fat bacon, one teacupful of vinegar, black pepper, allspice, two cloves well mixed and finely pounded, making altogether one heaped teaspoonful. Salt to taste, one bunch of savory herbs, including parsley, all finely minced and well mixed, three onions, two large carrots, one turnip, one head of celery, one and a half pint of water, one glass of port wine. Mode. Slice and fry the onions of a pale brown, and cut up the other vegetables in small pieces, and prepare the beef for stewing in the following manner. Choose a fine piece of beef, cut the bacon into long slices, about an inch in thickness. Dip them into vinegar, and then into a little of the above seasoning of spice, and mixed with the same quantity of minced herbs. With a sharp knife make holes deep enough to let in the bacon, then rub the beef over with the remainder of the seasoning and herbs, and bind it up in a nice shape with tape. Have ready a well-tinned stew pan, it should not be much larger than the piece of meat you are cooking, into which put the beef, with the vegetables, vinegar, and water. Let it simmer very gently for five hours, or rather longer, should the meat not be extremely tender, and turn it once or twice. When ready to serve, take out the beef, remove the tape, and put it on a hot dish. Skim off every particle of fat from the gravy, add the port wine, just let it boil, pour it over the beef, and it is ready to serve. Great care must be taken that this does not boil fast, or the meat will be tough and tasteless. It should only just bubble. When convenient, all kinds of stews, and should be cooked on a hot plate, as the process is so much more gradual than on an open fire. Time. Five hours, or rather more. Average cost, 7D. Per LB. Sufficient for 7 or 8 persons. Seasonable all the year, but more suitable for a winter dish. Good meat. The layer of meat when freshly killed, and the animal, when slaughtered, being in a state of perfect health, adheres firmly to the bones. Beef of the best quality is of a deep red color, and when the animal has approached maturity, and been well fed, the lean is intermixed with fat, giving it the mottled appearance which is so much esteemed. It is also full of juice, which resembles in color claret wine. The fat of the best beef is of a firm and waxy consistency, of a color resembling that of the finest grass butter. Bright in appearance, neither greasy nor friable to the touch, but moderately unctuous, in a medium degree between the last mentioned properties. Beef steaks and oyster sauce. Ingredients. Three dozen oysters, ingredients for oyster sauce, see no. For 92, 2 pounds, of rump steak, seasoning to taste of pepper and salt. Mode. Make the oyster sauce by recipe number 492, and when that is ready, put it by the side of the fire, but do not let it keep boiling. 
have the steaks cut of an equal thickness, broil them over a very clear fire, turning them often, that the gravy may not escape. In about eight minutes they will be done, then put them on a very hot dish. Smother with the oyster sauce, and the remainder send to table in a tureen. Serve quickly. Time. About 8 to 10 minutes, according to the thickness of the steak. Average cost, 1s. Per LB. Sufficient for 4 persons. Seasonable from September to April. Beef steak pie. Ingredients. 3 pounds, of rump steak, seasoning to taste of salt, cayenne, and black pepper, crust, water, the yolk of an egg. Mode. Have the steaks cut from a rump that has hung a few days, that they may be tender, and be particular that every portion is perfectly sweet. Cut the steaks into pieces about 3 inches long and 2 wide, allowing a small piece of fat to each piece of lean, and arrange the meat in layers in a pie dish. Between each layer sprinkle a seasoning of salt, pepper, and, when liked, a few grains of cayenne. Fill the dish sufficiently with meat to support the crust, and to give it a nice raised appearance when baked, and not to look flat and hollow. Pour in sufficient water to half fill the dish, and border it with paste, see pastry, brush it over with a little water, and put on the cover, slightly press down the edges with the thumb, and trim off close to the dish. Ornament the pie with leaves, or pieces of paste cut in any shape that fancy may direct, brush it over with the beaten yolk of an egg, make a hole in the top of the crust, and bake in a hot oven for about one and a half hour. Time. In a hot oven, one and a half hour. Average cost, for this size, 3.6 d. Sufficient for six or eight persons. Seasonable at any time. Note. Beefsteak pies may be flavored in various ways, with oysters and their liquor, mushrooms, minced onions, and k. For family pies, suet may be used instead of butter or lard for the crust, and clarified beef dripping answers very well where economy is an object. Pieces of underdone roast or boiled meat may in pies be used very advantageously. But always remove the bone from pie meat, unless it be chicken or game. We have directed that the meat shall be cut smaller than is usually the case. For on trial we have found it much more tender, more easily helped, and with more gravy, than when put into the dish in one or two large steaks. Illustration, Sherry Pudding Dish Beef Steak and Kidney Pudding Ingredients 2 pounds Of rump steak, 2 kidneys, seasoning to taste of salt and black pepper, suet crust made with milk, see pastry, in the proportion of 6 ounces of suet to each 1 pound, of flour. Mode. Procure some tender rump steak, that which has been hung a little time, and divide it into pieces about an inch square, and cut each kidney into eight pieces. Line the dish, of which we have given an engraving, with crust made with suet and flour in the above proportion, leaving a small piece of crust to overlap the edge. Then cover the bottom with a portion of the steak and a few pieces of kidney. Season with salt and pepper, some add a little flour to thicken the gravy, but it is not necessary, and then add another layer of steak, kidney, and seasoning. Proceed in this manner till the dish is full, when pour in sufficient water to come within two inches of the top of the basin. Moisten the edges of the crust, cover the pudding over, press the two crusts together, that the gravy may not escape, and turn up the overhanging paste. Wring out a cloth in hot water, flour it, and tie up the pudding. Put it into boiling water, and let it boil for at least four hours. If the water diminishes, always replenish with some, hot in a jug, as the pudding should be kept covered all the time, and not allowed to stop boiling. When the cloth is removed, cut out a round piece in the top of the crust, to prevent the pudding bursting, and send it to table in the basin, either in an ornamental dish, or with a napkin pinned round it. Serve quickly. Time. For a pudding with two pounds, of steak and two kidneys allow four hours. Average cost, twos. 8d. Sufficient for six persons. Seasonable all the year, but more suitable in winter. Note. Beefsteak pudding may be very much enriched by adding a few oysters or mushrooms. 
The above recipe was contributed to this work by a Sussex lady, in which county the inhabitants are noted for their savory puddings. It differs from the general way of making them, as the meat is cut up into very small pieces and the basin is differently shaped, on trial, this pudding will be found far nicer, and more full of gravy, than when laid in large pieces in the dish. Bad Meat In the flesh of animals slaughtered whilst suffering acute inflammation or fever, the hollow fibers, or capillaries, as they are called, which form the substance of the lear, are filled with congested and unassimilated animal fluid, which, from its impurity, gives the lear a dark color, and produces a tendency to rapid putrefaction. In a more advanced stage of such disease, serous, and sometimes purulent matter, is formed in the cellular tissues between the muscles of the flesh, and when such is the case, nothing can be more poisonous than such abominable carrion. In the flesh of animals killed whilst under the influence of any disease of an emaciating effect, the lear adheres but slightly to the bones, with its fibers contracted and dry. And the little fat that there may be is friable, and shrunk within its integuments. The flesh of animals slaughtered whilst under considerable depression of vital energy, as from previous bleeding, has a diminished tendency to stiffen after death, the feebleness of this tendency being in proportion to the degree of depression. It presents, also, an unnatural blue or pallid appearance, has a faint and slightly sour smell, and soon becomes putrid. When an animal has died otherwise than by slaughtering, its flesh is flaccid and clammy, emits a peculiar faint and disagreeable smell, and, it need scarcely be added, spontaneous decomposition proceeds very rapidly. Beef steaks with fried potatoes, or biftec aux pommes de terra, a la mode française. Ingredients 2 pounds of steak, 8 potatoes, a quarter pound of butter, salt and pepper to taste, 1 teaspoonful of minced herbs. Mode Put the butter into a frying or sauté pan, set it over the fire, and let it get very hot, peel, and cut the potatoes into long thin slices, put them into the hot butter, and fry them till of a nice brown color. Now broil the steaks over a bright clear fire, turning them frequently, that every part may be equally done, as they should not be thick, five minutes will broil them. Put the herbs and seasoning in the butter the potatoes were fried in, pour it under the steak, and place the fried potatoes round, as a garnish. To have this dish in perfection, a portion of the fillet of the sirloin should be used, as the meat is generally so much more tender than that of the rump, and the steaks should be cut about one-third of an inch in thickness. Time 5 minutes to broil the steaks, and about the same time to fry the potatoes. Average cost, 1s. Per LB. Sufficient for 4 persons. Seasonable all the year, but not so good in warm weather, as the meat cannot hang to get tender. Illustration, AITCH Bone of Beef. Boiled AITCH Bone of Beef. Ingredients. Beef, Water. Mode. After this joint has been in salt five or six days, it will be ready for use, and will not take so long boiling, as a round, for it is not so solid. Wash the meat, and, if too salt, soak it for a few hours, changing the water once or twice, till the required freshness is obtained. Put into a saucepan, or boiling pot, sufficient water to cover the meat. Set it over the fire, and when it boils, Plunge in the joint, see number 557, and let it boil up quickly. Now draw the pot to the side of the fire, and let the process be very gradual, as the water must only simmer, or the meat will be hard and tough. Carefully remove the scum from the surface of the water, and continue doing this for a few minutes after it first boils. Carrots and turnips are served with this dish, and sometimes suet dumplings, which may be boiled with the beef. Garnish with a few of the carrots and turnips, and serve the remainder in a vegetable dish. Time An H bone of 10 pounds, 2 and a half hours after the water boils, 1 of 20 pounds, 4 hours. Average cost, 6d. Per lb. Sufficient. 10 pounds. For 7 or 8 persons. Seasonable all the year, but best from September to March. Note. 
The liquor in which the meat has been boiled may be easily converted into a very excellent pea soup. It will require very few vegetables, as it will be impregnated with the flavor of those boiled with the meat. The action of salt on meat. The manner in which salt acts in preserving meat is not difficult to understand. By its strong affinity, it, in the first place, extracts the juices from the substance of meat in sufficient quantity to form a saturated solution with the water contained in the juice. And the meat then absorbs the saturated brine in place of the juice extracted by the salt. In this way, matter incapable of putrefaction takes the places of that portion in the meat which is most perishable. Such, however, is not the only office of salt as a means of preserving meat. It acts also by its astringency in contracting the fibers of the muscles, and so excludes the action of air on the interior of the substance of the meat. The last mentioned operation of salt as an antiseptic is evinced by the diminution of the volume of meat to which it is applied. The astringent action of saltpetry on meat is much greater than that of salt, and thereby renders meat to which it is applied very hard. But, in small quantities, it considerably assists the antiseptic action of salt, and also prevents the destruction of the florid color of meat, which is caused by the application of salt. Thus, it will be perceived, from the foregoing statement, that the application of salt and saltpetry diminishes, in a considerable degree, the nutritive, and, to some extent, the wholesome qualities of meat. And, therefore, in their use, the quantity applied should be as small as possible, consistent with the perfect preservation of the meat. Boiled round of beef. Ingredients. Beef, water. Mode. As a whole round of beef, generally speaking, is too large for small families, and very seldom required, we here give the recipe for dressing a portion of the silver side of the round. Take from 12 to 16 pounds. After it has been in salt about 10 days, just wash off the salt, skewer it up in a nice round looking form, and bind it with tape to keep the skewers in their places. Put it in a saucepan of boiling water, as in the preceding recipe, set it upon a good fire, and when it begins to boil, carefully remove all scum from the surface, as, if this is not attended to, it sinks on to the meat, and when brought to table, presents a very unsightly appearance. When it is well skimmed, draw the pot to the corner of the fire, and let it simmer very gently until done. Remove the tape and skewers, which should be replaced by a silver one, pour over a little of the pot liquor, and garnish with carrots. See Colored Plate 2. Carrots, turnips, parsnips, and sometimes suet dumplings, accompany this dish, and these may all be boiled with the beef. The pot liquor should be saved, and converted into pea soup. And the outside slices, which are generally hard, and of an uninviting appearance, may be out off before being sent to table, and potted. These make an excellent relish for the breakfast or luncheon table. Time. Part of a round of beef weighing 12 pounds, about 3 hours after the water boils. Average cost, 8d. Per lb. Sufficient for 10 persons. Seasonable all the year, but more suitable for winter. 609. Sawyer's recipe for preserving the gravy in salt meat, when it is to be served cold. Fill two tubs with cold water, into which throw a few pounds of rough ice, and when the meat is done, put it into one of the tubs of ice water. Let it remain one minute, when take out, and put it into the other tub. Fill the first tub again with water, and continue this process for about 20 minutes, then set it upon a dish, and let it remain until quite cold. When cut, the fat will be as white as possible, besides having saved the whole, of the gravy. If there is no ice, spring water will answer the same purpose, but will require to be more frequently changed. Note. The brisket and rump may be boiled by the above recipe, of course allowing more or less time, according to the size of the joint. Beef Cake. Ingredients. The remains of cold roast beef, to each pound of cold meat allow a quarter pound, of bacon or ham. Seasoning to taste of pepper and salt, one small bunch of minced savory herbs, one or two eggs. Mode. Mince the beef very finely, if underdone it will be better, add to it the bacon, 
which must also be chopped very small, and mix well together. Season, stir in the herbs, and bind with an egg, or two should one not be sufficient. Make it into small square cakes, about half an inch thick, fry them in hot dripping, and serve in a dish with good gravy poured round them. Time. 10 minutes. Average cost, exclusive of the cold meat, 6d. Seasonable at any time. Broiled beef steaks or rump steaks. Ingredients. Steaks, a piece of butter the size of a walnut, salt to taste, one tablespoonful of good mushroom ketchup or Harvey's sauce. Mode. As the success of a good broil so much depends on the state of the fire, see that it is bright and clear, and perfectly free from smoke, and do not add any fresh fuel just before you require to use the gridiron. Sprinkle a little salt over the fire, put on the gridiron for a few minutes, to get thoroughly hot through. Rub it with a piece of fresh, suet, to prevent the meat from sticking, and lay on the steaks, which should be cut of an equal thickness, about three quarters of an inch, or rather thinner. And level them by beating them as little as possible with a rolling pin. Turn them frequently with steak tongs, if these are not at hand, stick a fork in the edge of the fat, that no gravy escapes, and in from eight to ten minutes they will be done. Have ready a very hot dish, into which put the ketchup, and, when liked, a little minced shallot, dish up the steaks, rub them over with butter, and season with pepper and salt. The exact time for broiling steaks must be determined by taste, whether they are liked underdone or well done, more than from 8 to 10 minutes for a steak 3 quarters inch in thickness, we think, would spoil and dry up the juices of the meat. Great expedition is necessary in sending broiled steaks to table. And, to have them in perfection, they should not be cooked till everything else prepared for dinner has been dished up, as their excellence entirely depends on their being served very hot. Garnish with scraped horseradish, or slices of cucumber. Oyster, tomato, onion, and many other sauces, are frequent accompaniments to rump steak, but true lovers of this English dish generally reject all additions but pepper and salt. Time. 8 to 10 minutes. Average cost, 1s. Per LB. Sufficient. Allow half a pound, to each person, if the party consists entirely of gentlemen, three quarters pound will not be too much. Seasonable all the year, but not good in the height of summer, as the meat cannot hang long enough to be tender. Different seasons for beef. We have already stated, see number 593, that the Scots breed of oxen, like the South Down in mutton, stands first in excellence. It should be borne in mind, however, that each county has its particular season, and that the London and other large markets are always supplied by those counties whose meat, from local circumstances, is in the best condition at the time. Thus, the season in Norfolk, from which the Scots come, these being the principal oxen bred by the Norfolk and Suffolk graziers, commences about Christmas and terminates about June, when this breed begins to fall off. Their place being taken by grass-fed oxen. A large quantity of most excellent meat is sent to the dead markets from Scotland, and some of the best London butchers are supplied from this source. Broiled beef and mushroom sauce. Cold meat cookery. Ingredients. Two or three dozen small button mushrooms, one ounce of butter, salt and cayenne to taste, one tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup, mashed potatoes, slices of cold roast beef. Mode. Wipe the mushrooms free from grit with a piece of flannel, and salt. Put them in a stew pan with the butter, seasoning, and ketchup, stir over the fire until the mushrooms are quite done, when pour it in the middle of mashed potatoes, browned. Then place round the potatoes slices of cold roast beef, nicely broiled, over a clear fire. In making the mushroom sauce, the ketchup may be dispensed with, if there is sufficient gravy. Time. A quarter hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 8d. Seasonable from August to October. Broiled beef and oyster sauce, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. Two dozen oysters, three cloves, one blade of mace, two ounces. Of butter, one half teaspoonful of flour, 
cayenne and salt to taste, mashed potatoes, a few slices of cold roast beef. Mode. Put the oysters in a stew pan, with their liquor strained. Add the cloves, mace, butter, flour, and seasoning, and let them simmer gently for 5 minutes. Have ready in the center of a dish round walls of mashed potatoes, browned. Into the middle pour the oyster sauce, quite hot, and round the potatoes place, in layers, slices of the beef, which should be previously broiled over a nice clear fire. Time. 5 minutes. Average cost, 1s, 6d, exclusive of the cold meat. Sufficient for 4 or 5 persons. Seasonable from September to April. Broiled beef bones. Ingredients. The bones of ribs or sirloin, salt, pepper, and cayenne. Mode. Separate the bones, taking care that the meat on them is not too thick in any part, sprinkle them well with the above seasoning, and broil over a very clear fire. When nicely browned they are done, but do not allow them to blacken. To dress a bullock's heart. Ingredients. One heart, stuffing of veal forcemeat, number 417. Mode. Put the heart into warm water to soak for two hours. Then wipe it well with a cloth, and, after cutting off the lobes, stuff the inside with a highly seasoned forcemeat, number 417. Fasten it in, by means of a needle and coarse thread. Tie the heart up in paper, and set it before a good fire, being very particular to keep it well basted, or it will eat dry, there being very little of its own fat. Two or three minutes before serving, remove the paper, baste well, and serve with good gravy in red currant jelly or melted butter. If the heart is very large, it will require two hours, and, covered with a caul, may be baked as well as roasted. Time. Large heart, two hours. Average cost, twos. 6D. Sufficient for six or eight persons. Seasonable all the year. Note. This is an excellent family dish, is very savory, and, though not seen at many good tables, may be recommended for its cheapness and economy. Bubble and Squeak, Cold Meat Cookery. Ingredients. A few thin slices of cold boiled beef. Butter, cabbage, one sliced onion, pepper and salt to taste. Mode. Fry the slices of beef gently in a little butter taking care not to dry them up. Lay them on a flat dish, and cover with fried greens. The greens may be prepared from cabbage sprouts or green savoys. They should be boiled till tender, well drained, minced, and placed, till quite hot, in a frying pan, with butter, a sliced onion, and seasoning of pepper and salt. When the onion is done, it is ready to serve. Time. Altogether, half an hour. Average cost, exclusive of the cold beef, 3D. Seasonable at any time. Illustration, collared beef. Collared beef. Ingredients. 7 pounds. Of the thin end of the flank of beef, 2 ounces of coarse sugar, 6 ounces of salt, 1 ounce, of salt petri, 1 large handful of parsley minced, 1 dessert spoonful of minced sage, a bunch of savory herbs, one half teaspoonful of pounded allspice. Salt and pepper to taste. Mode. Choose fine tender beef, but not too fat, lay it in a dish, rub in the sugar, salt and salt petri, and let it remain in the pickle for a week or ten days, turning and rubbing it every day. Then bone it, remove all the gristle and the coarse skin of the inside part, and sprinkle it thickly with parsley, herbs, spice, and seasoning in the above proportion taking care that the former are finely minced, and the latter well pounded. Roll the meat up in a cloth as tightly as possible, in the same shape as shown in the engraving, bind it firmly with broad tape, and boil it gently for six hours. Immediately on taking it out of the pot, put it under a good weight, without undoing it, and let it remain until cold. This dish is a very nice addition to the breakfast table. Time. Six hours. Average cost, for this quantity, fours. Seasonable at any time. Note. During the time the beef is in pickle, 
it should be kept cool, and regularly rubbed and turned every day. Beef Collops Ingredients 2 pounds, of rump steak, a quarter pound. Of butter, 1 pint of gravy, water may be substituted for this, salt and pepper to taste, 1 shallot finely minced, 1 half pickled walnut, 1 teaspoonful of capers. Mode Have the steak cut thin, and divide it in pieces about 3 inches long. Beat these with the blade of a knife, and dredge with flour. Put them in a frying pan with the butter, and let them fry for about 3 minutes, then lay them in a small stew pan, and pour over them the gravy. Add a piece of butter, kneaded with a little flour, put in the seasoning and all the other ingredients, and let the whole simmer, but not boil, for 10 minutes. Serve in a hot covered dish. Time. 10 minutes. Average cost, 1s. Per LB. Sufficient for 4 or 5 persons. Seasonable at any time. Minced collops, an entree. Ingredients. 1 pound, of rump steak, salt and pepper to taste, 2 ounces. Of butter, 1 onion minced, 1 quarter pint of water, 1 tablespoonful of Harvey's sauce, or lemon juice, or mushroom ketchup, 1 small bunch of savory herbs. Mode. Mince the beef and onion very small, and fry the latter in butter until of a pale brown. Put all the ingredients together in a stew pan, and boil gently for about 10 minutes, garnish with sip pets of toasted bread, and serve very hot. Time. 10 minutes. Average cost, 1s. Per LB. Sufficient for 2 or 3 persons. Seasonable at any time. Curried beef, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. A few slices of tolerably lean cold roast or boiled beef, 3 ounces of butter, 2 onions, 1 wine glassful of beer, 1 dessert spoonful of curry powder. Mode. Cut up the beef into pieces about 1 inch square, put the butter into a stew pan with the onions sliced, and fry them of a lightly brown color. Add all the other ingredients, and stir gently over a brisk fire for about 10 minutes. Should this be thought too dry, more beer, or a spoonful or two of gravy or water, may be added, but a good curry should not be very thin. Place it in a deep dish, with an edging of dry boiled rice, in the same manner as for other curries. Time. 10 minutes. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 4D. Seasonable in winter. To clarify beef dripping. I. 621. Good and fresh dripping answers very well for basting everything except game and poultry, and, when well clarified, serves for frying nearly as well as lard, it should be kept in a cool place, and will remain good some time. To clarify it, put the dripping into a basin, pour over it boiling water, and keep stirring the whole to wash away the impurities. Let it stand to cool, when the water and dirty sediment will settle at the bottom of the basin. Remove the dripping, and put it away in jars or basins for use. Another way. 622. Put the dripping into a clean saucepan, and let it boil for a few minutes over a slow fire, and be careful to skim it well. Let it stand to cool a little, then strain it through a piece of muslin into jars for use. Beef dripping is preferable to any other for cooking purposes, as, with mutton dripping, there is liable to be a tallowy taste and smell. Roast Filet of Beef, Larded Ingredients About 4 pounds, of the inside filet of the sirloin, 1 onion, a small bunch of parsley, salt and pepper to taste, sufficient vinegar to cover the meat, glaze, Spanish sauce, number 411. Mode Lard the beef with bacon, and put it into a pan with sufficient vinegar to cover it, with an onion sliced, parsley, and seasoning, and let it remain in this pickle for 12 hours. Roast it before a nice clear fire for about 1 to a quarter hour, and, when done, glaze it. Pour some Spanish sauce round the beef, and the remainder serve in a tureen. It may be garnished with Spanish onions boiled and glazed. Time. One and a half hour. Average cost, exclusive of the sauce, fours. Sufficient for six or eight persons. 
Seasonable at any time. Fricando of beef. Ingredients. About 3 pounds. Of the inside fillet of the sirloin, a piece of the rump may be substituted for this, pepper and salt to taste, 3 cloves, 2 blades of mace, 6 whole allspice, 1 pint of stock no. 105, or water, 1 glass of sherry, 1 bunch of savory herbs, 2 shallots, bacon. Mode. Cut some bacon into thin strips, and sprinkle over them a seasoning of pepper and salt, mixed with cloves, mace, and allspice, well pounded. Lard the beef with these, put it into a stew pan with the stock or water, sherry, herbs, shallots, two cloves, and more pepper and salt. Stew the meat gently until tender, when take it out, cover it closely, skim off all the fat from the gravy, and strain it. Set it on the fire, and boil, till it becomes a glaze. Glaze the larded side of the beef with this, and serve on sorrel sauce, which is made as follows, wash and pick some sorrel, and put it into a stew pan with only the water that hangs about it. Keep stirring, to prevent its burning, and when done, lay it in a sieve to drain. Chop it, and stew it with a small piece of butter and four or six tablespoonfuls of good gravy, for an hour, and rub it through a tammy. If too acid, add a little sugar. And a little cabbage lettuce boiled with the sorrel will be found an improvement. Time. Two hours to gently stew the meat. Average cost, for this quantity, fours. Sufficient for six persons. Seasonable at any time. Fried salt beef, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. A few slices of cold salt beef, pepper to taste, a quarter pound, of butter, mashed potatoes. Mode. Cut any part of cold salt beef into thin slices, fry them gently in butter, and season with a little pepper. Have ready some very hot mashed potatoes, lay the slices of beef on them, and garnish with three or four pickled gherkins. Cold salt beef, warmed in a little liquor from mixed pickle, drained, and served as above, will be found good. Time. About five minutes. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 4D. Seasonable at any time. Fried rump steak. Ingredients. Steaks, butter or clarified dripping. Mode. Although broiling is a far superior method of cooking steaks to frying them, yet, when the cook is not very expert, the latter mode may be adopted. And, when properly done, the dish may really look very inviting, and the flavor be good. The steaks should be cut rather thinner than for broiling, and with a small quantity of fat to each. Put some butter or clarified dripping into a frying pan. Let it get quite hot, then lay in the steaks. Turn them frequently until done, which will be in about 8 minutes, or rather more, should the steaks be very thick. Serve on a very hot dish, in which put a small piece of butter and a tablespoonful of ketchup, and season with pepper and salt. They should be sent to table quickly, as, when cold, the steaks are entirely spoiled. Time. 8 minutes for a medium-sized steak, rather longer for a very thick one. Average cost, 1s. Per LB. Seasonable all the year, but not good in summer, as the meat cannot hang to get tender. Note. Where much gravy is liked, make it in the following manner. As soon as the steaks are done, dish them, pour a little boiling water into the frying pan, add a seasoning of pepper and salt, a small piece of butter, and a tablespoonful of Harvey's sauce or mushroom ketchup. Hold the pan over the fire for a minute or two, just let the gravy simmer, then pour on the steak, and serve. A Frenchman's Opinion of Beef The following is translated from a celebrated modern French work, the production of one who in Paris enjoys a great reputation as cook and chemist, the flesh of the ox, to be in the best condition. Should be taken from an animal of from four to six years old, and neither too fat nor too lean. This meat, which possesses in the highest degree the most nutritive qualities, is generally easily digested, stock is made from it, and it is eaten boiled, broiled, roasted, stewed, braised, and in a hundred other different ways. Beef is the foundation of stock, gravies, braises, and 
its nutritious and succulent gravy gives body and flavor to numberless ragouts. It is an exhaustless mine in the hands of a skillful artist, and is truly the king of the kitchen. Without it, no soup, no gravy, and its absence would produce almost a famine in the civilized world. Beef fritters, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of cold roast beef, pepper and salt to taste, three quarters pound. Of flour, one half pint of water, two ounces of butter, the whites of two eggs. Mode. Mix very smoothly, and by degrees, the flour with the above proportion of water, stir in two ounces. Of butter, which must be melted, but not oiled, and, just before it is to be used, add the whites of two well-whisked eggs. Should the batter be too thick, more water must be added. Pare down the cold beef into thin shreds, season with pepper and salt, and mix it with the batter. Drop a small quantity at a time into a pan of boiling lard, and fry from 7 to 10 minutes, according to the size. When done on one side, turn and brown them on the other. Let them dry for a minute or two before the fire, and serve on a folded napkin. A small quantity of finely minced onions, mixed with the batter, is an improvement. Time. From 7 to 10 minutes. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 6D. Seasonable at any time. Hashed beef, cold meat cookery. I. Ingredients. Gravy saved from the meat, 1 teaspoonful of tomato sauce, 1 teaspoonful of Harvey's sauce, 1 teaspoonful of good mushroom ketchup, 1 half glass of port wine or strong ale, pepper and salt to taste, a little flour to thicken, 1 onion finely minced. A few slices of cold roast beef. Mode. Put all the ingredients but the beef into a stewpan with whatever gravy may have been saved from the meat the day it was roasted, let these simmer gently for 10 minutes, then take the stewpan off the fire. Let the gravy cool, and skim off the fat. Cut the beef into thin slices, dredge them with flour, and lay them in the gravy, let the whole simmer gently for 5 minutes, but not boil, or the meat will be tough and hard. Serve very hot, and garnish with sippets of toasted bread. Time. 20 minutes. Average cost, exclusive of the cold meat, 4D. Seasonable at any time. 2. Ingredients. The remains of ribs or sirloin of beef, 2 onions, 1 carrot, 1 bunch of savory herbs, pepper and salt to taste, 1 half blade of pounded mace, thickening of flour, rather more than 1 pint of water. Mode. Take off all the meat from the bones of ribs or sirloin of beef, remove the outside brown and gristle. Place the meat on one side, and well stew the bones and pieces, with the above ingredients, for about two hours, till it becomes a strong gravy, and is reduced to rather more than one half pint. Strain this, thicken with a teaspoonful of flour, and let the gravy cool, skim off all the fat, lay in the meat, let it get hot through, but do not allow it to boil, and garnish with sippets of toasted bread. The gravy may be flavored as in the preceding recipe. Time. Rather more than 2 hours. Average cost, exclusive of the cold meat, 2D. Seasonable at any time. Note. Either of the above recipes may be served in walls of mashed potatoes browned. In which case the sip pets should be omitted. Be careful that hashed meat does not boil, or it will become tough. To prepare hung beef. 630. This is preserved by salting and drying, either with or without smoke. Hang up the beef three or four days, till it becomes tender, but take care it does not begin to spoil, then salt it in the usual way, either by dry salting or by brine, with bay salt, brown sugar, salt petri, and a little pepper and allspice. Afterwards roll it tight in a cloth, and hang it up in a warm, but not hot place, for a fortnight or more, till it is sufficiently hard. If required to have a little of the smoky flavor, it may be hung for some time in a chimney corner, or smoked in any other way, it will keep a long time. Hunter's Beef Ingredients For a round of beef weighing 25 pounds, allow 3 ounces. Of salt petri, 3 ounces of coarse sugar, 
one ounce of cloves, one grated nutmeg, half a ounce of allspice, one pound of salt, half a pound bay salt. Mode. Let the beef hang for two or three days, and remove the bone. Pound spices, salt, and k. In the above proportion, and let them be reduced to the finest powder. Put the beef into a pan, rub all the ingredients well into it, and turn and rub it every day for rather more than a fortnight. When it has been sufficiently long in pickle, wash the meat, bind it up securely with tape, and put it into a pan with one half pint of water at the bottom. Mince some suet, cover the top of the meat with it, and over the pan put a common crust of flour and water, bake for six hours, and, when cold, remove the paste. Save the gravy that flows from it, as it adds greatly to the flavor of hashes, stews, and k. The beef may be glazed and garnished with meat jelly. Time. 6 hours. Seasonable all the year. Note. In salting or pickling beef or pork for family consumption, it not being generally required to be kept for a great length of time, a less quantity of salt and a larger quantity of other matters more adapted to retain mellowness in meat may be employed, which could not be adopted by the curer of the immense quantities of meat required to be preserved for victualling the shipping of this maritime country. Sugar, which is well known to possess the preserving principle in a very great degree, without the pungency and astringency of salt, may be, and is, very generally used in the preserving of meat for family consumption. Although it acts without corrugating or contracting the fibers of meat, as is the case in the action of salt, and, therefore, does not impair its mellowness, yet its use in sufficient quantities for preservative effect. Without the addition of other antiseptics, would impart a flavor not agreeable to the taste of many persons. It may be used, however, together with salt, with the greatest advantage in imparting mildness and mellowness to cured meat, in a proportion of about one part by weight to four of the mixture. And, perhaps, now that sugar is so much lower in price than it was in former years, one of the obstructions to its more frequent use is removed. To dress beef kidney. I. Ingredients. One kidney, clarified butter, pepper and salt to taste, a small quantity of highly seasoned gravy, one tablespoonful of lemon juice, one quarter teaspoonful of powdered sugar. Mode. Cut the kidneys into neat slices, put them into warm water to soak for two hours, and change the water two or three times. Then put them on a clean cloth to dry the water from them, and lay them in a frying pan with some clarified butter, and fry them of a nice brown, season each side with pepper and salt, put them round the dish, and the gravy in the middle. Before pouring the gravy in the dish, add the lemon juice and sugar. Time. From 5 to 10 minutes. Average cost, 9D. Each. Seasonable at any time. 2. Ingredients. 1 kidney, 1 dessert spoonful of minced parsley, 1 teaspoonful of minced shallot, salt and pepper to taste, 1 quarter pint of gravy, number 438, 3 tablespoonfuls of sherry. Mode. Take off a little of the kidney fat, mince it very fine, and put it in a frying pan, slice the kidney, sprinkle over it parsley and shallots in the above proportion, add a seasoning of pepper and salt, and fry it of a nice brown. When it is done enough, dredge over a little flour, and pour in the gravy and sherry. Let it just simmer, but not boil any more, or the kidney would harden, serve very hot, and garnish with croutons. Where the flavor of the shallot is disliked, it may be omitted, and a small quantity of savory herbs substituted for it. Time. From 5 to 10 minutes, according to the thickness of the slices. Average cost, 9d. Each. Sufficient for 3 persons. Seasonable at any time. 3. A more simple method. 634. Cut the kidney into thin slices, flour them, and fry of a nice brown. When done, make a gravy in the pan by pouring away the fat, putting in a small piece of butter, one quarter pint of boiling water, pepper and salt, and a tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup. Let the gravy just boil up, pour over the kidney, and serve. Boiled marrow bones. Ingredients. 
Bones, a small piece of common paste, a floured cloth. Mode. Have the bones neatly sawed into convenient sizes, and cover the ends with a small piece of common crust, made with flour and water. Over this tie a floured cloth, and place them upright in a saucepan of boiling water, taking care there is sufficient to cover the bones. Boil them for two hours, remove the cloth and paste, and serve them upright on a napkin with dry toast. Many persons clear the marrow from the bones after they are cooked, spread it over a slice of toast and add a seasoning of pepper, when served in this manner, it must be very expeditiously sent to table, as it so soon gets cold. Time. 2 hours. Seasonable at any time. Note. Marrow bones may be baked after preparing them as in the preceding recipe, they should be laid in a deep dish, and baked for 2 hours. Illustration, Marrow Bones Marrow Bones Bones are formed of a dense cellular tissue of membranous matter, made stiff and rigid by insoluble earthy salts, of which, phosphate of lime is the most abundant. In a large bone, the insoluble matter is generally deposited in such a manner as to leave a cavity, into which a fatty substance, distinguished by the name of marrow, is thrown. Hollow cylindrical bones possess the qualities of strength and lightness in a remarkable degree. If bones were entirely solid, they would be unnecessarily heavy. And if their materials were brought into smaller compass, they would be weaker, because the strength of a bone is in proportion to the distance at which its fibers are from the center. Some animals, it must, however, be observed, have no cavities in the center of their bones, such as the whale tribe, skate, and turtles. Minced Beef, Cold Meat Cookery Ingredients 1 ounce of butter, 1 small onion, 2 tablespoonfuls of gravy left from the meat, 1 tablespoonful of strong ale, 1 half a teaspoonful of flour, salt and pepper to taste, a few slices of lean roast beef. Mode Put into a stewpan the butter with an onion chopped fine, add the gravy, ale, and 1 half a teaspoonful of flour to thicken, Season with pepper and salt, and stir these ingredients over the fire until the onion is a rich brown. Cut, but do not chop the meat very fine, add it to the gravy, stir till quite hot, and serve. Garnish with sip pets of toasted bread. Be careful in not allowing the gravy to boil after the meat is added, as it would render it hard and tough. Time. About half an hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat. 3d. Seasonable at any time. Myraton of beef. Ingredients. A few slices of cold roast beef, 3 ounces of butter, salt and pepper to taste, 3 onions, 1 half pint of gravy. Mode. Slice the onions and put them into a frying pan with the cold beef and butter, place it over the fire, and keep turning and stirring the ingredients to prevent them burning. When of a pale brown, add the gravy in seasoning. Let it simmer for a few minutes, and serve very hot. This dish is excellent and economical. Time. 5 minutes. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 6d. Seasonable at any time. Stewed ox cheek. Ingredients. 1 cheek, salt and water, 4 or 5 onions, butter and flour, 6 cloves, 3 turnips, 2 carrots, 1 bay leaf, 1 head of celery, 1 bunch of savory herbs, cayenne, black pepper, and salt to taste, 1 ounce of butter, 2 dessertspoonfuls of flour, 2 tablespoonfuls of chili vinegar, 2 tablespoonfuls of mushroom ketchup, 2 tablespoonfuls of port wine, 2 tablespoonfuls of Harvey's sauce. Mode. Have the cheek boned, and prepare it the day before it is to be eaten, by cleaning and putting it to soak all night in salt and water. The next day, wipe it dry and clean, and put it into a stew pan. Just cover it with water, skim well when it boils, and let it gently simmer till the meat is quite tender. Slice and fry three onions in a little butter and flour, and put them into the gravy. Add two whole onions, each stuck with three cloves, three turnips quartered, two carrots sliced, a bay leaf, one head of celery, a bunch of herbs, and seasoning to taste of cayenne, black pepper, and salt. 
Let these stew till perfectly tender. Then take out the cheek, divide into pieces fit to help at table, skim and strain the gravy, and thicken one and a half pint of it with butter and flour in the above proportions. Add the vinegar, ketchup, and port wine, put in the pieces of cheek. Let the whole boil up, and serve quite hot. Send it to table in a ragu dish. If the color of the gravy should not be very good, add a tablespoonful of the browning, number 108. Time. 4 hours. Average cost, 3d. Per lb. Sufficient for 8 persons. Seasonable at any time. Fried ox feet, or cow heel. Ingredients. Ox feet, the yolk of one egg, bread crumbs, parsley, salt and cayenne to taste, boiling butter. Mode. Wash, scald, and thoroughly clean the feet, and cut them into pieces about two inches long, have ready some fine bread crumbs mixed with a little minced parsley, cayenne, and salt. Dip the pieces of heel into the yolk of egg, sprinkle them with the bread crumbs, and fry them until of a nice brown in boiling butter. Time. Minus 1 hour. Average cost, 6d. Each. Seasonable at any time. Note. Ox feet may be dressed in various ways, stowed in gravy or plainly boiled and served with melted butter. When plainly boiled, the liquor will answer for making sweet or relishing jellies, and also to give richness to soups or gravies. Stewed ox tails. Ingredients. 2 ox tails, 1 onion, 3 cloves, 1 blade of mace, 1 teaspoonful of whole black pepper, 1 teaspoonful of allspice, 1 half a teaspoonful of salt, a small bunch of savory herbs, thickening of butter and flour, 1 tablespoonful of lemon juice. 1 tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup. Mode. Divide the tails at the joints, wash, and put them into a stew pan with sufficient water to cover them, and set them on the fire. When the water boils, remove the scum, and add the onion cut into rings, the spice, seasoning, and herbs. Cover the stew pan closely, and let the tails simmer very gently until tender, which will be in about two and a half hours. Take them out, make a thickening of butter and flour, add it to the gravy, and let it boil for a quarter hour. Strain it through a sieve into a saucepan, put back the tails, add the lemon juice and ketchup, let the whole just boil up, and serve. Garnish with croutons or sippets of toasted bread. Time. Two and a half hours to stew the tails. Average cost, 9d. To ones. 6d, according to the season. Sufficient for eight persons. Seasonable all the year. The tails of animals. In the class Mammalia, the vertebral column or backbone presents only slight modifications, and everywhere shows the same characteristics as in man, who stands at the head of this division of the animal kingdom. The length of this column, however, varies much, and the number of vertebrae of which it is composed is far from being uniform. These numerical differences principally depend on the unequal development of the caudal portion, or tail end, of the column. Thus, the tail-forming vertebrae sometimes do not exist at all, amongst certain bats for example. In other instances we reckon 40, 50, and even upwards of 60 of these bones. Among the greater number of mammals, the tail is of little use for locomotion, except that it acts in many cases as does the rudder of a ship, steadying the animal in his rapid movements and enabling him to turn more easily and quickly. Among some animals, it becomes a very powerful instrument of progression. Thus, in the kangaroos and jerboas, the tail forms, with the hind feet, a kind of tripod from which the animal makes its spring. With most of the American monkeys it is prehensile, and serves the animal as a fifth hand to suspend itself from the branches of trees, and, lastly, among the whales, it grows to an enormous size, and becomes the principal instrument for swimming. A pickle for tongues or beef, new market recipe. Ingredients. One gallon of soft water, three pounds, of coarse salt, six ounces of coarse brown sugar, half a ounce of salt petri. Mode. Put all the ingredients into a saucepan, and let them boil for half an hour, clear off the scum as it rises, 
and when done pour the pickle into a pickling pan. Let it get cold, then put in the meat and allow it to remain in the pickle from 8 to 14 days, according to the size. It will keep good for 6 months if well boiled once a fortnight. Tongues will take 1 month or 6 weeks to be properly cured. And, in salting meat, beef and tongues should always be put in separate vessels. Time A moderate sized tongue should remain in the pickle about a month, and be turned every day. Illustration Potting JR Potted beef I Ingredients 2 pounds of lean beef, 1 tablespoonful of water, a quarter pound of butter, a seasoning to taste of salt, cayenne, pounded mace, and black pepper. Mode Procure a nice piece of lean beef, as free as possible from gristle, skin, and k. And put it into a jar, if at hand, one with a lid, with one tablespoonful of water. Cover it closely, and put the jar into a saucepan of boiling water, letting the water come within two inches of the top of the jar. Boil gently for three and a half hours, then take the beef, chop it very small with a chopping knife, and pound it thoroughly in a mortar. Mix with it by degrees all, or a portion, of the gravy that will have run from it, and a little clarified butter. Add the seasoning, put it in small pots for use, and cover with a little butter just warmed and poured over. If much gravy is added to it, it will keep but a short time. On the contrary, if a large proportion of butter is used, it may be preserved for some time. Time. Three and a half hours. Average cost, for this quantity, ones. 8d. Seasonable at any time. Potted beef, cold meat cookery. 2. Ingredients. The remains of cold roast or boiled beef, a quarter pound, of butter, cayenne to taste, two blades of pounded mace. Mode. As we have stated in recipe no. 608, the outside slices of boiled beef may, with a little trouble, be converted into a very nice addition to the breakfast table. Cut up the meat into small pieces and pound it well, with a little butter, in a mortar. Add a seasoning of cayenne and mace, and be very particular that the latter ingredient is reduced to the finest powder. When all the ingredients are thoroughly mixed, put it into glass or earthen potting pots, and pour on the top a coating of clarified butter. Seasonable at any time. Note. If cold roast beef is used, remove all pieces of gristle and dry outside pieces, as these do not pound well. Preserved meats. When an organic substance, like the flesh of animals, is heated to the boiling point, it loses the property of passing into a state of fermentation and decay. Fresh animal milk, as is well known, coagulates, after having been kept for two or three days, into a gelatinous mass, but it may be preserved for an indefinite period, as a perfectly sweet liquid, if it be heated daily to the boiling point. The knowledge of this effect of an elevated temperature has given rise to a most important branch of industry, namely, the preparation of preserved meats for the use of the Navy and Merchant Service. At Leith, in the neighborhood of Edinburgh, at Aberdeen, at Bordeaux, at Marseilles, and in many parts of Germany, establishments of enormous magnitude exist, in which soup, vegetables, and viands of every description are prepared. In such a manner that they retain their freshness for years. The prepared elements are enclosed in canisters of tin iron plate, the covers are soldered airtight, and the canisters exposed to the temperature of boiling water for three or four hours. The elements thus acquire a stability, which one may almost say is eternal, and when a canister is opened, after the lapse of several years, its contents are found to be unaltered in taste, color, and smell. We are indebted to the French philosopher Gay-Lussac for this beautiful practical application of the discovery that boiling checks fermentation. An exclusive salt meat diet is extremely injurious to the health. And, in former times, thousands of mariners lost their lives for the want of fresh aliments during long voyages. We are sorry to say that the preserved meats are sometimes carelessly prepared, and, though the statement seems incredible, sometimes adulterated. Dar. Lancaster, who has done so much to expose the frauds of trade, 
that he ought to be regarded as a public benefactor, says that he has seen things which were utterly unfit for food, shipped as preserved meats. Surely, as he observes, there ought to be some superintendent to examine the so-called articles of food that are taken on board ship. So that the poor men who have been fighting our battles abroad may run no risk of being starved or poisoned on their way home. Rib of beef bones. A pretty dish. Ingredients. Rib of beef bones, one onion chopped fine, a few slices of carrot and turnip, one quarter pint of gravy. Mode. The bones for this dish should have left on them a slight covering of meat. Saw them into pieces three inches long, season them with pepper and salt, and put them into a stew pan with the remaining ingredients. Stew gently, until the vegetables are tender, and serve on a flat dish within walls of mashed potatoes. Time. Three quarters hour. Average cost, exclusive of the bones, 2d. Seasonable at any time. Beef rissoles, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of cold roast beef, to each pound of meat allow three quarters pound. Of bread crumbs, salt and pepper to taste, a few chopped savory herbs, one half a teaspoonful of minced lemon peel, one or two eggs, according to the quantity of meat. Mode. Mince the beef very fine, which should be rather lean, and mix with this bread crumbs, herbs, seasoning, and lemon peel, in the above proportion, to each pound of meat. Make all into a thick paste with one or two eggs. Divide into balls or cones, and fry a rich brown. Garnish the dish with fried parsley, and send with them to table some good brown gravy in a tureen. Instead of garnishing with fried parsley, gravy may be poured in the dish, round the rissoles, in this case, it will not be necessary to send any in a tureen. Time. From 5 to 10 minutes, according to size. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 5d. Seasonable at any time. Rolled beef, to eat like hair. Ingredients. About 5 pounds, of the inside of the sirloin, 2 glasses of port wine, 2 glasses of vinegar, a small quantity of forcemeat, number 417, 1 teaspoonful of pounded allspice. Mode. Take the inside of a large sirloin, soak it in 1 glass of port wine and 1 glass of vinegar, mixed, and let it remain for 2 days. Make a forcemeat by recipe number 417, lay it on the meat, and bind it up securely. Roast it before a nice clear fire, and baste it with one glass each of port wine and vinegar, with which mix a teaspoonful of pounded allspice. Serve, with a good gravy in the dish, and send red currant jelly to table with it. Time. A piece of five pounds, about one and a half hour before a brisk fire. Average cost, for this quantity, fives. 4d. Sufficient for four persons. Seasonable at any time. Beef rolls, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of cold roast or boiled beef, seasoning to taste of salt, pepper, and minced herbs, puff paste. Mode. Mince the beef tolerably fine with a small amount of its own fat, add a seasoning of pepper, salt, and chopped herbs. Put the whole into a roll of puff paste, and bake for half an hour, or rather longer, should the roll be very large. Beef patties may be made of cold meat, by mincing and seasoning beef as directed above, and baking in a rich puff paste in patty tins. Time, half an hour. Seasonable at any time. Miniature round of beef. An excellent dish for a small family. Ingredients. From 5 to 10 pounds, of rib of beef, sufficient brine to cover the meat. Mode. Choose a fine rib, have the bone removed, rub some salt over the inside, and skewer the meat up into a nice round form, and bind it with tape. Put it into sufficient brine to cover it, the brine should be made by recipe no. 654, and let it remain for 6 days, turning the meat every day. When required to be dressed, drain from the pickle, and put the meat into very hot water. Let it boil rapidly for a few minutes, when draw the pot to the side of the fire, and let it simmer very gently until done. Remove the skewer, 
and replace it by a plated or silver one. Carrots and turnips should be served with this dish, and may be boiled with the meat. Time A small round of 8 pounds, about 2 hours after the water boils, one of 12 pounds, about 3 hours. Average cost, 9d. Per lb. Sufficient for 6 persons. Seasonable at any time. Note. Should the joint be very small, 4 or 5 days will be sufficient time to salt it. Brisket of beef, a la flamanda. Ingredients. About 6 or 8 pounds. Of the brisket of beef, 4 or 5 slices of bacon, 2 carrots, 1 onion, a bunch of savory herbs, salt and pepper to taste, 4 cloves, 4 whole allspice, 2 blades of mace. Mode. Choose that portion of the brisket which contains the gristle, trim it, and put it into a stew pan with the slices of bacon, which should be put under and over the meat. Add the vegetables, herbs, spices, and seasoning, and cover with a little weak stock or water, close the stew pan as hermetically as possible, and simmer very gently for 4 hours. Strain the liquor, reserve a portion of it for sauce, and the remainder boil quickly over a sharp fire until reduced to a glaze, with which glaze the meat. Garnish the dish with scooped carrots and turnips, and when liked, a little cabbage. All of which must be cooked separately. Thicken and flavor the liquor that was saved for sauce, pour it round the meat, and serve. The beef may also be garnished with glazed onions, artichoke bottoms, and k. Time. 4 hours. Average cost, 7d. Per lb. Sufficient for 6 or 8 persons. Seasonable at any time. French beef. It has been all but universally admitted, that the beef of France is greatly inferior in quality to that of England, owing to inferiority of pasturage. M. Kermer, however, one of the latest writers on the culinary art, tells us that this is a vulgar error, and that French beef is far superior to that of England. This is mere vaunting on the part of our neighbors, who seem to want La Gloire in everything, and we should not deign to notice it, if it had occurred in a work of small pretensions, but M. Kermer's book professes to be a complete exposition of the scientific principles of cookery, and holds a high rank in the didactic literature of France. We have suspect that M. Kermer obtained his knowledge of English beef in the same way as did the poor Frenchman, whom the late Mr. Matthews, the comedian, so humorously described. Mr. Lewis, in his Physiology of Common Life, has thus revived the story of the beef-eating son of France. A Frenchman was one day blandly remonstrating against the supercilious scorn expressed by Englishmen for the beef of France, which he, for his part, did not find so inferior to that of England. I have been two times in England, he remarked, but I never find the beef so superior to ours. I find it very convenient that they bring it you on little pieces of stick, for one penny, but I do not find the beef superior. On hearing this, the Englishman, read with astonishment, exclaimed, Good heavens, sir! You have been eating cat's meat. No, M. Kermer, we are ready to acknowledge the superiority of your cookery, but we have long since made up our minds as to the inferiority of your raw material. Beef olives. I. Ingredients. 2 pounds. Of rump steak, 1 egg, 1 tablespoonful of minced savory herbs, pepper and salt to taste, 1 pint of stock, number 105, 2 or 3 slices of bacon, 2 tablespoonfuls of any store sauce, a slight thickening of butter and flour. Mode. Have the steaks cut rather thin, slightly beat them to make them level, cut them into 6 or 7 pieces, brush over with egg, and sprinkle with herbs, which should be very finely minced. Season with pepper and salt, and roll up the pieces tightly, and fasten with a small skewer. Put the stock in a stew pan that will exactly hold them, for by being pressed together, they will keep their shape better. Lay in the rolls of meat, cover them with the bacon, cut in thin slices, and over that put a piece of paper. Stew them very gently for full two hours, for the slower they are done the better. Take them out, remove the skewers, thicken the gravy with butter and flour, 
and flavor with any store sauce that may be preferred. Give one boil, pour over the meat, and serve. Time. 2 hours. Average cost, 1s. Per pound. Sufficient for 4 or 6 persons. Seasonable at any time. 2. Economical. Ingredients. The remains of underdone cold roast beef, bread crumbs, one shallot finely minced, pepper and salt to taste, gravy made from the beef bones, thickening of butter and flour, one tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup. Mode. Cut some slices of underdone roast beef about half an inch thick, sprinkle over them some bread crumbs, minced shallot, and a little of the fat and seasoning, roll them, and fasten with a small skewer. Have ready some gravy made from the beef bones. Put in the pieces of meat and stew them till tender, which will be in about one to a quarter hour, or rather longer. Arrange the meat in a dish, thicken and flavor the gravy, and pour it over the meat, when it is ready to serve. Time. One and a half hour. Average cost, exclusive of the beef, 2d. Seasonable at any time. Broiled OX tail, an entree. Ingredients. Two tails, one and a half pint of stock, number 105, salt and cayenne to taste, bread crumbs, one egg. Mode. Joint and cut up the tails into convenient sized pieces, and put them into a stew pan, with the stock, cayenne, and salt, and, if liked very savory, a bunch of sweet herbs. Let them simmer gently for about two and a half hours. Then take them out, drain them, and let them cool. Beat an egg upon a plate, dip in each piece of tail, and, afterwards, throw them into a dish of bread crumbs. Broil them over a clear fire, until of a brownish color on both sides, and serve with a good gravy, or any sauce that may be preferred. Time. About two and a half hours. Average cost, from 9d. To 1s. 6d, according to the season. Sufficient for six persons. Seasonable at any time. Note. These may be more easily prepared by putting the tails in a brisk oven, after they have been dipped in egg and breadcrumb, and, when brown, they are done. They must be boiled the same time as for broiling. Strange tails. Naturalists cannot explain the uses of some of the strange tails borne by animals. In the Egyptian and Syrian sheep, for instance, the tail grows so large, that it is not infrequently supported upon a sort of little cart, in order to prevent inconvenience to the animal. Thin monstrous appendage sometimes attains a weight of 70, 80, or even a hundred pounds. Two dress beef palates, an entree. Ingredients. For palates, sufficient gravy to cover them, no. For 38, cayenne to taste, one tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup, one tablespoonful of pickled onion liquor, thickening of butter and flour. Mode. Wash the palates and put them into a stew pan, with sufficient water to cover them, and let them boil until perfectly tender, or until the upper skin may be easily peeled off. Have ready sufficient gravy, number 438, to cover them. Add a good seasoning of cayenne, and thicken with roux, number 625, or a little butter kneaded with flour, let it boil up, and skim. Cut the pallets into square pieces, put them in the gravy, and let them simmer gently for half an hour. Add ketchup and onion liquor, give one boil, and serve. Time. From 3 to 5 hours to boil the pallets. Sufficient for 4 persons. Seasonable at any time. Note. Pallets may be dressed in various ways with sauce turny, good onion sauce, tomato sauce, and also served in a volo vent, but the above will be found a more simple method of dressing them. Beef pickle which may also be used for any kind of meat, tongues, or hams. Ingredients 6 pounds of salt, 2 pounds of fine sugar, 3 ounces of powdered saltpetri, 3 gallons of spring water. Mode Boil all the ingredients gently together, so long as any scum or impurity arises, which carefully remove, when quite cold, pour it over the meat, every part of which must be covered with the brine. 
This may be used for pickling any kind of meat, and may be kept for some time, if boiled up occasionally with an addition of the ingredients. Time A ham should be kept in the pickle for a fortnight, a piece of beef weighing 14 pounds. 12 or 15 days, a tongue, 10 days, or a fortnight. Note For salting and pickling meat, it is a good plan to rub in only half the quantity of salt directed, and to let it remain for a day or two to disgorge and effectually to get rid of the blood and slime. Then rub in the remainder of the salt and other ingredients, and proceed as above. This rule may be applied to all the recipes we have given for salting and pickling meat. To pickle part of a round of beef for hanging. Ingredients For 14 pounds of a round of beef allow one and a half pounds of salt, half a ounce of powdered salt petri, or one pound of salt, half a pound of sugar, four ounces of powdered salt petri. Mode. Rub in and sprinkle either of the above mixtures on 14 pounds of meat. Keep it in an earthenware pan or a deep wooden tray and turn twice a week during three weeks, then bind up the beef tightly with coarse linen tape and hang it in a kitchen in which a fire is constantly kept, for three weeks. Pork, hams, and bacon may be cured in a similar way, but will require double the quantity of the salting mixture. And, if not smoke-dried, they should be taken down from hanging after three or four weeks, and afterwards kept in boxes or tubs, amongst dry oat husks. Time. Two or three weeks to remain in the brine, to be hung three weeks. Seasonable at any time. Note. The meat may be boiled fresh from this pickle, instead of smoking it. Beep ragu, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. About 2 pounds of cold roast beef, 6 onions, pepper, salt, and mixed spices to taste. 1 half pint of boiling water, 3 tablespoonfuls of gravy. Mode. Cut the beef into rather large pieces, and put them into a stew pan with the onions, which must be sliced. Season well with pepper, salt, and mixed spices, and pour over about one half pint of boiling water, and gravy in the above proportion, gravy saved from the meat answers the purpose. Let the whole stew very gently for about two hours, and serve with pickled walnuts, gherkins, or capers, just warmed in the gravy. Time. Two hours. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 4D. Seasonable at any time. Roast ribs of beef. Ingredients. Beef, a little salt. Mode. The fore rib is considered the primest roasting piece, but the middle rib is considered the most economical. Let the meat be well hung, should the weather permit, and cut off the thin ends of the bones, which should be salted for a few days, and then boiled. Put the meat down to a nice clear fire, put some clean dripping into the pan, dredge the joint with a little flour, and keep continually basting the whole time. Sprinkle some fine salt over it, this must never be done until the joint is dished, as it draws the juices from the meat, pour the dripping from the pan, put in a little boiling, water slightly salted, and strain the gravy over the meat. Garnish with tufts of scraped horseradish, and send horseradish sauce to table with it, see number 447. A Yorkshire pudding, sea puddings, sometimes accompanies this dish, and, if lightly made and well cooked, will be found a very agreeable addition. Time. 10 pounds, of beef, 2 and a half hours, 14 to 16 pounds, from 3 and a half to 4 hours. Average cost, 8 minus 1 divided by 2d. Per lb. Sufficient. A joint of 10 pounds sufficient for 8 or 9 persons. Seasonable at any time. Memoranda in roasting. The management of the fire is a point of primary importance in roasting. A radiant fire throughout the operation is absolutely necessary to ensure a good result. When the article to be dressed is thin and delicate, the fire may be small. But when the joint is large, the fire must fill the grate. Meat must never be put down before a hollow or exhausted fire, which may soon want recruiting. On the other hand, if the heat of the fire becomes too fierce, the meat must be removed to a considerable distance till it is somewhat abetted. 
some cooks always fail in their roasts, though they succeed in nearly everything else. A French writer on the culinary art says that anybody can learn how to cook, but one must be born a roaster. According to Liebig, beef or mutton cannot be said to be sufficiently roasted until it has acquired, throughout the whole mass, a temperature of 158 degree. But poultry may be well cooked and the inner parts have attained a temperature of from 130 degrees to 140 degrees. This depends on the greater amount of blood which beef and mutton contain, the coloring matter of blood not being coagulable under 158 degrees. Roast ribs of beef, boned and rolled, a very convenient joint for a small family. Ingredients 1 or 2 ribs of beef. Mode Choose a fine rib of beef, and have it cut according to the weight you require, either wide or narrow. Bone and roll the meat round, secure it with wooden skewers, and, if necessary, bind it round with a piece of tape. Spit the beef firmly, or, if a bottle jack is used, put the joint on the hook, and place it near a nice clear fire. Let it remain so till the outside of the meat is set, when draw it to a distance, and keep continually basting until the meat is done, which can be ascertained by the steam from it drawing towards the fire. As this joint is solid, rather more than a quarter hour must be allowed for each pound remove the skewers, put in a plated or silver one, and send the joint to table with gravy in the dish, and garnish with tufts of horseradish. Horseradish sauce, no. 447, is a great improvement to roast beef. Time. For 10 pounds, of the rolled ribs, 3 hours, as the joint is very solid, we have allowed an extra half an hour, for 6 pounds, 1 and a half hour. Average cost, 8 minus 1 divided by 2d. Per lb. Sufficient. A joint of 10 pounds. For 6 or 8 persons. Seasonable all the year. Note. When the weight exceeds 10 pounds, we would not advise the above method of boning and rolling. Only in the case of one or two ribs, when the joint cannot stand upright in the dish, and would look awkward. The bones should be put in with a few vegetables and herbs, and made into stock. Roast beef has long been a national dish in England. In most of our patriotic songs it is contrasted with the fricasseed frogs, popularly supposed to be the exclusive diet of Frenchmen. Oh the roast beef of Old England! And oh the Old English roast beef! This national chorus is appealed to whenever a songwriter wishes to account for the valor displayed by Englishmen at sea or on land. Roast Sirloin of Beef Ingredients Beef, a little salt. Mode As a joint cannot be well roasted without a good fire, see that it is well made up about three quarters hour before it is required, so that when the joint is put down, it is clear and bright. Choose a nice sirloin, the weight of which should not exceed 16 pounds, as the outside would be too much done, whilst the inside would not be done enough. Spit it or hook it onto the jack firmly, dredge it slightly with flour, and place it near the fire at first, as directed in the preceding recipe. Then draw it to a distance, and keep continually basting until the meat is done. Sprinkle a small quantity of salt over it, empty the dripping pan of all the dripping, pour in some boiling water slightly salted, stir it about, and strain over the meat. Garnish with tufts of horseradish, and send horseradish sauce and Yorkshire pudding to table with it. For carving, see. Time. A sirloin of 10 pounds, 2 and a half hours, 14 to 16 pounds, about 4 or 4 minus 1 half hours. Average cost, 8 minus 1 divided by 2d. Per lb. Sufficient. A joint of 10 pounds, for 8 or 9 persons. Seasonable at any time. The rump, round, and other pieces of beef are roasted in the same manner, allowing for solid joints a quarter hour to every lb. Note. The above is the usual method of roasting moat. But to have it in perfection and the juices kept in, the meat should at first be laid close to the fire, and when the outside is set and firm, drawn away to a good distance, and then left to roast very slowly. Where economy is studied, this plan would not answer, as the meat requires to be at the fire double the time of the ordinary way of cooking, 
consequently, double the quantity of fuel would be consumed. Origin of the word, sirloin. The loin of beef is said to have been knighted by King Charles II, at Friday Hall, Chingford. The, Merry Monarch returned to this hospitable mansion for Epping Forest literally, as hungry as a hunter, and beheld, with delight, a huge loin of beef steaming upon the table. A noble joint, exclaimed the king. Bias T. George, it shall have a title. Then drawing his sword, he raised it above the meat, and cried, with mock dignity, Loin, we dub thee knight, henceforward be Sir Loin. This anecdote is doubtless apocryphal, although the oak table upon which the joint was supposed to have received its knighthood, might have been seen by anyone who visited Friday Hill House, a few years ago. It is, perhaps, a pity to spoil so noble a story, but the interests of truth demand that we declare that sirloin is probably a corruption of sirloin, which signifies the upper part of a loin, the prefix sir being equivalent to over or above. In French we find this joint called sirloin, which so closely resembles our sirloin, that we may safely refer the two words to a common origin. To salt beef. Ingredients. One half round of beef, four ounces of sugar, one ounce of powdered saltpetri, two ounces. Of black pepper, a quarter pound, of bay salt, half a pound, of common salt. Mode. Rub the meat well with salt, and let it remain for a day, to disgorge and clear it from slime. The next day, rub it well with the above ingredients on every side, and let it remain in the pickle for about a fortnight, turning it every day. It may be boiled fresh from the pickle, or smoked. Time. One half round of beef to remain in pickle about a fortnight. Average cost, 7d. Per pound seasonable at any time. Note. The H-bone, flank, or brisket may be salted and pickled by any of the recipes we have given for salting beef, allowing less time for small joints to remain in the pickle, for instance, a joint of 8 or 9 pounds. Will be sufficiently salt in about a week. The Dutch way to salt beef. Ingredients. 10 pounds, of lean beef, 1 pound, of treacle, 1 ounce of salt petri, 1 pound, of common salt. Mode. Rub the beef well with the treacle, and let it remain for three days, turning and rubbing it often, then wipe it, pound the salt and saltpetri very fine, rub these well in, and turn it every day for ten days. Roll it up tightly in a coarse cloth, and press it under a large weight, have it smoked, and turn it upside down every day. Boil it, and, on taking it out of the pot, put a heavy weight on it to press it. Time. 17 days. Seasonable at any time. Beef sausages. Ingredients. To every pound of suet allow 2 pounds of lean beef, seasoning to taste of salt, pepper, and mixed spices. Mode. Clear the suet from skin and chop that and the beef as finely as possible. Season with pepper, salt, and spices and mix the whole well together. Make it into flat cakes, and fry of a nice brown. Many persons pound the meat in a mortar after it is chopped, but this is not necessary when the meat is minced finely. Time. 10 minutes. Average cost, for this quantity, 1s. 6d. Seasonable at any time. Beef steak, rolled, roasted, and stuffed. Ingredients. 2 pounds, of rump steak, Force meat number 417, pepper and salt to taste, clarified butter. Mode. Have the steaks cut rather thick from a well-hung rump of beef, and sprinkle over them a seasoning of pepper and salt. Make a force meat by recipe number 417, spread it over half of the steak. Roll it up, bind and skewer it firmly, that the force meat may not escape, and roast it before a nice clear fire for about one and a half hour, or rather longer, should the roll be very large and thick. Keep it constantly basted with butter, and serve with brown gravy, some of which must be poured round the steak, and the remainder sent to table in a tureen. Time. One and a half hour. Average cost, ones. Per LB. Sufficient for four persons. Seasonable all the year, 
but best in winter. Sliced and broiled beef, a pretty dish, cold meat cookery. Ingredients A few slices of cold roast beef, four or five potatoes, a thin batter, pepper and salt to taste. Mode Pair the potatoes as you would peel an apple, fry the parings in a thin batter seasoned with salt and pepper, until they are of a light brown color, and place them on a dish over some slices of beef, which should be nicely seasoned and broiled. Time 5 minutes to broil the meat. Seasonable at any time. Spiced beef, to serve cold. Ingredients 14 pounds, of the thick flank or rump of beef, half a pound, of coarse sugar, 1 ounce of salt petri, a quarter pound, of pounded allspice, 1 pound, of common salt. Mode Rub the sugar well into the beef, and let it lay for 12 hours, then rub the salt petri in allspice, both of which should be pounded, over the meat, and let it remain for another 12 hours, then rub in the salt. Turn daily in the liquor for a fortnight, soak it for a few hours in water, dry with a cloth, cover with a coarse paste, put a little water at the bottom of the pan, and bake in a moderate oven for 4 hours. If it is not covered with a paste, be careful to put the beef into a deep vessel, and cover with a plate, or it will be too crisp. During the time the meat is in the oven it should be turned once or twice. Time 4 hours Average cost, 7d Per lb Seasonable at any time Baking meat Baking exerts some unexplained influence on meat, rendering it less savory and less agreeable than meat which has been roasted. Those who have traveled in Germany and France, writes Mr. Lewis, one of our most popular scientific authors, must have repeatedly marveled at the singular uniformity in the flavor, or want of flavor, of the various roasts served up at the table d'hôte. The general explanation is, that the German and French meat is greatly inferior in quality to that of England and Holland, owing to the inferiority of pasturage, and doubtless this is one cause, but it is not the chief cause. The meat is inferior, but the cooking is mainly at fault. The meat is scarcely ever roasted, because there is no coal, and firewood is expensive. The meat is therefore baked. And the consequence of this baking is, that no meat is eatable or eaten, with its own gravy, but is always accompanied by some sauce more or less piquant. The Germans generally believe that in England we eat our beef and mutton almost raw. They shudder at our gravy, as if it were so much blood. Stewed beef or rump steak, an entree. Ingredients About 2 pounds, of beef or rump steak, 3 onions, 2 turnips, 3 carrots, 2 or 3 ounces. Of butter, 1 half pint of water, 1 teaspoonful of salt, 1 half dew. Of pepper, 1 tablespoonful of ketchup, 1 tablespoonful of flour. Mode have the steaks cut tolerably thick and rather lean. Divide them into convenient sized pieces, and fry them in the butter a nice brown on both sides. Cleanse and pare the vegetables, cut the onions and carrots into thin slices, and the turnips into dice, and fry these in the same fat that the steaks were done in. Put all into a saucepan, add one half pint of water, or rather more should it be necessary, and simmer very gently for two and a half or three hours. When nearly done, skim well, add salt, pepper, and ketchup in the above proportions, and thicken with a tablespoonful of flour mixed with two of cold water. Let it boil up for a minute or two after the thickening is added, and serve. When a vegetable scoop is at hand, use it to cut the vegetables in fanciful shapes, and tomato, Harvey's sauce, or walnut liquor may be used to flavor the gravy. It is less rich if stewed the previous day, so that the fat may be taken off when cold, when wanted for table, it will merely require warming through. Time 3 hours Average cost, 1s Per lb Sufficient for 4 or 5 persons Seasonable at any time Stewed beef and celery sauce, cold meat cookery Ingredients 3 roots of celery, 1 pint of gravy Number 436, 2 onions sliced, 2 pounds, of cold roast or boiled beef. Mode. 
Cut the celery into two inch pieces, put them in a stew pan, with the gravy and onions, simmer gently until the celery is tender, when add the beef cut into rather thick pieces, stew gently for 10 minutes, and serve with fried potatoes. Time From 20 to 25 minutes to stew the celery. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 6D. Seasonable from September to January. Stewed beef with oysters, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. A few thick steaks of cold ribs or sirloin of beef, 2 ounces. Of butter, 1 onion sliced, pepper and salt to taste, 1 half glass of port wine, a little flour to thicken, 1 or 2 dozen oysters, rather more than 1 half pint of water. Mode. Cut the steaks rather thick, from cold sirloin or ribs of beef. Brown them lightly in a stew pan, with the butter and a little water, add one half pint of water, the onion, pepper, and salt, and cover the stew pan closely, and let it simmer very gently for half an hour. Then mix about a teaspoonful of flour smoothly with a little of the liquor, add the port wine and oysters, their liquor having been previously strained and put into the stew pan, stir till the oysters plump and serve. It should not boil after the oysters are added, or they will harden. Time. Half an hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, ones. 4D. Seasonable from September to April. Stewed brisket of beef. Ingredients. 7 pounds. Of a brisket of beef, vinegar and salt, 6 carrots, 6 turnips, 6 small onions, 1 blade of pounded mace, 2 whole allspice pounded, thickening of butter and flour, 2 tablespoonfuls of ketchup, stock, or water. Mode. About an hour before dressing it, rub the meat over with vinegar and salt. Put it into a stew pan, with sufficient stock to cover it, when this is not at hand, water may be substituted for it, and be particular that the stew pan is not much larger than the meat. Skim well, and when it has simmered very gently for one hour, put in the vegetables, and continue simmering till the meat is perfectly tender. Draw out the bones, dish the meat, and garnish either with tufts of cauliflower or braised cabbage cut in quarters. Thicken as much gravy as required, with a little butter and flour. Add spices and ketchup in the above proportion, give one boil, pour some of it over the meat, and the remainder send in a tureen. Time. Rather more than 3 hours. Average cost, 7D. Per LB. Sufficient for 7 or 8 persons. Seasonable at any time. Note. The remainder of the liquor in which the beef was boiled may be served as a soup, or it may be sent to table with the meat in a tureen. Stewed rump of beef. Ingredients. One half rump of beef, sufficient stock to cover it, no. 105, 4 tablespoonfuls of vinegar, 2 tablespoonfuls of ketchup, 1 large bunch of savory herbs, 2 onions, 12 cloves, pepper and salt to taste, thickening of butter and flour, 1 glass of port wine. Mode. Cut out the bone, sprinkle the meat with a little cayenne, this must be sparingly used, and bind and tie it firmly up with tape. Put it into a stew pan with sufficient stock to cover it, and add vinegar, ketchup, herbs, onions, cloves, and seasoning in the above proportion, and simmer very gently for 4 or 5 hours, or until the meat is perfectly tender. Which may be ascertained by piercing it with a thin skewer. When done, remove the tape, lay it into a deep dish, which keep hot, strain and skim the gravy, thicken it with butter and flour, add a glass of port wine and any flavoring to make the gravy rich and palatable. Let it boil up, pour over the meat, and serve. This dish may be very much enriched by garnishing with forcemeat balls, or filling up the space whence the bone is taken with a good forcemeat. Sliced carrots, turnips, and onions boiled with the meat, are also a great improvement, and, where expense is not objected to, it may be glazed. This, however, is not necessary where a good gravy is poured round and over the meat. Time. One half rump stewed gently from 4 to 5 hours. Average cost, 10 D. Per pound sufficient for 8 or 10 persons. Seasonable at any time. 
Note. A stock or gravy in which to boil the meat may be made of the bone and trimmings by boiling them with water and adding carrots, onions, turnips, and a bunch of sweet herbs. To make this dish richer and more savory, half roast the rump and afterwards stew it in strong stock and a little Madeira. This is an expensive method and is not, after all, much better than a plainer dressed joint. The Baron of Beef This noble joint, which consisted of two sirloins not cut asunder, was a favorite dish of our ancestors. It is rarely seen nowadays. Indeed, it seems out of place on a modern table, as it requires the grim boar's head and Christmas pie as supporters. Sir Walter Scott has described a feast at which the Baron of Beef would have appeared to great advantage. We will quote a few lines to remind us of those days when England was Merry England, and when hospitality was thought to be the highest virtue. The fire, with well dried logs supplied, went roaring up the chimney wide. The huge hall table's oaken face scrubbed till it shone, the day to grace. Bore then, upon its massive board, no mark to part the squire and lord. Then was brought in the lusty brawn. By old blue coated serving man. Then the grim boar's head frowned on high, crested with bays and rosemary. Well can the green garbed ranger tell how, when, and where the monster fell, what dogs before his death he tore, and all the baiting of the boar, while round the merry wassail bowl, garnished with ribbons, blithe did trowel. There the huge sirloin reeked, hard by. Plum porridge stood, and Christmas pie. Nor failed old Scotland to produce. At such high tide, her savoury goose. When a lord's son came of age, in the olden time, the baron of beef was too small a joint, by many degrees, to satisfy the retainers who would flock to the hall, a whole ox was therefore generally roasted over a fire built up of huge logs. We may here mention, that an ox was roasted entire on the frozen Thames, in the early part of the present century. Stewed shin of beef. Ingredients. A shin of beef, one head of celery, one onion, a faggot of savory herbs, one half teaspoonful of allspice, one half teaspoonful of whole black pepper, four carrots, twelve button onions, two turnips, thickening of butter and flour, three tablespoonfuls of mushroom ketchup. 2 tablespoonfuls of port wine. Pepper and salt to taste. Mode. Have the bone sawn into four or five pieces, cover with hot water, bring it to a boil, and remove any scum that may rise to the surface. Put in the celery, onion, herbs, spice, and seasoning, and simmer very gently until the meat is tender. Peel the vegetables, cut them into any shape fancy may dictate, and boil them with the onions until tender. Lift out the beef, put it on a dish, which keep hot, and thicken with butter and flour as much of the liquor as will be wanted for gravy, keep stirring till it boils, then strain and skim. Put the gravy back in the stew pan, add the seasoning, port wine, and ketchup, give one boil, and pour it over the beef, garnish with the boiled carrots, turnips, and onions. Time the meat to be stewed about 4 hours. Average cost, 4d. Per lb. With bone. Sufficient for 7 or 8 persons. Seasonable at any time. Toad and the whole, a homely but savory dish. Ingredients. 1 and a half pounds, of rump steak, 1 sheep's kidney, pepper and salt to taste. For the batter, 3 eggs, 1 pint of milk, 4 tablespoonfuls of flour, 1 half salt spoonful of salt. Mode. Cut up the steak and kidney into convenient sized pieces, and put them into a pie dish, with a good seasoning of salt and pepper. Mix the flour with a small quantity of milk at first, to prevent its being lumpy, add the remainder, and the three eggs, which should be well beaten, put in the salt, stir the batter for about 5 minutes, and pour it over the steak. Place it in a tolerably brisk oven immediately, and bake for one and a half hour. Time. One and a half hour. Average cost, ones. 9d. Sufficient for four or five persons. Seasonable at any time. Note. 
The remains of cold beef, rather underdone, may be substituted for the steak, and, when liked, the smallest possible quantity of minced onion or shallot may be added. Boiled Tongue Ingredients 1 tongue, a bunch of savory herbs, water. Mode In choosing a tongue, ascertain how long it has been dried or pickled, and select one with a smooth skin, which denotes its being young and tender. If a dried one, and rather hard, soak it at least for 12 hours previous to cooking it. If, however, it is fresh from the pickle, two or three hours will be sufficient for it to remain in sock. Put the tongue in a stew pan with plenty of cold water and a bunch of savory herbs. Let it gradually come to a boil, skim well and simmer very gently until tender. Peel off the skin, garnish with tufts of cauliflowers or Brussels sprouts, and serve. Boiled tongue is frequently sent to table with boiled poultry, instead of ham, and is, by many persons, preferred. If to serve cold, peel it, fasten it down to a piece of board by sticking a fork through the root, and another through the top, to straighten it. When cold, glaze it, and put a paper ruche round the root, and garnish with tufts of parsley. Time A large smoked tongue, four to four and a half hours, a small one, two and a half to three hours. A large unsmoked tongue, three to three and a half hours, a small one, two to two and a half hours. Average cost, for a moderate-sized tongue, threes. 6d. Seasonable at any time. To cure tongues. i. Ingredients. For a tongue of seven pounds, one ounce of saltpetri, half a ounce of black pepper, four ounces of sugar, three ounces of juniper berries, six ounces of salt. Mode. Rub the above ingredients well into the tongue, and let it remain in the pickle for ten days or a fortnight, then drain it, tie it up in brown paper, and have it smoked for about twenty days over a wood fire, or it may be boiled out of this pickle. Time. From ten to fourteen days to remain in the pickle, to be smoked twenty-four days. Average cost, for a medium-sized uncured tongue, twos. 6d. Seasonable at any time. Note. If not wanted immediately, the tongue will keep three or four weeks without being too salt. Then it must not be rubbed, but only turned in the pickle. 2. Ingredients. 9 pounds, of salt, 8 ounces of sugar, 9 ounces of powdered saltpetri. Mode. Rub the above ingredients well into the tongues, and keep them in this curing mixture for two months, turning them every day. Drain them from the pickle, cover with brown paper, and have them smoked for about three weeks. Time. The tongues to remain in pickle two months, to be smoked three weeks. Sufficient. The above quantity of brine sufficient for twelve tongues, of five pounds, each. Seasonable at any time. Illustration, Beef Tongue The Tongues of Animals The tongue, whether in the ox or in man, is the seat of the sense of taste. This sense warns the animal against swallowing deleterious substances. Dar. Carpenter says, that, among the lower animals, the instinctive perceptions connected with this sense, are much more remarkable than our own. Thus, an omnivorous monkey will seldom touch fruits of a poisonous character, although their taste may be agreeable. However this may be, man's instinct has decided that ox tongue is better than horse tongue. Nevertheless, the latter is frequently substituted by dishonest dealers for the former. The horse's tongue may be readily distinguished by a spoon-like expansion at its end. To pickle and dress a tongue to eat cold. Ingredients 6 ounces Of salt, 2 ounces of bay salt, 1 ounce of salt petri, 3 ounces of coarse sugar, cloves, mace, and allspice to taste, butter, common crust of flour and water. Mode. Lay the tongue for a fortnight in the above pickle, turn it every day, and be particular that the spices are well pounded, put it into a small pan just large enough to hold it, place some pieces of butter on it, and cover with a common crust. Bake in a slow oven until so tender that a straw would penetrate it, 
take off the skin, fasten it down to a piece of board by running a fork through the root and another through the tip, at the same time straightening it and putting it into shape. When cold, glaze it, put a paper ruche round the root, which is generally very unsightly, and garnish with tufts of parsley. Time From 3 or 4 hours in a slow oven, according to size. Average cost, for a medium-sized uncured tongue, twos. 6d. Seasonable at any time. To dress tripe. Ingredients. Tripe, onion sauce, number 484, milk and water. Mode. Ascertain that the tripe is quite fresh, and have it cleaned and dressed. Cut away the coarsest fat, and boil it in equal proportions of milk and water for three quarters hour. Should the tripe be entirely undressed, more than double that time should be allowed for it. Have ready some onion sauce made by recipe no. For S4, dish the tripe, smother it with the sauce, and the remainder send to table in a tureen. Time. 1 hour, for undressed tripe, from 2 and a half to 3 hours. Average cost, 7d. Per lb. Seasonable at any time. Note. Tripe may be dressed in a variety of ways. It may be cut in pieces and fried in batter, stewed in gravy with mushrooms, or cut into collops, sprinkled with minced onion and savory herbs, and fried a nice brown in clarified butter. Beef Carving H-bone of beef A boiled H-bone of beef is not a difficult joint to carve, as will be seen on reference to the accompanying engraving. By following with the knife the direction of the line from 1 to 2, nice slices will be easily cut. It may be necessary, as in a round of beef, to cut a thick slice off the outside before commencing to serve. Illustration Brisket of beef There is but little description necessary to add, to show the carving of a boiled brisket of beef, beyond the engraving here inserted. The only point to be observed is, that the joint should be cut evenly and firmly quite across the bones, so that, on its reappearance at table, it should not have a jagged and untidy look. Illustration Ribs of beef This dish resembles the sirloin, except that it has no fillet or undercut. As explained in the recipes, the end piece is often cut off, salted and boiled. The mode of carving is similar to that of the sirloin, viz. In the direction of the dotted line from 1 to 2. This joint will be the more easily cut if the plan be pursued which is suggested in carving the sirloin. Namely, the inserting of the knife immediately between the bone and the moat, before commencing to cut it into slices. All joints of roast beef should be cut in even and thin slices. Horseradish, finely scraped, may be served as a garnish. But horseradish sauce is preferable for eating with the beef. Illustration Sirloin of Beef this dish is served differently at various tables, some preferring it to come to table with the fillet, or, as it is usually called, the undercut, uppermost. The reverse way, as shown in the cut, is that most usually adopted. Still the undercut is best eaten when hot, consequently, the carver himself may raise the joint, and cut some slices from the underside, in the direction of from one to two, as the fillet is very much preferred by some eaters. The upper part of the sirloin should be cut in the direction of the line from 5 to 6, and care should be taken to carve it evenly and in thin slices. It will be found a great assistance, in carving this joint well, if the knife be first inserted just above the bone at the bottom, and run sharply along between the bone and meat. And also to divide the meat from the bone in the same way at the side of the joint. The slices will then come away more readily. Illustration some carvers cut the upper side of the sirloin across, as shown by the line from 3 to 4, but this is a wasteful plan, and one not to be recommended. With the sirloin, very finely scraped horseradish is usually served, and a little given, when liked, to each guest. Horseradish sauce is preferable, however, for serving on the plate, although the scraped horseradish may still be used as a garnish. Illustration A round of beef a round of beef is not so easily carved as many other joints of beef, and to manage it properly, a thin-bladed and very sharp knife is necessary. 
Off the outside of the joint, at its top, a thick slice should first be cut, so as to leave the surface smooth, then thin and even slices should be cleverly carved in the direction of the line 1 to 2. And with each slice of the lean a delicate morsel of the fat should be served. Illustration Beef Tongue Passing the knife down in the direction of from 1 to 2, a not too thin slice should be helped. And the carving of a tongue may be continued in this way until the best portions of the upper side are served. The fat which lies about the root of the tongue can be served by turning the tongue and cutting in the direction of from 3 to 4. Illustration Illustration Chapter 14 General Observations on the Sheep and Lamb 678. Of all wild or domesticated animals, the sheep is, without exception, the most useful to man as a food, and the most necessary to his health and comfort. For it not only supplies him with the lightest and most nutritious of meats, but, in the absence of the cow, its udder yields him milk, cream, and a sound though inferior cheese. While from its fat he obtains light, and from its fleece broadcloth, kersimir, blankets, gloves, and hose. Its bones when burnt make an animal charcoal, ivory black, to polish his boots, and when powdered, a manure for the cultivation of his wheat. The skin, either split or whole, is made into a mat for his carriage, a housing for his horse, or a lining for his hat, and many other useful purposes besides, being extensively employed in the manufacture of parchment. And finally, when oppressed by care and sorrow, the harmonious strains that carry such soothing contentment to the heart, are elicited from the musical strings, prepared almost exclusively from the intestines of the sheep. 679. This valuable animal, of which England is estimated to maintain an average stock of 32 million, belongs to the class already indicated under the ox, the mammalia, to the order of ruminantia, or cut-chewing animal. To the tribe of capridae, or horned quadrupeds, and the genus Ovis, or the sheep. The sheep may be either with or without horns. When present, however, they have always this peculiarity, that they spring from a triangular base, are spiral in form, and lateral, at the side of the head, in situation. The fleece of the sheep is of two sorts, either short and harsh, or soft and woolly, the wool always preponderating in an exact ratio to the care, attention, and amount of domestication bestowed on the animal. The generic peculiarities of the sheep are the triangular and spiral form of the horns, always larger in the male when present, but absent in the most cultivated species. Having sinuses at the base of all the toes of the four feet, with two rudimentary hoofs on the four legs, two inguinal teats to the udder, with a short tail in the wild breed, but of varying length in the domesticated. Have no incisor teeth in the upper jaw, but in their place a hard elastic cushion along the margin of the gum, on which the animal nips and breaks the herbage on which it feeds. In the lower jaw there are eight incisor teeth and six molars on each side of both jaws, making in all thirty-two teeth. The fleece consists of two coats, one to keep the animal warm, the other to carry off the water without wetting the skin. The first is of wool, the weight and fineness of which depend on the quality of the pasture and the care bestowed on the flock. The other of hair, that pierces the wool and overlaps it, and is in excess in exact proportion to the badness of the keep and inattention with which the animal is treated. 680. The great object of the grazier is to procure an animal that will yield the greatest pecuniary return in the shortest time or, in other words, soonest convert grass and turnips into good mutton and fine fleece. All sheep will not do this alike. Some, like men, are so restless and irritable, that no system of feeding, however good, will develop their frames or make them fat. The system adopted by the breeder to obtain a valuable animal for the butcher, is to enlarge the capacity and functions of the digestive organs, and reduce those of the head and chest, or the mental and respiratory organs. In the first place, the mind should be tranquilized, and those spaces that can never produce animal fiber curtailed, and greater room afforded, as in the abdomen, for those that can. And as nothing militates against the fattening process so much as restlessness, the chief wish of the grazier is to find a dull, indolent sheep, one who, instead of frisking himself, leaping his wattles. 
or even condescending to notice the budding gambols of his silly companions, silently fills his paunch with pasture, and then seeking a shady nook, indolently and luxuriously chows his cud with closed eyes and blissful satisfaction. Only rising when his delicious repast is ended, to proceed silently and without emotion to repeat the pleasing process of laying in more provender, and then returning to his dreamy siesta to renew the delightful task of rumination. Such animals are said to have a lymphatic temperament, and are of so kindly a nature, that on good pasturage they may be said to grow daily. The Leicestershire breed is the best example of this lymphatic and contented animal, and the active Orkney, who is half goat in his habits, of the restless and unprofitable. The rich pasture of our midland counties would take years in making the wiry Orkney fat and profitable. While one day's fatigue in climbing rocks after a coarse and scanty herbage would probably cause the actual death of the pampered and short-winded Lester. 681. The more removed from the nature of the animal is the food on which it lives, the more difficult is the process of assimilation, and the more complex the chain of digestive organs. For it must be evident to all, that the same apparatus that converts flesh into flesh, is hardly calculated to transmute grass into flesh. As the process of digestion in carnivorous animals is extremely simple, these organs are found to be remarkably short, seldom exceeding the length of the animal's body. While, where digestion is more difficult, from the unassimilating nature of the aliment, as in the ruminant order, the alimentary canal, as is the case with the sheep, is twenty-seven times the length of the body. The digestive organ in all ruminant animals consists of four stomachs, or, rather, a capacious pouch, divided by doorways and valves into four compartments, called, in their order of position, the paunch, the reticulum, the omasum, and the abomasum. When the sheep nibbles the grass, and is ignorantly supposed to be eating, he is, in fact, only preparing the raw material of his meal, in reality only mowing the pasture, which, as he collects, is swallowed instantly. Passing into the first receptacle, the paunch, where it is surrounded by a quantity of warm saliva, in which the herbage undergoes a process of maceration or softening, till the animal having filled this compartment. The contents pass through a valve into the second or smaller bag, the reticulum, where, having again filled the paunch with a reserve, the sheep lies down and commences that singular process of chewing the cud, or, in other words, masticating the food he has collected. By the operation of a certain set of muscles, a small quantity of this softened food from the reticulum, or second bag, is passed into the mouth, which it now becomes the pleasure of the sheep to grind under his molar teeth into a soft smooth pulp. The operation being further assisted by a flow of saliva, answering the double purpose of increasing the flavor of the aliment and promoting the solvency of the mass. Having completely comminuted and blended this mouthful, it is swallowed a second time. But instead of returning to the paunch or reticulum, it passes through another valve into a side cavity, the omasum, where, after a maceration in more saliva for some hours, it glides by the same contrivance into the fourth pouch, the abomasum. An apartment in all respects analogous to the ordinary stomach of animals, and where the process of digestion, begun and carried on in the previous three, is here consummated, and the nutrient principle, by means of the bile, Eliminated from the digested aliment. Such is the process of digestion in sheep and oxen. 682. And no other animal, even of the same order, possesses in so remarkable a degree the power of converting pasture into flesh as the Leicestershire sheep. The South Down and Cheviot, the two next breeds in quality, are, in consequence of the greater vivacity of the animal's nature, not equal to it in that respect. Though in both the brain and chest are kept subservient to the greater capacity of the organs of digestion. Besides the advantage of increased bulk and finer fleeces, the breeder seeks to obtain an augmented deposit of tissue in those parts of the carcass most esteemed as food, or, what are called in the trade, prime joints. And so far has this been effected, that the comparative weight of the hindquarters over the fore has become a test of quality in the breed, the butchers in some markets charging tuppence a pound more for that portion of the sheep. Indeed, so superior are the hindquarters of mutton now regarded, that very many of the West End butchers never deal in any other part of the sheep. 683. 
The difference in the quality of the flesh in various breeds is a well-established fact, not alone in flavor, but also in tenderness. And that the nature of the pasture on which the sheep is fed influences the flavor of the meat, is equally certain, and shown in the estimation in which those flocks are held which have grazed on the tiny heath of Bamstead in Sussex. It is also a well-established truth, that the larger the frame of the animal, the coarser is the meat, and that small bones are both guarantees for the fineness of the breed and the delicacy of the flesh. The sex too has much to do in determining the quality of the meat. In the males, the lean is closer in fiber, deeper in color, harder in texture, less juicy, and freer from fat, than in the female, and is consequently tougher and more difficult of digestion. But probably age, and the character of the pasturage on which they are reared, has, more than any other cause, an influence on the quality and tenderness of the meat. 684. The numerous varieties of sheep inhabiting the different regions of the earth have been reduced by Cuvier to three, or at most four, species, the Ovis Amon, or the Argali, the presumed parent stock of all the rest. The Ovis Trigelophus, the bearded sheep of Africa, the Ovis Musman, the Musman of Southern Europe, and the Ovis Montana, the Mouflon of America. Though it is believed by many naturalists that this last is so nearly identical with the Indian Argali as to be undeserving a separate place. It is still a controversy to which of these three we are indebted for the many breeds of modern domestication, the Argali, however, by general belief, has been considered as the most probable progenitor of the present varieties. 685. The effects produced by change of climate, accident, and other causes, must have been great to accomplish so complete a physical alteration as the primitive Argali must have undergone before the Musman, or Mouflon of Corsica. The immediate progenitor of all our European breeds, assumed his present appearance. The Argali is about a fifth larger in size than the ordinary English sheep, and being a native of a tropical clime, his fleece is of hair instead of wool, and of a warm reddish-brown, approaching to yellow. A thick mane of darker hair, about seven inches long, commences from two long tufts at the angle of the jaws, and, running under the throat and neck, descends down the chest, dividing, at the fore fork, into two parts. One running down the front of each leg, as low as the shank. The horns, unlike the character of the order generally, have a quadrangular base, and, sweeping inwards, terminate in a sharp point. The tail, about seven inches long, ends in a tuft of stiff hairs. From this remarkable muffler-looking beard, the French have given the species the name of Mouflon à Manchettes. From the primitive stock eleven varieties have been reared in this country, of the domesticated sheep, each supposed by their advocates to possess some one or more special qualities. These eleven, embracing the Shetland or Orkney, the Dunwold. Black-faced, or Heathbred, the Moorland, or Devonshire, the Cheviot, the Horned, of Norfolk the Ryland, South Down, the Merino, the Old Leicester, and the Teeswater, or New Leicester, have of late years been epitomized. And, for all useful and practical purposes, reduced to the following four orders. 686. The South Down, the Leicester, the Black-Faced, and the Chiviot. Illustration, South Down Ram. Illustration, South Down EWE. 687, South Downs. It appears, as far as our investigation can trace the fact, that from the very earliest epoch of agricultural history in England, the breezy range of light chalky hills running through the southwest and south of Sussex and Hampshire, and known as the South Downs, has been famous for a superior race of sheep. And we find the Romans early established mills and a cloth factory at Winchester, where they may be said to terminate, which rose to such estimation, from the fineness of the wool and texture of the cloth. That the produce was kept as only worthy to clothe emperors. From this, it may be inferred that sheep have always been indigenous to this hilly tract. Though boasting so remote a reputation, it is comparatively within late years that the improvement and present state of perfection of this breed has been effected, the South Down new ranking, for symmetry of shape, constitution, and early maturity. With any stock in the kingdom. The South Down has no horns, is covered with a fine wool from two to three inches long, has a small head, and legs and face of a grey colour. 
It is, however, considered deficient in depth and breadth of chest. A marked peculiarity of this breed is that its hind quarters stand higher than the fore, the quarters weighing from 15 to 18 pounds. Illustration, Lester Ram. Illustration, Lester E. W. E. 688, The Lester. It was not till the year 1755 that Mr. Robert Bakewell directed his attention to the improvement of his stock of sheep, and ultimately effected that change in the character of his flock which has brought the breed to hold so prominent a place. The Lester is regarded as the largest example of the improved breeds, very productive, and yielding a good fleece. He has a small head, covered with short white hairs, a clean muzzle, an open countenance, full eye, long thin ear, tapering neck, well-arched ribs, and straight back. The meat is indifferent, its flavor not being so good as that of the South Down, and there is a very large proportion of fat. Average weight of carcass from 90 to 100 pounds. Illustration, Heath Ram. Illustration, Heath E.W.E. 689. Black-faced, on Heath-bred sheep. This is the most hardy of all our native breeds, and originally came from Ettrick Forest. The face and legs are black, or sometimes mottled, the horn spiral, and on the top of the forehead it has a small round tuft of lighter colored wool than on the face. Has the muzzle and lips of the same light hue, and what shepherds call a mealy mouth, the eye is full of vivacity and fire, and well open, the body long, round, and firm, and the limbs robust. The wool is thin, coarse, and light. Weight of the quarter, from 10 to 16 pounds. 690, the Cheviot. From the earliest traditions, these hills in the north, like the chalk ridges in the south, have possessed a race of large carcassed sheep, producing a valuable fleece. To these physical advantages, they added a sound constitution, remarkable vigor, and capability to endure great privation. Both sexes are destitute of horns, face white, legs long and clean, carries the head erect, has the throat and neck well covered, the cars long and open, and the face animated. The Cheviot is a small bone sheep, and well covered with wool to the hoff, the only defect in this breed, is in a want of depth in the chest. Weight of the quarter, from 12 to 18 pounds. Illustration, Romney Marsh Ram. Illustration, Romney Marsh EWE. 691. Though the Romney Marshes, that wide tract of morass and lowland moor extending from the Weald, or ancient forest, of Kent into Sussex, has rather been regarded as a general feeding ground for any kind of sheep to be pastured on, it has yet. From the earliest date, been famous for a breed of animals almost peculiar to the locality, and especially for size, length, thickness, and quantity of wool, and what is called thickness of stocking and on this account for ages held preeminence over every other breed in the kingdom. So satisfied were the Kentish men with the superiority of their sheep, that they long resisted any crossing in the breed. At length, however, this was effected, and from the old Romney and New Leicester a stock was produced that proved, in an eminent degree, the advantage of the cross. And though the breed was actually smaller than the original, it was found that the new stock did not consume so much food, the stocking was increased, they were ready for the market a year sooner. That the fat formed more on the exterior of the carcass, where it was of most advantage to the grazier, rather than as formerly in the interior, where it went to the butcher as offal. And though the wool was shorter and lighter, it was of a better color, finer, and possessed of superior felting properties. 692. The Romney Marsh breed is a large animal, deep, close, and compact, with white face and legs, and yields a heavy fleece of a good staple quality. The general structure is, however, considered defective, the chest being narrow and the extremities coarse, nevertheless its tendency to fatten, and its early maturity, are universally admitted. The Romney Marsh, therefore, though not ranking as a first class in respect of perfection and symmetry of breed, is a highly useful, profitable, and generally advantageous variety of the English domestic sheep. 693. Different names have been given to sheep by their breeders, according to their age and sex. The male is called a ram, or tup, after weaning, he is said to be a hog, or hogget, or a lamb hog, 
tup hog or teg, later he is a weather, or weather hog. After the first shearing, a shearing, or dimment, and after each succeeding shearing, a two, three, or four shear ram, tup, or weather, according to circumstances. The female is called a ewe, or jimmer lamb, till weaned, when she becomes, according to the shepherd's nomenclature, a jimmer ewe, hog, or teg, after shearing, a jimmer or shearing ewe, or the ave. And in future a two, three, or four shear ewe, or the ave. 694. The mode of slaughtering sheep is perhaps as humane and expeditious a process as could be adopted to attain the object sought, the animal being laid on its side in a sort of concave stool, the butcher, while pressing the body with his knee. Transfixes the throat near the angle of the jaw, passing his knife between the windpipe and bones of the neck. Thus dividing the jugulars, carotids, and large vessels, the death being very rapid from such a hemorrhage. Illustration, side of mutton, showing the several joints. 695. Almost every large city has a particular manner of cutting up, or, as it is called, dressing the carcass. In London this process is very simple, and as our butchers have found that much skewering back, doubling one part over another, or scoring the inner cuticle or fell, tends to spoil the meat and shorten the time it would otherwise keep. They avoid all such treatment entirely. The carcass when flayed, which operation is performed while yet warm, the sheep when hung up and the head removed, presents the profile shown in our cut, the small numerals indicating the parts or joints into which one half of the animal is cut. After separating the hind from the four quarters, with eleven ribs to the latter, the quarters are usually subdivided in the manner shown in the sketch, in which the several joints are defined by the intervening lines and figures. Hind quarter, no. 1. The leg, 2. The loin, the two, when cut in one piece, being called the saddle. For quarter, number 3, the shoulder, 4 and 5 the neck, no. 5 being called, for distinction, the scrag, which is generally afterward separated from 4, the lower and better joint, number 6, the breast. The haunch of mutton, so often served at public dinners and special entertainments, comprises all the leg and so much of the loin, short of the ribs or lap, as is indicated on the upper part of the carcass by a dotted line. 696. The gentle and timid disposition of the sheep, and its defenseless condition, must very early have attached it to man for motives less selfish than either its fleece or its flesh. For it has been proved beyond a doubt that, obtuse as we generally regard it, it is susceptible of a high degree of domesticity, obedience, and affection. In many parts of Europe, where the flocks are guided by the shepherd's voice alone, it is no unusual thing for a sheep to quit the herd when called by its name, and follow the keeper like a dog. In the mountains of Scotland, when a flock is invaded by a savage dog, the rams have been known to form the herd into a circle, and placing themselves on the outside line, keep the enemy at bay, or charging on him in a troop. Have dispatched him with their horns. 697. The value of the sheep seems to have been early understood by Adam in his fallen state, his skin not only affording him protection for his body, but a covering for his tent. And accordingly, we find Abel entrusted with this portion of his father's stock, for the Bible tells us that Abel was a keeper of sheep. What other animals were domesticated at that time we can only conjecture, or at what exact period the flesh of the sheep was first eaten for food by man, is equally, if not uncertain, open to controversy. For though some authorities maintain the contrary, it is but natural to suppose that when Abel brought firstlings of his flock, and the fat thereof, as a sacrifice, the less dainty portions, not being oblations, were hardly likely to have been flung away as refuse. Indeed, without supposing Adam and his descendants to have eaten animal food, we cannot reconcile the fact of Jubal Cain, Cain's son, and his family, living in tents, as they are reported to have done. Knowing that both their own garments and the coverings of the tents, were made from the hides and skins of the animals they bred. For the number of sheep and oxen slain for oblations only, would not have supplied sufficient material for two such necessary purposes. The opposite opinion is, that animal food was not eaten till after the flood, when the Lord renewed his covenant with Noah. 
From scriptural authority we learn many interesting facts as regards the sheep, the first, that mutton fat was considered the most delicious portion of any meat, and the tail and adjacent part the most exquisite morsel in the whole body. Consequently, such were regarded as especially fit for the offer of sacrifice. From this fact we may reasonably infer that the animal still so often met with in Palestine and Syria, and known as the fat-tailed sheep, was in use in the days of the patriarchs, though probably not then of the size and weight it now attains to. A supposition that gains greater strength, when it is remembered that the ram Abraham found in the bush, when he went to offer up Isaac, was a horned animal, being entangled in the brake by his curved horns. So far proving that it belonged to the tribe of the Capridae, the fat-tailed sheep appertaining to the same family. Lambs. 698. Though the lambing season in this country usually commences in March, under the artificial system, so much pursued now to please the appetite of luxury, lambs can be procured at all seasons. When, however, the sheep lambs in midwinter, or the inclemency of the weather would endanger the lives of mother and young, if exposed to its influence, it is customary to rear the lambs within doors, and under the shelter of stables or barns. Where, foddered on soft hay, and part fed on cow's milk, the little creatures thrive rapidly, to such it is customary to give the name of house lamb, to distinguish it from that reared in the open air, or grass fed. The ewe goes five months with her young, about 152 days, or close on 22 weeks. The weaning season commences on poor lambs, about the end of the third month, but on rich pasture not till the close of the fourth, sometimes longer. 699. From the large proportion of moisture or fluids contained in the tissues of all young animals, the flesh of lamb and veal is much more prone, in close, damp weather, to become tainted and spoil than the flesh of the more mature, drier and closer textured beef and mutton. Among epicures, the most delicious sorts of lamb are those of the South Down breed, known by their black feet, and of these, those which have been exclusively suckled on the milk of the parent ewe, are considered the finest. Next to these in estimation are those fed on the milk of several dams, and last of all, though the fattest, the grass-fed lamb, this, however, implies an age much greater than either of the others. Illustration Side of lamb. 700. Lamb, in the early part of the season, however reared, is in London, and indeed generally, sold in quarters, divided with eleven ribs to the forequarter. But, as the season advances, these are subdivided into two, and the hindquarter in the same manner, the first consisting of the shoulder, and the neck and breast, the latter, of the leg and the loin, as shown in the cut illustrative of mutton. As lamb, from the juicy nature of its flesh, is especially liable to spoil in unfavorable weather, it should be frequently wiped, so as to remove any moisture that may form on it. 701. In the purchasing of lamb for the table, there are certain signs by which the experienced judgment is able to form an accurate opinion whether the animal has been lately slaughtered. And whether the joints possess that condition of fiber indicative of good and wholesome meat. The first of these doubts may be solved satisfactorily by the bright and dilated appearance of the eye, the quality of the forequarter can always be guaranteed by the blue or healthy ruddiness of the jugular, or vein of the neck. While the rigidity of the knuckle, and the firm, compact feel of the kidney, will answer in an equally positive manner for the integrity of the hindquarter. 702, Mode of Cutting Up a Side of Lamb in London 1. 1. Ribs, 2. Breast, 3. Shoulder, 4. Loin, 5. Leg, 1, 2, 3. For quarter. Recipes. Chapter 15. Baked minced mutton, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of any joint of cold roast mutton, one or two onions, one bunch of savory herbs, pepper and salt to taste, two blades of pounded mace or nutmeg, 2 tablespoonfuls of gravy, mashed potatoes. Mode. Mince an onion rather fine, and fry it a light brown color, add the herbs and mutton, both of which should be also finely minced and well mixed. Season with pepper and salt, and a little pounded mace or nutmeg, and moisten with the above proportion of gravy. 
Put a layer of mashed potatoes at the bottom of a dish, then the mutton, and then another layer of potatoes, and bake for about half an hour. Time. Half an hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 4D. Seasonable at any time. Note. If there should be a large quantity of meat, use two onions instead of one. Boiled breast of mutton and caper sauce. Ingredients. Breast of mutton, bread crumbs, two tablespoonfuls of minced savory herbs, put a large proportion of parsley, pepper and salt to taste. Mode. Cut off the superfluous fat, bone it. Sprinkle over a layer of bread crumbs, minced herbs, and seasoning, roll, and bind it up firmly. Boil gently for two hours, remove the tape, and serve with caper sauce, number 382, a little of which should be poured over the meat. Time. 2 hours. Average cost, 6D. Per LB. Sufficient for 4 or 6 persons. Seasonable all the year. Boiled leg of mutton. Ingredients. Mutton, water, salt. Mode. A. Leg of mutton for boiling should not hang too long, as it will not look a good color when dressed. Cut off the shank bone, trim the knuckle, and wash and wipe it very clean, plunge it into sufficient boiling water to cover it. Let it boil up, then draw the saucepan to the side of the fire, where it should remain till the finger can be borne in the water. Then place it sufficiently near the fire, that the water may gently simmer, and be very careful that it does not boil fast, or the meat will be hard. Skim well, add a little salt, and in about two and a quarter hours after the water begins to simmer, moderate-sized leg of mutton will be done. Serve with carrots and mashed turnips, which may be boiled with the meat, and send caper sauce, no. 382, to table with it in a tureen. Time. A moderate-sized leg of mutton of 9 pounds, 2 and a quarter hours after the water boils, 1 of 12 pounds, 3 hours. Average cost, 8 minus 1 divided by 2d. Per lb. Sufficient. A moderate-sized leg of mutton for 6 or 8 persons. Seasonable nearly all the year, but not so good in June, July, and August. Note. When meat is liked very thoroughly cooked, allow more time than stated above. The liquor this joint was boiled in should be converted into soup. The Good Shepherd. The sheep's complete dependence upon the shepherd for protection from its numerous enemies is frequently referred to in the Bible, thus the psalmist likens himself to a lost sheep, and prays the Almighty to seek his servant. And our Savior, when dispatching his twelve chosen disciples to preach the gospel amongst their unbelieving brethren, compares them to lambs going amongst wolves. The shepherd of the East, by kind treatment, calls forth from his sheep unmistakable signs of affection. The sheep obey his voice and recognize the names by which he calls them, and they follow him in and out of the fold. The beautiful figure of the Good Shepherd, which so often occurs in the New Testament, expresses the tenderness of the Saviour for mankind. The Good Shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. John, x. 11. I am the Good Shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known by mine. John, x. 14. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. John, x. 16. Boned leg of mutton stuffed. Ingredients. A small leg of mutton, weighing six or seven pounds, forcemeat, number 417, two shallots finely minced. Mode. Make a forcemeat by recipe number 417, to which add two finely minced shallots. Bone the leg of mutton, without spoiling the skin, and cut off a great deal of the fat. Fill the hole up whence the bone was taken, with the forcemeat, and sew it up underneath, to prevent its falling out. Bind and tie it up compactly, and roast it before a nice clear fire for about two and a half hours or rather longer, remove the tape and send it to table with a good gravy. It may be glazed or not, as preferred. Time. Two and a half hours, or rather longer. Average cost, fours. 8d. 
sufficient for six or seven persons. Seasonable at any time. Braised fillet of mutton with French beans. Ingredients. The chump end of a loin of mutton, buttered paper, French beans, a little glaze, one pint of gravy. Mode. Roll up the mutton in a piece of buttered paper, roast it for two hours, and do not allow it to acquire the least color. Have ready some French beans, boiled, and drained on a sieve, remove the paper from the mutton, glaze it. Just heat up the beans in the gravy, and lay them on the dish with the meat over them. The remainder of the gravy may be strained, and sent to table in a tureen. Time. 2 hours. Average cost, 8 minus 1 divided by 2d. Per lb. Sufficient for 4 or 5 persons. Seasonable at any time. Various qualities of mutton. Mutton is, undoubtedly, the meat most generally used in families. And, both by connoisseurs and medical men, it stands first in favor, whether it's the favor, digestible qualifications, or general wholesomeness, be considered. Of all mutton, that furnished by South Down sheep is the most highly esteemed. It is also the dearest, on account of its scarcity, and the great demand of it. Therefore, if the housekeeper is told by the butcher that he has not any in his shop, it should not occasion disappointment to the purchaser. The London and other markets are chiefly supplied with sheep called half-breeds, which are a cross between the Down and Lincoln or Leicester. These half-breeds make a greater weight of mutton than the true South Downs, and, for this very desirable qualification, they are preferred by the great sheepmasters. The legs of this mutton range from 7 to 11 pounds, in weight. The shoulders, necks, or loins, about 6 to 9 pounds, and if care is taken not to purchase it, the shoulders, necks, or loins, about 8 to 9 pounds. And if cure is taken not to purchase it too fat, it will be found the most satisfactory and economical mutton that can be bought. Braised Leg of Mutton Ingredients One small leg of mutton, four carrots, three onions, one faggot of savory herbs, a bunch of parsley, seasoning to taste of pepper and salt, a few slices of bacon, a few veal trimmings, one half pint of gravy or water. Mode Line the bottom of a braising pan with a few slices of bacon, put in the carrots, onions, herbs, parsley, and seasoning, and over these place the mutton. Cover the whole with a few more slices of bacon and the veal trimmings, pour in the gravy or water, and stew very gently for four hours. Strain the gravy, reduce it to a glaze over a sharp fire, glaze the mutton with it, and send it to table, placed on a dish of white haricot beans boiled tender, or garnished with glazed onions. Time. Four hours. Average cost, fives. Sufficient for six or seven persons. Seasonable at any time. The Order of the Golden Fleece. This order of knighthood was founded by Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy, in 1429, on the day of his marriage with the Princess Isabella of Portugal. The number of the members was originally fixed at 31, including the sovereign, as the head and chief of the institution. In 1516, Pope Leo X consented to increase the number to 52, including the head. In 1700 the German Emperor Charles VI and King Philip of Spain both laid claim to the order. The former, however, on leaving Spain, which he could not maintain by force of arms, took with him, to Vienna, the archives of the order, the inauguration of which he solemnized there in 1713, with great magnificence. But Philip V. of Spain declared himself Grand Master, and formally protested, at the Congress of Cambrai, 1721, against the pretensions of the Emperor. The dispute, though subsequently settled by the intercession of France, England, and Holland, was frequently renewed, until the order was tacitly introduced into both countries. And it now passes by the respective names of the Spanish or Austrian Order of the Golden Fleece according to the country where it is issued. An excellent way to cook a breast of mutton. Ingredients Breast of mutton, two onions, salt and pepper to taste, flour, a bunch of savory herbs, green peas. Mode Cut the mutton into pieces about two inches square, 
and let it be tolerably lean. Put it into a stew pan, with a little fat or butter, and fry it of a nice brown, then dredge in a little flour, slice the onions, and put it with the herbs in the stew pan. Pour in sufficient water just to cover the meat, and simmer the whole gently until the mutton is tender. Take out the meat, strain, and skim off all the fat from the gravy, and put both the meat and gravy back into the stew pan. Add about a quart of young green peas, and let them boil gently until done. Two or three slices of bacon added and stewed with the mutton give additional flavor. And, to ensure the peas being a beautiful green color, they may be boiled in water separately, and added to the stew at the moment of serving. Time. Two and a half hours. Average cost, 6d. Per lb. Sufficient for four or five persons. Seasonable from June to August. Names of animals Saxon, and of their flesh Norman. The names of all our domestic animals are of Saxon origin. But it is curious to observe that Norman names have been given to the different sorts of flesh which these animals yield. How beautifully this illustrates the relative position of Saxon and Norman after the conquest. The Saxon hind had the charge of tending and feeding the domestic animals, but only that they might appear on the table of his Norman lord. Thus, ox, steer, cow, are Saxon, but beef is Norman, calf is Saxon, but veal Norman. Sheep is Saxon, but mutton Norman, so it is severally with deer and venison, swine and pork, fowl and pullet. Bacon, the only flesh which, perhaps, ever came within his reach, is the single exception. Broiled mutton and tomato sauce, cold meat cookery. Ingredients A few slices of cold mutton, tomato sauce, number 529. Mode Cut some nice slices from a cold leg or shoulder of mutton. Season them with pepper and salt, and broil over a clear fire. Make some tomato sauce by recipe number 529, pour it over the mutton, and serve. This makes an excellent dish, and must be served very hot. Time about five minutes to broil the mutton. Seasonable in September and October, when tomatoes are plentiful and seasonable. Shepherds and their flocks. The shepherd's crook is older than either the husbandman's plow or the warrior's sword. We are told that Abel was a keeper of sheep. Many passages in Holy Writ enable us to appreciate the pastoral riches of the first Eastern nations. And we can form an idea of the number of their flocks, when we read that Jacob gave the children of Hammer a hundred sheep for the price of a field, and that the king of Israel received a hundred thousand every year from the king of Moab. His tributary, and a like number of rams covered with their fleece. The tendency which most sheep have to ramble, renders it necessary for them to be attended by a shepherd. To keep a flock within bounds, is no easy task, but the watchful shepherd manages to accomplish it without harassing the sheep. In the highlands of Scotland, where the herbage is scanty, the sheep farm requires to be very large, and to be watched over by many shepherds. The farms of some of the great Scottish landowners are of enormous extent. How many sheep have you on your estate? asked Prince Esterhazy of the Duke of Argyll. I have not the most remote idea, replied the Duke, but I know the shepherds number several thousands. Broiled Mutton Chops Ingredients Loin of mutton, pepper and salt, a small piece of butter. Mode. Cut the chops from a well-hung tender loin of mutton, remove a portion of the fat, and trim them into a nice shape, slightly beat and level them. Place the gridiron over a bright clear fire, rub the bars with a little fat, and lay on the chops. Whilst broiling, frequently turn them, and in about eight minutes they will be done. Season with pepper and salt. Dish them on a very hot dish, rub a small piece of butter on each chop, and serve very hot and expeditiously. Time. About 8 minutes. Average cost, 10d. Per lb. Sufficient. Allow one chop to each person. Seasonable at any time. China Chilo. Ingredients. One and a half pounds, of leg, loin, or neck of mutton. 2 onions, 2 lettuces, 1 pint of green peas, 
one teaspoonful of salt, one teaspoonful of pepper, one quarter pint of water, a quarter pound of clarified butter. When liked, a little cayenne. Mode. Mince the above quantity of undressed leg, loin, or neck of mutton, adding a little of the fat, also minced. Put it into a stew pan with the remaining ingredients, previously shredding the lettuce and onion rather fine, closely cover the stew pan, after the ingredients have been well stirred, and simmer gently for rather more than two hours. Serve in a dish, with a border of rice round, the same as for curry. Time. Rather more than two hours. Average cost, ones. 6D. Sufficient for three or four persons. Seasonable from June to August. Curried mutton, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of any joint of cold mutton, two onions, a quarter pound, of butter, one dessert spoonful of curry powder, one dessert spoonful of flour, salt to taste, one quarter pint of stock or water. Mode. Slice the onions in thin rings, and put them into a stew pan with the butter, and fry of a light brown, stir in the curry powder, flour, and salt, and mix all well together. Cut the meat into nice thin slices, if there is not sufficient to do this, it may be minced, and add it to the other ingredients, when well browned, add the stock or gravy, and stew gently for about half an hour. Serve in a dish with a border of boiled rice, the same as for other curries. Time. Half an hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 6D. Seasonable in winter. Cutlets of cold mutton, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of cold loin or neck of mutton, one egg, bread crumbs, brown gravy, number 436, or tomato sauce, number 529. Mode. Cut the remains of cold loin or neck of mutton into cutlets, trim them, and take away a portion of the fat, should there be too much, dip them in beaten egg, and sprinkle with bread crumbs, and fry them a nice brown in hot dripping. Arrange them on a dish, and pour round them either a good gravy or hot tomato sauce. Time. About 7 minutes. Seasonable. Tomatoes to be had most reasonably in September and October. Dormers. Ingredients. Half a pound, of cold mutton, two ounces. Of beef suet, pepper and salt to taste, three ounces of boiled rice, one egg, bread crumbs, made gravy. Mode. Chop the meat, suet, and rice finely, mix well together, and add a high seasoning of pepper and salt, and roll into sausages. Cover them with egg and bread crumbs, and fry in hot dripping of a nice brown. Serve in a dish with made gravy poured round them, and a little in a tureen. Time. Half an hour to fry the sausages. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 6D. Seasonable at any time. The Golden Fleece. The ancient fable of the Golden Fleece may be thus briefly told, Phrixus, a son of Athamas, king of Thebes, to escape the persecutions of his stepmother Eno, paid a visit to his friend Eats, king of Colchis. A ram, whose fleece was of pure gold, carried the youth through the air in a most obliging manner to the court of his friend. When safe at Colchis, Phrixus offered the ram on the altars of Mars, and pocketed the fleece. The king received him with great kindness, and gave him his daughter Chalciope in marriage, but, some time after, he murdered him in order to obtain possession of the precious fleece. The murder of Phrixus was amply revenged by the Greeks. It gave rise to the famous Argonautic expedition, undertaken by Jason and fifty of the most celebrated heroes of Greece. The Argonauts recovered the fleece by the help of the celebrated sorceress Medea, daughter of Eats, who fell desperately in love with the gallant but faithless Jason. In the story of the voyage of the Argo, a substratum of truth probably exists, though overlaid by a mass of fiction. The ram which carried Phrixus to Colchis is by some supposed to have been the name of the ship in which he embarked. The fleece of gold is thought to represent the immense treasures he bore away from Thebes. The alchemists of the 15th century were firmly convinced that the Golden Fleece was a treatise on the transmutation of metals, written on sheepskin. Harico Mutton. I.
Ingredients 4 pounds, of the middle or best end of the neck of mutton, 3 carrots, 3 turnips, 3 onions, popper and salt to taste, 1 tablespoonful of ketchup or Harvey's sauce. Mode Trim off some of the fat, cut the mutton into rather thin chops, and put them into a frying pan with the fat trimmings. Fry of a pale brown, but do not cook them enough for eating. Cut the carrots and turnips into dice, and the onions into slices, and slightly fry them in the same fat that the mutton was browned in, but do not allow them to take any color. Now lay the mutton at the bottom of a stew pan, then the vegetables, and pour over them just sufficient boiling water to cover the whole. Give one boil, skim well, and then set the pan on the side of the fire to simmer gently until the meat is tender. Skim off every particle of fat, add a seasoning of pepper and salt, and a little ketchup, and serve. This dish is very much better if made the day before it is wanted for table, as the fat can be so much more easily removed when the gravy is cold. This should be particularly attended to, as it is apt to be rather rich and greasy if eaten the same day it is made. It should be served in rather a deep dish. Time. Two and a half hours to simmer gently. Average cost, for this quantity, threes. Sufficient for six or seven persons. Seasonable at any time. 2. Ingredients. Breast or scrag of mutton, flour, pepper and salt to taste, one large onion, three cloves, a bunch of savory herbs, one blade of mace, carrots and turnips, sugar. Mode. Cut the mutton into square pieces, and fry them a nice color. Then dredge over them a little flour and a seasoning of pepper and salt. Put all into a stew pan, and moisten with boiling water, adding the onion, stuck with three cloves, the mace, and herbs. Simmer gently till the meat is nearly done, skim off all the fat, and then add the carrots and turnips, which should previously be cut in dice and fried in a little sugar to color them. Let the whole simmer again for ten minutes. Take out the onion and bunch of herbs, and serve. Time. About 3 hours to simmer. Average cost, 6d. Per lb. Sufficient for 4 or 5 persons. Seasonable at any time. Harico mutton, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of cold neck or loin of mutton, 2 ounces. Of butter, 3 onions, 1 dessert spoonful of flour, 1 half pint of good gravy, pepper and salt to taste, 2 tablespoonfuls of port wine, 1 tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup, 2 carrots, 2 turnips, 1 head of celery. Mode. Cut the cold mutton into moderate sized chops, and take off the fat, slice the onions, and fry them with the chops, in a little butter, of a nice brown color, stir in the flour, add the gravy, and let it stew gently nearly an hour. In the meantime boil the vegetables until nearly tender, slice them, and add them to the mutton about a quarter hour before it is to be served. Season with pepper and salt, add the ketchup and port wine, give one boil, and serve. Time. 1 hour. Average cost, exclusive of the cold meat, 9d. Seasonable at any time. Hashed mutton. Ingredients. The remains of cold roast shoulder or leg of mutton, six whole peppers, six whole allspice, a faggot of savory herbs, one half head of celery, one onion, two ounces of butter, flour. Mode. Cut the meat in nice even slices from the bones, trimming off all superfluous fat and gristle, chop the bones and fragments of the joint, put them into a stew pan with the pepper, spice, herbs, and celery, cover with water, and simmer for one hour. Slice and fry the onion of a nice pale brown color, dredge in a little flour to make it thick, and add this to the bones, and stew for a quarter hour, strain the gravy, and let it cool. Then skim off every particle of fat, and put it, with the meat, into a stew pan. Flavor with ketchup, Harvey's sauce, tomato sauce, or any flavoring that may be preferred, and let the meat gradually warm through, but not boil, or it will harden. To hash meat properly, it should be laid in cold gravy, and only left on the fire just long enough to warm through. Time. 
one and a half hour to simmer the gravy. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 4D. Seasonable at any time. Hashed mutton. Many persons express a decided aversion to hashed mutton, and, doubtless, this dislike has arisen from the fact that they have unfortunately never been properly served with this dish. If properly done, however, the meat tender, it ought to be as tender as when first roasted, the gravy abundant and well-flavored, and the sippets nicely toasted, and the whole served neatly. Then, hashed mutton is by no means to be despised, and is infinitely more wholesome and appetizing than the cold leg or shoulder, of which fathers and husbands, and their bachelor friends, stand in such natural awe. Hodgepodge, Cold Meat Cookery Ingredients About one pound, of underdone cold mutton, two lettuces, one pint of green peas, five or six green onions, two ounces of butter, pepper and salt to taste, one half teacupful of water. Mode Mince the mutton and cut up the lettuces and onions in slices. Put these in a stew pan, with all the ingredients except the peas, and let these simmer very gently for three quarters hour, keeping them well stirred. Boil the peas separately, mix these with the mutton, and serve very hot. Time. Three quarters hour. Sufficient for three or four persons. Seasonable from the end of May to August. Irish stew. I. Ingredients. 3 pounds, of the loin or neck of mutton, 5 pounds, of potatoes, 5 large onions, pepper and salt to taste, rather more than 1 pint of water. Mode. Trim off some of the fat of the above quantity of loin or neck of mutton, and cut it into chops of a moderate thickness. Pair and have the potatoes, and cut the onions into thick slices. Put a layer of potatoes at the bottom of a stew pan, then a layer of mutton and onions, and season with pepper and salt, proceed in this manner until the stew pan is full, taking care to have plenty of vegetables at the top. Pour in the water, and let it stew very gently for two and a half hours, keeping the lid of the stew pan closely shut the whole time, and occasionally shaking it to prevent its burning. Time. Two and a half hours. Average cost, for this quantity, twos. 8d. Sufficient for five or six persons. Seasonable. More suitable for a winter dish. 2. Ingredients. 2 or 3 pounds, of the breast of mutton, 1 and a half pint of water, salt and pepper to taste, 4 pounds, of potatoes, 4 large onions. Mode. Put the mutton into a stew pan with the water and a little salt, and let it stew gently for an hour. Cut the meat into small pieces, skim the fat from the gravy, and pare and slice the potatoes and onions. Put all the ingredients into the stew pan in layers, first a layer of vegetables, then one of meat, and sprinkle seasoning of pepper and salt between each layer. Cover closely, and let the whole stew very gently for one hour of rather more, shaking it frequently to prevent its burning. Time. Rather more than two hours. Average cost. 1s, 6d. Sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable. Suitable for a winter dish. Note. Irish stew may be prepared in the same manner as above, but baked in a jar instead of boiled. About 2 hours or rather more in a moderate oven will be sufficient time to bake it. Italian mutton cutlets. Ingredients. About 3 pounds. Of the neck of mutton, clarified butter, the yolk of one egg, four tablespoonfuls of bread crumbs, one tablespoonful of minced savory herbs, one tablespoonful of minced parsley, one teaspoonful of minced shallot, one salt spoonful of finely chopped lemon peel. Pepper, salt and pounded mace to taste, flour, one half pint of hot broth or water, two teaspoonfuls of Harvey's sauce, one teaspoonful of soy, two teaspoonfuls of tarragon vinegar, 1 tablespoonful of port wine. Mode. Cut the mutton into nicely shaped cutlets, flatten them, and trim off some of the fat, dip them in clarified butter, and then, into the beaten yolk of an egg. Mix well together bread crumbs, herbs, parsley, shallot, lemon peel, and seasoning in the above proportion, and cover the cutlets with these ingredients. 
melt some butter in a frying pan, lay in the cutlets, and fry them a nice brown. Take them out and keep them hot before the fire. Dredge some flour into the pan, and if there is not sufficient butter, add a little more, stir till it looks brown, then pour in the hot broth or water, and the remaining ingredients. Give one boil, and pour round the cutlets. If the gravy should not be thick enough, add a little more flour. Mushrooms, when obtainable, are a great improvement to this dish, and when not in season, mushroom powder may be substituted for them. Time. 10 minutes, rather longer, should the cutlets be very thick. Average cost, twos. 9d. Sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable at any time. The downs. The well-known substance chalk, which the chemist regards as a nearly pure carbonate of lime, and the microscopist as an aggregation of inconceivably minute shells and corals, forms the subsoil of the hilly districts of the southeast of England. The chalk hills known as the South Downs start from the bold promontory of Beachy Head, traverse the county of Sussex from east to west, and pass through Hampshire into Surrey. The North Downs extend from Godalming, by Godstone, into Kent, and terminate in the line of cliffs which stretches from Dover to Ramsgate. The downs are clothed with short verdant turf. But the layer of soil which rests upon the chalk is too thin to support trees and shrubs. The hills have rounded summits, and their smooth, undulated outlines are unbroken save by the sepulchral monuments of the early inhabitants of the country. The coombs and furrows, which ramify and extend into deep valleys, appear like dried-up channels of streams and rivulets. From time immemorial, immense flocks of sheep have been reared on these downs. The herbage of these hills is remarkably nutritious. And whilst the natural healthiness of the climate, consequent on the dryness of the air and the moderate elevation of the land, is eminently favorable to rearing a superior race of sheep. The arable land in the immediate neighborhood of the downs affords the means of a supply of other food, when the natural produce of the hills fails. The mutton of the South Down breed of sheep is highly valued for its delicate flavor, and the wool for its fineness. But the best specimens of this breed, when imported from England into the West Indies, become miserably lean in the course of a year or two, and their woolly fleece gives place to a covering of short, crisp, brownish hair. Broiled kidneys a breakfast or supper dish. Ingredients Sheep kidneys, pepper and salt to taste. Mode Ascertain that the kidneys are fresh, and cut them open very evenly, lengthwise, down to the root, for should one half be thicker than the other, one would be underdone whilst the other would be dried, but do not separate them. Skin them, and pass a skewer under the white part of each half to keep them flat, and broil over a nice clear fire, Placing the inside downwards, turn them when done enough on one side, and cook them on the other. Remove the skewers, place the kidneys on a very hot dish, season with pepper and salt, and put a tiny piece of butter in the middle of each, serve very hot and quickly, and send very hot plates to table. Time 6 to 8 minutes. Average cost 1 minus 1 divided by 2d. Each. Sufficient. Allow one for each person. Seasonable at any time. Note. A prettier dish than the above may be made by serving the kidneys each on a piece of buttered toast out in any fanciful shape. In this case a little lemon juice will be found an improvement. Illustration, Kidneys. Fried Kidneys. Ingredients. Kidneys, butter, pepper and salt to taste. Mode. Cut the kidneys open without quite dividing them, remove the skin, and put a small piece of butter in the frying pan. When the butter is melted, lay in the kidneys the flat side downwards, and fry them for 7 or 8 minutes, turning them when they are half done. Serve on a piece of dry toast, season with pepper and salt, and put a small piece of butter in each kidney. Pour the gravy from the pan over them, and serve very hot. Time. 7 or 8 minutes. Average cost, 1 minus 1 divided by 2d. Each. Sufficient. Allow 1 kidney to each person. Seasonable at any time. Roast haunch of mutton. 
Illustration, Haunch of Mutton Ingredients Haunch of mutton, a little salt, flour Mode Let this joint hang as long as possible without becoming tainted, and while hanging dust flour over it, which keeps off the flies, and prevents the air from getting to it. If not well hung, the joint, when it comes to table, will neither do credit to the butcher or the cook, as it will not be tender. Wash the outside well, lest it should have a bad flavor from keeping. Then flour it and put it down to a nice brisk fire, at some distance, so that it may gradually warm through. Keep continually basting, and about half an hour before it is served, draw it nearer to the fire to get nicely brown. Sprinkle a little fine salt over the meat, pour off the dripping, add a little boiling water slightly salted, and strain this over the joint. Place a paper rouge on the bone, and send red currant jelly and gravy in a tureen to table with it. Time. About 4 hours. Average cost, 10 d. Per lb. Sufficient for 8 to 10 persons. Seasonable. In best season from September to March. How to buy meat economically. If the housekeeper is not very particular as to the precise joints to cook for dinner, there is oftentimes an opportunity for her to save as much money in her purchases of meat as will pay for the bread to eat with it. It often occurs, for instance, that the butcher may have a superfluity of certain joints, and these he would be glad to get rid of at a reduction of sometimes as much as 1d. Or 1 minus 1 divided by 2d. Per pound, and thus, in a joint of 8 or 9 pounds. Will be saved enough to buy two quartern loaves. It frequently happens with many butchers, that, in consequence of a demand for legs and loins of mutton, they have only shoulders left, and these they will be glad to sell at a reduction. Roast Leg of Mutton Illustration, Leg of Mutton Ingredients Leg of mutton, a little salt. Mode As mutton, when freshly killed, is never tender, hang it almost as long as it will keep. Flour it, and put it in a cool airy place for a few days, if the weather will permit. Wash off the flour, wipe it very dry, and cut off the shank bone. Put it down to a brisk clear fire, dredge with flour, and keep continually basting the whole time it is cooking. About 20 minutes before serving, draw it near the fire to get nicely brown. Sprinkle over it a little salt, dish the meat, pour off the dripping, add some boiling water slightly salted, strain it over the joint, and serve. Time A leg of mutton weighing 10 pounds, about 2 and a quarter or 2 and a half hours, one of 7 pounds. About 2 hours, or rather less. Average cost, 8 minus 1 divided by 2d. Per lb. Sufficient. A moderate-sized leg of mutton sufficient for 6 or 8 persons. Seasonable at any time, but not so good in June, July, and August. Roast loin of mutton. Ingredients. Loin of mutton, a little salt. Mode. Cut and trim off the superfluous fat, and see that the butcher joints the meat properly, as thereby much annoyance is saved to the carver, when it comes to table. Have ready a nice clear fire, it need not be a very wide large one, put down the meat, dredge with flour, and baste well until it is done. Make the gravy as for roast leg of mutton, and serve very hot. Illustration, Loin of Mutton Time a loin of mutton weighing 6 pounds, 1 and a half hour, or rather longer. Average cost, 8 minus 1 divided by 2d. Per pound sufficient for 4 or 5 persons. Seasonable at any time. Rolled loin of mutton, very excellent. Ingredients. About 6 pounds. Of a loin of mutton, 1 half teaspoonful of pepper, 1 quarter teaspoonful of pounded allspice, 1 quarter teaspoonful of mace, 1 quarter teaspoonful of nutmeg, 6 cloves, forcemeat number 417, 1 glass of port wine, 2 tablespoonfuls of mushroom ketchup. Mode. Hang the mutton till tender, bone it, and sprinkle over it pepper, mace, cloves, allspice, and nutmeg in the above proportion, all of which must be pounded very fine. Let it remain for a day, then make a forcemeat by recipe no. 417, 
cover the meat with it, and roll and bind it up firmly. Half bake it in a slow oven, let it grow cold, take off the fat, and put the gravy into a stew pan, flour the meat, put it in the gravy, and stew it till perfectly tender. Now take out the meat, unbind it, add to the gravy wine and ketchup as above, give one boil, and pour over the meat. Serve with red currant jelly. And, if obtainable, a few mushrooms stewed for a few minutes in the gravy, will be found a great improvement. Time. One and a half hour to bake the meat, one and a half hour to stew gently. Average cost, fours. 9d, sufficient for five or six persons. Seasonable at any time. Note. This joint will be found very nice if rolled and stuffed, as here directed, and plainly roasted. It should be well basted, and served with a good gravy in currant jelly. Boiled neck of mutton. Ingredients. For pounds, of the middle, or best end of the neck of mutton, a little salt. Mode. Trim off a portion of the fat, should there be too much, and if it is to look particularly nice, the chine bone should be sawn down, the rib stripped halfway down, and the ends of the bones chopped off, this is, however, not necessary. Put the meat into sufficient boiling water to cover it, when it boils, add a little salt and remove all the scum. Draw the saucepan to the side of the fire, and let the water get so cool that the finger may be borne in it. Then simmer very slowly and gently until the meat is done, which will be in about one and a half hour, or rather more, reckoning from the time that it begins to simmer. Serve with turnips and caper sauce, number 382, and pour a little of it over the meat. The turnips should be boiled with the mutton, and, when at hand, a few carrots will also be found an improvement. These, however, if very large and thick, must be cut into long thinnish pieces, or they will not be sufficiently done by the time the mutton is ready. Garnish the dish with carrots and turnips placed alternately round the mutton. Time. 4 pounds. Of the neck of mutton, about one and a half hour. Average cost, eight and a half d per lb. Sufficient for six or seven persons. Seasonable at any time. The poets on sheep. The keeping of flocks seems to have been the first employment of mankind. And the most ancient sort of poetry was probably pastoral. The poem known as the pastoral gives a picture of the life of the simple shepherds of the golden age, who are supposed to have beguiled their time in singing. In all pastorals, repeated allusions are made to the fleecy flocks, the milk-white lambs, and the tender ewes, indeed, the sheep occupy a position in these poems inferior only to that of the shepherds who tend them. That nibbling sheep has ever been a favorite of the poets, and has supplied them with figures and similes without end. Shakespeare frequently compares men to sheep. When Gloucester rudely drives the lieutenant from the side of Henry VI. The poor king thus touchingly speaks of his helplessness. So flies the reckless shepherd from the wolf. So first the harmless sheep doth yield his fleece. And next his throat, unto the butcher's knife. In the, Two Gentlemen of Verona, we meet with the following. Humorous comparison. Proteus. The sheep for fodder follow the shepherd, the shepherd for food follows not the sheep, thou for wages followest thy master, thy master for wages follows not thee, therefore, thou art a sheep. Speed. Such another proof will make me cry ba. The descriptive poets give us some charming pictures of sheep. Every one is familiar with the sheep shearing scene in Thompson's. Seasons. Heavy and dripping, to the breezy brow. Slow move the harmless race. Where, as they spread. Their dwelling treasures to the sunny ray. Inly disturbed, and wondering what this wild. Outrageous tumult means, their loud complaints. The country fill. And, tossed from rock to rock. Incessant bleedings run around the hills. What an exquisite idea of stillness is conveyed in the oft quoted line from Gray's Elegy. And drowsy tinklings lull the distant fold. From Dyer's quaint poem of The Fleece, we could cull a hundred passages relating to sheep, but we have already exceeded our space. 
We cannot, however, close this brief notice of the allusions that have been made to sheep by our poets, without quoting a couple of verses from Robert Burns's Elegy on Poor Mylai, his only petio. Through uh, the town she trolled by him. A lang half mile she could descry him. Why, kindly bleat, when she did spy him. She ran white speed. A friend mare faithful ne'er cam nigh him. Then my lie dead. I what she was a sheep o oh, sense. And could behave herself why mense. I'll sate, she never brack offence. Through thievish greed. Our bard I, lanely, keeps the spence. Sin, Maley's dead. Mutton collops, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. A few slices of a cold leg or loin of mutton, salt and pepper to taste, one blade of pounded mace, one small bunch of savory herbs minced very fine, two or three shallots, two or three ounces. Of butter, one dessertspoonful of flour, one half pint of gravy, one tablespoonful of lemon juice. Mode. Cut some very thin slices from a leg or the chump end of a loin of mutton. Sprinkle them with pepper, salt, pounded mace, minced savory herbs, and minced shallot, fry them in butter, stir in a dessert spoonful of flour, add the gravy and lemon juice, simmer very gently about five or seven minutes, and serve immediately. Time. Five to seven minutes. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 6d. Seasonable at any time. Illustration, mutton cutlets. Mutton cutlets with mashed potatoes. Ingredients. About three pounds. Of the best end of the neck of mutton, salt and pepper to taste, mashed potatoes. Mode. Procure a well-hung neck of mutton, saw off about three inches of the top of the bones, and cut the cutlets of a moderate thickness. Shape them by chopping off the thick part of the chine bone, beat them flat with a cutlet chopper, and scrape quite clean, a portion of the top of the bone. Broil them over a nice clear fire for about seven or eight minutes, and turn them frequently. Have ready some smoothly mashed white potatoes, place these in the middle of the dish, when the cutlets are done, season with pepper and salt. Arrange them round the potatoes, with the thick end of the cutlets downwards, and serve very hot and quickly. See colored plate. Time. Seven or eight minutes. Average cost, for this quantity, twos. 4D. Sufficient for five or six persons. Seasonable at any time. Note. Cutlets may be served in various ways, with peas, tomatoes, onions, sauce picante, and k. Mutton pie, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of a cold leg, loin, or neck of mutton, pepper and salt to taste, two blades of pounded mace, one dessert spoonful of chopped parsley, one teaspoonful of minced savory herbs, when liked, a little minced onion or shallot. Three or four potatoes, one teacupful of gravy, crust. Mode. Cold mutton may be made into very good pies if well seasoned and mixed with a few herbs, if the leg is used, cut it into very thin slices, if the loin or neck, into thin cutlets. Place some at the bottom of the dish, season well with pepper, salt, mace, parsley, and herbs, then put a layer of potatoes sliced, then more mutton, and so on till the dish is full, add the gravy, cover with a crust, and bake for one hour. Time. One hour. Seasonable at any time. Note. The remains of an underdone leg of mutton may be converted into a very good family pudding, by cutting the meat into slices, and putting them into a basin lined with a suet crust. It should be seasoned well with pepper, salt, and minced shallot, covered with a crust, and boiled for about three hours. Mutton Pie Ingredients 2 pounds, of the neck or loin of mutton, weighed after being boned. 2 kidneys, pepper and salt to taste, 2 teacupfuls of gravy or water, 2 tablespoonfuls of minced parsley, when liked, a little minced onion or shallot, puff crust. Mode. Bone the mutton, and cut the meat into steaks all of the same thickness, and leave but very little fat. 
cut up the kidneys, and arrange these with the meat neatly in a pie dish. Sprinkle over them the minced parsley and a seasoning of pepper and salt, pour in the gravy, and cover with a tolerably good puff crust. Bake for one and a half hour, or rather longer, should the pie be very large, and let the oven be rather brisk. A well-made suet crust may be used instead of puff crust, and will be found exceedingly good. Time. One and a half hour, or rather longer. Average cost, twos. Sufficient for six or six persons. Seasonable at any time. Mutton pudding. Ingredients. About two pounds, of the chump end of the loin of mutton, weighed after being boned, pepper and salt to taste, suet crust made with milk, sea pastry, in the proportion of six ounces of suet to each pound of flour. A very small quantity of minced onion, this may be omitted when the flavor is not liked. Mode. Cut the meat into rather thin slices, and season them with pepper and salt, line the pudding dish with crust. Lay in the meat, and nearly, but do not quite, fill it up with water, when the flavor is liked, add a small quantity of minced onion, cover with crust, and proceed in the same manner as directed in recipe no. 605, using the same kind of pudding dish as there mentioned. Time. About 3 hours. Average cost, 1s. 9d. Sufficient for 6 persons. Seasonable all the year, but more suitable in winter. Ragu of cold neck of mutton, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of a cold neck or loin of mutton, 2 ounces of butter, a little flour, 2 onions sliced, 1 quarter pint of water, 2 small carrots, 2 turnips, pepper and salt to taste. Mode. Cut the mutton into small chops, and trim off the greater portion of the fat, put the butter into a stew pan, dredge in a little flour, add the sliced onions, and keep stirring till brown, then put in the meat. When this is quite brown, add the water, and the carrots and turnips, which should be cut into very thin slices, season with pepper and salt, and stew till quite tender, which will be in about three quarters hour. When in season, green peas may be substituted for the carrots and turnips, they should be piled in the center of the dish, and the chops laid round. Time. Three quarters hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 4d. Seasonable, with peas, from June to August. Roast neck of mutton. Illustration, neck of mutton 1 to 2. Best end. 2 to 3, scrag. Ingredients. Neck of mutton, a little salt. Mode. For roasting, choose the middle, or the best end, of the neck of mutton, and if there is a very large proportion of fat, trim off some of it, and save it for making into suet puddings, which will be found exceedingly good. Let the bones be cut short and see that it is properly jointed before it is laid down to the fire, as they will be more easily separated when they come to table. Place the joint at a nice brisk fire, dredge it with flour, and keep continually basting until done. A few minutes before serving, draw it nearer the, the fire to acquire a nice color, sprinkle over it a little salt, pour off the dripping, add a little boiling water slightly salted, strain this over the meat and serve. Red currant jelly may be sent to table with it. Time. For pounds, of the neck of mutton, rather more than one hour. Average cost, 8 minus 1 divided by 2d. Per lb. Sufficient for 4 or 5 persons. Seasonable at any time. Woolen manufactures. The distinction between hair and wool is rather arbitrary than natural, consisting in the greater or less degrees of fineness, softness, and pliability of the fibers. When the fibers possess these properties so far as to admit of their being spun and woven into a texture sufficiently pliable to be used as an article of dress, they are called wool. The sheep, llama, angora goat, and the goat of Thibet, are the animals from which most of the wool used in manufactures is obtained. The finest of all wools is that from the goat of Thibet, of which the Kashmir shawls are made. Of European wools, the finest is that yielded by the Merino sheep, the Spanish and Saxon breeds taking the precedence. The Merino sheep, as now naturalized in Australia, furnishes an excellent fleece. 
but all varieties of sheep wool, reared either in Europe or Australia are inferior in softness of feel to that grown in India, and to that of the Lama of the Andes. The best of our British wools are inferior in fineness to any of the above mentioned, being nearly twelve times the thickness of the finest Spanish merino, but for the ordinary purposes of the manufacturer, they are unrivaled. Roast Saddle of Mutton Illustration, Saddle of Mutton Ingredients Saddle of Mutton, A Little Salt Mode To ensure this joint being tender, let it hang for ten days or a fortnight, if the weather permits. Cut off the tail and flaps and trim away every part that has not indisputable pretensions to be eaten, and have the skin taken off and skewered on again. Put it down to a bright, clear fire, and, when the joint has been cooking for an hour, remove the skin and dredge it with flour. It should not be placed too near the fire, as the fat should not be in the slightest degree burnt. Keep constantly basting, both before and after the skin is removed, sprinkle some salt over the joint. Make a little gravy in the dripping pan, pour it over the meat, which send to table with a tureen of made gravy and red currant jelly. Time A saddle of mutton weighing 10 pounds, 2 and a half hours, 14 pounds, 3 and a quarter hours. When liked underdone, allow rather less time. Average cost, 10 d. Per lb. Sufficient. A moderate-sized saddle of 10 pounds for 7 or 8 persons. Seasonable all the year. Not so good when lamb is in full season. Roast shoulder of mutton. Ingredients. Shoulder of mutton, a little salt. Mode. Put the joint down to a bright, clear fire, flour it well, and keep continually basting. About a quarter hour before serving, draw it near the fire that the outside may acquire a nice brown color, but not sufficiently near to blacken the fat. Sprinkle a little fine salt over the meat, empty the dripping pan of its contents, pour in a little boiling water slightly salted, and strain this over the joint. Onion sauce, or stewed Spanish onions, are usually sent to table with this dish, and sometimes baked potatoes. Time A shoulder of mutton weighing 6 or 7 pounds, 1 and a half hour. Average cost, 8d. Per lb. Sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable at any time. Note. Shoulder of mutton may be dressed in a variety of ways, boiled, and served with onion sauce, boned, and stuffed with a good veal forcemeat, or baked, with sliced potatoes in the dripping pan. The Ettrick Shepherd. James Hogg was perhaps the most remarkable man that ever wore the maud of a shepherd. Under the garb, aspect, and bearing of a rude peasant, and rude enough he was in most of these things, even after no inconsiderable experience of society, the world soon discovered a true poet. He taught himself to write, by copying the letters of a printed book as he lay watching his flock on the hillside and believed that he had reached the utmost pitch of his ambition when he first found that his artless rhymes could touch the heart of the milker who partook the shelter of his mantle during the passing storm. If the shepherd of Professor Wilson's Knox Ambrosiani may be taken as a true portrait of James Hogg, we must admit that, for quaintness of humor, the poet of Ettrick Forest had few rivals. Sir Walter Scott said that Hogg's thousand little touches of absurdity afforded him more entertainment than the best comedy that ever set the pit in a roar. Among the written productions of the shepherd poet, is an account of his own experiences in sheep tending, called, The Shepherd's Calendar. This work contains a vast amount of useful information upon sheep, their diseases, habits, and management. The Ettrick Shepherd died in 1835. Sheep's Brains, Ian Matalote, an entree. Ingredients. Six sheep's brains, vinegar, salt, a few slices of bacon, one small onion, two cloves, a small bunch of parsley, sufficient stock or weak broth to cover the brains, one tablespoonful of lemon juice, matalote sauce, number 512. Mode. Detach the brains from the heads without breaking them, and put them into a pan of warm water, remove the skin, and let them remain for two hours. Have ready a saucepan of boiling water, add a little vinegar and salt, and put in the brains. When they are quite firm, 
take them out and put them into very cold water. Place two or three slices of bacon in a stew pan, put in the brains, the onion stuck with two cloves, the parsley, and a good seasoning of pepper and salt. Cover with stock, or weak broth, and boil them gently for about 25 minutes. Have ready some croutons, arrange these in the dish alternately with the brains, and cover with a matelot sauce, no. 512, to which has been added the above proportion of lemon juice. Time. 25 minutes. Average cost, 1s. 6d. Sufficient for 6 persons. Seasonable at any time. Sheep's feet or trotters, Sawyer's recipe. Ingredients. 12 feet, a quarter pound. Of beef or mutton suet, 2 onions, 1 carrot, 2 bay leaves, 2 sprigs of thyme, 1 ounce of salt, a quarter ounce of pepper, 2 tablespoonfuls of flour, 2 and a half quarts of water, a quarter pound. Of fresh butter, 1 teaspoonful of salt, 1 teaspoonful of flour, 3 quarters teaspoonful of pepper, a little grated nutmeg, the juice of 1 lemon, 1 gill of milk, the yolks of 2 eggs. Mode. Have the feet cleaned, and the long bone extracted from them. Put the suet into a stew pan, with the onions and carrots sliced, the bay leaves, thyme, salt, and pepper, and let these simmer for five minutes. Add two tablespoonfuls of flour in the water, and keep stirring till it boils, then put in the feet. Let these simmer for three hours, or until perfectly tender, and take them and lay them on a sieve. Mix together, on a plate, with the back of a spoon, butter, salt, flour, one teaspoonful, pepper, nutmeg, and lemon juice as above, and put the feet, with a gill of milk, into a stewpan. When very hot, add the butter, and and stir continually till melted. Now mix the yolks of two eggs with five tablespoonfuls of milk. Stir this to the other ingredients, keep moving the pan over the fire continually for a minute or two, but do not allow it to boil after the eggs are added. Serve in a very hot dish, and garnish with croutons, or sip pets of toasted bread. Time. 3 hours. Average cost, 1s. 6d. Sufficient for 4 persons. Seasonable at any time. To dress a sheep's head. Ingredients. 1 sheep's head, sufficient water to cover it, 3 carrots, 3 turnips, 2 or 3 parsnips, 3 onions, a small bunch of parsley, 1 teaspoonful of pepper, 3 teaspoonfuls of salt, a quarter pound, of scotch oatmeal. Mode. Clean the head well, and let it soak in warm water for 2 hours, to get rid of the blood, put it into a saucepan, with sufficient cold water to cover it, and when it boils, add the vegetables, peeled and sliced, and the remaining ingredients. Before adding the oatmeal, mix it to a smooth batter with a little of the liquor. Keep stirring till it boils up, then shut the saucepan closely, and let it stew gently for one and a half or two hours. It may be thickened with rice or barley, but oatmeal is preferable. Time. One and a half or two hours. Average cost, 8d. Each. Sufficient for three persons. Seasonable at any time. Singed sheep's head. The village of Duddingston, which stands within a mile of Edinburgh town, was formerly celebrated for this ancient and homely Scottish dish. In the summer months, many opulent citizens used to resort to this place to solace themselves over singed sheep's heads, boiled or baked. The sheep fed upon the neighboring hills were slaughtered at this village, and the carcasses were sent to town. But the heads were left to be consumed in the place. We are not aware whether the custom of eating sheep's heads at Diddingston is still kept up by the good folks of Edinburgh. Tota in the Whole, Cold Meat Cookery Ingredients 6 ounces Of flour, 1 pint of milk, 3 eggs, butter, a few slices of cold mutton, pepper and salt to taste, 2 kidneys. Mode Make a smooth batter of flour, milk, and eggs in the above proportion, butter a baking dish, and pour in the batter. Into this place a few slices of cold mutton, previously well seasoned, and the kidneys, which should be cut into rather small pieces, 
bake about one hour, or rather longer, and send it to table in the dish it was baked in. Oysters or mushrooms may be substituted for the kidneys, and will be found exceedingly good. Time. Rather more than one hour. Average cost, exclusive of the cold meat, 8d. Seasonable at any time. Breast of lamb and green peas. Ingredients. One breast of lamb, a few slices of bacon, one quarter pint of stock number 105, one lemon, one onion, one bunch of savory herbs, green peas. Mode. Remove the skin from a breast of lamb, put it into a saucepan of boiling water, and let it simmer for five minutes. Take it out and lay it in cold water. Line the bottom of a stew pan with a few thin slices of bacon, lay the lamb on these, peel the lemon, cut it into slices, and put these on the meat, to keep it white and make it tender. Cover with one or two more slices of bacon, add the stock, onion, and herbs, and set it on a slow fire to simmer very gently until tender. Have ready some green peas, put these on a dish, and place the lamb on the top of these. The appearance of this dish may be much improved by glazing the lamb, and spinach may be substituted for the peas when variety is desired. Time. One and a half hour. Average cost, 10 d. Per lb. Sufficient for three persons. Seasonable, grass lamb, from Easter to Michaelmas. The lamb as a sacrifice. The number of lambs consumed in sacrifices by the Hebrews must have been very considerable. Two lambs, of the first year, were appointed to be sacrificed daily for the morning and evening sacrifice. And a lamb served as a substitute for the firstborn of unclean animals, such as the ass, which could not be accepted as an offering to the Lord. Every year, also, on the anniversary of the deliverance of the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt, every family was ordered to sacrifice a lamb or kid, and to sprinkle some of its blood upon the doorposts. In commemoration of the judgment of God upon the Egyptians. It was to be eaten roasted, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, in haste, with the loins girded, the shoes on the feet, and the staff in the hand, and whatever remained until the morning was to be burnt. The sheep was also used in the numerous special, individual, and national sacrifices ordered by the Jewish law. On extraordinary occasions, vast quantities of sheep were sacrificed at once. Thus Solomon, on the completion of the temple, offered sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. Stewed breast of lamb. Ingredients. One breast of lamb, pepper and salt to taste, sufficient stock, no. 105, to cover it, one glass of sherry, thickening of butter and flour. Mode. Skin the lamb, cut it into pieces, and season them with pepper and salt. Lay these in a stew pan, pour in sufficient stock or gravy to cover them, and stew very gently until tender, which will be in about one and a half hour. Just before serving, thicken the sauce with a little butter and flour. Add the sherry, give one boil, and pour it over the meat. Green peas, or stewed mushrooms, may be strewed over the meat, and will be found a very great improvement. Time. One and a half hour. Average cost, 10 d. Per lb. Sufficient for three persons. Seasonable, grass lamb, from Easter to Michaelmas. Lamb chops. Ingredients. Loin of lamb, pepper and salt to taste. Mode. Trim off the flap from a fine loin of lamb, aid cut it into chops about three quarters inch in thickness. Have ready a bright clear fire, lay the chops on a gridiron, and broil them of a nice pale brown, turning them when required. Season them with pepper and salt. Serve very hot and quickly, and garnish with crisped parsley, or place them on mashed potatoes. Asparagus, spinach, or peas are the favorite accompaniments to lamb chops. Time. About 8 or 10 minutes. Average cost, 1s. Per lb. Sufficient. Allow 2 chops to each person. Seasonable from Easter to Michaelmas. Lamb cutlets and spinach, an entree. Ingredients. 
8 cutlets, egg and bread crumbs, salt and pepper to taste, a little clarified butter. Mode. Cut the cutlets from a neck of lamb, and shape them by cutting off the thick part of the chine bone. Trim off most of the fat and all the skin, and scrape the top part of the bones quite clean. Brush the cutlets over with egg, sprinkle them with bread crumbs, and season with pepper and salt. Now dip them into clarified butter, sprinkle over a few more bread crumbs, and fry them over a sharp fire, turning them when required. Lay them before the fire to drain, and arrange them on a dish with spinach in the center, which should be previously well boiled, drained, chopped, and seasoned. Time. About 7 or 8 minutes. Average cost, 10 d. Per lb. Sufficient for 4 persons. Seasonable from Easter to Michaelmas. Note. Peas, asparagus, or French beans, may be substituted for the spinach, or lamb cutlets may be served with stewed cucumbers, soubi sauce, and k. And k. Lamb's fry. Ingredients. 1 pound. Of lamb's fry, 3 pints of water, egg and bread crumbs, 1 teaspoonful of chopped parsley, salt and pepper to taste. Mode. Boil the fry for a quarter hour in the above proportion of water, take it out and dry it in a cloth. Grate some bread down finely, mix with it a teaspoonful of chopped parsley and a high seasoning of pepper and salt. Brush the fry lightly over with the yolk of an egg, sprinkle over the bread crumbs, and fry for 5 minutes. Serve very hot on a napkin in a dish, and garnish with plenty of crisped parsley. Time. Minus 1 hour to simmer the fry, 5 minutes to ferry it. Average cost, 10 d. Per lb. Sufficient for 2 or 3 persons. Seasonable from Easter to Michaelmas. Hashed lamb and broiled blade bone. Ingredients. The remains of a cold shoulder of lamb, pepper and salt to taste, 2 ounces of butter, about 1 half pint of stock or gravy, 1 tablespoonful of shallot vinegar, 3 or 4 pickled gherkins. Mode. Take the blade bone from the shoulder, and cut the meat into collops as neatly as possible. Season the bone with pepper and salt, pour a little oiled butter over it, and place it in the oven to warm through. Put the stock into a stew pan, add the ketchup and shallot vinegar, and lay in the pieces of lamb. Let these heat gradually through, but do not allow them to boil. Take the blade bone out of the oven, and place it on a gridiron over a sharp fire to brown. Slice the gherkins, put them into the hash, and dish it with the blade bone in the center. It may be garnished with croutons or sippets of toasted bread. Time. Altogether half an hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 4d. Seasonable, house lamb, from Christmas to March, grass lamb, from Easter to Michaelmas. Illustration, four quarter of lamb. Roast four quarter of lamb. Ingredients. Lamb, a little salt. Mode. To obtain the flavor of lamb in perfection, it should not be long kept, time to cool is all that it requires. And though the meat may be somewhat thready, the juices and flavor will be infinitely superior to that of lamb that has been killed two or three days. Make up the fire in good time, that it may be clear and brisk when the joint is put down. Place it at a sufficient distance to prevent the fat from burning, and baste it constantly till the moment of serving. Lamb should be very thoroughly done without being dried up, and not the slightest appearance of red gravy should be visible, as in roast mutton, this rule is applicable to all young white meats. Serve with a little gravy made in the dripping pan, the same as for other roasts, and send to table with it a tureen of mint sauce, number 469, and a fresh salad. A cut lemon, a small piece of fresh butter, and a little cayenne, should also be placed on the table, so that when the carver separates the shoulder from the ribs, they may be ready for his use. If, however, he should not be very expert, we would recommend that the cook should divide these joints nicely before coming to table. Time. Four quarter of lamb weighing ten pounds, one and three quarters to two hours. Average cost, ten d. To ones. Per lb. 
sufficient for seven or eight persons. Seasonable, grass lamb, from Easter to Michaelmas. Boiled leg of lamb a la bechamel. Ingredients. Leg of lamb, bechamel sauce, number 367. Mode. Do not choose a very large joint, but one weighing about 5 pounds. Have ready a saucepan of boiling water, into which plunge the lamb, and when it boils up again, draw it to the side of the fire, and let the water cool a little. Then stew very gently for about one to a quarter hour, reckoning from the time that the water begins to simmer. Make some bechamel by recipe number 367, dish the lamb, pour the sauce over it, and garnish with tufts of boiled cauliflower or carrots. When liked, melted butter may be substituted for the bechamel, this is a more simple method, but not nearly so nice. Send to table with it some of the sauce in a tureen, and boiled cauliflowers or spinach, with whichever vegetable the dish is garnished. Time. 1 to a quarter hour after the water simmers. Average cost, 10 d. 2 ones. Per pound sufficient for 4 or 5 persons. Seasonable from Easter to Michaelmas. Roast leg of lamb. Ingredients. Lamb, a little salt. Illustration, leg of lamb. Mode. Place the joint at a good distance from the fire at first, and baste well the whole time it is cooking. When nearly done, draw it nearer the fire to acquire a nice brown color. Sprinkle a little fine salt over the meat, empty the dripping pan of its contents, pour in a little boiling water, and strain this over the meat. Serve with mint sauce and a fresh salad, and for vegetables send peas, spinach, or cauliflowers to table with it. Time. A leg of lamb weighing 5 pounds, 1 and a half hour. Average cost, 10 d. 2 ones. Per pound sufficient for 4 or 5 persons. Seasonable from Easter to Michaelmas. Braised loin of lamb. Illustration, loin of lamb. Ingredients. 1 loin of lamb, a few slices of bacon, 1 bunch of green onions, 5 or 6 young carrots, a bunch of savory herbs, 2 blades of pounded mace, 1 pint of stock salt to taste. Mode. Bone a loin of lamb, and line the bottom of a stew pan just capable of holding it, with a few thin slices of fat bacon. Add the remaining ingredients, cover the meat with a few more slices of bacon, pour in the stock, and simmer very gently for two hours. Take it up, dry it, strain and reduce the gravy to a glaze, with which glaze the meat, and serve it either on stewed peas, spinach, or stewed cucumbers. Time. 2 hours. Average cost, 11 d. Per lb. Sufficient for 4 or 5 persons. Seasonable from Easter to Michaelmas. Illustration, saddle of lamb. Ribs of lamb. Roast saddle of lamb. Ingredients. Lamb, a little salt. Mode. This joint is now very much in vogue and is generally considered a nice one for a small party. Have ready a clear brisk fire, put down the joint at a little distance, to prevent the fat from scorching, and keep it well basted all the time it is cooking. Serve with mint sauce and a fresh salad, and send to table with it either peas, cauliflowers, or spinach. Time. A small saddle, one and a half hour, a large one, two hours. Average cost, 10 d. To ones. Per lb. Sufficient for five or six persons. Seasonable from Easter to Michaelmas. Note. Loin and ribs of lamb are roasted in the same manner, and served with the same sauces as the above. A loin will take about one to a quarter hour, ribs, from one to one to a quarter hour. Roast shoulder of lamb. Ingredients. Lamb, a little salt. Mode. Have ready a clear brisk fire, and put down the joint at a sufficient distance from it, that the fat may not burn. Keep constantly basting until done, and serve with a little gravy made in the dripping pan, and send mint sauce to table with it. Peas, spinach, or cauliflowers are the usual vegetables served with lamb, 
and also a fresh salad. Time. A shoulder of lamb rather more than one hour. Average cost, tens. To ones. Per LB. Sufficient for four or five persons. Seasonable from Easter to Michaelmas. Shoulder of lamb stuffed. Ingredients. Shoulder of lamb, force meat no. 417, trimmings of veal or beef, 2 onions, 1 half head of celery, 1 faggot of savory herbs, a few slices of fat bacon, 1 quart of stock number 105. Mode. Take the blade bone out of a shoulder of lamb, fill up its place with forcemeat, and sew it up with coarse thread. Put it into a stew pan with a few slices of bacon under and over the lamb, and add the remaining ingredients. Stew very gently for rather more than two hours. Reduce the gravy, with which glaze the meat, and serve with peas, stewed cucumbers, or sorrel sauce. Time. Rather more than two hours. Average cost, 10 d. To ones. Per lb. Sufficient for four or five persons. Seasonable from Easter to Michaelmas. Lambs SWETBREADS, larded, and asparagus, an entree. Ingredients 2 or 3 sweetbreads, 1 half pint of veal stock, white pepper and salt to taste, a small bunch of green onions, 1 blade of pounded mace, thickening of butter and flour, 2 eggs, nearly 1 half pint of cream, 1 teaspoonful of minced parsley. A very little grated nutmeg. Mode Soak the sweetbreads in lukewarm water, and put them into a saucepan with sufficient boiling water to cover them, and let them simmer for 10 minutes, then take them out and put them into cold water. Now lard them, lay them in a stew pan, add the stock, seasoning, onions, mace, and a thickening of butter and flour, and stew gently for a quarter hour or 20 minutes. Beat up the egg with the cream, to which add the minced parsley and a very little grated nutmeg. Put this to the other ingredients, stir it well till quite hot, but do not let it boil after the cream is added, or it will curdle. Have ready some asparagus tops, boiled, add these to the sweetbreads, and serve. Time. Altogether half an hour. Average cost, twos. 6d to threes. 6d each. Sufficient, three sweetbreads for one entree. Seasonable from Easter to Michaelmas. Another way to dress SWETBREADS, an entree. Ingredients Sweetbreads, egg and bread crumbs, one half pint of gravy, number 442, one half glass of sherry. Mode Soak the sweetbreads in water for an hour, and throw them into boiling water to render them firm. Let them stew gently for about a quarter hour. Take them out and put them into a cloth to drain all the water from them. Brush them over with egg, sprinkle them with bread crumbs, and either brown them in the oven or before the fire. Have ready the above quantity of gravy, to which add one half glass of sherry. Dish the sweetbreads, pour the gravy under them, and garnish with water cresses. Time. Rather more than half an hour. Average cost, twos. 6d to 3s. 6d each. Sufficient, 3 sweetbreads for 1 entree. Seasonable from Easter to Michaelmas. Mutton and lamb carving. Haunch of mutton. Illustration, haunch of mutton. 759, a deep cut should, in the first place, be made quite down to the bone, across the knuckle end of the joint, along the line 1 to 2. This will let the gravy escape. And then it should be carved, in not too thick slices, along the whole length of the haunch, in the direction of the line from 4 to 3. Illustration, Leg of Mutton Leg of Mutton 760 This homely, but capital English joint, is almost invariably served at table as shown in the engraving. The carving of it is not very difficult. The knife should be carried sharply down in the direction of the line from 1 to 2, and slices taken from either side, as the guests may desire, some liking the knuckle end, as well done. And others preferring the more underdone part. The fat should be sought near the line 3 to 4. 
Some connoisseurs are fond of having this joint dished with the underside uppermost, so as to get at the finely grained meat lying under that part of the meat, known as the Pope's eye. But this is an extravagant fashion, and one that will hardly find favor in the eyes of many economical British housewives and housekeepers. Loin of Mutton Illustration, Loin of Mutton 761 there is one point in connection with carving a loin of mutton which includes every other, that is, that the joint should be thoroughly well jointed by the butcher before it is cooked. This knack of jointing requires practice and the proper tools. And no one but the butcher is supposed to have these. If the bones be not well jointed, the carving of a loin of mutton is not a gracious business, whereas, if that has been attended to, it is an easy and untroublesome task. The knife should be inserted at figure 1, and after feeling your way between the bones, it should be carried sharply in the direction of the line 1 to 2. As there are some people who prefer the outside cut, while others do not like it, the question as to their choice of this should be asked. Saddle of Mutton Illustration, Saddle of Mutton 762 Although we have heard, at various intervals, growlings expressed at the inevitable saddle of mutton at the dinner parties of our middle classes, yet we doubt whether any other joint is better liked. When it has been well hung and artistically cooked. There is a diversity of opinion respecting the mode of sending this joint to table, but it has only reference to whether or no there shall be any portion of the tail, or, if so, how many joints of the tail. We ourselves prefer the mode as shown in our colored illustration, O, oh, but others may, upon equally good grounds, like the way shown in the engraving on this page. Some trim the tail with a paper frill. The carving is not difficult, it is usually cut in the direction of the line from two to one, quite down to the bones, in evenly sliced pieces. A fashion, however, patronized by some, is to carve it obliquely, in the direction of the line from four to three. In which case the joint would be turned round the other way, having the tail end on the right of the carver. Shoulder of Mutton Illustration, Shoulder of Mutton 763, this is a joint not difficult to carve. The knife should be drawn from the outer edge of the shoulder in the direction of the line from 1 to 2, until the bone of the shoulder is reached. As many slices as can be carved in this manner should be taken, and afterwards the meat lying on either side of the blade bone should be served, by carving in the direction of 3 to 4 and 3 to 4. The uppermost side of the shoulder being now finished, the joint should be turned, and slices taken off along its whole length. There are some who prefer this underside of the shoulder for its juicy flesh, although the grain of the meat is not so fine as that on the other side. Forequarter of Lamb Illustration, Forequarter of Lamb 764. We always think that a good and practiced carver delights in the manipulation of this joint, for there is a little field for his judgment and dexterity which does not always occur. The separation of the shoulder from the breast is the first point to be attended to. This is done by passing the knife lightly round the dotted line, as shown by the figures 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5, so as to cut through the skin, and then, by raising with a little force the shoulder, into which the fork should be firmly fixed. It will come away with just a little more exercise of the knife. In dividing the shoulder and breast, the carver should take care not to cut away too much of the meat from the latter, as that would rather spoil its appearance when the shoulder is removed. The breast and shoulder being separated, it is usual to lay a small piece of butter, and sprinkle a little cayenne, lemon juice, and salt between them. And when this is melted and incorporated with the meat and gravy, the shoulder may, as more convenient, be removed into another dish. The next operation is to separate the ribs from the brisket by cutting through the meat on the line 5 to 6. The joint is then ready to be served to the guests, the ribs being carved in the direction of the lines from 9 to 10, and the brisket from 7 to 8. The carver should ask those at the table what parts they prefer ribs, brisket, or a piece of the shoulder. Leg of lamb, loin of lamb, saddle of lamb, shoulder of lamb are carved in the same manner as the corresponding joints of mutton. See Nose 760, 761, 762, 763 Illustration 
Chapter 16 General Observations on the Common Hog 765, The hog belongs to the order Mammalia, the genus Scrofa, and the species Pachydermida, or thick-skinned. And its generic characters are, a small head, with long flexible snout truncated. 42 teeth, divided into four upper incisors, converging, six lower incisors, projecting, two upper and two lower canine, or tusks, the former short, the latter projecting, formidable, and sharp, and fourteen molars in each jaw. Cloven feet furnished with four toes, and tail, small, short, and twisted, while, in some varieties, this appendage is altogether wanting. 766. From the number and position of the teeth, physiologists are enabled to define the nature and functions of the animal. And from those of the seuss, or hog, it is evident that he is as much a grinder as a biter, or can live as well on vegetable as on animal food. Though a mixture of both is plainly indicated as the character of food most conducive to the integrity and health of its physical system. 767. Thus the pig tribe, though not a ruminating mammal, as might be inferred from the number of its molar teeth, is yet a link between the herbivorous and the carnivorous tribes, and is consequently what is known as an omnivorous quadruped. Or, in other words, capable of converting any kind of aliment into nutriment. 768. Though the hoof in the hog is, as a general rule, cloven, there are several remarkable exceptions, as in the species native to Norway, Illyria, Sardinia, and formerly to the Berkshire variety of the British domesticated pig, in which the hoof is entire and underscore un underscore cleft. 769. Whatever difference in ITS physical nature, climate and soil may produce in this animal, his functional characteristics are the same in whatever part of the world he may be found. And whether in the trackless forests of South America, the coral isles of Polynesia, the jungles of India, or the spicy breaks of Sumatra, he is everywhere known for his gluttony, laziness, and indifference to the character and quality of his food. And though he occasionally shows an epicure's relish for a succulent plant or a luscious carrot, which he will discuss with all his salivary organs keenly excited, he will, the next moment, turn with equal gusto to some carrion offal that might excite the forbearance of the unscrupulous cormorant. It is this coarse and repulsive mode of feeding that has, in every country and language, obtained for him the opprobrium of being an unclean animal. 770. In the Masaikal Law, the pig is condemned as an unclean beast, and consequently interdicted to the Israelites, as unfit for human food. And the swine, though he divideth the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cut. He is unclean to you. Leviticus 11. 7. Strict, however, as the law was respecting the cut-chewing and hoof-divided animals, the Jews, with their usual perversity and violation of the divine commands, seem afterwards to have ignored the prohibition. 4. Unless they ate pork, it is difficult to conceive for what purpose they kept troves of swine, as from the circumstance recorded in Matthew 18. 32. When Jesus was in Galilee, and the devils, cast out of the two men, were permitted to enter the herd of swine that were feeding on the hills in the neighborhood of the Sea of Tiberias, it is very evident they did. There is only one interpretation by which we can account for a prohibition that debarred the Jews from so many foods which we regard as nutritious luxuries, that, being fat and the texture more hard of digestion than other meats, they were likely. In a hot dry climate, where vigorous exercise could seldom be taken, to produce disease, and especially cutaneous affections. Indeed, in this light, as a code of sanitary ethics, the book of Leviticus is the most admirable system of moral government ever conceived for man's benefit. 771. Setting his coarse feeding and slovenly habits out of the question, there is no domestic animal so profitable or so useful to man as the much maligned pig, or any that yields him a more varied or more luxurious repast. The prolific powers of the pig are extraordinary, even under the restraint of domestication. But when left to run wild in favorable situations, as in the islands of the South Pacific, the result, in a few years, from two animals put on shore and left undisturbed, is truly surprising. For they breed so fast, 
and have such numerous litters, that unless killed off in vast numbers both for the use of the inhabitants and as fresh provisions for ships' crews, they would degenerate into vermin. In this country the pig has usually two litters, or pharaohs, in a year, the breeding seasons being April and October, and the period the female goes with her young is about four months, sixteen weeks or one hundred and twenty-two days. The number produced at each litter depends upon the character of the breed, twelve being the average number in the small variety, and ten in the large. In the mixed breeds, however, the average is between ten and fifteen, and in some instances has reached as many as twenty. But however few, or however many, young pigs there may be to the pharaoh, there is always one who is the dwarf of the family circle, a poor, little, shriveled, half-starved anatomy, with a small melancholy voice, a staggering gait. A woebegone countenance, and a thread of a tail, whose existence the complacent mother ignores, his plethoric brothers and sisters repudiate, and for whose emaciated jaws there is never a spare or supplemental teat. Till one of the favored gormandizers, overtaken by momentary oblivion, drops the lacteal fountain, and gives the little squeaking straggler the chance of a momentary mouthful. This miserable little object, which may be seen bringing up the rear of every litter, is called the Tony Pig, or the Anthony, so named, it is presumed, from being the one always assigned to the church, when tithe was taken in kind, and as is tea. Anthony was the patron of husbandry, his name was given in a sort of bitter derision to the starveling that constituted his dues. For whether there are ten or fifteen pharaohs to the litter, the Anthony is always the last of the family to come into the world. 772. From the grossness of his feeding, the large amount of aliment he consumes, his gluttonous way of eating it, from his slothful habits, laziness, and indulgence in sleep, the pig is particularly liable to disease, and especially indigestion. Heartburn and affections of the skin. 773. Teo counteract the consequence of a violation of the physical laws, a powerful monitor in the brain of the pig teaches him to seek for relief and medicine. To open the pores of his skin, blocked up with mud, and excite perspiration, he resorts to a tree, a stump, or his trough, anything rough and angular, and using it as a curry comb to his body. Obtains the luxury of a scratch and the benefit of cuticular evaporation. He next proceeds with his long supple snout to grub up antiscorbutic roots, cooling salads of mallow and dandelion, and, greatest treat of all, he stumbles on a piece of chalk or a mouthful of delicious cinder, which, he knows by instinct, is the most sovereign remedy in the world for that hot, unpleasant sensation he has had all the morning at his stomach. 774. It is a remarkable fact that, though every one who keeps a pig knows how prone he is to disease, how that disease injures the quality of the meat, and how eagerly he pounces on a bit of coal or cinder, or any coarse dry substance that will adulterate the rich food on which he lives, and by affording soda to his system, correct the vitiated fluids of his body, yet very few have the judgment to act on what they see. And by supplying the pig with a few shovelfuls of cinders in his sty, save the necessity of his rooting for what is so needful to his health. Instead of this, however, and without supplying the animal with what its instinct craves for, his nostril is bored with a red-hot iron, and a ring clinched in his nose to prevent rooting for what he feels to be absolutely necessary for his health. And ignoring the fact that, in a domestic state at least, the pig lives on the richest of all food, scraps of cooked animal substances, boiled vegetables, bread, and other items. Given in that concentrated essence of aliment for a quadruped called wash, and that he eats to repletion, takes no exercise, and finally sleeps all the twenty-four hours he is not eating, and then. When the animal at last seeks for those medicinal aids which would obviate the evil of such a forcing diet, his keeper, instead of meeting his animal instinct by human reason, and giving him what he seeks, has the inhumanity to torture him by a ring, that, keeping up a perpetual, raw, in the pig's snout, prevents his digging for those corrective drugs which would remove the evils of his artificial existence. 775. Though subject to so many diseases, no domestic animal is more easily kept in health, cleanliness, and comfort, and this without the necessity of wringing or any excessive desire of the hog to roam, break through his sty, or plough up his pound. 
Whatever the kind of food may be on which the pig is being fed or fattened, a teaspoonful or more of salt should always be given in his mess of food, and a little heap of well-burnt cinders, with occasional bits of chalk. Should always be kept by the side of his trough, as well as a vessel of clean water, his pound, or the front part of his sty, should be totally free from straw, the brick flooring being every day swept out and sprinkled with a layer of sand. His lair, or sleeping apartment, should be well sheltered by roof and sides from cold, wet, and all changes of weather, and the bed made up of a good supply of clean straw. Sufficiently deep to enable the pig to burrow his unprotected body beneath it. All the refuse of the garden, in the shape of roots, leaves, and stalks, should be placed in a corner of his pound or feeding chamber, for the delectation of his leisure moments. And once a week, on the family washing day, a pail of warm soap suds should be taken into his sty, and, by means of a scrubbing brush and soap, his back, shoulders, and flanks should be well cleaned. A pail of clean warm water being thrown over his body at the conclusion, before he is allowed to retreat to his clean straw to dry himself. By this means, the excessive nutrition of his aliment will be corrected, a more perfect digestion ensured, and, by opening the pores of the skin, a more vigorous state of health acquired than could have been obtained under any other system. 776. We have already said that no other animal yields man so many kinds and varieties of luxurious food as is supplied to him by the flesh of the hog differently prepared. For almost every part of the animal, either fresh, salted, or dried, is used for food, and even those viscera not so employed are of the utmost utility in a domestic point of view. 777. Though destitute of the hide, horns, and hoofs, constituting the offal of most domestic animals, the pig is not behind the other mammalia in its usefulness to man. Its skin, especially that of the boar, from its extreme closeness of texture, when tanned, is employed for the seats of saddles, to cover powder, shot, and drinking flasks. And the hair, according to its color, flexibility, and stubbornness, is manufactured into tooth, nail, and hairbrushes, others into hat, clothes, and shoe brushes. While the longer and finer qualities are made into long and short brooms and painter's brushes, and a still more rigid description, under the name of bristles, are used by the shoemaker as needles for the passage of his wax end. Besides so many benefits and useful services conferred on man by this valuable animal, his fat, in a commercial sense, is quite as important as his flesh, and brings a price equal to the best joints in the carcass. This fat is rendered, or melted out of the caul, or membrane in which it is contained, by boiling water, and, while liquid, run into prepared bladders, when, under the name of lard, it becomes an article of extensive trade and value. 778. Of the numerous varieties of the domesticated hog, the following list of breeds may be accepted as the best, presenting severally all those qualities aimed at in the rearing of domestic stock, as affecting both the breeder and the consumer. Native, Berkshire, Essex, York, and Cumberland, Foreign, the Chinese. Before, however, proceeding with the consideration of the different orders, in the series we have placed them, it will be necessary to make a few remarks relative to the pig generally. In the first place, the black pig is regarded by breeders as the best and most eligible animal, not only from the fineness and delicacy of the skin, but because it is less affected by the heat in summer. And far less subject to cuticular disease than either the white or brindled hog, but more particularly from its kindlier nature and greater aptitude to fatten. 779. The great quality first sought for in a hog is a capacious stomach, and next, a healthy power of digestion, for the greater the quantity he can eat, and the more rapidly he can digest what he has eaten, the more quickly will he fatten. And the faster he can be made to increase in flesh, without a material increase of bone, the better is the breed considered, and the more valuable the animal. In the usual order of nature, the development of flesh and enlargement of bone proceed together, but here the object is to outstrip the growth of the bones by the quicker development of their fleshy covering. 780. The chief points sought for in the choice of a hog are breadth of chest, depth of carcass, width of loin, chine, and ribs, compactness of form, docility, cheerfulness, and general beauty of appearance. 
The head in a well-bred hog must not be too long, the forehead narrow and convex, cheeks full, snout fine, mouth small, eyes small and quick, ears short, thin, and sharp, pendulous, and pointing forwards. Neck full and broad, particularly on the top, where it should join very broad shoulders, the ribs, loin, and haunch should be in a uniform line, and the tail well set, neither too high nor too low. At the same time the back is to be straight or slightly curved, the chest deep, broad, and prominent, the legs short and thick. The belly, when well fattened, should nearly touch the ground, the hair be long, thin, fine, and having few bristles, and whatever the color, uniform, either white, black, or blue, but not spotted, speckled, brindled, or sandy. Such are the features and requisites that, among breeders and judges, constitute the beau ideal of a perfect pig. Illustration, Berkshire S.O.W. 781. The Berkshire pig is the best known and most esteemed of all our English domestic breeds, and so highly is it regarded, that even the varieties of the stock are in as great estimation as the parent breed itself. The characteristics of the Berkshire hog are that it has a tawny color, spotted with black, large ears hanging over the eyes, a thick, close, and well-made body, legs short and small in the bone. Feeds up to a great weight, fattens quickly, and is good either for pork or bacon. The new or improved Berkshire possesses all the above qualities, but is infinitely more prone to fatten, while the objectionable color has been entirely done away with, being now either all white or completely black. Illustration, Essex SOW. 782, next to the former, the Essex takes place in public estimation, always competing, and often successfully, with the Berkshire. The peculiar characters of the Essex breed are that it is tip-eared, has a long sharp head, is roach-backed, with a long flat body, standing high on the legs. Is rather bare of hair, is a quick feeder, has an enormous capacity of stomach and belly, and an appetite to match its receiving capability. Its color is white, or else black and white, and it has a restless habit and an unquiet disposition. The present valuable stock has sprung from a cross between the common native animal and either the white Chinese or black Neapolitan breeds. Illustration, Yorkshire SOW. 783. The Yorkshire, called also the Old Lincolnshire, was at one time the largest stock of the pig family in England, and perhaps, at that time, the worst. It was long-legged, weak in the loins, with coarse white curly hair, and flabby flesh. Now, however, it has undergone as great a change as any breed in the kingdom, and by judicious crossing has become the most valuable we possess, being a very well-formed pig throughout, with a good head, a pleasant docile countenance. With moderate-sized drooping ears, a broad back, slightly curved, large chine and loins, with deep sides, full chest, and well covered with long thickly set white hairs. Besides these qualities of form, he is a quick grower, feeds fast, and will easily make from twenty to twenty-five stone before completing his first year. The quality of the meat is also uncommonly good, the fat and lean being laid on in almost equal proportions. So capable is this species of development, both in flesh and stature, that examples of the Yorkshire breed have been exhibited weighing as much as a Scotch ox. Illustration, Cumberland SOW. 784. Though almost every country in England can boast some local variety or other of this useful animal, obtained from the native stock by crossing with some of the foreign kinds. Cumberland and the northwest parts of the kingdom have been celebrated for a small breed of white pigs, with a thick, compact, and well-made body, short in the legs, the head and back well-formed, ears slouching in a little downwards. And on the whole, a hardy, profitable animal, and one well disposed to fatten. 785. There is no variety of this useful animal that presents such peculiar features as the species known to us as the Chinese pig. And as it is the general belief that to this animal and the Neapolitan hog we are indebted for that remarkable improvement which has taken place in the breeds of the English pig, it is necessary to be minute in the description of this. In all respects, singular animal. The Chinese, in the first place, consists of many varieties, and presents as many forms of body as differences of color, 
the best kind, however, has a beautiful white skin of singular thinness and delicacy. The hair too is perfectly white and thinly set over the body, with here and there a few bristles. He has a broad snout, short head, eyes bright and fiery, very small fine pink ears, wide cheeks, high chine, with a neck of such immense thickness, that when the animal is fat it looks like an elongated carcass, a mass of fat, without shape or form. Like a feather pillow. The belly is dependent, and almost trailing on the ground, the legs very short, and the tail so small as to be little more than a rudiment. It has a ravenous appetite, and will eat anything that the wonderful assimilating powers of its stomach can digest, and to that capability, there seems no limit in the whole range of animal or vegetable nature. The consequence of this perfect and singularly rapid digestion is an unprecedented proneness to obesity, a process of fattening that, once commenced, goes on with such rapid development, that, in a short time, it loses all form. Depositing such an amount of fat, that it in fact ceases to have any refuse part or offal, and, beyond the hair on its back and the callous extremity of the snout, the whole carcass is eatable. Illustration, Chinese SOW. 786, when judiciously fed on vegetable diet, and this obese tendency checked, the flesh of the Chinese pig is extremely delicate and delicious. But when left to gorge almost exclusively on animal food, it becomes oily, coarse, and unpleasant. Perhaps there is no other instance in nature where the effect of rapid and perfect digestion is so well shown as in this animal, which thrives on everything, and turns to the benefit of its physical economy, food of the most opposite nature. And of the most unwholesome and offensive character. When fully fattened, the thin cuticle, that is one of its characteristics, cracks, from the adipose distension beneath, exposing the fatty mass, which discharges a liquid oil from the adjacent tissues. The great fault in this breed is the remarkably small quantity of lean laid down, to the immense proportion of fat. Some idea of the growth of this species may be inferred from the fact of their attaining to 18 stone before two years, and when further advanced, as much as 40 stone. In its pure state, except for roasters, the Chinese pig is too disproportionate for the English market, but when crossed with some of our lean stock, the breed becomes almost invaluable. Illustration, Westphalian Boar 787 The wild boar is a much more cleanly and sagacious animal than the domesticated hog, he is longer in the snout, has his ears shorter and his tusks considerably longer, very frequently measuring as much as 10 inches. They are extremely sharp, and are bent in an upward circle. Unlike his domestic brother, who roots up here and there, or wherever his fancy takes, the wild boar plows the ground in continuous lines or furrows. The boar, when selected as the parent of a stock, should have a small head, be deep and broad in the chest, the chine should be arched, the ribs and barrel well rounded, with the haunches falling full down nearly to the hock and he should always be more compact and smaller than the female. The color of the wild boar is always of a uniform hue, and generally of an iron gray, shading off into a black. The hair of the boar is of considerable length, especially about the head and mane, he stands, in general, from 20 to 30 inches in height at the shoulders, though instances have occurred where he has reached 42 inches. The young are of a pale yellowish tint, irregularly brindled with light brown. The boar of Germany is a large and formidable animal, and the hunting of him, with a small species of mastiff, is still a national sport. From living almost exclusively on acorns and nuts, his flesh is held in great esteem, and in Westphalia his legs are made into hams by a process which, it is said, enhances the flavor and quality of the meat in a remarkable degree. 788 there are two points to be taken into consideration by all breeders of pigs, to what ultimate use is the flesh to be put, for, if meant to be eaten fresh, or simply salted, the small breed of pigs is host suited for the purpose. If for hams or bacon, the large variety of the animal is necessary. Pigs are usually weaned between six and eight weeks after birth, after which they are fed on soft food, such as mashed potatoes in skimmed or buttermilk. The general period at which the small hogs are killed for the market is from 12 to 16 weeks, 
from four to five mouths, they are called store pigs, and are turned out to graze till the animal has acquired its full stature. As soon as this point has been reached, the pig should be forced to maturity as quickly as possible. He should therefore be taken from the fields and farmyard, and shut up on boiled potatoes, buttermilk, and peas meal, after a time to be followed by grains, oil cake, wash, barley, and Indian meal. Supplying his sty at the same time with plenty of water, cinders, and a quantity of salt in every mess of food presented to him. 789. The estimated number of pigs in Great Britain is supposed to exceed 20 millions. And, considering the third of the number as worth two pounds apiece, and the remaining two-thirds as of the relative value of tens. Each, would give a marketable estimate of over 20 million pounds for this animal alone. 790. The best and most humane mode of killing all large hogs is to strike them down like a bullock, with the pointed end of a poleaxe, on the forehead, which has the effect of killing the animal at once. All the butcher has then to do, is to open the aorta and great arteries, and laying the animal's neck over a trough, let out the blood as quickly as possible. The carcass is then to be scalded, either on a board or by immersion in a tub of very hot water, and all the hair and dirt rapidly scraped off, till the skin is made perfectly white, when it is hung up, opened, and dressed, as it is called. In the usual way. It is then allowed to cool, a sheet being thrown around the carcass, to prevent the air from discoloring the newly cleaned skin. When meant for bacon, the hair is singed instead of being scalded off. 791. In the country, where for ordinary consumption the pork killed for sale is usually both larger and fatter than that supplied to the London consumer, it is customary to remove the skin and fat down to the lean, and, salting that. Roast what remains of the joint. Pork goes further, and is consequently a more economical food than other meats, simply because the texture is closer, and there is less waste in the cooking, either in roasting or boiling. 792. In fresh pork, the leg is the most economical family joint, and the loin the richest. 793. Comparatively speaking, very little difference exists between the weight of the live and dead pig, and this, simply because there is neither the head nor the hide to be removed. It has been proved that pork loses in cooking 13.5% of its weight. A salted hand weighing 4 pounds, 5 ounces lost in the cooking 11 ounces, after cooking, the meat weighing only 3 pounds, 1 ounce, and the bone 9 ounces. The original cost was 7 minus 1 divided by 2d. A pound, but by this deduction, the cost rose to 9d. Per pound with the bone, and 10 minus 1 divided by 4d. Without it. 794, pork, TOB preserved, is cured in several ways, either by covering it with salt, or immersing it in ready-made brine, where it is kept till required. Or it is only partially salted, and then hung up to dry, when the meat is called white bacon, or, after salting, it is hung in wood smoke till the flesh is impregnated with the aroma from the wood. The Wiltshire bacon, which is regarded as the finest in the kingdom, is prepared by laying the sides of a hog in large wooden troughs, and then rubbing into the flesh quantities of powdered basalt, made hot in a frying pan. This process is repeated for four days, they are then left for three weeks, merely turning the flitches every other day. After that time they are hung up to dry. The hogs usually killed for purposes of bacon in England average from 18 to 20 stone. On the other hand, the hogs killed in the country for farmhouse purposes, seldom weigh less than 26 stone. The legs of boars, hogs, and, in Germany, those of bears, are prepared differently, and called hams. 795. The practice in vogue formerly in this country was to cut out the hams and cure them separately, then to remove the ribs, which were roasted as spare ribs, and, curing the remainder of the side, call it a gammon of bacon. Small pork to cut for table in joints, is cut up, in most places throughout the kingdom, as represented in the engraving. The sale is divided with nine ribs to the fore quarter. And the following is an enumeration of the joints in the two respective quarters. 1. The leg. Hind quarter 2. 
the loin. 3. The spring, or belly. 4. The hand. 4. Quarter 5. The forloin. 6. The cheek. Illustration, side of a pig, showing the several joints. The weight of the several joints of a good pork pig of four stone may be as follows, viz. The leg eight pounds. The loin and spring seven pounds. The hand six pounds. The chine seven pounds. The cheek from two to three pounds. Of a bacon pig, the legs are reserved for curing, and when cured are called hams, when the meat is separated from the shoulder blade and bones and cured, it is called bacon. The bones, with part of the meat left on them, are divided into spare ribs, griskins, and chins. Chapter 17 Pork Cutlets, Cold Meat Cookery Ingredients The remains of cold roast loin of pork, 1 ounce. Of butter, 2 onions, 1 dessertspoonful of flour, 1 half pint of gravy, pepper and salt to taste, 1 teaspoonful of vinegar and mustard. Mode Cut the pork into nice-sized cutlets, trim off most of the fat, and chop the onions. Put the butter into a stew pan, lay in the cutlets and chopped onions, and fry a light brown, then add the remaining ingredients, simmer gently for 5 or 7 minutes, and serve. Time 5 to 7 minutes Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 4D Seasonable from October to March Austrian method of herding pigs in the Austrian Empire there are great numbers of wild swine, while, among the wandering tribes peopling the interior of Hungary, and spreading over the vast steppes of that country, droves of swine form a great portion of the wealth of the people, who chiefly live on a coarse bread and wind-dried bacon. In German Switzerland, the Tyrol, and other mountainous districts of continental Europe, though the inhabitants, almost everywhere, as in England, keep one or more pigs, they are at little or no trouble in feeding them. One or more men being employed by one or several villages as swine herds. Who, at a certain hour, every morning, call for the pig or pigs, and driving them to their feeding grounds on the mountainside and in the wood, take custody of the herd till, on the approach of night. They are collected into a compact body and driven home for a night's repose in their several styes. The amount of intelligence and docility displayed by the pigs in these mountain regions, is much more considerable than that usually allowed to this animal, and the manner in which these immense herds of swine are collected, and again distributed. Without an accident or mistake, is a sight both curious and interesting. For it is all done without the assistance of a dog, or the aid even of the human voice, and solely by the crack of the long-lashed and heavily loaded whip, which the swineherd carries, and cracks much after the fashion of the French postillion. And which, though he frequently cracks, waking a hundred sharp echoes from the woods and rocks, he seldom has to use correctionally, the animal soon acquiring a thorough knowledge of the meaning of each crack. And once having felt its leaded thong, a lasting remembrance of its power. At early dawn, the swineherd takes his stand at the outskirts of the first village, and begins flourishing through the misty air his immensely long lash, keeping a sort of rude time with the crack, 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 crack of his whip. The nearest pigs, hearing the well-remembered sound, rouse from their straw, and rush from their sties into the road, followed by all their litters. As soon as a sufficient number are collected, the drove is set in motion, receiving, right and left, as they advance, fresh numbers. Whole communities, or solitary individuals, streaming in from all quarters, and taking their place, without distinction, in the general herd. And, as if conscious where their breakfast lay, without wasting a moment on idle investigation, all eagerly push on to the mountains. In this manner village after village is collected, till the drove not unfrequently consists of several thousands. The feeding ground has, of course, often to be changed, and the drove have sometimes to be driven many miles, and to a considerable height up the mountain, before the whip gives the signal for the dispersion of the body and the order to feed. When the herdsman proceeds to form himself a shelter, and look after his own comfort for the rest of the day. As soon as twilight sets in, the whip is again heard echoing the signal for muster. And in the same order in which they were collected, the swine are driven back, 
each group tailing off to its respective sty, as the herd approaches the villages, till the last grunter, having found his home, the drover seeks his cottage and repose. Pork cutlets or chops. I. Ingredients. Loin of pork, pepper and salt to taste. Mode. Cut the cutlets from a delicate loin of pork, bone and trim them neatly, and cut away the greater portion of the fat. Season them with pepper. Place the gridiron on the fire, when quite hot, lay on the chops and broil them for about a quarter hour, turning them three or four times, and be particular that they are thoroughly done, but not dry. Dish them, sprinkle over a little fine salt and serve plain, or with tomato sauce, sauce picante, or pickled gherkins, a few of which should be laid round the dish as a garnish. Time. About a quarter hour. Average cost, 10 d. Per pound for chops. Sufficient. Allow 6 for 4 persons. Seasonable from October to March. 2. Another way. Ingredients. Loin or forloin, of pork, egg and bread crumbs, salt and pepper to taste. To every tablespoonful of bread crumbs allow one half teaspoonful of minced sage, clarified butter. Mode. Cut the cutlets from a loin, or forloin, of pork, trim them the same as mutton cutlets, and scrape the top part of the bone. Brush them over with egg, sprinkle with bread crumbs, with which have been mixed minced sage and a seasoning of pepper and salt, drop a little clarified butter on them, and press the crumbs well down. Put the frying pan on the fire, put in some lard, when this is hot, lay in the cutlets, and fry them a light brown on both sides. Take them out, put them before the fire to dry the greasy moisture from them, and dish them on mashed potatoes. Serve with them any sauce that may be preferred, such as tomato sauce, sauce picante, sauce robert, or pickled gherkins. Time. From 15 to 20 minutes. Average cost, 10 d. Per pound for chops. Sufficient. Allow 6 cutlets for 4 persons. Seasonable from October to March. Note. The remains of roast loin of pork may be dressed in the same manner. Pork cheese, an excellent breakfast dish. Ingredients. 2 pounds. Of cold roast pork, pepper and salt to taste, 1 dessert spoonful of minced parsley, for leaves of sage, a very small bunch of savory herbs, 2 blades of pounded mace, a little nutmeg, one half teaspoonful of minced lemon peel. Good strong gravy, sufficient to fill the mold. Mode. Cut, but do not chop, the pork into fine pieces, and allow a quarter pound of fat to each pound of lean. Season with pepper and salt. Pound well the spices, and chop finely the parsley, sage, herbs, and lemon peel, and mix the whole nicely together. Put it into a mold, Fill up with good strong well-flavored gravy, and bake rather more than one hour. When cold, turn it out of the mold. Time. Rather more than one hour. Seasonable from October to March. Roast leg of pork. Illustration, roast leg of pork. Ingredients. Leg of pork, a little oil for stuffing. See recipe number 504. Mode. Choose a small leg of pork, and score the skin across in narrow strips, about a quarter inch apart. Cut a slit in the knuckle, loosen the skin, and fill it with a sage and onion stuffing, made by recipe number 504. Brush the joint over with a little salad oil, this makes the crackling crisper, and a better color, and put it down to a bright, clear fire, not too near, as that would cause the skin to blister. Baste it well, and serve with a little gravy made in the dripping pan, and do not omit to send to table with it a tureen of well-made applesauce. SEC number 363. Time. A leg of pork weighing 8 pounds, about 3 hours. Average cost, 9d. Per lb. Sufficient for 6 or 7 persons. Seasonable from September to March. English mode of hunting, and Indian pig sticking. The hunting of the wild boar has been in all times, and in all countries, a pastime of the highest interest and excitement, 
and from the age of Nimrod, has only been considered second to the more dangerous sport of lion hunting. The buried treasures of Nineveh, restored to us by Mr. Layard, show us, on their sculptured annals, the kings of Assyria in their royal pastime of boar hunting. That the Greeks were passionately attached to this sport, we know both from history and the romantic fables of the poets. Mark Antony, at one of his breakfasts with Cleopatra, had eight wild boars roasted whole. And though the Romans do not appear to have been addicted to hunting, wild boar fights formed part of their gladiatorial shows in the amphitheater. In France, Germany, and Britain, from the earliest time, the boar hunt formed one of the most exciting of sports, but it was only in this country that the sport was conducted without dogs, a real hand-to-hand -hand contest of man and beast. The hunter, armed only with a boar spear, a weapon about four feet long, the ash staff, guarded by plates of steel, and terminating in a long, narrow, and very sharp blade, this, with a hunting knife, or hanger, completed his offensive arms. Thus equipped, the hunter would either encounter his enemy face to face, confront his desperate charge, as with erect tail, depressed head, and flaming eyes, he rushed with his foamy tusks full against him. Who either sought to pierce his vitals through his counter, or driving his spear through his chine, transfix his heart. Or failing those more difficult aims, plunge it into his flank, and, without withdrawing the weapon, strike his ready hanger into his throat. But expert as the hunter might be, it was not often the formidable brute was so quickly dispatched. For he would sometimes seize the spear in his powerful teeth, and nip it off like a reed, or, coming full tilt on his enemy, by his momentum and weight bear him to the earth, ripping up, with a horrid gash, his leg or side. And before the writhing hunter could draw his knife, the infuriated beast would plunge his snout in the wound, and rip, with savage teeth, the bowels of his victim. At other times, he would suddenly swerve from his charge, and doubling on his opponent, attack the hunter in the rear. From his speed, great weight, and savage disposition, the wild boar is always a dangerous antagonist and requires great courage, coolness, and agility on the part of the hunter. The continental sportsman rides to the chase in a cavalcade, with music and dogs, a kind of small hound or mastiff, and leaving all the honorary part of the contest to them, when the boar is becoming weary, and while beset by the dogs, rides up. And drives his lance home in the beast's back or side. Boar hunting has been for some centuries obsolete in England, the animal no longer existing in a wild state among us. But in our Indian Empire, and especially in Bengal, the pastime is pursued by our countrymen with all the daring of the national character. And as the animal which inhabits the cane brakes and jungles is a formidable foe, the sport is attended with great excitement. The hunters, mounted on small, active horses, and armed only with long lances, ride, at early daylight, to the skirts of the jungle, and having sent in their attendants to beat the cover. Wait till the tusked monster comes crashing from among the canes, when chase is immediately given, till he is come up with, and transfixed by the first weapon. Instead of flight, however, he often turns to bay, and by more than one dead horse and wounded hunter, shows how formidable he is, and what those polished tusks, sharp as pitchforks, can effect, when the enraged animal defends his life. To glaze ham. See recipe number 430. Hashed pork. Ingredients. The remains of cold roast pork, two onions, one teaspoonful of flour, two blades of pounded mace, two cloves, one tablespoonful of vinegar, one half pint of gravy, pepper and salt to taste. Mode. Chop the onions and fry them of a nice brown, cut the pork into thin slices, season them with pepper and salt, and add these to the remaining ingredients. Stew gently for about half an hour, and serve garnished with sip pets of toasted bread. Time. Half an hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 3D. Seasonable from October to March. Fried rashers of bacon and poached eggs. Ingredients. Bacon, eggs. Mode. Cut the bacon into thin slices, trim away the rusty parts, and cut off the rind. Put it into a cold frying pan, that is to say, do not place the pan on the fire before the bacon is in it. 
turn it two or three times, and dish it on a very hot dish. Poach the eggs and slip them on to the bacon, without breaking the yolks, and serve quickly. Time. 3 or 4 minutes. Average cost, 10 d. 2 ones. Per pound for the primest parts. Sufficient. Allow 6 eggs for 3 persons. Seasonable at any time. Note. Fried rashers of bacon, curled, serve as a pretty garnish to many dishes, and, for small families, answer very well as a substitute for boiled bacon, to serve with a small dish of poultry, and broiled rashers of bacon, a breakfast dish. 803. Before purchasing bacon, ascertain that it is perfectly free from rust, which may easily be detected by its yellow color, and for broiling, the streaked part of the thick flank, is generally the most esteemed. Cut it into thin slices, take off the rind, and broil over a nice clear fire, turn it two or three times, and serve very hot. Should there be any cold bacon left from the previous day, it answers very well for breakfast, cut into slices, and broiled or fried. Time. 3 or 4 minutes. Average cost, 10 d. 2 ones. Per pound for the primest parts. Seasonable at any time. Note. When the bacon is cut very thin, the slices may be curled round and fastened by means of small skewers, and fried or toasted before the fire. Boiled bacon. Ingredients. Bacon, water. Illustration, boiled bacon. Mode. As bacon is frequently excessively salt, let it be soaked in warm water for an hour or two previous to dressing it, then pare off the rusty parts, and scrape the underside and rind as clean as possible. Put it into a saucepan of cold water, let it come gradually to a boil, and as fast as the scum rises to the surface of the water, remove it. Let it simmer very gently until it is thoroughly done. Then take it up, strip off the skin, and sprinkle over the bacon a few bread raspings, and garnish with tufts of cauliflower or Brussels sprouts. When served alone, young and tender broad beans or green peas are the usual accompaniments. Time. 1 pound, of bacon, a quarter hour, 2 pounds, 1 and a half hour. Average cost, 10 d. 2 ones. Per pound for the primest parts. Sufficient. 2 pounds, when served with poultry or veal, sufficient for 10 persons. Seasonable at any time. To cure bacon in the Wiltshire way. Ingredients. 1 and a half pounds, of coarse sugar, 1 and a half pounds, of bay salt, 6 ounces of salt petri, 1 pound, of common salt. Mode. Sprinkle each flitch with salt, and let the blood drain off for 24 hours. Then pound and mix the above ingredients well together and rub it well into the meat, which should be turned every day for a month, then hang it to dry, and afterwards smoke it for 10 days. Time. To remain in the pickle one month, to be smoked 10 days. Sufficient. The above quantity of salt for one pig. How pigs were formerly pastured and fed. Though unquestionably far greater numbers of swine are now kept in England than formerly, every peasant having one or more of that useful animal, in feudal times immense droves of pigs were kept by the franklings and barons. In those days the swineherds being a regular part of the domestic service of every feudal household, their duty consisted in daily driving the herd of swine from the castle yard or outlying farm, to the nearest woods, chase, or forest. Where the Franklin or Vavasur had, either by right or grant, what was called free warren, or the liberty to feed his hogs off the acorns, beech, and chestnuts that lay in such abundance on the earth. And far exceeded the power of the royal or privileged game to consume. Indeed, it was the license granted the nobles of free warren, especially for their swine, that kept up the iniquitous forest laws to so late a date, and covered so large a portion of the land with such immense tracts of wood and brake. To the injury of agriculture and the misery of the people. Some idea of the extent to which swine were grazed in the feudal times, may be formed by observing the number of pigs still fed in Epping Forest, the Forest of Dean, and the New Forest, in Hampshire, where, 
for several months of the year. The beech nuts and acorns yield them so plentiful a diet. In Germany, where the chestnut is so largely cultivated, the amount of food shed every autumn is enormous, and consequently the pig, both wild and domestic, has, for a considerable portion of the year, an unfailing supply of admirable nourishment. Impressed with the value of this fruit for the food of pigs, the prince consort has, with great judgment, of late encouraged the collection of chestnuts in Windsor Park. And by giving a small reward to old people and children for every bushel collected, has not only found an occupation for many of the unemployed poor, but, by providing a gratuitous food for their pig, encouraged a feeling of providence and economy. For curing bacon, and keeping it free from rust, Cobbett's recipe. 806. The two sides that remain, and which are called flitches, are to be cured for bacon. They are first rubbed with salt on their insides, or flesh sides, then placed one on the other, the flesh sides uppermost, in a salting trough which has a gut around its edges to drain away the brine. For, to have sweet and fine bacon, the flitches must not be sopping in brine, which gives it the sort of vile taste that barrel and sea pork have. Every one knows how different is the taste of fresh dry salt from that of salt in a dissolved state. Therefore change the salt often, once in four or five days, let it melt and sink in, but not lie too long. Twice change the flitches, put that at bottom which was first on the top, this mode will cost you a great deal more in salt than the sopping mode, but without it your bacon will not be so sweet and fine, nor keep so well. As for the time required in making your flitches sufficiently salt, it depends on circumstances. It takes a longer time for a thick than a thin flitch, and longer in dry than in damp weather, or in a dry than in a damp place. But for the flitches of a hog of five score, in weather not very dry or damp, about six weeks may do, and as yours is to be fat, which receives little injury from oversalting, give time enough, for you are to have bacon until Christmas comes again. 807. The place for salting should, like a dairy, always be cool, but well ventilated, confined air, though cool, will taint meat sooner than the midday day sun accompanied by a breeze. With regard to smoking the bacon, two precautions are necessary, first, to hang the flitches where no rain comes down upon them, and next, that the smoke must proceed from wood, not peat, turf, or coal. As to the time required to smoke a flitch, it depends a good deal upon whether there be a constant fire beneath, and whether the fire be large or small, a month will do, if the fire be pretty constant and rich, as a farmhouse fire usually is. But over smoking, or rather too long hanging in the air, makes the bacon rust, great attention should therefore be paid to this matter. The flitch ought not to be dried up to the hardness of a board, and yet it ought to be perfectly dry. Before you hang it up, lay it on the floor, scatter the flesh side pretty thickly over with bran, or with some fine sawdust, not of deal or fur. Rub it on the flesh, or pat it well down upon it, this keeps the smoke from getting into the little openings, and makes a sort of crust to be dried on. 808. To keep the bacon sweet and good, and free from hoppers, sift fine some clean and dry wood ashes. Put some at the bottom of a box or chest long enough to hold a flitch of bacon. Lay in one flitch, and then put in more ashes, then another flitch, and cover this with six or eight inches of the ashes. The place where the box or chest is kept ought to be dry, and should the ashes become damp, they should be put in the fireplace to dry, and when cold, put back again. With these precautions, the bacon will be as good at the end of the year as on the first day. 809. For simple general rules, these may be safely taken as a guide. And those who implicitly follow the directions given, will possess at the expiration of from six weeks to two months well-flavored and well-cured bacon. Hog not bacon. Anecdote of Lord Bacon. As Lord Bacon, on one occasion, was about to pass sentence of death upon a man of the name of Hogg, who had just been tried for a long career of crime, the prisoner suddenly claimed to be heard in arrest of judgment, saying, With an expression of arch confidence as he addressed the bench, I claim indulgence, my lord, on the plea of relationship. For I am convinced your lordship will never be unnatural enough to hang one of your own family. Indeed, replied the judge, with some amazement, 
I was not aware that I had the honor of your alliance. Perhaps you will be good enough to name the degree of our mutual affinity. I am sorry, my lord, returned the impudent thief, I cannot trace the links of consanguinity, but the moral evidence is sufficiently pertinent. My name, my lord, is Hogg, your lordship's is Bacon, and all the world will allow that Bacon and Hogg are very closely allied. I am sorry, replied his lordship, I cannot admit the truth of your instance, Hogg cannot be Bacon till it is hanged. And so, before I can admit your plea, or acknowledge the family compact, Hogg must be hanged tomorrow morning. To bake a ham. Ingredients. Ham, a common crust. Mode. As a ham for baking should be well soaked, let it remain in water for at least twelve hours. Wipe it dry, trim away any rusty places underneath, and cover it with a common crust, taking care that this is of sufficient thickness all over to keep the gravy in. Place it in a moderately heated oven, and bake for nearly four hours. Take off the crust, and skin, and cover with raspings, the same as for boiled ham, and garnish the knuckle with a paper frill. This method of cooking a ham is, by many persons, considered far superior to boiling it, as it cuts fuller of gravy and has a finer flavor, besides keeping a much longer time good. Time. A medium-sized ham, 4 hours. Average cost, from 8d. To 10d. Per pound by the whole ham. Seasonable all the year. To boil a ham. Illustration, boiled ham. Ingredients. Ham, water, glaze or raspings. Mode. In choosing a ham, ascertain that it is perfectly sweet, by running a sharp knife into it, close to the bone, and if, when the knife is withdrawn, it has an agreeable smell, the ham is good. If, on the contrary, the blade has a greasy appearance and offensive smell, the ham is bad. If it has been long hung, and is very dry and salt, let it remain in soak for 24 hours, changing the water frequently. This length of time is only necessary in the case of its being very hard, from 8 to 12 hours would be sufficient for a Yorkshire or Westmoreland ham. Wash it thoroughly clean, and trim away from the underside, all the rusty and smoked parts, which would spoil the appearance. Put it into a boiling pot, with sufficient cold water to cover it. Bring it gradually to boil, and as the scum rises, carefully remove it. Keep it simmering very gently until tender, and be careful that it does not stop boiling, nor boil too quickly. When done, take it out of the pot, strip off the skin, and sprinkle over it a few fine bread raspings, put a frill of cut paper round the knuckle, and serve. If to be eaten cold, let the ham remain in the water until nearly cold, by this method the juices are kept in, and it will be found infinitely superior to one taken out of the water hot. It should, however, be borne in mind that the ham must not remain in the saucepan all night. When the skin is removed, sprinkle over bread raspings, or, if wanted particularly nice, glaze it. Place a paper frill round the knuckle, and garnish with parsley or cut vegetable flowers. See Colored Plate P. Time. A ham weighing 10 pounds, 4 hours to simmer gently, 15 pounds, 5 hours, a very large one, about 5 hours. Average cost, from 8d. to 10d. Per pound by the whole ham. Seasonable all the year. How to boil a ham to give it an excellent flavor. Ingredients. Vinegar and water. 2 heads of celery, 2 turnips, 3 onions, a large bunch of savory herbs. Mode. Prepare the ham as in the preceding recipe, and let it soak for a few hours in vinegar and water. Put it on in cold water, and when it boils, add the vegetables and herbs. Simmer very gently until tender, take it out, strip off the skin, cover with bread raspings, and put a paper ruche or frill round the knuckle. Time. A ham weighing 10 pounds, 4 hours. Average cost, 8d. To 10d. Per pound by the whole ham. Seasonable at any time. How to silence a pig. Anecdote of Charles V, when the Emperor Charles V. Was one day walking in the neighborhood of Vienna, 
full of pious considerations, engendered by the thoughts of the Dominican cloister he was about to visit, he was much annoyed by the noise of a pig, which a country youth was carrying a little way before him. At length, irritated by the unmitigated noise, have you not learned how to quiet a pig, demanded the imperial traveller, tartly. Noah, replied the ingenuous peasant, ignorant of the quality of his interrogator, Noah. And I should very much like to know how to do it, changing the position of his burthen, and giving his load a surreptitious pinch of the ear, which immediately altered the tone and volume of his complaining. Why, take the pig by the tail, said the emperor, and you will see how quiet he will become. Struck by the novelty of the suggestion, the countryman at once dangled his noisy companion by the tail, and soon discovered that, under the partial congestion caused by its inverted position, the pig had indeed become silent. When, looking with admiration on his august adviser, he exclaimed, Ah, you must have learned the trade much longer than I, for you understand it a great deal better. Fried ham and eggs, a breakfast dish. Ingredients Ham, eggs. Mode. Cut the ham into slices, and take care that they are of the same thickness in every part. Cut off the rind, and if the ham should be particularly hard and salt, it will be found an improvement to soak it for about ten minutes in hot water, and then dry it in a cloth. Put it into a cold frying pan, set it over the fire, and turn the slices three or four times whilst they are cooking. When done, place them on a dish, which should be kept hot in front of the fire during the time the eggs are being poached. Poach the eggs, slip them on to the slices of ham, and serve quickly. Time. 7 or 8 minutes to broil the ham. Average cost, from 8 d. to 10 d. per pound by the whole ham. Seasonable at any time. Note. Ham may also be toasted or broiled. But, with the latter method, to ensure its being well cooked, the fire must be beautifully clear, or it will have a smoky flavor far from agreeable. Potted ham, that will keep good for some time. I. Ingredients. To 4 pounds. Of lean ham allow 1 pound, of fat, 2 teaspoonfuls of pounded mace, 1 half nutmeg grated, rather more than 1 half teaspoonful of cayenne, clarified lard. Mode. Mince the ham, fat and lean together in the above proportion, and pound it well in a mortar, seasoning it with cayenne pepper, pounded mace, and nutmeg. Put the mixture into a deep baking dish and bake for half an hour. Then press it well into a stone jar, fill up the jar with clarified lard, cover it closely, and paste over it a piece of thick paper. If well seasoned, it will keep a long time in winter, and will be found very convenient for sandwiches, and time. Half an hour. Seasonable at any time. 2. A nice addition to the breakfast or luncheon table. Ingredients. To 2 pounds, of lean ham allow half a pound. Of fat, 1 teaspoonful of pounded mace, 1 half teaspoonful of pounded allspice, 1 half nutmeg, pepper to taste, clarified butter. Mode. Cut some slices from the remains of a cold ham, mince them small, and to every 2 pounds. Of lean, allow the above proportion of fat. Pound the ham in a mortar to a fine paste, with the fat, gradually add the seasoning and spices, and be very particular that all the ingredients are well mixed and the spices well pounded. Press the mixture into potting pots, pour over clarified butter, and keep it in a cool place. Average cost for this quantity, 2s. 6d. Seasonable at any time. Importance of the boar's head, Scottish feuds, and k. The boar's head, in ancient times, formed the most important dish on the table, and was invariably the first placed on the board upon Christmas Day, being preceded by a body of servitors, a flourish of trumpets, and other marks of distinction and reverence, and carried into the hall by the individual of next rank to the lord of the feast. At some of our colleges and inns of court, the serving of the boar's head on a silver platter on Christmas Day is a custom still followed. Until very lately, a boar's head was competed for at Christmas time by the young men of a rural parish in Essex. Indeed, 
So highly was the grisly boar's head regarded in former times, that it passed into a cognizance of some of the noblest families in the realm, thus it was not only the crest of the Nevilles and Warwicks, with their collateral houses. But it was the cognizance of Richard III. That wretched, bloody, and usurping boar. That spoiled your summer fields and fruitful vines. Swills your warm blood like wash, and makes his trough. In your emboweled bosoms. And whose nature it was supposed to typify. And was universally used as a sign to taverns. The boar's head in East Cheap, which, till within the last twenty-five years still stood in all its primitive quaintness, though removed to make way for the London Bridge approaches, will live vividly in the mind of every reader of Shakespeare. As the resort of the Prince of Wales, Poins, and his companions, and the residence of Falstaff and his coney-catching knaves, Bardolph, Pistol, and N.Y.M. And whose sign was a boar's head, carved in stone over the door, and a smaller one in wood on each side of the doorway. The traditions and deeds of savage vengeance recorded in connection with this grim trophy of the chase are numerous in all parts of Europe. But the most remarkable connected with the subject in this country, were two events that occurred in Scotland, about the 11th and 15th centuries. A border family having been dispossessed of their castle and lands by a more powerful chief, were reduced for many years to great indigence, the expelled owner only living in the hope of wreaking a terrible vengeance, which, agreeably to the motto of his house, he was content to bide his time for. The usurper having invited a large number of his kindred to a grand hunt in his new domains, and a feast after in the great hall, returned from the chase, and discovering the feast not spread, vented his wrath in no measured terms on the heads of the tardy servitors. At length a menial approached, followed by a line of servants, and placing the boar's head on the table, the guests rushed forward to begin the meal, when, to their horror, they discovered, not a boar's but a bull's head, a sign of death. The doors were immediately closed, and the false servants, who were the adherents of the dispossessed chief, threw off their disguise, and falling on the usurper and his friends, butchered them and every soul in the castle belonging to the rival faction. A tribe of Caterans, or mountain robbers, in the western highlands, having been greatly persecuted by a powerful chief of the district, waylaid him and his retinue, put them all to the sword, and cutting off the chief's head, repaired to his castle, where they ordered the terrified wife to supply them with food and drink. To appease their savage humor, the lady gave order for their entertainment, and on returning to the hall to see her orders were complied with, discovered, in place of the boar's head that should have graced the board, her husband's bleeding head. The savage caterans, in rude derision, as a substitute for the apple or lemon usually placed between the jaws, having thrust a slice of bread in the dead man's mouth. For curing hams, mons. Ude's recipe. Ingredients. For two hams weighing about sixteen or eighteen pounds, each, allow one pound, of moist sugar, one pound, of common salt, two ounces of saltpetri, one quart of good vinegar. Mode. As soon as the pig is cold enough to be cut up, take the two hams and rub them well with common salt, and leave them in a large pan for three days. When the salt has drawn out all the blood, drain the hams, and throw the brine away. Mix sugar, salt, and saltpetri together in the above proportion, rub the hams well with these, and put them into a vessel large enough to hold them, always keeping the salt over them. Let them remain for three days, then pour over them a quart of good vinegar. Turn them in the brine every day for a month, then drain them well, and rub them with bran. Have them smoked over a wood fire, and be particular that the hams are hung as high up as possible from the fire, otherwise the fat will melt, and they will become dry and hard. Time. To be pickled one month, to be smoked one month. Sufficient for two hams of eighteen pounds each. Seasonable from October to March. The price of a sow in Africa. In one of the native states of Africa, a pig one day stole a piece of food from a child as it was in the act of conveying the morsel to its mouth. Upon which the robbed child cried so loud that the mother rushed out of her hovel to ascertain the cause. And seeing the purloining pig make off munching his booty, the woman in her heat struck the grunter so smart a blow, 
that the surly rascal took it into his head to go home very much indisposed, and after a certain time resolved to die. A resolution that he accordingly put into practice. Upon which the owner instituted judicial proceedings before the Star Chamber Court of his tribe, against the husband and family of the woman whose rash act had led to such results. And as the pig happened to be a sow, in the very flower of her age, the prospective loss to the owner in unnumbered teams of pigs, with the expenses attending so high a tribunal, swelled the damages and costs to such a sum, that it was found impossible to pay them. And as, in the barbarous justice existing among these rude people, every member of a family is equally liable as the individual who committed the wrong, the father, mother, children, relatives, an entire community, to the number of thirty-two souls, were sold as slaves, and a fearful sum of human misery perpetrated, to pay the value of a thieving old sow. Two salt two hams, about twelve or fifteen pounds, each. Ingredients. Two pounds, of treacle, half a pound, of saltpetri, one pound, of bay salt, two pounds of common salt. Mode. Two days before they are put into pickle, rub the hams well with salt, to draw away all slime and blood. Throw what comes from them away, and then rub them with treacle, saltpetri, and salt. Lay them in a deep pan, and let them remain one day. Boil the above proportion of treacle, saltpetri, bay salt, and common salt for a quarter hour, and pour this pickle boiling hot over the hams, there should be sufficient of it to cover them. For a day or two rub them well with it. Afterwards they will only require turning. They ought to remain in this pickle for three weeks or a month, and then be sent to be smoked, which will take nearly or quite a month to do. An ox tongue pickled in this way is most excellent, to be eaten either green or smoked. Time. To remain in the pickle three weeks or a month, to be smoked about a month. Seasonable from October to March. To cure sweet hams in the Westmoreland way. Ingredients. Three pounds, of common salt, three pounds, of coarse sugar, one pound, of bay salt, three quarts of strong beer. Mode. Before the hams are put into pickle, rub them the preceding day well with salt, and drain the brine well from them. Put the above ingredients into a saucepan, and boil for a quarter hour, pour over the hams, and let them remain a month in the pickle. Rub and turn them every day, but do not take them out of the pickling pan, and have them smoked for a month. Time. To be pickled one month, to be smoked one month. Seasonable from October to March. Two pickle hams, Suffolk recipe. Ingredients. To a ham from 10 to 12 pounds, allow 1 pound, of coarse sugar, 3 quarters pound, of salt, 1 ounce. Of salt petri, 1 half a teacupful of vinegar. Mode. Rub the hams well with common salt, and leave them for a day or two to drain, then rub well in, the above proportion of sugar, salt, saltpetri, and vinegar, and turn them every other day. Keep them in the pickle one month, drain them, and send them to be smoked over a wood fire for three weeks or a month. Time. To remain in the pickle one month. To be smoked three weeks or one month. Sufficient. The above proportion of pickle sufficient for one ham. Seasonable. Hams should be pickled from October to March. Novel way of recovering a stolen pig. It is a well-known fact, that in Ireland the pig is, in every respect, a domesticated animal, sharing often both the bed and board of the family, and making an outer ring to the domestic circle, as, seated round the pot of potatoes. They partake of the midday meal called dinner. An Irishman upon one occasion having lost an interesting member of his household, in the form of a promising young porker, consulted his priest on the occasion. And having hinted at the person he suspected of purloining the elegant slip of a pig, he was advised to take no further notice of the matter, but leave the issue to his spiritual adviser. Next Sunday his reverence, after Mass, came to the front of the altar rails, and looking very hard at the supposed culprit, exclaimed, Who stole Pat Doolan's pig? To this inquiry there was of course no answer. The priest did not expect there would be any. The following Sunday the same query was propounded a little stronger, Who of you was it, 
I say, who stole poor Pat Doolan's pig. It now became evident that the culprit was a hardened sinner. So on the third Sunday, instead of repeating the unsatisfactory inquiry, the priest, after, as usual, eyeing the obdurate offender, said, in a tone of pious sorrow, Mike Reagan, Mike Reagan, you treat me with contempt. That night, when the family was all asleep, the latch of the door was noiselessly lifted, and the elegant slip of a pig cautiously slipped into the cabin. To smoke hams and fish at home. 820. Take an old hogshead, stop up all the crevices, and fix a place to put a cross stick near the bottom, to hang the articles to be smoked on. Next, in the side, cut a hole near the top, to introduce an iron pan filled with sawdust and small pieces of green wood. Having turned the tub upside down, hang the articles upon the cross stick, introduce the iron pan in the opening, and place a piece of red-hot iron in the pan, cover it with sawdust, and all will be complete. Let a large ham remain forty hours, and keep up a good smoke. To cure bacon or hams in the Devonshire way. Ingredients To every fourteen pounds, of meat, allow two ounces of salt petri, two ounces of salt prunella, one pound, of common salt. For the pickle, three gallons of water, five pounds, of common salt, seven pounds, of coarse sugar, three pounds, of bay salt. Mode. Weigh the sides, hams, and cheeks, and to every fourteen pounds allow the above proportion of salt petri, salt prunella, and common salt. Pound and mix these together, and rub well into the meat, lay it in a stone trough or tub, rubbing it thoroughly, and turning it daily for two successive days. At the end of the second day, pour on it a pickle made as follows, put the above ingredients into a saucepan, set it on the fire, and stir frequently, remove all the scum, allow it to boil for a quarter hour, and pour it hot over the meat. Let the hams, and k, be well rubbed and turned daily, if the meat is small, a fortnight will be sufficient for the sides and shoulders to remain in the pickle, and the hams three weeks, if from thirty pounds. And upwards, three weeks will be required for the sides, and k, and from four to five weeks for the hams. On taking the pieces out, let them drain for an hour, Cover with dry sawdust and smoke from a fortnight to three weeks. Boil and carefully skim the pickle after using, and it will keep good, closely corked, for two years. When boiling it for use, add about two pounds of common salt and the same of treacle to allow for waste. Tongues are excellent put into this pickle cold, having been first rubbed well with saltpetri and salt and allowed to remain twenty-four hours, not forgetting to make a deep incision under the thick part of the tongue. So as to allow the pickle to penetrate more readily. A fortnight or three weeks, according to the size of the tongue, will be sufficient. Time, small meat to remain in the pickle a fortnight, hams three weeks, to be smoked from a fortnight to three weeks. The following is from Morton's Cyclopedia of Agriculture, and will be found fully worthy of the high character of that publication. Curing of Hams and Bacon 822. The carcass of the hog, after hanging overnight to cool, is laid on a strong bench or stool, and the head is separated from the body at the neck, close behind the ears, the feet and also the internal fat are removed. The carcass is next divided into two sides in the following manner. The ribs are divided about an inch from the spine on each side, and the spine, with the ends of the ribs attached, together with the internal flesh between it and the kidneys. And also the flesh above it, throughout the whole length of the sides, are removed. The portion of the carcass thus cut out is in the form of a wedge, the breadth of the interior consisting of the breadth of the spine, and about an inch of the ribs on each side being diminished to about half an inch at the exterior or skin along the back. The breastbone, and also the first anterior rib, are also dissected from the side. Sometimes the whole of the ribs are removed, but this, for reasons afterwards to be noticed, is a very bad practice. When the hams are cured separately from the sides, which is generally the case, they are cut out so as to include the hock bone, in a similar manner to the London mode of cutting a haunch of mutton. The carcass of the hog thus cut up is ready for being salted, which process, in large carrying establishments, is generally as follows. 
The skin side of the pork is rubbed over with a mixture of 50 parts by weight of salt, and one part of salt petri in powder, and the incised parts of the ham or flitch, and the inside of the flitch covered with the same. The salted bacon, in pairs of flitches with the insides to each other, is piled one pair of flitches above another on benches slightly inclined, and furnished with spouts or troughs to convey the brine to receivers in the floor of the salting house. To be afterwards used for pickling pork for navy purposes. In this state the bacon remains a fortnight, which is sufficient for flitches cut from nogs of a carcass weight less than 15 stone, 14 pounds, to the stone. Flitches of a larger size, at the expiration of that time, are wiped dry and reversed in their place in the pile, having, at the same time, about half the first quantity of fresh, dry, common salt sprinkled over the inside and incised parts. After which they remain on the benches for another week. Hams being thicker than flitches, will require, when less than 20 pounds, weight, 3 weeks, and when above that weight, 4 weeks to remain under the above described process. The next and last process in the preparation of bacon and hams, previous to being sent to market, is drying. This is effected by hanging the flitches and hams for two or three weeks in a room heated by stoves, or in a smokehouse. In which they are exposed for the same length of time to the smoke arising from the slow combustion of the sawdust of oak or other hardwood. The latter mode of completing the curing process has some advantages over the other, as by it the meat is subject to the action of creosote, a volatile oil produced by the combustion of the sawdust, which is powerfully antiseptic. The process also furnishing a thin covering of a resinous varnish, excludes the air not only from the muscle but also from the fat, thus effectually preventing the meat from becoming rusted. And the principal reasons for condemning the practice of removing the ribs from the flitches of pork are, that by so doing the meat becomes unpleasantly hard and pungent in the process of salting, and by being more opposed to the action of the air, becomes sooner and more extensively rusted. Notwithstanding its superior efficacy in completing the process of curing, the flavor which smoke drying imparts to meat is disliked by many persons, and it is therefore by no means the most general mode of drying adopted by mercantile curers. A very impure variety of pyroligneous acid, or vinegar made from the destructive distillation of wood, is sometimes used, on account of the highly preservative power of the creosote which it contains, and also to impart the smoke flavor. In which latter object, however, the coarse flavor of tar is given, rather than that derived from the smoke from combustion of wood. A considerable portion of the bacon and hams salted in Ireland is exported from that country packed amongst salt, in bales, immediately from the salting process, without having been in any degree dried. In the process of salting above described, pork loses from 8 to 10 percent of its weight, according to the size and quality of the meat and a further diminution of weight, to the extent of 5 to 6 percent. Takes place in drying during the first fortnight after being taken out of salt, so that the total loss in weight occasioned by the preparation of bacon and hams in a proper state for market, is not less on an average than 15 percent. On the weight of the fresh pork. Collared pig's face, a breakfast or luncheon dish. Ingredients. 1 pig's face, salt. For brine, 1 gallon of spring water, 1 pound. Of common salt, 1 half handful of chopped juniper berries, 6 bruised cloves, 2 bay leaves, a few sprigs of thyme, basil, sage, a quarter ounce of salt petri. For forcemeat, half a pound, of ham, half a pound, bacon, 1 teaspoonful of mixed spices, pepper to taste, a quarter pound. Of lard, 1 tablespoonful of minced parsley, 6 young onions. Illustration, Pig's Face Mode Singe the head carefully, bone it without breaking the skin, and rub it well with salt. Make the brine by boiling the above ingredients for a quarter hour, and letting it stand to cool. When cold, pour it over the head, and let it steep in this for ten days, turning and rubbing it often. Then wipe, drain, and dry it. For the forcemeat, pound the ham and bacon very finely, and mix with these the remaining ingredients, taking care that the whole is thoroughly incorporated. Spread this equally over the head, roll it tightly in a cloth, and bind it securely with broad tape. 
put it into a saucepan with a few meat trimmings, and cover it with stock. Let it simmer gently for four hours, and be particular that it does not stop boiling the whole time. When quite tender, take it up, put it between two dishes with a heavy weight on the top, and when cold, remove the cloth and tape. It should be sent to table on a napkin, or garnished with a piece of deep white paper with a ruche at the top. Time. 4 hours. Average cost, from 2s. To 2s. 6d. Seasonable from October to March. The wild and domestic hog. The domestic hog is the descendant of a race long since banished from this island. And it is remarkable, that while the tamed animal has been and is kept under surveillance, the wild type whence this race sprung, has maintained itself in its ancient freedom, the fierce denizen of the forest. And one of the renowned beasts of the chase. Whatever doubt may exist as to the true origin of the dog, the horse, the ox, and others, or as to whether their original race is yet extant or not, these doubts do not apply to the domestic hog. Its wild source still exists, and is universally recognized, like the wolf, however, it has been expelled from our island, but, like that animal, it still roams through the vast wooded tracks of Europe and Asia. 2 Dress Pigs FRY, A Savory Dish Ingredients 1 and a half pounds, of pig's fry, 2 onions, a few sage leaves, 3 pounds, of potatoes, pepper and salt to taste. Mode Put the lean fry at the bottom of a pie dish, sprinkle over it some minced sage and onion, and a seasoning of pepper and salt. Slice the potatoes, put a layer of these on the seasoning, then the fat fry, then more seasoning, and a layer of potatoes at the top. Fill the dish with boiling water, and bake for two hours, or rather longer. Time. Rather more than two hours. Average cost, 6d. Per lb. Sufficient for three or four persons. Seasonable from October to March. To melt lard. 825. Melt the inner fat of the pig, by putting it in a stone jar, and placing this in a saucepan of boiling water, previously stripping off the skin. Let it simmer gently over a bright fire, and as it melts, pour it carefully from the sediment. Put it into small jars or bladders for use, and keep it in a cool place. The fleet or inside fat of the pig, before it is melted, makes exceedingly light crust, and is particularly wholesome. It may be preserved a length of time by salting it well, and occasionally changing the brine. When wanted for use, wash and wipe it, and it will answer for making into paste as well as fresh lard. Average cost, 10 d. Per lb. Boiled leg of pork. Ingredients. Leg of pork, salt. Mode. For boiling, choose a small, compact, well-filled leg, and rub it well with salt, let it remain in pickle for a week or ten days, turning and rubbing it every day. An hour before dressing it, put it into cold water for an hour, which improves the color. If the pork is purchased ready salted, ascertain how long the meat has been in pickle, and soak it accordingly. Put it into a boiling pot, with sufficient cold water to cover it, let it gradually come to a boil, and remove the scum as it rises. Simmer it very gently until tender, and do not allow it to boil fast, or the knuckle will fall to pieces before the middle of the leg is done. Carrots, turnips, or parsnips may be boiled with the pork, some of which should be laid round the dish as a garnish, and a well-made peas pudding is an indispensable accompaniment. Time. A leg of pork weighing 8 pounds. 3 hours after the water boils, and to be simmered very gently. Average cost. 9d. Per lb. Sufficient for 7 or 8 persons. Seasonable from September to March. Note. The liquor in which a leg of pork has been boiled, makes excellent pea soup. Antiquity of the hog. The hog has survived changes which have swept multitudes of pachydermatous animals from the surface of our earth. It still presents the same characteristics, both physical and moral, which the earliest writers, whether sacred or profane, have faithfully delineated. Although the domestic has been more or less modified by long culture, 
yet the wild species remains unaltered, insomuch that the fossil relics may be identified with the bones of their existing descendants. Roast Griskin of Pork Ingredients Pork, a little powdered sage. Illustration, spare rib of pork. Illustration, griskin of pork. Mode. As this joint frequently comes to table hard and dry, particular care should be taken that it is well basted. Put it down to a bright fire, and flour it. About ten minutes before taking it up, sprinkle over some powdered sage, make a little gravy in the dripping pan, strain it over the meat and serve with a tureen of applesauce. This joint will be done in far less time than when the skin is left on, consequently, should have the greatest attention that it be not dried up. Time. Griskin of pork weighing 6 pounds, 1 and a half hour. Average cost, 7d. Per lb. Sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable from September to March. Note. A spare rib of pork is roasted in the same manner as above, and would take one and a half hour for one weighing about six pounds. Illustration, bacon for larding, and larding needle. Larding. Ingredients. Bacon and larding needle. Mode. Bacon for larding should be firm and fat, and ought to be cured without any salt petri, as this reddens white meats. Lay it on a table, the rinds downwards. Trim off any rusty part, and cut it into slices of an equal thickness. Place the slices one on the top of another, and cut them evenly into narrow strips, so arranging it that every piece of bacon is of the same size. Bacon for fricando, poultry, and game, should be about two inches in length, and rather more than one-eighth of an inch in width. If for larding fillets of beef or loin of veal, the pieces of bacon must be thicker. The following recipe of Sawyer is, we think, very explicit, and any cook, by following the directions here given, may be able to lard, if not well, sufficiently for general use. Have the fricando trimmed, lay it, lengthwise, upon a clean napkin across your hand, forming a kind of bridge with your thumb at the part you are about to commence at. Then with the point of the larding needle make three distinct lines across, half an inch apart, run the needle into the third line, at the further side of the fricando, and bring it out at the first, placing one of the lardoons in it. Draw the needle through, leaving out a quarter inch of the bacon at each line, proceed thus to the end of the row. Then make another line, half an inch distant, stick in another row of lardoons, bringing them out at the second line, leaving the ends of the bacon out all the same length. Make the next row again at the same distance, bringing the ends out between the lardoons of the first row, proceeding in this manner until the whole surface is larded in checkered rows. Everything else is larded in a similar way. And, in the case of poultry, hold the breast over a charcoal fire for one minute, or dip it into boiling water, in order to make the flesh firm. Roast loin of pork. Ingredients. Pork, a little salt. Illustration, forloin of pork. Illustration, hind loin of pork. Mode. Score the skin in strips rather more than a quarter inch apart, and place the joint at a good distance from the fire, on account of the crackling, which would harden before the meat would be heated through, were it placed too near. If very lean, it should be rubbed over with a little salad oil, and kept well basted all the time it is at the fire. Pork should be very thoroughly cooked, but not dry. And be careful never to send it to table the least underdone, as nothing is more unwholesome and disagreeable than underdressed white meats. Serve with apple sauce, number 363, and a little gravy made in the dripping pan. A stuffing of sage and onion may be made separately, and baked in a flat dish, this method is better than putting it in the meat, as many persons have so great an objection to the flavor. Time. A loin of pork weighing 5 pounds. About 2 hours, allow more time should it be very fat. Average cost, 9d. Per lb. Sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable from September to March. Fossil remains of the hog. In British strata, the oldest fossil remains of the hog which Professor Owen states that he has examined, were from fissures in the red crag, 
probably Miocene, of Newborn, near Woodbridge, Suffolk. They were associated with teeth of an extinct felis about the size of a leopard, with those of a bear, and with remains of a large cervus. These mammalian remains were found with the ordinary fossils of the red crag, they had undergone the same process of trituration, and were impregnated with the same coloring matter as the associated bones and teeth of fishes acknowledged to be derived from the regular strata of the red crag. These mammaliferous beds have been proved by Mr. Lyell to be older than the Fluvio Marine, or Norwich Crag, in which remains of the mastodon, rhinoceros, and horse have been discovered. And still older than the freshwater Pleistocene deposits, from which the remains of the mammoth, rhinoceros, and k are obtained in such abundance. I have met, says the professor, in addition, with some satisfactory instances of the association of fossil remains of a species of hog with those of the mammoth, in the newer Pliocene freshwater formations of England. To dry pig's cheeks. Ingredients. Salt, 4 ounces of saltpetri, 2 ounces of bay salt, 4 ounces of coarse sugar. Mode. Cut out the snout, remove the brains, and split the head, taking off the upper bone to make the jowl a good shape rub it well with salt. Next day take away the brine, and salt it again the following day, cover the head with salt petri, bay salt, and coarse sugar, in the above proportion, adding a little common salt. Let the head be often turned, and when it has been in the pickle for ten days, smoke it for a week or rather longer. Time. To remain in the pickle ten days, to be smoked one week. Seasonable. Should be made from September to March. Note. A pig's check, or bath chap, will take about two hours after the water boils. Pig's liver, a savory and economical dish. Ingredients. The liver and lights of a pig, six or seven slices of bacon, potatoes, one large bunch of parsley, two onions, two sage leaves, pepper and salt to taste, a little broth or water. Mode. Slice the liver and lights, and wash these perfectly clean, and parboil the potatoes, mince the parsley and sage, and chop the onion rather small. Put the meat, potatoes, and bacon into a deep tin dish, in alternate layers, with a sprinkling of the herbs, and a seasoning of pepper and salt between each, pour on a little water or broth, and bake in a moderately heated oven for two hours. Time. Two hours. Average cost. 1s. 6d. Sufficient for 6 or 7 persons. Seasonable from September to March. Pig's Petitos. Ingredients. A thin slice of bacon, 1 onion, 1 blade of mace, 6 peppercorns, 3 or 4 sprigs of thyme, 1 pint of gravy, pepper and salt to taste, thickening of butter and flour. Mode. Put the liver, heart, and pettitoes into a stew pan with the bacon, mace, peppercorns, thyme, onion, and gravy, and simmer these gently for a quarter hour, then take out the heart and liver, and mince them very fine. Keep stewing the feet until quite tender, which will be in from twenty minutes to half an hour, reckoning from the time that they boiled up first. Then put back the minced liver, thicken the gravy with a little butter and flour, Season with pepper and salt and simmer over a gentle fire for five minutes, occasionally stirring the contents. Dish the mince, split the feet and arrange them round alternately with sippets of toasted bread, and pour the gravy in the middle. Time. Altogether 40 minutes. Sufficient for three or four persons. Seasonable from September to March. To pickle pork. Ingredients. A quarter pound of salt petri, salt. Mode. As pork does not keep long without being salted, cut it into pieces of a suitable size as soon as the pig is cold. Rub the pieces of pork well with salt, and put them into a pan with a sprinkling of it between each piece, as it melts on the top, strew on more. Lay a coarse cloth over the pan, a board over that, and a weight on the board, to keep the pork down in the brine. If excluded from the air, it will continue good for nearly two years. Average cost, 10 d. Per pound for the prime parts. Seasonable. The best time for pickling meat is late in the autumn. 
The Universality of the Hog A singular circumstance in the domestic history of the hog, is the extent of its distribution over the surface of the earth. Being found even in insulated places, where the inhabitants are semi-barbarous, and where the wild species is entirely unknown. The South Sea Islands, for example, were found on their discovery to be well stocked with a small black hog. And the traditionary belief of the people was that these animals were coeval with the origin of themselves. Yet they possessed no knowledge of the wild boar, or any other animal of the hog kind, from which the domestic breed might be supposed to be derived. In these islands the hog is the principal quadruped, and the fruit of the bread tree is its principal food, although it is also fed with yams, edos, and other vegetables. This nutritious diet, which it has in great abundance, is, according to Foster, the reason of its flesh being so delicious, so full of juice, and so rich in fat, which is not less delicate to the taste than the finest butter. To Boil Pickled Pork Ingredients Pork, Water Mode Should the pork be very salt, let it remain in water about two hours before it is dressed. Put it into a saucepan with sufficient cold water to cover it, let it gradually come to a boil, then gently simmer until quite tender. Allow ample time for it to cook, as nothing is more disagreeable than underdone pork, and when boiled fast, the meat becomes hard. This is sometimes served with boiled poultry in roast veal, instead of bacon, when tender, and not over salt, it will be found equally good. Time A piece of pickled pork weighing 2 pounds, 1 to a quarter hour, 4 pounds, rather more than 2 hours. Average cost, 10 d. Per pound for the primest parts. Seasonable at any time. The antiquity of the hog. By what nation and in what period the hog was reclaimed, is involved in the deepest obscurity. So far back as we have any records of history, we find notices of this animal, and of its flesh being used as the food of man. By some nations, however, its flesh was denounced as unclean, and therefore prohibited to be used, whilst by others it was esteemed as a great delicacy. By the Mosaic law it was forbidden to be eaten by the Jews, and the Mohammedans hold it in utter abhorrence. Dar. Kiddo, however, says that there does not appear to be any reason in the law of Moses why the hog should be held in such peculiar abomination. There seems nothing to have prevented the Jews, if they had been so inclined, to rear pigs for sale, or for the use of the land. In the Talmud there are some indications that this was actually done. And it was, probably, for such purposes that the herds of swine mentioned in the New Testament were kept, although it is usual to consider that they were kept by the foreign settlers in the land. Indeed, the story which accounts for the peculiar aversion of the Hebrews to the hog, assumes that it did not originate until about 130 years before Christ and that, previously, some Jews were in the habit of rearing hogs for the purposes indicated. Pork Pies, Warwickshire Recipe Ingredients For the crust, 5 pounds, of lard to 14 pounds, of flour, milk, and water. For filling the pies, to every 3 pounds, of meat allow 1 ounce of salt, 2 and a quarter ounces. Of pepper, a small quantity of cayenne, 1 pint of water. Mode Rub into the flour a portion of the lard, the remainder put with sufficient milk and water to mix the crust, and boil this gently for a quarter hour. Pour it boiling on the flour, and knead and beat it till perfectly smooth. Now raise the crust in either a round or oval form, cut up the pork into pieces the size of a nut, season it in the above proportion, and press it compactly into the pie, in alternate layers of fat and lean, and pour in a small quantity of water. Lay on the lid, Cut the edges smoothly round, and pinch them together. Bake in a brick oven, which should be slow, as the meat is very solid. Very frequently, the inexperienced cook finds much difficulty in raising the crust. She should bear in mind that it must not be allowed to get cold, or it will fall immediately. To prevent this, the operation should be performed as near the fire as possible. As considerable dexterity and expertness are necessary to raise the crust with the hand only, a glass bottle or small jar may be placed in the middle of the paste, and the crust molded on this, 
but be particular that it is kept warm the whole time. Sufficient. The proportions for one pie are one pound of flour and three pounds of meat. Seasonable from September to March. The flesh of swine in hot climates. It is observed by M. Suniny that the flesh of swine, in hot climates, is considered unwholesome, and therefore may account for its proscription by the legislators and priests of the East. In Egypt, Syria, and even the southern parts of Greece, although both white and delicate, it is so flabby and surcharged with fat, that it disagrees with the strongest stomachs. Abstinence from it in general was, therefore, indispensable to health under the burning suns of Egypt and Arabia. The Egyptians were permitted to eat it only once a year, on the Feast of the Moon. And then they sacrificed a number of these animals to that planet. At other seasons, should any one even touch a hog, he was obliged immediately to plunge into the river Nile, as he stood, with his clothes on, in order to purify himself from the supposed contamination he had contracted by the touch. Little Raised Pork Pies Ingredients 2 pounds of flour half a pound, of butter, half a pound, of mutton suet, salt and white pepper to taste, four pounds, of the neck of pork, one dessert spoonful of powdered sage. Mode. Well dry the flour, mince the suet, and put these with the butter into a saucepan, to be made hot, and add a little salt. When melted, mix it up into a stiff paste, and put it before the fire with a cloth over it until ready to make up. Chop the pork into small pieces, season it with white pepper, salt, and powdered sage, divide the paste into rather small pieces, raise it in a round or oval form, fill with the meat and bake in a brick oven. These pies will require a fiercer oven than those in the preceding recipe, as they are made so much smaller, and consequently do not require so soaking a heat. Time If made small, about one and a half hour. Seasonable from September to March. Swineherds of Antiquity. From the prejudice against the hog among the ancients, those who tended them formed an isolated class, and were esteemed as the outcasts of society. However much the flesh of the animal was esteemed by the Greeks and Romans, yet the swineherd is not mentioned by either the classic writers or the poets who, in ancient Greece and Rome, painted rural life. We have no descriptions of gods or heroes descending to the occupation of keeping swine. The swineherd is never introduced into the idols of Theocritus, nor has Virgil admitted him into his eclogues. The Eumius of Homer is the only exception that we have of a swineherd meeting with favor in the eyes of a poet of antiquity. This may be accounted for, on the supposition that the prejudices of the Egyptians relative to this class of men, extended to both Greece and Italy, and imparted a bias to popular opinion. To make sausages. Author's Oxford Recipe. Ingredients. One pound, of pork, fat and lean, without skin or gristle, one pound, of lean veal, one pound, of beef suet, half a pound. Of bread crumbs, the rind of one half lemon, one small nutmeg, six sage leaves, one teaspoonful of pepper, two teaspoonfuls of salt, one half teaspoonful of savory, one half teaspoonful of marjoram. Mode. Chop the pork, veal, and suet finely together, add the bread crumbs, lemon peel, which should be well minced, and a small nutmeg grated. Wash and chop the sage leaves very finely. Add these with the remaining ingredients to the sausage meat, and when thoroughly mixed, either put the meat into skins, or, when wanted for table, form it into little cakes, which should be floured and fried. Average cost, for this quantity, 2s. 6d. Sufficient for about 30 moderate-sized sausages. Seasonable from October to March. The Hog in England. From time immemorial, in England, this animal has been esteemed as of the highest importance. In the Anglo-Saxon period, vast herds of swine were tended by men, who watched over their safety, and who collected them under shelter at night. At that time, the flesh of the animal was the staple article of consumption in every family, and a large portion of the wealth of the rich freemen of the country consisted of these animals. Hence it was common to make bequests of swine, with lands for their support. And to these were attached rights and privileges in connection with their feeding, 
and the extent of woodland to be occupied by a given number was granted in accordance with established rules. This is proved by an ancient Saxon grant, quoted by Sharon Turner, in his History of the Anglo-Saxons. Where the right of pasturage is conveyed in a deed by the following words, I give food for seventy swine in that woody allotment which the countrymen call Wolfordenleg. Fried Sausages Illustration, Fried Sausages Ingredients Sausages, a small piece of butter. Mode Prick the sausages with a fork, this prevents them from bursting, and put them into a frying pan with a small piece of butter. Keep moving the pan about, and turn the sausages three or four times. In from 10 to 12 minutes they will be sufficiently cooked, unless they are very large, when a little more time should be allowed for them. Dish them with or without a piece of toast under them, and serve very hot. In some counties, sausages are boiled and served on toast. They should be plunged into boiling water, and simmered for about 10 or 12 minutes. Time. 10 to 12 minutes. Average cost, 10 d. Per lb. Seasonable. Good from September to March. Note. Sometimes, in close warm weather, sausages very soon turn sour, to prevent this, put them in the oven for a few minutes with a small piece of butter to keep them moist. When wanted for table, they will not require so long frying as uncooked sausages. The Saxon Swineherd The men employed in herding swine during the Anglo-Saxon period of our history were, in general, thralls or born slaves of the soil, who were assisted by powerful dogs. Capable even of singly contending with the wolf until his master came with his spear to the rescue. In the Ivanhoe of Sir Walter Scott, we have an admirable picture, in the character of Geth, an Anglo-Saxon swineherd, as we also have of his master, a large landed proprietor, a great portion of whose wealth consisted of swine, and whose rude but plentiful board was liberally supplied with the flesh. Sausage Meat Cakes Ingredients To every pound of lean pork, add three quarters pound, of fat bacon, a quarter ounce of salt, one salt spoonful of pepper, one quarter teaspoonful of grated nutmeg, 1 teaspoonful of minced parsley. Mode. Remove from the pork all skin, gristle, and bone, and chop it finely with the bacon, add the remaining ingredients, and carefully mix all together. Pound it well in a mortar, make it into convenient-sized cakes, flour these, and fry them a nice brown for about 10 minutes. This is a very simple method of making sausage meat, and on trial will prove very good, its great recommendation being, that it is so easily made. Time. 10 minutes. Seasonable from September to March. To scald a sucking pig. 840. Put the pig into cold water directly it is killed, let it remain for a few minutes, then immerse it in a large pan of boiling water for two minutes. Take it out, lay it on a table, and pull off the hair as quickly as possible. When the skin looks clean, make a slit down the belly, Take out the entrails, well clean the nostrils and ears, wash the pig in cold water, and wipe it thoroughly dry. Take off the feet at the first joint, and loosen and leave sufficient skin to turn neatly over. If not to be dressed immediately, fold it in a wet cloth to keep it from the air. The learned pig. That the pig is capable of education, is a fact long known to the world, and though, like the ass, naturally stubborn and obstinate, that he is equally amenable with other animals to caresses and kindness, has been shown from very remote time. The best modern evidence of his docility, however, is the instance of the learned pig, first exhibited about a century since. But which has been continued down to our own time by repeated instances of an animal who will put together all the letters or figures that compose the day, month, hour, and date of the exhibition, besides many other unquestioned evidences of memory. The instance already given of breaking a sow into a pointer, till she became more stanch even than the dog itself, though surprising, is far less wonderful than that evidence of education where so generally obtuse an animal may be taught not only to spell, but couple figures and give dates correctly. Roast Sucking Pig Ingredients Pig, 6 ounces of bread crumbs, 16 sage leaves, 
pepper and salt to taste, a piece of butter the size of an egg, salad oil or butter to baste with, about one half pint of gravy, one tablespoonful of lemon juice. Illustration, Roast Sucking Pig Mode A sucking pig, to be eaten in perfection, should not be more than three weeks old, and should be dressed the same day that it is killed. After preparing the pig for cooking, as in the preceding recipe, stuff it with finely grated bread crumbs, minced sage, pepper, salt, and a piece of butter the size of an egg, all of which should be well mixed together. And put into the body of the pig. Sew up the slit neatly, and truss the legs back, to allow the inside to be roasted, and the under part to be crisp. Put the pig down to a bright clear fire, not too near, and let it lay till thoroughly dry. Then have ready some butter tied up in a piece of thin cloth, and rub the pig with this in every part. Keep it well rubbed with the butter the whole of the time it is roasting, and do not allow the crackling to become blistered or burnt. When half done, hang a pig iron before the middle part, if this is not obtainable, use a flat iron, to prevent its being scorched and dried up before the ends are done. Before it is taken from the fire, cut off the head, and part that and the body down the middle. Chop the brains and mix them with the stuffing, add one half pint of good gravy, a tablespoonful of lemon juice, and the gravy that flowed from the pig. Put a little of this on the dish with the pig, and the remainder send to table in a tureen. Place the pig back to back in the dish, with one half of the head on each side, and one of the ears at each end, and send it to table as hot as possible. Instead of butter, many cooks take salad oil for basting, which makes the crackling crisp, and as this is one of the principal things to be considered, perhaps it is desirable to use it. But be particular that it is very pure, or it will impart an unpleasant flavor to the meat. The brains and stuffing may be stirred into a tureen of melted butter instead of gravy, when the latter is not liked. Apple sauce and the old-fashioned currant sauce are not yet quite obsolete as an accompaniment to roast pig. Time. One and a half to two hours for a small pig. Average cost, fives. To a success. Sufficient for nine or ten persons. Seasonable from September to February. How Roast Pig Was Discovered Charles Lamb, who, in the early part of this century, delighted the reading public by his quaint prose sketches, written under the title of Essays of Elia, has, in his own quiet humorous way, devoted one paper to the subject of roast pig. And more especially to that luxurious and toothsome dainty known as, crackling. And shows, in a manner peculiarly his own, how crackling first came into the world. According to this erudite authority, man in the golden age, or at all events the primitive age, eat his pork and bacon raw, as, indeed, he did his beef and mutton. Unless, as Hudibras tells us, he was an epicure, when he used to make a saddle of his saddle of mutton, and after spreading it on his horse's back, and riding on it for a few hours till thoroughly warmed. He sat down to the luxury of a dish cooked to a turn. At the epoch of the story, however, a citizen of some Scythian community had the misfortune to have his hut, or that portion of it containing his live stock of pigs, burnt down. In going over the debris on the following day, and picking out all the available salvage, the proprietor touched something unusually or unexpectedly hot, which caused him to shake his hand with great energy. And clapped the tips of his suffering fingers to his mouth. The act was simple and natural, but the result was wonderful. He rolled his eyes in ecstatic pleasure, his frame distended, and, conscious of a celestial odor, his nostrils widened, and, while drawing in deep inspirations of the ravishing perfume, he sucked his fingers with a gusto he had never, in his most hungry moments, conceived. Clearing away the rubbish from beneath him, he at last brought to view the carcass of one of his pigs, roasted to death. Stooping down to examine this curious object, and touching its body, a fragment of the burnt skin was detached, which, with a sort of superstitious dread, he at length, and in a spirit of philosophical inquiry, put into his mouth. Ye gods! The felicity he then enjoyed, no pen can chronicle. Then it was that he, the world, first tasted crackling. Like a miser with his gold, the Scythian hid his treasure from the prying eyes of the world, and feasted, in secret, more sumptuously than the gods.
When he had eaten up all his pig, the poor man fell into a melancholy. He refused the most tempting steak, though cooked on the horse's back, and turned every half hour after his own favorite recipe. He fell, in fact, from his appetite, and was reduced to a shadow, till, unable longer to endure the torments of memory he hourly suffered, he rose one night and secretly set fire to his hut, and once more was restored to flesh and manhood. Finding it impossible to live in future without roast pig, he set fire to his house every time his larder became empty. Till at last his neighbors, scandalized by the frequency of these incendiary acts, brought his conduct before the supreme council of the nation. To avert the penalty that awaited him, he brought his judges to the smoldering ruins, and discovering the secret, invited them to eat. Which having done, with tears of gratitude, the August Synod embraced him, and, with an overflowing feeling of ecstasy, dedicated a statue to the memory of the man who first instituted roast pork. Pork carving. Sucking pig. Illustration, Sucking pig. 842, A sucking pig seems, at first sight, rather an elaborate dish, or rather animal, to carve, but by carefully mastering the details of the business, every difficulty will vanish. And if a partial failure be at first made, yet all embarrassment will quickly disappear on a second trial. A sucking pig is usually sent to table in the manner shown in the engraving, and also in colored plate S, and the first point to be attended to is to separate the shoulder from the carcass. By carrying the knife quickly and neatly round the circular line, as shown by the figures 1 and 2, 3. The shoulder will then easily come away. The next step is to take off the leg, and this is done in the same way, by cutting round this joint in the direction shown by the figures 1 and 2 and 3, in the same way as the shoulder. The ribs then stand fairly open to the knife, which should be carried down in the direction of the line 4 to 5, and two or three helpings will dispose of these. The other half of the pig is served, of course, in the same manner. Different parts of the pig are variously esteemed, some preferring the flesh of the neck, others, the ribs, and others, again, the shoulders. The truth is, the whole of a sucking pig is delicious, delicate eating. But, in carving it, the host should consult the various tastes and fancies of his guests, keeping the larger joints, generally, for the gentlemen of the party. Ham. Illustration, Ham. 843. In cutting a ham, the carver must be guided according as he desires to practice economy, or have, at once, fine slices out of the prime part. Under the first supposition, he will commence at the knuckle end, and cut off thin slices towards the thick part of the ham. To reach the choicer portion, the knife, which must be very sharp and thin, should be carried quite down to the bone, in the direction of the line 1 to 2. The slices should be thin and even, and always cut down to the bone. There are some who like to carve a ham by cutting a hole at the top, and then slicing pieces off inside the hole, gradually enlarging the circle, but we think this a plan not to be recommended. A ham, when hot, is usually sent to table with a paper ruffle round the knuckle, when cold, it is served in the manner shown by colored plate P. Leg of Pork Illustration, Leg of Pork 844. This joint, which is such a favorite one with many people, is easy to carve. The knife should be carried sharply down to the bone, clean through the crackling, in the direction of the line 1 to 2. Sago and onion and apple sauce are usually sent to table with this dish, sometimes the leg of pork is stuffed, and the guests should be asked if they will have either or both. A frequent plan, and we think a good one, is now pursued, of sending sage and onion to table separately from the joint, as it is not everybody to whom the flavor of this stuffing is agreeable. Note. The other dishes of pork do not call for any special remarks as to their carving or helping. Chapter 18. General Observations on the Calf. 845. Any remarks made on the calf or the lamb must naturally be in a measure supplementary to the more copious observations made on the parent stock of either. As the calf, at least as far as it is identified with veal, is destined to die young, to be, indeed, cut off in its comparative infancy, it may, at first sight, 
appear of little or no consequence to inquire to what particular variety or breed of the general stock his sire or dam may belong. The great art, however, in the modern science of husbandry has been to obtain an animal that shall not only have the utmost beauty of form of which the species is capable, but, at the same time, a constitution free from all taint. A frame that shall rapidly attain bulk and stature, and a disposition so kindly that every quantum of food it takes shall, without drawback or procrastination, be eliminated into fat and muscle. The breed, then, is of very considerable consequence in determining, not only the quality of the meat to the consumer, but its commercial value to the breeder and butcher. 846. Under the artificial system adopted in the rearing of domestic cattle, and stock in general, to gratify the arbitrary mandates of luxury and fashion, we can have veal, like lamb, at all seasons in the market. Though the usual time in the metropolis for veal to make its appearance is about the beginning of February. 847. The cow goes with young for nine months, and the affection and solicitude she evinces for her offspring is more human in its tenderness mid-intensity than is displayed by any other animal. And her distress when she hears its bleeding, and is not allowed to reach it with her distended udders, is often painful to witness, and when the calf has died, or been accidentally killed. Her grief frequently makes her refuse to give down her milk. At such times, the breeder has adopted the expedient of flaying the dead carcass, and, distending the skin with hay, lays the effigy before her, and then taking advantage of her solicitude, milks her while she is caressing the skin with her tongue. 848. In a state of nature, the cow, like the deer, hides her young in the tall ferns and brakes, and the most secret places. And only at stated times, twice or thrice a day, quits the herd, and, hastening to the secret cover, gives suck to her calf, and with the same, circumspection returns to the community. 849. In some countries, to please the epicurean taste of vitiated appetites, it is the custom to kill the calf for food almost immediately after birth, and any accident that forestalls that event, is considered to enhance its value. We are happy to say, however, that in this country, as far as England and Scotland are concerned, the taste for very young veal has entirely gone out, and, staggering Bob, as the poor little animal was called in the language of the shambles, is no longer to be met with in such a place. 850. The weaning of calves is a process that requires a great amount of care and judgment. For though they are in reality not weaned till between the eighth and the twelfth week, the process of rearing them by hand commences in fact from the birth, the calf never being allowed to suck its dam. As the rearing of calves for the market is a very important and lucrative business, the breeder generally arranges his stock so that ten or a dozen of his cows shall calve about the same time. And then, by setting aside one or two, to find food for the entire family, gets the remaining eight or ten with their full fountains of milk, to carry on the operations of his dairy. Some people have an idea that skimmed milk, if given in sufficient quantity, is good enough for the weaning period of calf feeding. But this is a very serious mistake, for the cream, of which it has been deprived, contained nearly all the oleaginous principles, and the azote or nitrogen, on which the vivifying properties of that fluid depends. Indeed, so remarkably correct has this fact proved to be, that a calf reared on one part of new milk mixed with five of water, will thrive and look well, while another, treated with unlimited skimmed milk, will be poor, thin, and miserable. 851. It is sometimes a matter of considerable trouble to induce the blundering calf, whose instinct only teaches him to suck, and that he will do at anything and with anything, acquire the knowledge of imbibition. That for the first few days it is often necessary to fill a bottle with milk, and, opening his mouth, pour the contents down his throat. The manner, however, by which he is finally educated into the mystery of suction, is by putting his allowance of milk into a large wooden bowl. The nurse then puts her hand into the milk, and, by bending her fingers upwards, makes a rude teat for the calf to grasp in his lips, when the vacuum caused by his suction of the fingers, causes the milk to rise along them into his mouth. In this manner one by one the whole family are to be fed three times a day, care being taken, that newborn calves are not, at first, fed on milk from a cow who has some days calved. 
852. As the calf progresses towards his tenth week, his diet requires to be increased in quantity and quality. For these objects, his milk can be thickened with flour or meal, and small pieces of softened oil cake are to be slipped into his mouth after sucking, that they may dissolve there, till he grows familiar with, and to like the taste. When it may be softened and scraped down into his milk and water. After a time, sliced turnips softened by steam are to be given to him in tolerable quantities, then succulent grasses, and finally, hay may be added to the others. Some farmers, desirous of rendering their calves fat for the butcher in as short a time as possible, forget both the natural weakness of the digestive powers, and the contracted volume of the stomach, and allow the animals either to suck ad libitum, or give them, if brought up at the pail or by hand, a larger quantity of milk than they can digest. The idea of overloading the stomach never suggests itself to their minds. They suppose that the more food the young creature consumes, the sooner it will be fat, and they allow it no exercise whatever, for fear it should denude its very bones of their flesh. Under such circumstances, the stomach soon becomes deranged. Its functions are no longer capable of acting, the milk, subjected to the acid of the stomach, coagulates, and forms a hardened mass of curd, when the muscles become affected with spasms, and death frequently ensues. 853. There was no species of slaughtering practiced in this country so inhuman and disgraceful as that, till very lately, employed in killing this poor animal. When, under the plea of making the flesh white, the calf was bled day by day, till, when the final hour came, the animal was unable to stand. This inhumanity is, we believe, now everywhere abolished, and the calf is at once killed, and with the least amount of pain, a sharp-pointed knife is run through the neck, severing all the large veins and arteries up to the vertebrae. The skin is then taken off to the knee, which is disjointed, and to the head, which is removed. It is then reflected backwards, and the carcass having been opened and dressed, is kept apart by stretchers, and the thin membrane, the call, extended over the organs left in the carcass, as the kidneys and sweetbread. Some melted fat is then scattered suddenly over the whole interior, giving that white and frosted appearance to the meat that is thought to add to its beauty, the whole is then hung up to cool and harden. 854. The manner of cutting up veal for the English market is to divide the carcass into four quarters, with eleven ribs to each four quarter, which are again subdivided into joints as exemplified on the cut. Illustration, side of a calf, showing the several joints. Hind quarter. 1. The loin. 2. The chump, consisting of the rump. And hock bone. 3. The fillet. 4. The hock, or hind knuckle. 4. Quarter. 5. The shoulder. 6. The neck. 7. The breast. 8. The fore knuckle. 855. The several parts of a moderately sized well fed calf, about 8 weeks old, are nearly of the following weights loin and chump 18 pounds, fillet 12 and a half pounds, hind knuckle 5 and a half pounds, shoulder 11 pounds, neck 11 pounds, breast 9 pounds, and fore knuckle 5 pounds, making a total of 144 pounds weight. The London mode of cutting the carcass is considered better than that pursued in Edinburgh, as giving three roasting joints, and one boiling, in each quarter. Besides the pieces being more equally divided, as regards flesh, and from the handsomer appearance they make on the table. Recipes Chapter 19 Baked Veal, Cold Meat Cookery Ingredients Half a pound Of cold roast veal, a few slices of bacon, one pint of bread crumbs, one half pint of good veal gravy, one half teaspoonful of minced lemon peel, one blade of pounded mace, cayenne and salt to taste, four eggs. Mode. Mince finely the veal and bacon. Add the bread crumbs, gravy, and seasoning, and stir these ingredients well together. Beat up the eggs thoroughly, add these, mix the whole well together, put into a dish, and bake from March 4th to 1 hour. When liked, a little good gravy may be served in a tureen as an accompaniment. Time. 
from three quarters to one hour. Average cost, exclusive of the cold meat, 6D. Sufficient for three or four persons. Seasonable from March to October. Roast breast of veal. Illustration, breast of veal. Ingredients. Veal, a little flour. Mode. Wash the veal, well wipe it, and dredge it with flour, put it down to a bright fire, not too near, as it should not be scorched. Baste it plentifully until done. Dish it, pour over the meat some good melted butter, and send to table with it a piece of boiled bacon and a cut lemon. Time. From one and a half to two hours. Average cost, 8 minus 1 divided by 2d. Per pound sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Stewed breast of veal and peas. Ingredients. Breast of veal, 2 ounces of butter, a bunch of savory herbs, including parsley. 2 blades of pounded mace, 2 cloves, 5 or 6 young onions, 1 strip of lemon peel, 6 allspice, 1 quarter teaspoonful of pepper, 1 teaspoonful of salt, thickening of butter and flour, 2 tablespoonfuls of sherry, 2 tablespoonfuls of tomato sauce. 1 tablespoonful of lemon juice, 2 tablespoonfuls of mushroom ketchup, green peas. Mode. Cut the breast in half, after removing the bone underneath, and divide the meat into convenient sized pieces. Put the butter into a frying pan, lay in the pieces of veal, and fry until of a nice brown color. Now place these in a stew pan with the herbs, mace, cloves, onions, lemon peel, allspice, and seasoning, pour over them just sufficient boiling water to cover the meat, well close the lid, and let the whole simmer very gently for about two hours. Strain off as much gravy as is required, thicken it with butter and flour, add the remaining ingredients, skim well, let it simmer for about ten minutes, then pour it over the meat. Have ready some green peas, boiled separately. Sprinkle these over the veal, and serve. It may be garnished with forcemeat balls, or rashers of bacon curled and fried. Instead of cutting up the meat, many persons prefer it dressed whole. In that case it should be half roasted before the water, and are put to it. Time. Two and a quarter hours. Average cost, 8 minus 1 divided by 2d. Per lb. Sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Breeding of calves. The forwarding of calves to maturity, whether intended to be reared for stock, or brought to an early market as veal, is always a subject of great importance, and requires a considerable amount of intelligence in the selection of the best course. To adopt for either end. When meant to be reared as stock, the breeding should be so arranged that the cow shall calve about the middle of May. As our subject, however, has more immediate reference to the calf as meat than as stock, we shall confine our remarks to the mode of procedure adopted in the former case, and here, the first process adopted is that of weaning. Which consists in separating the calf entirely from the cow, but, at the same time, rearing it on the mother's milk. As the business of the dairy would be suspended if every cow were allowed to rear its young, and butter, cheese, and cream become desiderata, things to be desired, but not possessed, a system of economical husbandry becomes necessary. So as to retain our dairy produce, and yet, for some weeks at least, nourish the calf on its mother's milk, but without allowing the animal to draw that supply for itself, this, with the proper substituted food on which to rear the young animal is called weaning. Veal cake, a convenient dish for a picnic. Ingredients. A few slices of cold roast veal, a few slices of cold ham, two hard-boiled eggs, two tablespoonfuls of minced parsley, a little pepper, good gravy. Mode. Cut off all the brown outside from the veal, and cut the eggs into slices. Procure a pretty mold. Lay veal, ham, eggs, and parsley in layers, with a little pepper between each, and when the mold is full, get some strong stock, and fill up the shape. Bake for half an hour, and when cold, turn it out. Time. Half an hour. Seasonable at any time. Boiled calves feet and parsley and butter. 
Ingredients 2 calves feet, 2 slices of bacon, 2 ounces of butter, 2 tablespoonfuls of lemon juice, salt and whole pepper to taste, 1 onion, a bunch of savory herbs, 4 cloves, 1 blade of mace, water, parsley and butter number 493. Mode Procure 2 white calves feet. Bone them as far as the first joint, and put them into warm water to soak for 2 hours. Then put the bacon, butter, lemon juice, onion, herbs, spices, and seasoning into a stew pan. Lay in the feet, and pour in just sufficient water to cover the whole. Stew gently for about 3 hours, take out the feet, dish them, and cover with parsley and butter, made by recipe number 493. The liquor they were boiled in should be strained and put by in a clean basin for use, it will be found very good as an addition to gravies, and and time rather more than three hours average cost in full season 9d each sufficient for four persons seasonable from march to october when a calf should be killed the age at which a calf ought to be killed should not be under four weeks before that time the flesh is certainly not wholesome wanting firmness due development of muscular fiber and those animal juices on which the flavor and nutritive properties of the flesh depend, whatever the unhealthy palate of epicures may deem to the contrary. In France, a law exists to prevent the slaughtering of calves under six weeks of age. The calf is considered in prime condition at ten weeks, when he will weigh from sixteen to eighteen stone, and sometimes even twenty. Fricasseed Calves' Feet Ingredients A set of calves' feet for the batter allow for each egg one tablespoonful of flour, one tablespoonful of bread crumbs, hot lard or clarified dripping, pepper and salt to taste. Mode If the feet are purchased uncleaned, dip them into warm water repeatedly, and scrape off the hair, first one foot and then the other, until the skin looks perfectly clean, a saucepan of water being kept by the fire until they are finished. After washing and soaking in cold water, Boil them in just sufficient water to cover them, until the bones come easily away. Then pick them out, and after straining the liquor into a clean vessel, put the meat into a pie dish until the next day. Now cut it down in slices about half an inch thick, lay on them a stiff batter made of egg, flour, and bread crumbs in the above proportion, season with pepper and salt, and plunge them into a pan of boiling lard. Fry the slices a nice brown, Dry them before the fire for a minute or two, dish them on a napkin, and garnish with tufts of parsley. This should be eaten with melted butter, mustard, and vinegar. Be careful to have the lard boiling to set the batter, or the pieces of feet will run about the pan. The liquor they were boiled in should be saved, and will be found useful for enriching gravies, making jellies, andy. Andy. Time. About three hours to stew the feet. 10 or 15 minutes to ferry them. Average cost, in full season, 9d. Each. Sufficient for 8 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Note. This dish can be highly recommended to delicate persons. Color of veal. As whiteness of flesh is considered a great advantage in veal, butchers, in the selection of their calves, are in the habit of examining the inside of its mouth, and noting the color of the calf's eyes. Alleging that, from the signs they there see, they can prognosticate whether the veal will be white or florid. Collared Calf's Head Ingredients A calf's head, four tablespoonfuls of minced parsley, four blades of pounded mace, one half teaspoonful of grated nutmeg, white pepper to taste, a few thick slices of ham, the yolks of six eggs boiled hard. Mode. Scald the head for a few minutes. Take it out of the water, and with a blunt knife scrape off all the hair. Clean it nicely, divide the head and remove the brains. Boil it tender enough to take out the bones, which will be in about two hours. When the head is boned, flatten it on the table, sprinkle over it a thick layer of parsley, then a layer of ham, and then the yolks of the eggs cut into thin rings and put a seasoning of pounded mace, nutmeg, and white pepper between each layer. Roll the head up in a cloth, 
and tie it up as tightly as possible. Boil it for 4 hours, and when it is taken out of the pot, place a heavy weight on the top, the same as for other collars. Let it remain till cold. Then remove the cloth and binding, and it will be ready to serve. Time. Altogether 6 hours. Average cost, 5s. To 7s. Each. Seasonable from March to October. Feeding a calf. The amount of milk necessary for a calf for some time, will be about 4 quarts a day, though, after the first fortnight, that quantity should be gradually increased, according to its development of body, when, if fed exclusively on milk. As much as 3 gallons a day will be requisite for the due health and requirements of the animal. If the weather is fine and genial, it should be turned into an orchard or small paddock for a few hours each day, to give it an opportunity to acquire a relish for the fresh pasture, which, by the tenth or twelfth week, it will begin to nibble and enjoy. After a certain time, the quantity of milk may be diminished, and its place supplied by water thickened with meal. Hay tea and linseed jelly are also highly nutritious substances, and may be used either as adjuncts or substitutes. Fricasseed calves head, an entree. Ingredients. The remains of a boiled calf's head, one and a half pint of the liquor in which the head was boiled, one blade of pounded mace, one onion minced, a bunch of savory herbs, salt and white pepper to taste, thickening of butter and flour, the yolks of two eggs. One tablespoonful of lemon juice, force meat balls. Mode. Remove all the bones from the head, and cut the meat into nice square pieces. Put one and a half pint of the liquor it was boiled in into a saucepan, with mace, onion, herbs, and seasoning in the above proportion. Let this simmer gently for three quarters hour, then strain it and put in the meat. When quite hot through, thicken the gravy with a little butter rolled in flour, and, just before dishing the fricassee, put in the beaten yolks of eggs and lemon juice. But be particular, after these two latter ingredients are added, that the sauce does not boil, or it will curdle. Garnish with forcemeat balls and curled slices of broiled bacon. To ensure the sauce being smooth, it is a good plan to dish the meat first, and then to add the eggs to the gravy. When these are set, the sauce may be poured over the meat. Time. Altogether, one to a quarter hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 6d. Calves head a la maitre d'hôtel. Ingredients. The remains of a cold calf's head, rather more than one half pint of maitre d'hôtel sauce number 466. Mode. Make the sauce by recipe no. 466, and have it sufficiently thick that it may nicely cover the meat, remove the bones from the head, and cut the meat into neat slices. When the sauce is ready, lay in the meat. Let it gradually warm through, and, after it boils up, let it simmer very gently for 5 minutes, and serve. Time. Rather more than one and a half hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, ones. 2d. Seasonable from March to October. The calf in America. In America, the calf is left with the mother for three or four days, when it is removed, and at once fed on barley and oats ground together and made into a gruel, one quart of the meal being boiled for half an hour in twelve quarts of water. One quart of this certainly nutritious gruel, is to be given, lukewarm, morning and evening. In ten days, a bundle of soft hay is put beside the calf, which he soon begins to eat, and, at the same time, some of the dry meal is placed in his manger for him to lick. This process, gradually increasing the quantity of gruel twice a day, is continued for two months, till the calf is fit to go to grass, and, as it is said, with the best possible success. But, in this country, the mode pointed out in no. 862 has received the sanction of the best experience. Curried veal, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of cold roast veal, four onions, two apples sliced, one tablespoonful of curry powder, one dessertspoonful of flour, one half pint of broth or water, one tablespoonful of lemon juice. Mode. Slice the onions and apples, and fry them in a little butter, then take them out, 
cut the meat into neat cutlets, and fry these of a pale brown. Add the curry powder and flour, put in the onion, apples, and a little broth or water, and stew gently till quite tender, add the lemon juice, and serve with an edging of boiled rice. The curry may be ornamented with pickles, capsicums, and gherkins arranged prettily on the top. Time. 3 quarters hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 4D. Seasonable from March to October. Veal cutlets, an entree. Ingredients. About 3 pounds. Of the prime part of the leg of veal, egg and bread crumbs, 3 tablespoonfuls of minced savory herbs, salt and popper to taste, a small piece of butter. Illustration, Veal Cutlets. Mode. Have the veal cut into slices about 3 quarters of an inch in thickness, and, if not cut perfectly even, level the meat with a cutlet bat or rolling pin. Shape and trim the cutlets, and brush them over with egg. Sprinkle with bread crumbs, with which have been mixed minced herbs and a seasoning of pepper and salt, and press the crumbs down. Fry them of a delicate brown in fresh lard or butter, and be careful not to burn them. They should be very thoroughly done, but not dry. If the cutlets be thick, keep the pan covered for a few minutes at a good distance from the fire, after they have acquired a good color, by this means, the meat will be done through. Lay the cutlets in a dish, Keep them hot, and make a gravy in the pan as follows, dredge in a little flour, add a piece of butter the size of a walnut, brown it, then pour as much boiling water as is required over it, season with pepper and salt. Add a little lemon juice, give one boil, and pour it over the cutlets. They should be garnished with slices of broiled bacon, and a few force meat balls will be found a very excellent addition to this dish. Time for cutlets of a moderate thickness, about 12 minutes, if very thick, allow more time. Average cost, 10 d. Per pound sufficient for 6 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Note. Veal cutlets may be merely floured and fried of a nice brown, the gravy and garnishing should be the same as in the preceding recipe. They may also be cut from the loin or neck, as shown in the engraving. Broiled veal cutlets à l'italienne, an entree. Ingredients Neck of veal, salt and pepper to taste, the yolk of one egg, bread crumbs, one half pint of Italian sauce number 453. Mode Cut the veal into cutlets, flatten and trim them nicely, powder over them a little salt and pepper, brush them over with the yolk of an egg, dip them into bread crumbs, then into clarified butter, and, afterwards, in the bread crumbs again. Broil or fry them over a clear fire, that they may acquire a good brown color. Arrange them in the dish alternately with rashers of broiled ham, and pour the sauce, made by recipe number 453, in the middle. Time. 10 to 15 minutes, according to the thickness of the cutlets. Average cost, 10 d. Per lb. Seasonable from March to October. The Caps H.E.A.D. Club. When the restoration of Charles II. Took the straight waistcoat off the mines and morose religion of the Commonwealth period, and gave a loose rein to the long compressed spirits of the people, there still remained a large section of society wedded to the former state of things. The elders of this party retired from public sight, where, unoffended by the reigning Saturnalia, they might dream in seclusion over their departed utopia. The young bloods of this school, however, who were compelled to mingle in the world, yet detesting the politics which had become the fashion, adopted a novel expedient to keep alive their republican sentiments. And mark their contempt of the reigning family. They accordingly met, in considerable numbers, at some convenient inn, on the 30th of January in each year, the anniversary of Charles's death, and dined together off a feast prepared from calves' heads, dressed in every possible variety of way. And with an abundance of wine drank toasts of defiance and hatred to the house of Stuart, and glory to the memory of old Hall Cromwell. And having lighted a large bonfire in the yard, the club of fast young Puritans, with their white handkerchiefs stained red in wine, and one of the party in a mask, bearing an axe, followed by the chairman. Carrying a calf's head pinned up in a napkin, marched in mock procession to the bonfire, 
into which, with great shouts and uproar, they flung the enveloped head. This odd custom was continued for some time, and even down to the early part of this century it was customary for men of republican politics always to dine off calves' head on the 30th of January. Veal cutlets a la maintenance, an entree. Ingredients. Two or three pounds, of veal cutlets, egg and bread crumbs, two tablespoonfuls of minced savory herbs, salt and pepper to taste, a little grated nutmeg. Mode. Cut the cutlets about three quarters inch in thickness, flatten them, and brush them over with the yolk of an egg, dip them into bread crumbs and minced herbs, season with pepper and salt and grated nutmeg, and fold each cutlet in a piece of buttered paper. Broil them, and send them to table with melted butter or a good gravy. Time. From 15 to 18 minutes. Average cost, 10 d. Per lb. Sufficient for five or six persons. Seasonable from March to October. Ville à la bourgeoise. Excellent. Ingredients. Two to three pounds, of the loin or neck of veal, ten or twelve young carrots, a bunch of green onions, two slices of lean bacon, two blades of pounded mace, one bunch of savory herbs, pepper and salt to taste, a few new potatoes, one pint of green peas. Mode. Cut the veal into cutlets, trim them, and put the trimmings into a stew pan with a little butter, lay in the cutlets and fry them a nice brown color on both sides. Add the bacon, carrots, onions, spice, herbs, and seasoning. Pour in about a pint of boiling water, and stew gently for two hours on a very slow fire. When done, skim off the fat, take out the herbs, and flavor the gravy with a little tomato sauce and ketchup. Have ready the peas and potatoes, boiled separately, put them with the veal, and serve. Time. 2 hours. Average cost, 2s. 9d. Sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable from June to August with peas, rather earlier when these are omitted. Scotch collops, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of cold roast veal, a little butter, flour, one half pint of water, one onion, one blade of pounded mace, one tablespoonful of lemon juice, one half teaspoonful of finely minced lemon peel, two tablespoonfuls of sherry. One tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup. Mode. Cut the veal the same thickness as for cutlets, rather larger than a crown piece, flour the meat well, and fry a light brown in butter, dredge again with flour, and add one half pint of water, pouring it in by degrees. Set it on the fire, and when it boils, add the onion and mace, and let it simmer very gently about three quarters hour, flavor the gravy with lemon juice, peel, wine, and ketchup, in the above proportion, give one boil, and serve. Time. Three quarters hour. Seasonable from March to October. Scotch collops, white, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of cold roast veal, one half teaspoonful of grated nutmeg, two blades of pounded mace, cayenne and salt to taste, a little butter, one dessert spoonful of flour, one quarter pint of water, one teaspoonful of anchovy sauce, one tablespoonful of lemon juice. One teaspoonful of lemon peel, one tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup, three tablespoonfuls of cream, one tablespoonful of sherry. Mode. Cut the veal into thin slices about three inches in width, hack them with a knife, and grate on them the nutmeg, mace, cayenne, and salt, and fry them in a little butter. Dish them, and make a gravy in the pan by putting in the remaining ingredients. Give one boil, and pour it over the collops, garnish with lemon and slices of toasted bacon, rolled. Force meat balls may be added to this dish. If cream is not at hand, substitute the yolk of an egg beaten up well with a little milk. Time. About 5 or 7 minutes. Seasonable from May to October. Cooking Collops. Dean Ramsay, who tells us, in his, Reminiscences of Scottish Life and Character, a number of famous stories of the strong-headed, warm-hearted, and plain-spoken old dames of the North, gives, amongst them. The following. A strong-minded lady of this class was inquiring the character of a cook she was about to hire. 
The lady who was giving the character entered a little upon the cook's moral qualifications, and described her as a very decent woman, to which the astounding reply, this was sixty years ago, and a dean tells the story, oh, d, and her decency. Can she make good collops? Roast Filet of Veal Ingredients Veal, force meat number 417, melted butter Mode Have the filet cut according to the size required. Take out the bone, and after raising the skin from the meat, put under the flap a nice force meat, made by recipe number 417. Prepare sufficient of this, as there should be some left to eat cold, and to season and flavor a mince if required. Skewer and bind the veal up in a round form, dredge well with flour, put it down at some distance from the fire at first, and baste continually. About half an hour before serving, draw it nearer the fire, that it may acquire more color, as the outside should be of a rich brown, but not burnt. Dish it, remove the skewers, which replace by a silver one. Pour over the joint some good melted butter, and serve with either boiled ham, bacon, or pickled pork. Never omit to send a cut lemon to table with roast veal. Illustration, Filet of Veal Time A filet of veal weighing 12 pounds. About 4 hours. Average cost, 9d. Per lb. Sufficient for 9 or 10 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Stewed Filet of Veal Ingredients A small filet of veal, force meat no. For 17, thickening of butter and flour, a few mushrooms, white pepper to taste, two tablespoonfuls of lemon juice, two blades of pounded mace, one half glass of sherry. Mode If the whole of the leg is purchased, take off the knuckle to stew, and also the square end, which will serve for cutlets or pies. Remove the bone, and fill the space with a forcemeat number 417. Roll and skewer it up firmly. Place a few skewers at the bottom of a stew pan to prevent the meat from sticking, and cover the veal with a little weak stock. Let it simmer very gently until tender, as the more slowly veal is stewed, the better. Strain and thicken the sauce, flavor it with lemon juice, mace, sherry, and white pepper, give one boil, and pour it over the meat. The skewers should be removed, and replaced by a silver one, and the dish garnished with slices of cut lemon. Time A. Filet of veal weighing 6 pounds, 3 hours, very gentle stewing. Average cost, 9d. Per lb. Sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable from March to October. The Golden Calf we are told in the book of Genesis, that Aaron, in the lengthened absence of Moses, was constrained by the impatient people to make them an image to worship. And that Aaron, instead of using his delegated power to curb this sinful expression of the tribes, and appease the discontented Jews, at once complied with their demand, and, telling them to bring to him their rings and trinkets. Fashioned out of their willing contributions a calf of gold, before which the multitude fell down and worshipped. Whether this image was a solid figure of gold, or a wooden effigy merely, coated with metal, is uncertain. To suppose the former, knowing the size of the image made from such trifling articles as rings, we must presuppose the Israelites to have spoiled the Egyptians most unmercifully, the figure, however, is of more consequence than the weight or size of the idol. That the Israelite brought away more from Goshen than the plunder of the Egyptians, and that they were deeply imbued with Egyptian superstition, the golden calf is only one, out of many instances of proof. For a gilded ox, covered with a pall, was in that country an emblem of Osiris, one of the gods of the Egyptian trinity. Besides having a sacred cow, and many varieties of the holy bull, this priest-ridden people worshipped the ox as a symbol of the sun, and offered to it divine honors, as the emblem of frugality, industry, and husbandry. It is therefore probable that, in borrowing so familiar a type, the Israelites, in their calf worship, meant, under a well-understood cherubic symbol, to acknowledge the full force of those virtues, under an emblem of divine power and goodness. The prophet Hosea is full of denunciations against calf worship in Israel, and alludes to the custom of kissing these idols, Hosea, 8, 4-6. 
fricando of veal, an entree. Ingredients A piece of the fat side of a leg of veal, about 3 pounds. Lardons, 2 carrots, 2 large onions, a faggot of savory herbs, 2 blades of pounded mace, 6 whole allspice, 2 bay leaves, pepper to taste, a few slices of fat bacon, 1 pint of stock number 107. Illustration, Fricando of Veal Mode The veal for a fricando should be of the best quality, or it will not be good. It may be known by the meat being white and not thready. Take off the skin, flatten the veal on the table, then at one stroke of the knife, cut off as much as is required, for a fricando with an uneven surface never looks well. Trim it, and with a sharp knife make two or three slits in the middle, that it may taste more of the seasoning. Now lard it thickly with fat bacon, as lean gives a red color to the fricando. Slice the vegetables, and put these, with the herbs and spices, in the middle of a stew pan, with a few slices of bacon at the top, these should form a sort of mound in the center for the veal to rest upon. Lay the fricando over the bacon, sprinkle over it a little salt, and pour in just sufficient stock to cover the bacon, and, without touching the veal. Let it gradually come to a boil. Then put it over a slow and equal fire, and let it simmer very gently for about two and a half hours, or longer should it be very large. Baste it frequently with the liquor, and a short time before serving, put it into a brisk oven, to make the bacon firm, which otherwise would break when it was glazed. Dish the fricando, keep it hot, skim off the fat from the liquor, and reduce it quickly to a glaze, with which glaze the fricando, and serve with a puree of whatever vegetable happens to be in season, spinach, sorrel, asparagus, cucumbers, peas. And k. Time. Two and a half hours. If very large, allow more time. Average cost, threes. 6d. Sufficient for an entree. Seasonable from March to October. Fricando of veal, more economical. Ingredients. The best end of a neck of veal, about two and a half pounds. Lardons, two carrots, two onions, a faggot of savory herbs, two blades of mace, two bay leaves, a little whole white pepper, a few slices of fat bacon. Mode. Cut away the lean part of the best end of a neck of veal with a sharp knife, scooping it from the bones. Put the bones in with a little water, which will serve to moisten the fricando, they should stew about one and a half hour. Lard the veal, proceed in the same way as in the preceding recipe, and be careful that the gravy does not touch the fricando. Stew very gently for three hours, glaze, and serve it on sorrel, spinach, or with a little gravy in the dish. Time. Three hours. Average cost, twos. 6d. Sufficient for an entree. Seasonable from March to October. Note. When the prime part of the leg is cut off, it spoils the whole, consequently, to use this for a fricando is rather extravagant. The best end of the neck answers the purpose nearly or quite as well. Boiled calf's head, with the skin on. Ingredients. Calf's head, boiling water, bread crumbs, one large bunch of parsley, butter, white pepper and salt to taste, four tablespoonfuls of melted butter, one tablespoonful of lemon juice, two or three grains of cayenne. Mode. Put the head into boiling water, and let it remain by the side of the fire for three or four minutes. Take it out, hold it by the ear, and with the back of a knife, scrape off the hair, should it not come off easily, dip the head again into boiling water. When perfectly clean, take the eyes out, cut off the ears, and remove the brain, which soak for an hour in warm water. Put the head into hot water to soak for a few minutes, to make it look white, and then have ready a stew pan, into which lay the head, cover it with cold water, and bring it gradually to boil. Remove the scum, and add a little salt, which assists to throw it up. Simmer it very gently from two and a half to three hours, and when nearly done, boil the brains for a quarter hour. Skin and chop them, not too finely, and add a tablespoonful of minced parsley which has been previously scalded. Season with pepper and salt, and stir the brains, parsley, and k, 
into about 4 tablespoonfuls of melted butter. Add the lemon juice and cayenne, and keep these hot by the side of the fire. Take up the head, cut out the tongue, skin it, put it on a small dish with the brains round it. Sprinkle over the head a few bread crumbs mixed with a little minced parsley, brown these before the fire, and serve with a tureen of parsley and butter, and either boiled bacon, ham, or pickled pork as an accompaniment. Time. Two and a half to three hours. Average cost, according to the season, from threes. To sevens. 6D. Sufficient for eight or nine persons. Seasonable from March to October. Boiled calf's head, without the skin. Ingredients. Calf's head, water, a little salt, four tablespoonfuls of melted butter, one tablespoonful of minced parsley, pepper and salt to taste, one tablespoonful of lemon juice. Illustration, calf's head. Illustration, half a calf's head. Mode. After the head has been thoroughly cleaned, and the brains removed, soak it in warm water to blanch it. Lay the brains also into warm water to soak, and let them remain for about an hour. Put the head into a stew pan, with sufficient cold water to cover it, and when it boils, add a little salt, take off every particle of scum as it rises, and boil the head until perfectly tender. Boil the brains, chop them, and mix with them melted butter, minced parsley, pepper, salt, and lemon juice in the above proportion. Take up the head, skin the tongue, and put it on a small dish with the brains round it. Have ready some parsley and butter, smother the head with it, and the remainder send to table in a tureen. Bacon, ham, pickled pork, or a pig's cheek, are indispensable with calf's head. The brains are sometimes chopped with hard-boiled eggs, and mixed with a little bechamel or white sauce. Time from one and a half to two and a quarter hours. Average cost, according to the season, from threes. To fives. Sufficient for six or seven persons. Seasonable from March to October. Note. The liquor in which the head was boiled should be saved, it makes excellent soup, and will be found a nice addition to gravies, and Half a calf's head is as frequently served as a whole one, it being a more convenient sized joint for a small family. It is cooked in the same manner, and served with the same sauces, as in the preceding recipe. Hashed calf's head, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of a cold boiled calf's head, one quart of the liquor in which it was boiled, a faggot of savory herbs, one onion, one carrot, a strip of lemon peel, two blades of pounded mace, salt and white pepper to taste, a very little cayenne. Rather more than two tablespoonfuls of sherry, one tablespoonful of lemon juice, one tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup, force meat balls. Mode. Cut the meat into neat slices, and put the bones and trimmings into a stew pan with the above proportion of liquor that the head was boiled in. Add a bunch of savory herbs, one onion, one carrot, a strip of lemon peel, and two blades of pounded mace, and let these boil for one hour, or until the gravy is reduced nearly half. Strain it into a clean stew pan, thicken it with a little butter and flour, and add a flavoring of sherry, lemon juice, and ketchup, in the above proportion, season with pepper, salt, and a little cayenne. Put in the meat, let it gradually warm through, but not boil more than two or three minutes. Garnish the dish with force meat balls and pieces of bacon rolled and toasted, placed alternately, and send it to table very hot. Time. Altogether one and a half hour. Average cost, exclusive of the remains of the head, 6D. Seasonable from March to October. Veal collops, an entree. Ingredients. About two pounds, of the prime part of the leg of veal, a few slices of bacon, Force meat no. For 17, cayenne to taste, egg and bread crumbs, gravy. Mode. Cut the veal into long thin collops, flatten them, and lay on each a piece of thin bacon of the same size, have ready some force meat, made by recipe no. For 17, which spread over the bacon, sprinkle over all a little cayenne, roll them up tightly, and do not let them be more than 2 inches long. Skewer each one firmly, 
egg and bread crumb them, and fry them a nice brown in a little butter, turning them occasionally, and shaking the pan about. When done, place them on a dish before the fire. Put a small piece of butter in the pan, dredge in a little flour, add one quarter pint of water, two tablespoonfuls of lemon juice, a seasoning of salt, pepper, and pounded mace, let the whole boil up, and pour it over the collops. Time. From 10 to 15 minutes. Average cost, 10 d. Per lb. Sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Calves liver AUX finds herbs and sauce picante. Ingredients. A calf's liver, flour, a bunch of savory herbs, including parsley, when liked, two minced shallots, one teaspoonful of flour, one tablespoonful of vinegar, one tablespoonful of lemon juice, pepper and salt to taste, one quarter pint water. Mode. Procure a calf's liver as white as possible, and cut it into slices of a good and equal shape. Dip them in flour, and fry them of a good color in a little butter. When they are done, put them on a dish, which keep hot before the fire. Mince the herbs very fine, put them in the frying pan with a little more butter, add the remaining ingredients, simmer gently until the herbs are done, and pour over the liver. Time. According to the thickness of the slices, from 5 to 10 minutes. Average cost, 10 d. Per pound sufficient for 7 or 8 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Calves liver and bacon. Ingredients. 2 or 3 pounds. Of liver, bacon, pepper and salt to taste, a small piece of butter, flour, 2 tablespoonfuls of lemon juice, 1 quarter pint of water. Mode. Cut the liver in thin slices, and cut as many slices of bacon as there are of liver. Fry the bacon first, and put that on a hot dish before the fire. Fry the liver in the fat which comes from the bacon, after seasoning it with pepper and salt and dredging over it a very little flour. Turn the liver occasionally to prevent its burning, and when done, lay it round the dish with a piece of bacon between each. Pour away the bacon fat, put in a small piece of butter, dredge in a little flour, add the lemon juice and water, give one boil, and pour it in the middle of the dish. It may be garnished with slices of cut lemon, or force meat balls. Time. According to the thickness of the slices, from 5 to 10 minutes. Average cost, 10 d. Per pound sufficient for 6 or 7 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Calves liver larded and roasted, an entree. Ingredients. A calf's liver, vinegar, one onion, three or four sprigs of parsley and thyme, salt and pepper to taste, one bay leaf, lardons, brown gravy. Mode. Take a fine white liver, and lard it the same as a fricando. Put it into vinegar with an onion cut in slices, parsley, thyme, bay leaf, and seasoning in the above proportion. Let it remain in this pickle for 24 hours, then roast and baste it frequently with the vinegar, and glaze it, serve under it a good brown gravy, or sauce picante, and send it to table very hot. Time. Rather more than one hour. Average cost, 10 d. Per lb. Sufficient for 7 or 8 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Note. Calves liver stuffed with forcemeat number 417, to which has been added a little fat bacon, will be found a very savory dish. It should be larded or wrapped in buttered paper, and roasted before a clear fire. Brown gravy and currant jelly should be served with it. Filet of veal au bechamel, cold meat cookery. Ingredients A small filet of veal, one pint of bechamel sauce number 367, a few bread crumbs, clarified butter. Mode A filet of real that has been roasted the preceding day will answer very well for this dish. Cut the middle out rather deep, leaving a good margin round, from which to cut nice slices, and if there should be any cracks in the veal, fill them up with forcemeat. Mince finely the meat that was taken out, mixing with it a little of the forcemeat to flavor, and stir to it sufficient bechamel to make it of a proper consistency. 
Warm the veal in the oven for about an hour, taking care to baste it well, that it may not be dry, put the mince in the place where the meat was taken out, sprinkle a few bread crumbs over it, and drop a little clarified butter on the bread crumbs. Put it into the oven for a quarter hour to brown, and pour bechamel round the sides of the dish. Time. Altogether one and a half hour. Seasonable from March to October. To ragu a knuckle of veal. Ingredients. Knuckle of veal, pepper and salt to taste, flour, one onion, one head of celery, or a little celery seed, a faggot of savory herbs, two blades of pounded mace, thickening of butter and flour, a few young carrots, one tablespoonful of ketchup. One tablespoonful of tomato sauce, three tablespoonfuls of sherry, the juice of one quarter lemon. Mode. Cut the meat from a knuckle of veal into neat slices, season with pepper and salt, and dredge them with flour. Fry them in a little butter of a pale brown, and put them into a stew pan with the bone, which should be chopped in several places, add the celery, herbs, mace, and carrots. Pour over all about one pint of hot water, and let it simmer very gently for two hours, over a slow but clear fire. Take out the slices of meat and carrots, strain and thicken the gravy with a little butter rolled in flour. Add the remaining ingredients, give one boil, put back the meat and carrots, let these get hot through, and serve. When in season, a few green peas, boiled separately, and added to this dish at the moment of serving, would be found a very agreeable addition. Time. 2 hours. Average cost, 5d. To 6d. Per lb. Sufficient for 4 or 6 persons. Stewed knuckle of veal and rice. Ingredients. Knuckle of veal, 1 onion, 2 blades of mace, 1 teaspoonful of salt, half a pound, of rice. Illustration. Knuckle of veal. Mode. Have the knuckle cut small, or cut some cutlets from it, that it may be just large enough to be eaten the same day it is dressed, as cold boiled veal is not a particularly tempting dish. Break the shank bone, wash it clean, and put the meat into a stew pan with sufficient water to cover it. Let it gradually come to a boil, put in the salt, and remove the scum as fast as it rises. When it has simmered gently for about three quarters hour, add the remaining ingredients, and stew the whole gently for two and a quarter hours. Put the meat into a deep dish, pour over it the rice, and and send boiled bacon, and a tureen of parsley and butter to table with it. Time. A knuckle of veal weighing six pounds, three hours, gentle stewing. Average cost, 5d. To 6d. Per lb. Sufficient for five or six persons. Seasonable from March to October. Note. Macaroni, instead of rice, boiled with the veal, will be found good, or the rice and macaroni may be omitted, and the veal sent to table smothered in parsley and butter. Roast loin of veal. Illustration, loin of veal. Ingredients. Veal, melted butter. Mode. Paper the kidney fat, roll in and skewer the flap, which makes the joint a good shape, dredge it well with flour, and put it down to a bright fire. Should the loin be very large, skewer the kidney back for a time to roast thoroughly. Keep it well basted, and a short time before serving, remove the paper from the kidney, and allow it to acquire a nice brown color, but it should not be burnt. Have ready some melted butter, put it into the dripping pan after it is emptied of its contents, pour it over the veal, and serve. Garnish the dish with slices of lemon and forcemeat balls, and send to table with it, boiled bacon, ham, pickled pork, or pig's cheek. Time. A large loin, 3 hours. Average cost, 9 minus 1 divided by 2d. Per lb. Sufficient for 7 or 8 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Note. A piece of toast should be placed under the kidney when the veal is dished. Loin of veal au bechamel, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. Loin of veal, one half teaspoonful of minced lemon peel, rather more than one half pint of bechamel or white sauce. Mode. 
A loin of veal which has come from table with very little taken off, answers very well for this dish. Cut off the meat from the inside, mince it, and mix with it some minced lemon peel, put it into sufficient bechamel to warm through. In the meantime, wrap the joint in buttered paper, and place it in the oven to warm. When thoroughly hot, dish the mince, place the loin above it, and pour over the remainder of the bechamel. Time. One and a half hour to warm the meat in the oven. Seasonable from March to October. Loin of veal, a la dobe. Ingredients. The chump end of a loin of veal, force meat number 417, a few slices of bacon, a bunch of savory herbs, two blades of mace, one half teaspoonful of whole white pepper, one pint of veal stock or water, five or six green onions. Mode. Cut off the chump from a loin of veal, and take out the bone, fill the cavity with forcemeat number 417, tie it up tightly, and lay it in a stew pan with the bones and trimmings, and cover the veal with a few slices of bacon. Add the herbs, mace, pepper, and onions, and stock or water, cover the pan with a closely fitting lid, and simmer for two hours, shaking the stew pan occasionally. Take out the bacon, herbs, and onions. Reduce the gravy, if not already thick enough, to a glaze, with which glaze the meat, and serve with tomato, mushroom, or sorrel sauce. Time. 2 hours. Average cost, 9d. Per lb. Sufficient for 4 or 5 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Minced veal, with bechamel sauce, cold meat cookery. Very good. Ingredients The remains of a fillet of veal, one pint of bechamel sauce number 367, one half teaspoonful of minced lemon peel, force meatballs. Mode Cut, but do not chop, a few slices of cold roast veal as finely as possible, sufficient to make rather more than one pound, weighed after being minced. Make the above proportion of bechamel, by recipe number 367. Add the lemon peel, Put in the veal, and let the whole gradually warm through. When it is at the point of simmering, dish it, and garnish with force meat balls and fried sippets of bread. Time. To simmer 1 minute. Average cost, exclusive of the cold meat, 1s. 4d. Sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Minced veal. More economical. Ingredients. The remains of cold roast filet or loin of veal, rather more than one pint of water, one onion, one half teaspoonful of minced lemon peel, salt and white pepper to taste, one blade of pounded mace, two or three young carrots, a faggot of sweet herbs. Thickening of butter and flour, one tablespoonful of lemon juice, three tablespoonfuls of cream or milk. Mode. Take about one pound, of veal and should there be any bones, dredge them with flour, and put them into a stew pan with the brown outside, and a few meat trimmings. Add rather more than a pint of water, the onion cut in slices, lemon peel, seasoning, mace, carrots, and herbs, simmer these well for rather more than one hour, and strain the liquor. Rub a little flour into some butter. Add this to the gravy, set it on the fire, and, when it boils, skim well. Mince the veal finely by cutting, and not chopping it, put it in the gravy, let it get warmed through gradually. Add the lemon juice and cream, and, when it is on the point of boiling, serve. Garnish the dish with sip pets of toasted bread and slices of bacon rolled and toasted. Force meat balls may also be added. If more lemon peel is liked than is stated above, put a little very finely minced to the veal, after it is warmed in the gravy. Time. 1 hour to make the gravy. Average cost, exclusive of the cold meat, 6d. Seasonable from March to October. The calf a symbol of divine power. A singular symbolical ceremony existed among the Hebrews, in which the calf performed a most important part. The calf being a type or symbol of divine power, or what was called the Elohim, the almighty intelligence that brought them out of Egypt, was looked upon much in the same light by the Jews, as the cross subsequently was by the Christians. A mystical emblem of the divine passion and goodness. 
Consequently, an oath taken on either the calf or the cross was considered equally solemn and sacred by Jew or Nazarene, and the breaking of it a soul-staining perjury on themselves, and an insult and profanation directly offered to the Almighty. To render the oath more impressive and solemn, it was customary to slaughter a dedicated calf in the temple, when, the priests having divided the carcass into a certain number of parts, and with intervening spaces, arranged the severed limbs on the marble pavement, the one, or all the party, if there were many individuals, to be bound by the oath, repeating the words of the compact, threaded their way in and out through the different spaces. Till they had taken the circuit of each portion of the divided calf, when the ceremony was concluded. To avert the anger of the Lord, when Jerusalem was threatened by Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian host, the Jews had made a solemn to God, ratified by the ceremony of the calf, if he released them from their dreaded foe. To cancel the servitude of their Hebrew brethren. After investing the city for some time, and reducing the inhabitants to dreadful suffering and privation, the Babylonians, hearing that Pharaoh, whom the Jews had solicited for aid, was rapidly approaching with a powerful army, hastily raised the siege, and, removing to a distance, took up a position where they could intercept the Egyptians, and still cover the city. No sooner did the Jews behold the retreat of the enemy, then they believed all danger was past, and, with their usual turpitude, they repudiated their oath, and refused to liberate their oppressed countrymen. For this violation of their covenant with the Lord, they were given over to all the horrors of the sword, pestilence, and famine, Jeremiah, 34. 15-17. Minced veal and macaroni. A pretty side or corner dish. Ingredients. 3 quarters pound. Of minced cold roast veal, 3 ounces of ham, 1 tablespoonful of gravy, pepper and salt to taste, 3 teaspoonful of grated nutmeg, a quarter pound, of bread crumbs, a quarter pound, of macaroni, 1 or 2 eggs to bind, a small piece of butter. Mode. Cut some nice slices from a cold fillet of veal, trim off the brown outside, and mince the meat finely with the above proportion of ham, should the meat be very dry, add a spoonful of good gravy. Season highly with pepper and salt, add the grated nutmeg and bread crumbs, and mix these ingredients with one or two eggs well beaten, which should bind the mixture and make it like forcemeat. In the meantime, boil the macaroni in salt and water, and drain it, butter a mold, put some of the macaroni at the bottom and sides of it, in whatever form is liked. Mix the remainder with the forcemeat, fill the mold up to the top, put a plate or small dish on it, and steam for half an hour. Turn it out carefully, and serve with good gravy poured round, but not over, the meat. Time. Half an hour. Average cost, exclusive of the cold meat, 10 d. Seasonable from March to October. Note. To make a variety, boil some carrots and turnips separately in a little salt and water, when done, cut them into pieces about 1 8 inch in thickness. Butter an oval mold, and place these in it, in white and red stripes alternately, at the bottom and sides. Proceed as in the foregoing recipe, and be very careful in turning it out of the mold. Molded minced veal, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. 3 quarters pound, of cold roast veal, a small slice of bacon, 1 quarter teaspoonful of minced lemon peel, 1 half onion chopped fine, salt, pepper, and pounded mace to taste, a slice of toast soaked in milk, 1 egg. Mode. Mince the meat very fine, after removing from it all skin and outside pieces, and chop the bacon, mix these well together, adding the lemon peel, onion, seasoning, mace, and toast. When all the ingredients are thoroughly incorporated, heat up an egg, with which bind the mixture. Butter a shape, put in the meat, and hake for three quarters hour, turn it out of the mold carefully, and pour round it a good brown gravy. A sheep's head dressed in this manner is an economical and savory dish. Time. Three quarters hour. Average cost, exclusive of the meat, 6 d. Seasonable from March to October. Braised neck of veal. Ingredients. The best end of the neck of veal, from 3 to 4 pounds, bacon, 1 tablespoonful of minced parsley, salt, pepper, and grated nutmeg to taste. 1 onion, 
2 carrots, a little celery, when this is not obtainable, use the seed, 1 half glass of sherry, thickening of butter and flour, lemon juice, 1 blade of pounded mace. Mode. Prepare the bacon for larding, and roll it in minced parsley, salt, pepper, and grated nutmeg, lard the veal, put it into a stew pan with a few slices of lean bacon or ham, an onion, carrots, and celery, and do not quite cover it with water. Stew it gently for two hours, or until it is quite tender, strain off the liquor, stir together over the fire, in a stew pan, a little flour and butter until brown. Lay the veal in this, the upper side to the bottom of the pan, and let it remain till of a nice brown color. Place it in the dish. Pour into the stew pan as much gravy as is required, boil it up, skim well, add the wine, pounded mace, and lemon juice, simmer for 3 minutes, pour it over the meat and serve. Time. Rather more than 2 hours. Average cost, 8d. Per lb. Sufficient for 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Birth of calves. The cow seldom produces more than a single calf, sometimes, twins, and, very rarely, three. A French newspaper, however, the Nouveau Bulletin de Sciences, gave a trustworthy but extraordinary account of a cow which produced nine calves in all, at three successive births, in three successive years. The first year, four cow calves. The second year, three calves, two of them females, the third year, two calves, both females. With the exception of two belonging to the first birth, all were suckled by the mother. Roast neck of veal. Ingredients. Veal, melted butter, force meat balls. Mode. Have the veal cut from the best end of the neck, dredge it with flour, and put it down to a bright clear fire, keep it well basted. Dish it, pour over it some melted butter, and garnish the dish with fried force meat balls, send to table with a cut lemon. The scrag may be boiled or stewed in various ways, with rice, onion sauce, or parsley in butter. Time. About 2 hours. Average cost, 8d. Per lb. Sufficient. 4 or 5 pounds, 4 5 or 6 persons. Seasonable from March to October. Veal olive pe, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. A few thin slices of cold fillet of veal, a few thin slices of bacon, force meat no. For 17, a cupful of gravy, 4 tablespoonfuls of cream, puff crust. Mode. Cut thin slices from a fillet of veal, place on them thin slices of bacon, and over them a layer of force meat, made by recipe no. For 17, with an additional seasoning of shallot and cayenne, roll them tightly, and fill up a pie dish with them, add the gravy and cream, cover with a puff crust, and bake for one to one and a half hour. Should the pie be very large, allow 2 hours. The pieces of rolled veal should be about 3 inches in length, and about 3 inches round. Time. Moderate sized pie, 1 to 1 and a half hour. Seasonable from March to October. Fried patties, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. Cold roast veal, a few slices of cold ham, 1 egg boiled hard, pounded mace, pepper and salt to taste, gravy, cream, 1 teaspoonful of minced lemon peel, good puff paste. Mode. Mince a little cold veal and ham, allowing one-third ham to two-thirds veal, add an egg boiled hard and chopped, and a seasoning of pounded mace, salt, pepper, and lemon peel, moisten with a little gravy and cream. Make a good puff paste. Roll rather thin, and cut it into round or square pieces, put the mince between two of them, Pinch the edges to keep in the gravy, and fry a light brown. They may be also baked in patty pans, in that case, they should be brushed over with the yolk of an egg before they are put in the oven. To make a variety, oysters may be substituted for the ham. Time 15 minutes to ferry the patties. Seasonable from March to October. Veal pie. Ingredients 2 pounds of veal cutlets, 1 or 2 slices of lean bacon or ham, pepper and salt to taste, 
2 tablespoonfuls of minced savory herbs, 2 blades of pounded mace, crust, 1 teacupful of gravy. Mode. Cut the cutlets into square pieces, and season them with pepper, salt, and pounded mace. Put them in a pie dish with the savory herbs sprinkled over, and one or two slices of lean bacon or ham placed at the top, if possible, this should be previously cooked, as undressed bacon makes the veal red, and spoils its appearance. Pour in a little water, cover with crust, ornament it in any way that is approved, brush it over with the yolk of an egg, and bake in a well-heated oven for about one and a half hour. Pour in a good gravy after baking, which is done by removing the top ornament, and replacing it after the gravy is added. Time. About one and a half hour. Average cost, twos. 6D. Sufficient for five or six persons. Seasonable from March to October. A very veal dinner. At a dinner given by Lord Polk Emmett, a Scotch nobleman and judge, his guests saw, when the covers were removed, that the fare consisted of veal broth, a roasted fillet of veal, veal cutlets, a veal pie, a calf's head, and calf's foot jelly. The judge, observing the surprise of his guests, volunteered an explanation. Oh, I, it's a cough, when we kill a beast, we just eat up A.E. side, and down the tither. Veal and ham pie. Ingredients. Two pounds, of veal cutlets, half a pound. Of boiled ham, two tablespoonfuls of minced savory herbs, one quarter teaspoonful of grated nutmeg, two blades of pounded mace, pepper and salt to taste, a strip of lemon peel finely minced, the yolks of two hard-boiled eggs, one half pint of water. Nearly one half pint of good strong gravy, puff crust. Mode. Cut the veal into nice square pieces, and put a layer of them at the bottom of a pie dish, sprinkle over these a portion of the herbs, spices, seasoning, lemon peel, and the yolks of the eggs cut in slices. Cut the ham very thin, and put a layer of this in. Proceed in this manner until the dish is full, so arranging it that the ham comes at the top. Lay a puff paste on the edge of the dish, and pour in about one half pint of water. Cover with crust, ornament it with leaves, brush it over with the yolk of an egg, and bake in a well-heated oven for one to one and a half hour, or longer, should the pie be very large. When it is taken out of the oven, pour in at the top, through a funnel, nearly one half pint of strong gravy, this should be made sufficiently good that, when cold, it may cut in a firm jelly. This pie may be very much enriched by adding a few mushrooms, oysters, or sweetbreads, but it will be found very good without any of the last named additions. Time. One and a half hour, or longer, should the pie be very large. Average cost, threes. Sufficient for five or six persons. Seasonable from March to October. Potted veal, for breakfast. Ingredients. To every pound of veal allow a quarter pound, of ham, cayenne and pounded mace to taste, six ounces of fresh butter, clarified butter. Mode. Mince the veal and ham together as finely as possible, and pound well in a mortar, with cayenne, pounded mace, and fresh butter in the above proportion. When reduced to a perfectly smooth paste, press it into potting pots, and cover with clarified butter. If kept in a cool place, it will remain good some days. Seasonable from March to October. Names of calves, and k. During the time the young male calf is suckled by his mother, he is called a bull or ox calf, when turned a year old, he is called a stirk, stot, or yearling. On the completion of his second year, he is called a two-year-old bull or steer, and in some counties a twinter, then, a three-year-old steer, and at four, an ox or a bullock, which latter names are retained till death. It may be here remarked, that the term ox is used as a general or common appellation for neat cattle, in a specific sense, and irrespective of sex, as the British ox, the Indian ox. The female is termed cow, but while sucking the mother, a cow-calf. At the age of a year, she is called a yearling ke, in another year, a heifer, or twinter, then, a three-year-old ke or twinter, and, at four years old, a cow. Other names, to be regarded as provincialisms, may exist in different districts. 
Ragu of cold veal, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of cold veal, 1 ounce. Of butter, 1 half pint of gravy, thickening of butter and flour, pepper and salt to taste, 1 blade of pounded mace, 1 tablespoonful of mushroom ketchup, 1 tablespoonful of sherry, 1 dessert spoonful of lemon juice, force meat balls. Mode. Any part of veal will make this dish. Cut the meat into nice looking pieces, put them in a stew pan with 1 ounce of butter, and fry a light brown. Add the gravy, hot water may be substituted for this, thicken with a little butter and flour, and stew gently about a quarter hour, season with pepper, salt and pounded mace, add the ketchup, sherry, and lemon juice, give one boil, and serve. Garnish the dish with force meat balls and fried rashers of bacon. Time. Altogether half an hour. Average cost, exclusive of the cold meat, 6D. Seasonable from March to October. Note. The above recipe may be varied, by adding vegetables, such as peas, cucumbers, lettuces, green onions cut in slices, a dozen or two of green gooseberries, not seedy, all of which should be fried a little with the meat. And then stewed in the gravy. Veal rissoles, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. A few slices of cold roast veal, a few slices of ham or bacon, one tablespoonful of minced parsley, one tablespoonful of minced savory herbs, one blade of pounded mace, a very little grated nutmeg, cayenne and salt to taste, two eggs well beaten. Bread crumbs. Mode. Mince the veal very finely with a little ham or bacon, add the parsley, herbs, spices, and seasoning, mix into a paste with an egg, form into balls or cones, brush these over with egg, sprinkle with bread crumbs, and fry a rich brown. Serve with brown gravy, and garnish the dish with fried parsley. Time. About 10 minutes to ferry the rissoles. Seasonable from March to October. Veal rolls, cold meat cookery. Ingredients. The remains of a cold fillet of veal, egg and bread crumbs, a few slices of fat bacon, force meat number 417. Mode. Cut a few slices from a cold fillet of veal half an inch thick, rub them over with egg. Lay a thin slice of fat bacon over each piece of veal, brush these with the egg, and over this spread the force meat thinly, roll up each piece tightly, egg and bread crumb them, and fry them a rich brown. Serve with mushroom sauce or brown gravy. Time. 10 to 15 minutes to ferry the rolls. Seasonable from March to October. Shoulder of veal, stuffed and stewed. Ingredients. A shoulder of veal, a few slices of ham or bacon, force meat no. 417, 3 carrots, 2 onions, salt and pepper to taste, a faggot of savory herbs, 3 blades of pounded mace, water, thickening of butter and flour. Mode. Bone the joint by carefully detaching the meat from the blade bone on one side, and then on the other, being particular not to pierce the skin, then cut the bone from the knuckle, and take it out. Fill the cavity whence the bone was taken with a forcemeat made by recipe number 417. Roll and bind the veal up tightly, put it into a stew pan with the carrots, onions, seasoning, herbs, and mace. Pour in just sufficient water to cover it, and let it stew very gently for about 5 hours. Before taking it up, Try if it is properly done by thrusting a larding needle in it, if it penetrates easily, it is sufficiently cooked. Strain and skim the gravy, thicken with butter and flour, give one boil, and pour it round the meat. A few young carrots may be boiled and placed round the dish as a garnish, and, when in season, green peas should always be served with this dish. Time. 5 hours. Average cost, 7d per lb. Sufficient for 8 or 9 persons. Seasonable from March to October. The fattening of calves. The fattening of calves for the market is an important business in Lanarkshire or Clydesdale, and numbers of newly dropped calves are regularly carried there from the farmers of the adjacent districts, in order to be prepared for the butcher. The mode of feeding them is very simple, milk is the chief article of their diet, 
and of this the calves require a sufficient supply from first to last. Added to this, they must be kept in a well-aired place, neither too hot nor too cold, and freely supplied with dry litter. It is usual to exclude the light, at all events to a great degree, and to put within their reach a lump of chalk, which they are very fond of licking. Thus fed, calves, at the end of eight or nine weeks, often attain a very large size, viz. 18 to 20 stone, exclusive of the offal. Far heavier weights have occurred, and without any deterioration in the delicacy and richness of the flesh. This mode of feeding upon milk alone at first appears to be very expensive, but it is not so, when all things are taken into consideration. For at the age of nine or ten weeks a calf, originally purchased for eight shillings, will realize nearly the same number of pounds. For four, or even six weeks, the milk of one cow is sufficient, indeed half that quantity is enough for the first fortnight. But after the fifth or sixth week it will consume the greater portion of the milk of two moderate cows, but then it requires neither oil cake nor linseed, nor any other food. Usually, however, the calves are not kept beyond the age of six weeks, and will then sell for five or six pounds each, the milk of the cow is then ready for a successor. In this manner a relay of calves may be prepared for the markets from early spring to the end of summer, a plan more advantageous than that of overfeeding one to a useless degree of corpulency. Veal Sausages Ingredients Equal quantities of fat bacon and lean veal, to every pound of meat, allow one teaspoonful of minced sage, salt and pepper to taste. Mode Chop the meat and bacon finely, and to every pound allow the above proportion of very finely minced sage. Add a seasoning of pepper and salt, mix the whole well together, make it into flat cakes, and fry a nice brown. Seasonable from March to October. Stewed veal, with peas, young carrots, and new potatoes. Ingredients 3 or 4 pounds Of the loin or neck of veal, 15 young carrots, a few green onions, 1 pint of green peas, 12 new potatoes, a bunch of savory herbs, pepper and salt to taste, 1 tablespoonful of lemon juice, 2 tablespoonfuls of tomato sauce. 2 tablespoonfuls of mushroom ketchup. Mode. Dredge the meat with flour, and roast or bake it for about 3 quarters hour, it should acquire a nice brown color. Put the meat into a stew pan with the carrots, onions, potatoes, herbs, pepper, and salt. Pour over it sufficient boiling water to cover it, and stew gently for two hours. Take out the meat and herbs, put it in a deep dish, skim off all the fat from the gravy, and flavor it with lemon juice, tomato sauce, and mushroom ketchup in the above proportion. Have ready a pint of green peas boiled. Put these with the meat, pour over it the gravy, and serve. The dish may be garnished with a few force meat balls. The meat, when preferred, may be cut into chops and floured and fried instead of being roasted. And any part of veal dressed in this way will be found extremely savory and good. Time 3 hours. Average cost 9d. Per lb. Sufficient for 6 or 7 persons. Seasonable with peas from June to August. Baked SWETBREADS, an entree. Ingredients 3 sweetbreads, egg and bread crumbs, oiled butter, 3 slices of toast, brown gravy. Illustration, SWETBREADS Mode Choose large white sweetbreads, put them into warm water to draw out the blood, and to improve their color. Let them remain for rather more than 1 hour, then put them into boiling water, and allow them to simmer for about 10 minutes, which renders them firm. Take them up, drain them, brush over with egg, sprinkle with bread crumbs. Dip them in egg again, and then into more bread crumbs. Drop on them a little oiled butter, and put the sweetbreads into a moderately heated oven, and let them bake for nearly three quarters hour. Make three pieces of toast. Place the sweetbreads on the toast, and pour round, but not over them, a good brown gravy. Time. To soak one hour, to be boiled 10 minutes, baked 40 minutes. Average cost, 1s. 
to fives. Sufficient for an entree. Seasonable. In full season from May to August. Fried SWETBREADS a la maitre d'hôtel, an entree. Ingredients. Three sweetbreads, egg and bread crumbs, a quarter pound, of butter, salt and pepper to taste, rather more than one half pint of maitre d'hôtel sauce number 466. Mode. Soak the sweetbreads in warm water for an hour, then boil them for 10 minutes, cut them in slices, egg and bread crumb them, season with pepper and salt, and put them into a frying pan, with the above proportion of butter. Keep churning them until done, which will be in about 10 minutes, dish them, and pour over them a maitre d'hôtel sauce, made by recipe number 466. The dish may be garnished with slices of cut lemon. Time. To soak one hour, to be broiled 10 minutes, to be fried about 10 minutes. Average cost, ones. To fives, according to the season. Sufficient for an entree. Seasonable. In full season from May to August. Note. The egg and bread crumb may be omitted, and the slices of sweetbread dredged with a little flour instead, and a good gravy may be substituted for the maitre d'hôtel sauce. This is a very simple method of dressing them. Stewed SWETBREADS, an entree. Ingredients. Three sweetbreads, one pint of white stock number 107, thickening of butter and flour, six tablespoonfuls of cream, one tablespoonful of lemon juice, one blade of pounded mace, white pepper and salt to taste. Mode. Soak the sweetbreads in warm water for one hour, and boil them for ten minutes, Take them out, put them into cold water for a few minutes, lay them in a stew pan with the stock, and simmer them gently for rather more than half an hour. Dish them. Thicken the gravy with a little butter and flour, let it boil up, add the remaining ingredients, allow the sauce to get quite hot, but not boil, and pour it over the sweetbreads. Time. To soak one hour, to be boiled ten minutes, stewed rather more than half an hour. Average cost. From ones to fives, according to the season. Sufficient for an entree. Seasonable. In full season from May to August. Note. A few mushrooms added to this dish, and stewed with the sweetbreads, will be found an improvement. Season and choice of veal. Veal, like all other meats, has its season of plenty. The best veal, and the largest supply, are to be had from March to the end of July. It comes principally from the western counties, and is generally of the Alderney breed. In purchasing veal, its whiteness and fineness of grain should be considered, the color being especially of the utmost consequence. Veal may be bought at all times of the year and of excellent quality, but is generally very dear, except in the months of plenty. Stewed tendrons DVAU, an entree. Ingredients the gristles from two breasts of veal, stock no. 107, one faggot of savory herbs, two blades of pounded mace, four cloves, two carrots, two onions, a strip of lemon peel. Mode. The tendrons or gristles, which are found round the front of a breast of veal, are now very frequently served as an entree, and when well dressed, make a nice and favorite dish. Detach the gristles from the bone, and cut them neatly out, so as not to spoil the joint for roasting or stewing. Put them into a stew pan, with sufficient stock, number 107, to cover them. Add the herbs, mace, cloves, carrots, onions, and lemon, and simmer these for nearly, or quite, four hours. They should be stewed until a fork will enter the meat easily. Take them up, drain them, strain the gravy, boil it down to a glaze, with which glaze the meat. Dish the tendrons in a circle, with croutons fried of a nice color placed between each. And put mushroom sauce, or a puree of green peas or tomatoes, in the middle. Time. 4 hours. Sufficient for one entree. Seasonable. With peas, from June to August. Calpio X, or variola. It is to Dr. Jenner, of Berkeley, Gloucestershire, 
who died in 1823, that we owe the practice of vaccination, as a preservative from the attack of that destructive scourge of the human race, the smallpox. The experiments of this philosophic man were begun in 1797, and published the next year. He had observed that cows were subject to a certain infectious eruption of the teats, and that those persons who became affected by it, while milking the cattle, escaped the smallpox raging around them. This fact, known to farmers from time immemorial, led him to a course of experiments, the result of which all are acquainted with. Tendrons devau, an entree. Ingredients. The gristles from two breasts of veal, stock no. 107, one faggot of savory herbs, one blade of pounded mace, for cloves, two carrots, two onions, a strip of lemon peel, egg and bread crumbs, two tablespoonfuls of chopped mushrooms, salt and pepper to taste, two tablespoonfuls of sherry, the yolk of one egg. Three tablespoonfuls of cream. Mode. After removing the gristles from a breast of veal, stew them for four hours, as in the preceding recipe, with stock, herbs, mace, cloves, carrots, onions, and lemon peel. When perfectly tender, lift them out and remove any bones or hard parts remaining. Put them between two dishes, with a weight on the top, and when cold, cut them into slices. Brush these over with egg, sprinkle with bread crumbs, and fry a pale brown. Take one half pint of the gravy they were boiled in, add two tablespoonfuls of chopped mushrooms, a seasoning of salt and pepper, the sherry, and the yolk of an egg beaten with three tablespoonfuls of cream. Stir the sauce over the fire until it thickens. When it is on the point of boiling, dish the tendrons in a circle, and pour the sauce in the middle. Tendrons are dressed in a variety of ways, with sauce a l'espagnol, vegetables of all kinds, when they are served with a puree, they should always be glazed. Time. Four and a half hours. Average cost. Usually bought with breast of veal. Sufficient for an entree. Seasonable from March to October. Tete de vo en tortu, an entree. Ingredients. Half a calf's head, or the remains of a cold boiled one, rather more than one pint of good white stock, no. 107, one glass of sherry or Madeira, cayenne and salt to taste, about 12 mushroom buttons, when obtainable, 6 hard-boiled eggs, 4 gherkins, 8 canals or force meat balls, number 422 or 423, 12 crayfish, 12 croutons. Mode. Half a calf's head is sufficient to make a good entree, and if there are any remains of a cold one left from the preceding day, it will answer very well for this dish. After boiling the head until tender, remove the bones, and cut the meat into neat pieces, put the stock into a stew pan, add the wine, and a seasoning of salt and cayenne, fry the mushrooms in butter for two or three minutes, and add these to the gravy. Boil this quickly until somewhat reduced, then put in the yolks of the hard-boiled eggs whole, the whites cut in small pieces, and the gherkins chopped. Have ready a few veal canals, made by recipe number 422 or 423. Add these, with the slices of head, to the other ingredients, and let the whole get thoroughly hot, without boiling. Arrange the pieces of head as high in the center of the dish as possible. Pour over them the ragu, and garnish with the crayfish and croutons placed alternately. A little of the gravy should also be served in a tureen. Time. About half an hour to reduce the stock. Sufficient for six or seven persons. Average cost, exclusive of the calf's head, twos. 9d. Seasonable from March to October. A Frenchman's opinion of veal. A great authority in his native Paris tells us, that veal, as a meat, is but little nourishing, is relaxing, and sufficiently difficult of digestion. Lending itself, as it does, he says, in all the flowery imagery of the French tongue and manner, to so many metamorphoses, it may be called, without exaggeration, the chameleon of the kitchen. Who has not eaten calves head au naturel, simply boiled with the skin on, its flavor heightened by sauce just a little sharp. It is a dish as wholesome as it is agreeable, and one that the most inexperienced cook may serve with success. Calves feet a la poulette, 
au gratin, fried, and k, les cervelles, served in the same manner, and under the same names. Sweetbreads and fricando, peaks and fin, all these offer most satisfactory entrees, which the art of the cook, more or less, varies for the gratification of his glory in the well-being of our appetites. We have not spoken, in the above catalogue either of the liver, or of the phrase, or of the ears, which also share the honour of appearing at our tables. Where is the man not acquainted with calves' liver à la bourgeoise, the most frequent and convenient dish at unpretentious tables? The phrase, cooked in water, and eaten with vinegar, is a wholesome and agreeable dish, and contains a mucilage well adapted for delicate persons. Calves' ears have, in common with the feet and cervelles, the advantage of being able to be eaten either fried or à la poulette, and besides, can be made into a farce, with the addition of peas, onions, cheese, and k. Neither is it confined to the calves' tongue, or even the eyes, that these shall dispute alone the glory of awakening the taste of man. Thus, the fresher, which, as is known, comprises the heart, the mouth, and the rate, although not a very recherché dish, lends itself to all the caprices of an expert artist, and may, under various marvellous disguises, deceive, and please. And even awaken our appetite. Verily, we might say, after this rhapsody of our neighbour, that his country's weal will not suffer in him as an able and eloquent exponent and admirer. Veal Carving Breast of Veal Illustration, Breast of Veal 912. The carving of a breast of veal is not dissimilar to that of a forequarter of lamb, when the shoulder has been taken off. The breast of veal consists of two parts, the rib bones and the gristly brisket. These two parts should first be separated by sharply passing the knife in the direction of the lines 1, 2, when they are entirely divided, the rib bones should be carved in the direction of the lines 5 to 6. And the brisket can be helped by cutting pieces in the direction 3 to 4. The carver should ask the guests whether they have a preference for the brisket or ribs. And if there be a sweetbread served with the dish, as it often is with roast breast of veal, each person should receive a piece. Calves Head Illustration, Calves Head 913 This is not altogether the most easy-looking dish to cut when it is put before a carver for the first time. There is not much real difficulty in the operation, however, when the head has been attentively examined, and, after the manner of a phrenologist, you get to know its bumps, good and bad. In the first place, inserting the knife quite down to the bone, cut slices in the direction of the line 1 to 2, with each of these should be helped a piece of what is called the throat sweetbread, cut in the direction of from 3 to 4. The eye, and the flesh round, are favorite morsels with many, and should be given to those at the table who are known to be the greatest connoisseurs. The jawbone being removed, there will then be found some nice lean. And the palate, which is reckoned by some a titbit, lies under the head. On a separate dish there is always served the tongue and brains, and each guest should be asked to take some of these. Filet of Veal Illustration, Filet of Veal 914 the carving of this joint is similar to that of a round of beef. Slices, not too thick, in the direction of the line 1 to 2 are cut, and the only point to be careful about is, that the veal be evenly carved. Between the flap and the meat the stuffing is inserted, and a small portion of this should be served to every guest. The persons whom the host wishes most to honor should be asked if they like the delicious brown outside slice, as this, by many, is exceedingly relished. Knuckle of Veal Illustration, Knuckle of Veal 915 The engraving, showing the dotted line from 1 to 2, sufficiently indicates the direction which should be given to the knife in carving this dish. The best slices are those from the thickest part of the knuckle, that is, outside the line 1 to 2. Loin of Veal Illustration, Loin of Veal 916 as is the case with a loin of mutton, the careful jointing of a loin of veal is more than half the battle in carving it. If the butcher be negligent in this matter, he should be admonished. For there is nothing more annoying or irritating to an inexperienced carver than to be obliged to turn his knife in all directions to find the exact place where it should be inserted in order to divide the bones. 
When the jointing is properly performed, there is little difficulty in carrying the knife down in the direction of the line 1 to 2. To each guest should be given a piece of the kidney and kidney fat, which lie underneath, and are considered great delicacies. Illustration Illustration Chapter 20 General Observations on Birds Birds, the free tenants of land, air, and ocean. Their forms all symmetry, their motions grace. In plumage delicate and beautiful. Thick without burthen, close as fish's scales. Or loose as full-blown poppies to the breeze. The Pelican Island. 917, the divisions of birds are founded principally on their habits of life, and the natural resemblance which their external parts, especially their bills, bear to each other. According to Mr. Vigors, there are five orders, each of which occupies its peculiar place on the surface of the globe, so that the air, the forest, the land, the marsh, and the water, has each its appropriate kind of inhabitants. These are respectively designated as birds of prey, perchiers, walkers, waders, and swimmers. And, in contemplating their variety, lightness, beauty, and wonderful adaptation to the regions they severally inhabit, and the functions they are destined to perform in the grand scheme of creation. Our hearts are lifted with admiration at the exhaustless ingenuity, power, and wisdom of him who has, in producing them, so strikingly manifested his handiwork. Not only these, however, but all classes of animals, have their peculiar ends to fulfill, and, in order that this may be effectually performed, they are constructed in such a manner as will enable them to carry out their conditions. Thus the quadrupeds, that are formed to tread the earth in common with man, are muscular and vigorous. And, whether they have passed into the servitude of man, or are permitted to range the forest or the field, they still retain, in a high degree, the energies with which they were originally endowed. Birds, on the contrary, are generally feeble, and, therefore, timid. Accordingly, wings have been given them to enable them to fly through the air, and thus elude the force which, by nature, they are unable to resist. Notwithstanding the natural tendency of all bodies towards the center of the earth, birds, when raised in the atmosphere, glide through it with the greatest ease, rapidity, and vigor. There, they are in their natural element, and can vary their course with the greatest promptitude, can mount or descend with the utmost facility, and can light on any spot with the most perfect exactness. And without the slightest injury to themselves. 918. The mechanism which enables birds to wing their course through the air, is both singular and instructive. Their bodies are covered with feathers, which are much lighter than coverings of hair, with which quadrupeds are usually clothed. The feathers are so placed as to overlap each other, like the slates or the tiles on the roof of a house. They are also arranged from the forepart backwards, by which the animals are enabled the more conveniently to cut their way through the air. Their bones are tubular or hollow, and extremely light compared with those of terrestrial animals. This greatly facilitates their rising from the earth, whilst their heads, being comparatively small, their bills shaped like a wedge, their bodies slender, sharp below, and round above, all these present a union of conditions, favorable. In the last degree, to cutting their way through the aerial element to which they are considered as more peculiarly to belong. With all these conditions, however, birds could not fly without wings. These, therefore, are the instruments by which they have the power of rapid locomotion, and are constructed in such a manner as to be capable of great expansion when struck in a downward direction. If we accept, in this action, the slight hollow which takes place on the underside, they become almost two planes. In order that the downward action may be accomplished to the necessary extent, the muscles which move the wings have been made exceedingly large. So large, indeed, that, in some instances, they have been estimated at not less than a sixth of the weight of the whole body. Therefore, when a bird is on the ground and intends to fly, it takes a leap, and immediately stretching its wings, strikes them out with great force. By this act these are brought into an oblique direction, being turned partly upwards and partly horizontally forwards. That part of the force which has the upward tendency is neutralized by the weight of the bird, whilst the horizontal force serves to carry it forward. 
The stroke being completed, it moves upon its wings, which, being contracted and having their edges turned upwards, obviate, in a great measure, the resistance of the air. When it is sufficiently elevated, it makes a second stroke downwards, and the impulse of the air again moves it forward. These successive strokes may be regarded as so many leaps taken in the air. When the bird desires to direct its course to the right or the left, it strikes strongly with the opposite wing, which impels it to the proper side. In the motions of the animal, too, the tail takes a prominent part, and acts like the rudder of a ship, except that, instead of sideways, it moves upwards and downwards. If the bird wishes to rise, it raises its tail. And if to fall, it depresses it, and, whilst in a horizontal position, it keeps it steady. There are few who have not observed a pigeon or a crow preserve, for some time, a horizontal flight without any apparent motion of the wings. This is accomplished by the bird having already acquired sufficient velocity, and its wings being parallel to the horizon, meeting with but small resistance from the atmosphere. If it begins to fall, it can easily steer itself upward by means of its tail, till the motion it had acquired is nearly spent, when it must be renewed by a few more strokes of the wings. On alighting, a bird expands its wings and tail fully against the air, as a ship, in tacking round, backs her sails, in order that they may meet with all the resistance possible. 919. In the construction of the eyes of birds, there is a peculiarity necessary to their condition. As they pass a great portion of their lives among thickets and hedges, they are provided for the defense of their eyes from external injuries, as well as from the effects of the light, when flying in opposition to the rays of the sun. With a nictating or winking membrane, which can, at pleasure, be drawn over the whole eye like a curtain. This covering is neither opaque nor wholly pellucid, but is somewhat transparent, and it is by its means that the eagle is said to be able to gaze at the sun. In birds, says a writer on this subject, we find that the sight is much more piercing, extensive, and exact, than in the other orders of animals. The eye is much larger in proportion to the bulk of the head, than in any of these. This is a superiority conferred upon them not without a corresponding utility, it seems even indispensable to their safety and subsistence. Were this organ in birds dull, or in the least degree opaque, they would be in danger, from the rapidity of their motion, of striking against various objects in their flight. In this case their celerity, instead of being an advantage, would become an evil, and their flight be restrained by the danger resulting from it. Indeed we may consider the velocity with which an animal moves, as a sure indication of the perfection of its vision. Among the quadrupeds, the sloth has its sight greatly limited. Whilst the hawk, as it hovers in the air, can espy a lark sitting on a clod, perhaps at twenty times the distance at which a man or a dog could perceive it. 920. Amongst the many peculiarities in the construction of birds, not the least is the mode by which their respiration is accomplished. This is effected by means of air vessels, which extend throughout the body, and adhere to the undersurface of the bones. These, by their motion, force the air through the true lungs, which are very small, and placed in the uppermost part of the chest, and closely braced down to the back and ribs. The lungs, which are never expanded by air, are destined to the sole purpose of oxidizing the blood. In the experiments made by Mr. John Hunter, to discover the use of this general diffusion of air through the bodies of birds, he found that it prevents their respiration from being stopped or interrupted by the rapidity of their motion through a resisting medium. It is well known that, in proportion to celerity of motion, the air becomes resistive. And were it possible for a man to move with the swiftness of a swallow, as he is not provided with an internal construction similar to that of birds, the resistance of the air would soon suffocate him. 921. Birds are distributed over every part of the globe, being found in the coldest as well as the hottest regions, although some species are restricted to particular countries, whilst others are widely dispersed. At certain seasons of the year, many of them change their abodes, and migrate to climates better adapted to their temperaments or modes of life, for a time, than those which they leave. Many of the birds of Britain, directed by an unerring instinct, take their departure from the island before the commencement of winter, and proceed to the more congenial warmth of Africa, to return with the next spring. 
The causes assigned by naturalists for this peculiarity are either a deficiency of food, or the want of a secure asylum for the incubation and nourishment of their young. Their migrations are generally performed in large companies, and, in the day, they follow a leader, which is occasionally changed. During the night, many of the tribes send forth a continual cry, to keep themselves together. Although one would think that the noise which must accompany their flight would be sufficient for that purpose. The flight of birds across the Mediterranean was noticed 3,000 years ago, as we find it said in the Book of Numbers, in the Scriptures, that, there went forth a wind from the Lord, and brought quails from the sea. And let them fall upon the camp, and a day's journey round about it, to the height of two cubits above the earth. 922. If the beauty of birds were not a recommendation to their being universally admired, their general liveliness, gaiety, and psalm would endear them to mankind. It appears, however, from accurate observations founded upon experiment, that the notes peculiar to different kinds of birds are altogether acquired, and that they are not innate, any more than language is to man. The attempt of a nestling bird to sing has been compared to the endeavor of a child to talk. The first attempts do not seem to possess the slightest rudiments of the future song. But, as the bird grows older and becomes stronger, it is easily perceived to be aiming at acquiring the art of giving utterance to song. Whilst the scholar is thus endeavoring to form his notes, when he is once sure of a passage, he usually raises his tone, but drops it again when he finds himself unequal to the voluntary task he has undertaken. Many well-authenticated facts, says an ingenious writer, seem decisively to prove that birds have no innate notes, but that, like mankind, the language of those to whose care they have been committed at their birth will be their language in afterlife. It would appear, however, somewhat unaccountable why, in a wild state, they adhere so steadily to the song of their own species only, when the notes of so many others are to be heard around them. This is said to arise from the attention paid by the nestling bird to the instructions of its own parent only, generally disregarding the notes of all the rest. Persons. However, who have an accurate ear, and who have given their attention to the songs of birds, can frequently distinguish some which have their notes mixed with those of another species. But this is in general so trifling, that it can hardly be considered as more than the mere varieties of provincial dialects. 923. In reference to the food of birds, we find that it varies, as it does in quadrupeds, according to the species. Some are altogether carnivorous. Others, as so many of the web-footed tribes, subsist on fish, others, again, on insects and worms, and others on grain and fruit. The extraordinary powers of the gizzard of the granivorous tribes, in combinating their food so as to prepare it for digestion, would, were they not supported by incontrovertible facts founded on experiment, appear to exceed all credibility. Tin tubes, full of grain, have been forced into the stomachs of turkeys, and in twenty-four hours have been found broken, compressed, and distorted into every shape. Twelve small lancets, very sharp both at the point and edges, have been fixed in a ball of lead, covered with a case of paper, and given to a turkey cock, and left in its stomach for eight hours. After that time the stomach was opened, when nothing appeared except the naked ball. The twelve lancets were broken to pieces, whilst the stomach remained perfectly sound and entire. From these facts, it is concluded that the stones, so frequently found in the stomachs of the feathered tribes, are highly useful in assisting the gastric juices to grind down the grain and other hard substances which constitute their food. The stones, themselves, being also ground down and separated by the powerful action of the gizzard, are mixed with the food, and, no doubt, contribute very greatly to the health, as well as to the nourishment of the animals. 924. All birds being oviparous, the eggs which they produce after the process of incubation, or sitting for a certain length of time, are, in the various species, different both in figure and color, as well as in point of number. They contain the elements of the future young, for the perfecting of which in the incubation a bubble of air is always placed at the large end, between the shell and the inside skin. It is supposed that from the heat communicated by the sitting bird to this confined air, its spring is increased beyond its natural tenor, and, at the same time, its parts are put into motion by the gentle rarefaction. By this means, 
pressure and motion are communicated to the parts of the egg, which, in some inscrutable way, gradually promote the formation and growth of the young, till the time comes for its escaping from the shell. To preserve an egg perfectly fresh, and even fit for incubation, for five or six months after it has been laid, Riau Moore, the French naturalist, has shown that it is only necessary to stop up its pores with a slight coating of varnish or mutton suet. 925. Birds however, do not lay eggs before they have some place to put them, accordingly, they construct nests for themselves with astonishing art. As builders, they exhibit a degree of architectural skill, niceness, and propriety, that would seem even to mock the imitative talents of man, however greatly these are marked by his own high intelligence and ingenuity. Each circumstance. Most artfully contrived to favor warmth. Here read the reason of the vaulted roof. How providence compensates, ever kind. The enormous disproportion that subsists. Between the mother and the numerous brood. Which her small bulk must quicken into life. In building their nests, the male and female generally assist each other, and they contrive to make the outside of their tenement bear as great a resemblance as possible to the surrounding foliage or branches. So that it cannot very easily be discovered even by those who are in search of it. This art of nidification is one of the most wonderful contrivances which the wide field of nature can show, and which, of itself, ought to be sufficient to compel mankind to the belief, that they and every other part of the creation are constantly under the protecting power of a superintending being, whose benign dispensations seem as exhaustless as they are unlimited. Illustration Recipes Chapter 21 Chicken Cutlets, an Entree Ingredients 2 chickens, seasoning to taste of salt, white pepper, and cayenne 